Now, going to get everything I can together in terms of just some other people to hold mark time for me, really. Uh, of course, I didn't even have the microphone near me when I started streaming, so let's get that in front of my head. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, not even here physically right now, but I'm going to start calling everybody. Uh, let's start with the usual. And... <clears throat> We'll bring on our man Jameson first. Let me see if I can go get my voice back. There we are, Jameson. Thank you so much. I know you sent me uh, a lot of messages. I haven't had a chance to review them yet. We are streaming live, and I'm just going to bring everybody I can on who can help. Uh, let's see if we can uh, do that. And uh, in the meantime, uh, I'm glad that uh, you're here. Uh, by that I mean I'm glad you're back on Facebook. I understand you were um, considering leaving and that just would have been unworkable for me because uh, obviously we need convenient communications or we would never be able to ex expedite your helping me at all. Uh, so um, one yeah, of the... I think what I'll do is I'll keep Facebook up only on days when there's a transmission and I'll put it down on days when, you know... Yeah, just don't engage with just don't engage with all those people who make you angry. <laughs> well, it's, it's 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 not it's not that it's people who make me angry. It's that I make myself angry. Mm -hmm. It's a self reflection of myself that I can't stand. It's a uh, if I if I was at war with anything, it's with it's with myself. I'm, I'm glad you see that, and uh, that's appreciated that you've come to that realization. And uh, we welcome, of course, our dear brother, Mr. Salmon Shake, who is the only other person who's with us that I see at the moment among the people that I'm calling. I'm hoping other people will join us. And uh, dear Salmon, uh, if you could uh, uh, place some of what our uh, and Derek Talley has joined us, uh, and Amanda Ute uh, is listed as unavailable. Um, I'm, I'm going to um, ask Salman and Derek to hold the roundtable with our dear friend, uh, Jameson Reese. Uh, bless you all, uh, three caballeros, for uh, appearing tonight. And uh, we will ask uh, all of you to speak first before I uh, get my tea so that we can make this certain that your... Uh, your quality of sound is good so if you would uh if you would just say something each yeah, one of I, you that today was wednesday mm -hmm. oh no worries yes. no, yeah i was spending some time with the, the my son comes home at seven or he gets off at seven and i, I was just making some dinner for the family i was going to make today a family day but i um, like on brother douglas Oh, and peace be upon you as well, my dear brother. And uh, and that, uh, I'm certain, is a sentiment that's echoed by all of us. Uh, so uh, with uh, Derek having the grace to join us, uh, let me see. It wouldn't hurt to try with uh, Pac-1. He can just come on and say hello if, you, if he wishes. Uh, just going to add him in case he wants to do that. And uh, otherwise, hopefully, we're not interrupting uh, anything. And uh, the uh, in terms of his birthday, in case anyone didn't know it today, is both his birthday and the birthday of Lena Shea, which is, uh, you know, very coincident and uh, one of those little synchronicities that happens in the world. Uh, so there we have that. Oh, man, I, I got to put something on his timeline then. Uh, I didn't know it was today's birthday. Happy birthday, Pacquan, if you're yeah. out there listening. Yeah, yeah happy birthday. <laughs> And as always, Gemini's in the house. Yeah. Yes. Happy birthday, Pack One. Yes, yes. So at least he gets that from all of us. And uh, in the interim, I'm going to go mute for a few minutes. I'm going to uh, grab my tea, which will take a little bit of time, uh, probably about seven minutes or so, or, you know, nine minutes. So both, all of you be patient and uh, do me a favor. We're going to officially start the program. It's one minute after 5 p.m. here in California. So it's about a minute after 8 uh, on the night tide over there on the Atlantic seaboard. And uh, we're just going to let everyone acclimate to uh, these three, acclimate with these three gentlemen uh, carrying on the conversation. 
till I return. There's a number of things that I'll try and cover today, but honestly, right now, it's one of those situations where, once again, I need these men to hold everything for me while I uh, pull my head out of my ass and just try to uh, get my consciousness, you know, uh, just regain some kind of... Uh, uh, sense of uh, what's going on in the world around me. Uh, and I mean that in the most personal and immediate environmental sense as well as the global sense. So uh, all of you gentlemen are here to tether me to some modicum of sanity. Uh, and you may start by uh, just ushering in, uh, acclimating our audience to your voices. Uh, and I'll go all right. mute while all three of you well. do that. Okay, so there was something I didn't get to address last week that I wanted to address. Well, last transmission, actually. Uh, what I uh, what I came to realize was that the um, the ghoul perhaps have a different uh, have another way of being able to sense, you know, their prey. Um, they could probably sense auras or electromagnetic fields and whatnot. Um, uh, the reason why I came to this conclusion was because it, because, uh, it was stated that some of the dervishes were able to, you know, be in the desert and not be eaten by the ghoul. So I find that, find that in, uh, quite interesting. Oh, definitely yeah. brother JMO. It's, um, you know, a lot of the Sufis, if you really look at the way that they spend their life, they have, um, basically lost themselves in such an ecstasy for their love for God, Allah. And the prophet peace be upon him that any being that they come across whether that in whether they're in the desert or any environment where you have uh, any being or species that might register the human as a threat or a source of food they don't get registered as such because they have elevated above the terrestrial sphere in many ways you know in the concepts of what they do and how they do it so i think once we get to that level it's uh basically that aspect of Human uh, advancement and consciousness is within all of us, but only if we get to that level where we can be in harmony with the beings on this planet. I agree with you completely. And the other thing I wanted to bring up was uh, Douglas had, uh, I remember we were talking after I was uh, speaking with Penny Bradley about why, um, how expensive it would have been for many of the sci-fi uh people to create uh, less human-like aliens and whatnot. And I started to think that the first the first place I've ever seen aliens really, you know, projected as being alien in the sense that they're unrelatable to the human being were, were probably through the writings of H.P. Lovecraft and right. um, also the uh, story that was written by Arthur Conan Doyle. Where the uh, where where there's this guy who uh, encounters these sort of like amorphous jelly-like uh, beings in the skies. Yeah, that's definitely right. Because even with H.P. Lovecraft, with how Brother Douglas has explained that he had converted to Islam, and a lot of those names of the anti gods were from an Islamic origin, and on top of inheriting the library from his father he was able to gain that inspiration and it even most people don't realize even in islamic teachings the uh, prophet tells you about al Qatulu, which is the forsaker and the deserter and the destroyer so that concept has always been there and that's why the middle east uh, brother jmo is such a place of turmoil because of all of these beings and um, situations that are occurring in that land from one end of the uh, North Africa, you could say, all the way up to the Iran-Pakistan area. It's just so much there, so many hidden beings and civilizations, and so much history that there that we're not taught. And there's a reason why sometimes that area has never found its peace, because humanity is still working towards that evolution. Oh, yes. There's there's a lot of sophistication that goes on in those des desert regions. It's it's things are not as cut and dry as, you know, um, different sects of Islam fighting each other. There's there's a lot of deeper things going on. Um, there are governments searching for um, hidden artifacts, uh, certain artifacts that might be that might have power. Um, this is what I suspect 
uh, this is what I suspect is something that Michael Aquino was up to as well, you know, during the um, uh, wars in the desert, you know. Uh, I suspect that there are certain artifacts of power that can and ex- that, that, that exceed our imagination as to the amount of arcane power that they can yield. And I suspect that these things are also extremely guarded by certain uh, species, uh, what I would call the Shayatin or the Shaitanic species, uh, sh- Shaitanic uh, species. Yeah, that, that's right. I, I agree. I remember in um, certain border regions of Pakistan where I was, there were certain parts where you could not go unless the person who was there, he knew you and he could vouch for you and he could bring you knowing uh, that you're somebody that was not there to cause any kind of trouble. That's the only way you could sit and consult with a lot of those Sufi elders. And it's interesting, a lot of them, like any average normal human being could not live in those places because it's nine out of ten you might be dealing with anything that's in that realm of category in terms of hidden caves or hidden temples or artifacts. Even in Iraq, uh, I remember when the invasion happened in 2003, the uh, the Baghdad Museum, I think that's, that's like the first place that got hit, and they took all the the stuff that was there. And to this day, there's, I think even in the, the, the remainders of the ziggurats that are there, it's still something special about the history of the ancient Sumerians and the type of uh, history that they had left behind. So even in um, where I, you know in my part of the world, it was certain places where you couldn't go unless you had somebody there that knew you and could basically not register you as a threat. Just how like you have a lot of the Sufi dervishes just whirling around in the desert and any being or species that might see human as a threat or a food source, they don't give them that regard. They actually respect them that they have elevated above what, you know, our human physical body and mental and spiritual mindset is limited to. Yes, and and this is precisely why I suspect that the Agul, and they are a shaitanic species as well. Uh, This is one of the reasons why I suspect that they have the capacity to see in a way that's not conventional like us, you know, as far as physiology is concerned. Uh, this is something that I guess this this is a this is probably a gnosis that hit me while I was walking uh, outside today, but I suspect that they're able to see that they're drawn to people with certain uh, carnal attachments, and those are the people who are really ripped apart. Yeah, that's definitely right because it's ultimately it's your lower nature. If you could overcome the aspect of the lower nature, then any being that might see, let's say, the human as a food source or anything else, you just won't register in their database when they analyze you. So if you elevate yourself in uh, many ways and in many situations, then you can walk in these places. I mean, uh, just that picture that I had tagged you and Brother Douglas in, where you, the, the serpent was actually a companion of the Sufi master who's buried there. So they even made a grave, like a holy grave, even for the serpent, realizing that if these beings here could become one with the master that was here, then humanity has that same capability. But had it been a regular person from a lower nature in an aspect of chaos and division, he probably would have been devoured by the serpent rather than the serpent becoming its friend. It's like I think it's in the in the Buddha situation as well. Ah, uh, yes, that is true. And uh there are um, ruins in India that are really fascinating, uh, where they show like these almost, uh, where they show these uh, serpents that have like these uh, serpentine bodies in the upper bodies, like that of a human. And so, you know, there there are many different races and many different um, speciations that exist to this day and are still in a, still extent that we don't know about and that are probably living among living amongst us in in a sort of uh vibration that we can't fathom them in yes that, that's exactly right and i have a story for you brother jamo is um in the 1950s or 60s my father had described seeing this woman because at that time our family was living in the border region of india and pakistan and he had described seeing a being a woman 
like a slim, slender woman, tall stature. And when he looked at her feet, her feet were basically backwards. Like your normal human, his, his or uh, her feet are facing uh, to the front. But this woman, when she was walking, her feet was faced backwards. And that was uh, interesting how he had described me, the, the vibe that the woman gave him. And I mean, she was nice to him. I mean, and because he, he wasn't a bad person or anything. He was on his way. He was holding a lamp because electricity was an issue, too, at that time. And he was walking at night, going home. And that was interesting. He had encountered that woman, and she looked the way that she did with her feet facing backwards. So you're right. There are many of these beings who live amongst us. We just don't know, or some just don't have the comprehension to understand. Yes. And uh, the thing is, you know, we lack the maturity to... You know, we, we, we really lack the maturity here in the West to be able to really deal with things like this. Um, and this is very evident by the entire alien thing that they're trying to ram down everyone's throats, you know, and people um, calling every, you know, I remember uh, being in a forum for like UFOs and they were calling people with birth defects aliens they were calling anything that looked different aliens and, and i'm like are right. you kidding me um and that was a long time ago i don't i don't i definitely don't dwell in places like that anymore because those are more or less sewages of shit <laughs> which 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 are supporting this entire um which are on par with the agenda of this uh, russian propaganda alt-right state that wants to dismantle this country. And they're going to do it with aliens and all this other bullshit. And the uh, good thing is that we have, you know, men like we have Douglas Dietrich to let us know that that's all bullshit. Yeah, brother, that's absolutely correct. Um, I, I know one thing, any, any source or any uh, source of information that's telling you to look to the outside just know that they're taking your attention away from where the stuff is really going on, which is the inside. Same thing with the spiritual paths. You have to look within yourself. Same thing with what Brother Douglas has taught us is that they're focusing your attention on the exterior, not knowing that everything is right here. And then the, the racism behind the alien phenomena and the aspect of the UFOs and the, the right being in exile, like those are that's the information that's prevalent. But then again, you know, with his truth, whenever you speak the truth, you will be attacked and suppressed by the enemy. So it's it's interesting with the release of his book. Now they're coming out with all of this stuff out of nowhere. So it just goes to show you who Douglas Dietrich really is and the truth that he's uh, sharing with humanity and why it's prevalent for everyone to share his information and support him in any way possible. It's just evident with all of this stuff. And how it just like correlates with one another. There, there is, there are no such thing as coincidences. Bless you. That was wonderful. Uh, I hope all of you have been uh, sharing the roundtable. I came back just in time to hear the last few moments here before I inserted myself from uh, both uh, Brother Salmon and uh, Jameson speaking. And uh, yeah. literally, uh, oh, by the, by the way, uh, Paquan Morales. Uh, says, uh, thank you so much. I love everyone. We're at a bar or I'd be on. As soon as I get home, I'll call in. Uh, and uh, wonderful. So good to hear from him. And Amanda Ute says, uh, happy birthday, Paquan. And oh, she's with us. Oh, let's hear her voice. Oh, I'm so glad you're here, honey. And uh, uh, do, uh, you know, let's hear the quality of your sound. Uh, hello. <laughs> oh, you're wonderful. Yeah. And uh, so, honey, uh, go ahead and say, uh, you know, a little bit about what's going on with you in a few moments. I just want to, to say something a little more than hello before I jump back into asking what happened to Derek. <laughs> I noticed that he's uh, dropped off or is he with us? I think he's dropped off. Yes. Uh, I... Yes, it, it seems that uh, Derek uh, left the uh, Skype thing uh i don't uh it could have something to do with the fact that he's going through the um what do you call it oh uh -huh. uh, oh my gosh uh forgive me my brain is like 
Uh, I'm, I'm not much better off, so don't worry about that. Uh, he's going through. Uh, are we thinking of something emotional? The dialysis. Something to... Dialysis. Uh, well, yeah, he's not. Dialysis. He's not doing dialysis right at this moment, or he wouldn't have come on the call. Uh, oh, 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 okay. Um, that. All right. So oh, I'm that, that. 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 That's my sort of garbled thinking. Right. It's just like, <laughs> yes. So, yes. Uh, We're working with that, sir. So, so let's uh, take a look and see if he left any messages. But other than that, um, as I said, Solomon Shake, he really gives us the impression of brotherhood here, the real uh, feeling of of brotherhood, and of course, uh, this uh, is what renders the. Uh, the company of Amanda so much the more valuable because the sisterhood she represents. Uh, so, honey, uh, just uh, catch us up a little bit on what's been going on with the squirrel. You were fixing his his little uh, paw, and um, how's that coming along? It is fabulous. Um, I was able to get him back together. His they, We have um, his his paws his pads of his paws have healed around the bone so we have no infection no snapped bone no snap tendons and he's starting to use it to eat and so it's it's looking all good wonderful so, yeah after after probably a, another week just to make sure there is no infection and no issues he'll uh He'll be able to be re-released again, and he'll go back out frolicking with the other little squirrels. Yes, yes. So, of course, uh, we'll um, talk a little bit more about that later tonight, and I'll come up with some further squirrel girl uh, analogies or <laughs> parallels. Uh, I'm so glad you remember that character. Uh, honestly, she was never popular in Marvel Comics because everybody just, you know, squirrels, they're just not, they're just not uh, ominous enough for people to dig into as some kind of a badass uh, kind of superheroine. And so uh, she was relegated, if you might remember, among the X-Men to taking care of the other superheroes, uh, their children, the, the product of whatever illegitimate unions uh, the uh, her heroes and heroines of the uh, X community were, were, were you know, spawning. Uh, I don't know if you remember any of that. Kind of roughly mm -hmm. a, a bit of that, but not, not as much as the other I doubt anyone yeah. remembers. <laughs> you know, the thing about squirrels, though, is like they seem like cute little bunnies type of thing. But those little suckers are vicious. Yes. They're, <laughs> yeah. they, they are gnarly. And like, you know, Buddy is tame. That's his name. <laughs> yeah. um, but, you know, they they can bite through flesh. They can claw through flesh you know they they could rip you up you do not want a squirrel to attack you um yeah. so by you know, the way t tell people a little bit about how what happened was in uh new york central park all the crackheads uh would leave their crack pipes after they used them in uh, on park benches and shit and uh these were like disposable kinds of pipes that they were using they these weren't anything like a person would treasure or would preserve and they all had traces of the crack in them and the squirrels all became this is not a joke this is uh, very serious it became a real problem all the squirrels were getting high on the uh the speed the methamphetamine the crack and uh they were attacking people uh so um if you don't remember that do look that up and uh it, and get back to us on that because that is something that i'm sure you could yeah so tell us what was that oh i was just saying that is so sad but it, it's it's funny but yes. it's so that's right. It is. And uh, as she says, they can be really, uh, well, they're something you don't want with those big buck teeth and that kind of speed gnawing at you. Why, well, I remember when Squirrel Girl in the Marvel comics unleashed them all on Dr. Doom and he was screaming, ah, my nuts! Yes, it was just a horrible... Uh, oh, didn't she, uh, didn't, didn't Squirrel Girl also defeat Thanos? I don't remember. It might be true, uh, for all I know. I mean, honestly, we're getting into true geek. We're geeking here. out. Yes, yes. 
<laughs> but uh, but uh, Amanda is someone I feel comfortable doing that with because she's just so cute about it. And uh, I, I I actually wonder how she got into comics. Really, it's it's something that um, she's about um, my age, I would presume. Uh, and um, so I'm not quite sure. If, well, I know this for a fact. Many girls were simply not into comics at that time. It just wasn't viewed as all that feminine a thing. So I'm wondering if she was public about it or just kept, kind of kept this hidden as kind of like uh you know so how, how did you handle all that mandy your your pursuit of uh comics to the point where you have a knowledge grade about them that's higher than most um i i never really hit it i i mean i grew up in a town that was in an old mining town and so like and then you know living in alaska growing up there the rest of my childhood and teen years i was always outnumbered you know by boys and men that i think that's like one to ten mm-hmm. you know that uh, that men like you know outnumbered women in alaska and um okay. so you know i mean and i i grew up you know climbing trees and shooting guns and like playing with makeup and chick stuff too so you know i've i've never had a issue of of um being ashamed or just not you know having the luck of being exposed to things that other girls like you know in other settings might not have you know it wasn't proper for them or it wasn't available for them or they already had the stigma of not getting to enjoy it or whatnot so I kind of had the the jump on on that I suppose here in Portland where like the nerd girl is such a trendy thing I've I'm kind of um normal <laughs> right you're, you're <laughs> on the too. wave yeah yes so that was that was kind of funny when that was becoming a thing because it was kind of like well shit that's just a normal like day for me <laughs> so mm-hmm. yeah. yeah well that's so in other words when you grew up in alaska in particular it wasn't an issue because there really wasn't a um that nobody was measuring you against the mass of other girls really so to speak yeah. it was like uh, there yeah. were few enough around where uh you could uh kind of uh indulge in what were considered rather uh boyish uh uh activities without being perceived as tomboyish even uh so uh, that sounds about right pretty much yeah yeah and in terms of the gaming when you were engaging in say for instance the original arcade games they had arcades up in alaska i'm presuming they did uh, for you to indulge in things like uh street fighter and uh the chun li character that you were pitting against uh the others in uh and and you were kicking all the boys asses if i remember correctly uh yeah. <laughs> so tell us yeah. how, how, where were you accessing these games in um well, that was actually there. There were not very. I, actually, I can only think of one place in Juno that had um, classic arcade games and pinball games. Um, so that was mainly down here when I lived in Oregon um, before we moved up there when I was nine. And so, and I, we would visit my family in Seattle uh, on both my mom and dad's side of the family. So, and they were full of arcades and such and my dad was a computer builder and so he had the old atari and what was that system before the atari um the condor or um god well atari was like one of the first so any system before that would be something you'd almost have to be a computer historian to (laughs) to know about it was it was the con uh oh oh, oh, oh wait, wait, you, like oh. I'm, I'm trying to remember there was the trs 90s the old computers everybody yes. called them the trash 90s yes, it, was, yeah. it was it was that thing and then there was a it was the first home gaming system and it was they called it the condor or something like that right after and then right after that the atari came out so um my dad designing games and us playing games together is something that I've just always like grown up knowing and doing. 
Yeah, we'll really appreciate that. And uh, by the way, just checking in with the people in the uh, chat room. And of course, uh, Derek Talley was kind enough to uh, shill the Roswell deception for me. God bless him. And Marky Milk says, always a pleasure listening to all of you. Uh, Bless you in that regard. James and Reese also uh, brought up the uh, um, Roswell deception. And I presume his link works as, as well. For some reason, his link is a little bit more... Uh, stunted <laughs> than Tarek Daly's link. Uh, but presumably they both lead to the same place. And of course, we have concurrent viewers. And I want to thank everybody who's uh, supporting us with their um, uh, upvotes. And uh, let me uh, add my own onto that and uh, make certain that uh, we emphasize that everyone who's here, uh, please support us by doing so. And uh, of course, uh, do remember asking everyone for their help in this time towards the uh, uh, the tooth, which I'm getting fixed on Friday. And so the uh, price of that is uh, altogether $1,000 when I count in all the cab fare and all the rest of that uh, that I have to... Uh, deal with. And uh, even though everyone has taken us uh, quite a long way towards that uh, objective, I still need uh, beyond that to make rent. It's a tower for the rest of the month. So this is like uh, just making certain that I have enough of a buffer where everything runs smoothly. And, uh, and of course, uh, I thank everyone who's helped me to do that so far. And um, I have every confidence that uh, I'll be making it past the finish line with all the help that everyone has provided. I want to thank, of course, a shout out later on when I do the solicitation. Uh, I want to give a shout out to um, a- Eric Lastic, uh, who apparently didn't hear all the shout outs I provided uh, for him over the past several transmissions uh, about the quarter of a hundred dollars he was kind enough to provide, which he does monthly, and uh, always deeply appreciate it. And of course, uh, the um, a person who helped out immensely this month was Brother Salman Sheikh with 100 United States dollars. Wonderful individual, and of course, uh, do upvote his uh, his videos. And I want to bring you on for a second to promote your own book and your own channel and let people know where they can uh, subscribe. Because obviously, there's a lot of people, This people may find this strange, but there are a lot of Salman Sheikhs out there. It, it's, a, it's, it's not an uncommon name in uh, Pakistan or South Asia. So um, if you look on the net, you may not necessarily find him directly. So he might have a more direct uh, YouTube address. So do provide that as well as uh, a plug for the book that you've, uh, you've written. Yes, uh, Brother Douglas. And it's an honor and privilege to always support you and stand by your side. And I encourage all the viewers to please support Brother Douglas, donate to him, get his books, and upload his channel and videos. And uh, that said, you can find me on youtube.com forward slash C forward slash Salmon Shake 911. Or in the search bar, you can search for Salmon Shake Freemason and you can find me that way too, which will narrow down the results. And for uh, my book, Amazon, you can search the same. Just search uh, Sufi Freemasons, and my book will pop up. Or you can search my name in the same manner, and it will pop up as well. And uh, I thank Brother Douglas for allowing me to share that. Much love, my brother. Oh, the the honor's mine, and it's a pleasure. And <clears throat> I do want people to understand just how... Uh, important uh, Salman's work is. As a matter of fact, the very channel has the name 911 in the YouTube channel address. And uh, that's pointed uh, that he um, that he has that. Uh, the reason uh, that would come to my mind would be when he was uh, he was about three years of age, if I remember correctly, when the towers went down, which ought to make everybody else on this roundtable feel ancient. And uh, he uh, it was at some point when he was in school, a teacher referred to him as a terrorist. And I'm certain that this is just an ongoing bane in not only his life, but the life of any South Asian or Southwest Asian uh, or anyone from the Middle East or North Africa uh, or certainly anyone simply because they're Muslim. I remember when that idiot and uh, I'd like Salman Sheikh to provide whatever uh, observation he may have in terms of this, that idiot Mike Ringley, who I was uh, God involved with just uh, by dint of uh, circumstances, 
for many years because he provided myself a platform on Revolution Radio. And uh, honestly, if anyone thinks I'm ungrateful about this, you have no concept of the situation. Not that I ever paid for it, but uh, do remember I was bringing him his ratings. The two ratings makers were myself and Sean David Morton, uh, who, of course, there's a whole story behind him I don't need to go into. But uh, that idiot would indulge himself uh, because we've got this, you know, white trash rocker who's uh, doing uh, like his version of rock band uh, fantasy that, uh, you know, he carried on with him till the day he died, uh, thinking of himself along those lines as being a rocker. He became cognizant, uh, at least, of the fact that he was dying. And uh, certainly when he was holding those um, hawk fests or whatever they were, where, you know, he called himself the Night Hawk and he was holding these hawk fests where he was having people come to his birthday parties or whatever, uh, then uh, the people who arrived in Louisville, Kentucky to uh, go up to his estate. And mind you, the motherfucker has had an estate. So this was a man who owned quite a bit of acreage and considered himself a, uh, a, a commercial farmer. So we're not talking about just like a few acres. We're talking about literally hundreds of fucking acres that this son of a bitch owned that uh, he was always demanding money for to pay to maintain. Uh, but he was supposed to be drawing a profit uh, off uh, everything he was growing, which meant that uh, it's to, in order to do that, uh, the acreage you have to have has to be in terms of hundreds. We're not talking about subsistence farmer. Anyone who's drawing a profit is got to have hundreds of acres. You've got to be operating at a semi-industrial scale. And uh, this idiot's uh, indulgence was that he felt that people were picking on him. He would always make the story up. Oh, yeah, because I have a Lebanese background. You know, nobody knew the motherfucker was Lebanese. He just looked like any ordinary white trash piece of shit. It just, uh, you know, line him up with all the rest of that people uh, stretching from Louisville, Kentucky, going on down to, well, fucking using that as the epicenter to any other point in the United States. And all you're going to see in terms of white males is an endless... Uh, sea of beer belly and butt crack right so that's what you had in mike ringley and so this guy who looked like all the rest of them uh is asserting that because he had some lebanese uh nationality in his background that somehow people were picking on him that that this was you know utter, total and utter bullshit it, it just doesn't happen people judge completely by appearances and uh this sort of thing just to give people an example of this uh it, there is there are people who have made comments in thread of my interviews where uh people have said oh yeah i could take what he was saying seriously if he looked more conventional or conveyed himself with a more conventional appearance. What does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? It's not like I appear on interviews or have done so in the past in drag. Uh, it, it's not like I've appeared uh, in any particularly, I, I, I dumbed myself down enough in appearance, uh, in other words, instead of smartening up where uh, if anything, I, I looked as bland as I possibly could. But no, that's not enough for these people. What they really mean to say is he's not white. Is it, 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 That's really all it comes down to. He's not white. I can't take him seriously because he's not white. And so it doesn't matter what information you're conveying. Uh, this is what you're stuck with. So, um, you know, Salman, you can provide some insight into all of this, what I <laughs> shared and, you know, what you think of all this, what people indulge in and what you personally went through and what you know other people are really going through who are persecuted simply because they have, quote unquote, a Muslim sounding name or appear to be, quote unquote, Muslim, which, as you know, uh, to your average white trash piece of shit, uh, nets in every Sikh and every Asian Indian who looks swarthy, etc. You know, you take it from there. Thank you. Yes, my brother, uh, definitely. I mean, the aspect of that teacher who had called me a terrorist, that was in um, third grade when 9-11 uh, when happened. I was in third grade. And that's the same teacher after the incident happened who had said that to me. But at that time, I was, uh, I was an innocent child. I was naive and I didn't know why she was saying that to me and what it meant. What was the meaning of that word? 
So I, I never, t you know, realized as time went on what was actually going on. And it's, uh, it's unfortunate, my brother, because people still hold on to that ignorance. Like in recently, we saw in Canada where this white guy ran over a family of Pakistanis. And there was uh, five individuals and all of them died, including the mother and the father. And only a nine-year-old kid survived who's probably going to be adopted now by surviving family members. So the ignorance is there, my brother. And even with the aspect of many Lebanese Americans, which I have seen, I'm not saying all of them and I'm not generalizing all of them. But the ones that I have seen, Brother Douglas, they just try to blend in with the white people as if they were like one of their own, just like how... We see in many aspects of many of many of those from the Hispanic community who also fall into that line just to try to you know feel accepted or they'll have a American first name and then they'll have an Arab last name. George Nouri's from that same concept. Yeah. He's, he comes from an Arab background, but he tries to fit in with them just to try to feel accepted. I mean, even with uh, you know what I dealt with with the racism, even within the Masonic communities. That's why. I started my own channel because the real knowledge that needs to be taught, they weren't teaching it. So I did it. But then again, like you said, Brother Douglas, there are still many of those that don't give me any credit because I'm not white. So you do are you are sharing that truth in many aspects and how they treated you, how they treated me and how we must just continue up these individual efforts to continue battling this ignorance that still exists in this community on top of you know what we're dealing with on a national and international level where even in Canada you have these things taking place and in different parts of America people are still being uh, disregarding each other and not giving each other those human values and it, it just hurts me because when, when I made that video about the 85 percent as much as I wish it weren't true people just bring it upon themselves my brother and it, I just hope in my lifetime people take heed to what you're saying and the solutions you're offering them and they just apply that and not not just dis disregard you just because of that mentality that he's not white or they just have this smirk that they don't have to hear what you have to say because you're already beneath them so we just have to be there to love and respect one another and those that do understand you and respect you even from our white brothers and sisters uh, you know I, I give them credit for that and I just hope that or as time goes on we'll be able to deal with this ignorance on a big level, just how we're all doing on our individual levels. I mean, growing up, my brother, just in elementary school and middle school and high school, uh, I, and the school district I was in was very racist, too. So I had to deal with a lot of um, hostility growing up in terms of the teachers, administration. There were a few good teachers because you have good and bad everywhere. That always stuck by me and they kind of became friends as I went into the adult life after school. So I stayed in touch with them. But then again, it just goes to show you the intensity that I was dealing with. And to this day, that it's, it's still going on. So the battle is not yet won, my brother. And I stand with you shoulder to shoulder to bring peace to earth. Bless you. Now, when you uh, you have the 911 in your channel address, so did it originally start as a 911 truther kind of venue? Tell us about that. Oh, not not really, because uh, the numerical value of my name it comes up to a simplified nine. So if you do all the ciphers of my name, I guess from the gematria aspect. It all comes up to a simplified nine, which is a, a completion. And when I was born in Pakistan, I was born exactly at 9 a.m. in the morning. So that nine and plus the, uh, you know, the two ones, it basically symbolizes a aspect of completion for me. The what I what my birth and its numerical value represents, and plus uh, the one and one meaning both becoming one. The aspect of bringing oneness to all people of the earth and trying to bring peace so i guess most people would have that concept of the you know the 9-11 but it's the uh just what my name represents and it's a uh, numerical value from gematria and the other uh, sufi uh numerical perspectives mm -hmm. wonderful and M mandy if you're with us and uh do me a favor, honey, and when you, <clears throat> uh, you dropped off the other day when I was speaking about the ghouls, and uh, I was, uh, I, I don't know if you heard all that, or 
uh, where you were, but if you're with us right now, I'd like you to just kind of tell us what you were doing uh, when the 9-11 terror attacks did take place and what uh, you might have experienced in terms of any 9-11 trutherism. You live in Conspiracy Central up there in the Pacific Northwest where people fall prey to all kinds of uh, bizarre ideas. But nevertheless, you're dealing with someone who also exposed uh, much of the aspects of 9-11 uh, no one uh, knew about, including the Japanese architect who built those buildings, Mr. Yamasaki, and the entire history behind uh, his background, etc. And um, so obviously I work from a background that many people would claim to be conspiracy, but obviously is history. Where we get into the real uh, iffiness of it is where anyone starts getting into exotic technologies because there's no need uh, to turn uh, towards the exotic when uh, all evidence is right there before your eyes. It looked like a controlled demo demolition because it was a controlled demolition. You, know, you don't need heat ray or holograms or any of that other shit. And as for the planes crashing, yes, the planes did crash. Uh, people died. Uh, so, so take it from there, honey, and tell us a bit about some, some things you might have run into concerning all of this, what people were thinking, what you were doing, uh, and how things have developed since then, and, and how you taught your kids about this, how, how you tried to have your kids confront this reality without, uh, without destroying any sense of innocence uh that was must have been an incredible challenge sure um well and i would say the 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 exotic of 9 11 would be the hoops that the um media and the ignorant you know stunned people like mine tripped themselves to go through to accept the narrative and what we launched into what it just you know the the um that was quite an undertaking i would say that that um our national media and uh spin doctor uh uh entity was able to um pull off frankly um because it was a controlled demolition it's very obviously controlled demolition um my 911 was uh, I had my first year of um, uh, preschoolers mm -hmm. and because I lived in a state and a uh, the capital of that state that has a large, large military um, entity, including Coast Guard, um, we spent the week talking with the children whose parents were suddenly getting um, deployed or uh, sent out of state to be ready for deployment. So that was, um, and because it was a young age, uh, but it was Montessori, so it was children that were exposed to information, um, wasn't just the, the toddlers. Um, it was a very odd tightrope of, um, you know, children who were just being told that their mom and dad is, you know, leaving mm -hmm. and knowing why they left. And then other children who obviously would hear things from each other. Um, that was, that was very, that was, that was maybe the hard schooling time that I went through. Um, aside from, uh, we had, a, uh, I had a student who watched his brother and mother fall in the ice and drown. Oh. Uh, and another little girl that was choking in class and I had to do the Heimlich on like those three are like the most traumatic and up there in my, in my trauma teaching. <laughs> well, they must have. Oh my God. It's a pity that the one thing the Soviet Union had right was they had civilian medals they would award uh, to uh, people who participated in heroic acts in everyday uh, life. And uh, in terms of that, you deserved a medal for saving uh, that, that child's life. By the way, I want to thank you, Amanda. She wrote in the, uh, in the text box about Mike Ringley. He was a moron. That's why he was made fun of. Yes, indeed. Oh, my God. Don't even get me started because that's so tempting. It's so tempting to go down that road. <laughs> and, uh, oh, my God. I'll, I'll leave that for now. 
uh, some other time. And, uh, you know, and people might say, wasn't there any, you know, kind of affection that you had for him? You know, I tried. I tried. Really, I tried. And uh, but it, it, towards the end, it was just he's, I the one thing I hate most on Earth is chicken shit. And he was just too fucking chicken shit. And uh, so I never hated him the way so many people did from, uh, oh my God, help me out here, honey. Uh, Stephen Kelly, Stephen D. Kelly and uh, Mr. Uh, what's his name? Uh, oh, the the sleazy detective, Paul, uh, you know, Opperman, uh, uh, Ed Opperman, Ed Opperman and Stephen D. Kelly, who hated each other with a passion, both hated Mike Ringley with an equal passion. They hated each other. They hated Mike Ringley. Uh, and uh, it, it's, you know, it, it, it's like um, they hated him. I, I never hated him. It, it may sound like I do, but no, you haven't heard hate. I mean, when these guys talk about him, they'll just talk about him like, oh, he was a piece of shit because, and they'll start giving out reason after reason. Uh, honestly, it's it just what gets me is his just, you know, oh God, Mandy remembers all of it. Uh, just Mandy, tell them. Uh, okay, here, here's one example we can just have a little fun with. Let's indulge in this. Christmas on Christmas, he uh. like, yes, he told he knocked me off bandwidth and off schedule because he was hoping to spend the night uh, getting horny with Christine Joanna Hart that he wanted Christine Joanna Hart to play Mrs. Santa Claus. So he could basically get on band with her, with her and uh, basically play grab ass all night. Uh, but his wife wasn't having any of it. So his wife made certain to insert herself as Mrs. Santa Claus. And he and his wife played Mrs. Santa Claus throughout the night. Of course, nobody called in with kids to talk to them because they were talking just shit no one would ever want their kids to hear throughout the night and uh, you know just sex talk it was just sleazy i mean come on honey help me out here it i i i do remember that and i remember tuning in and um not only was there a lot of dead air space and them commenting about not having any calls or people coming in um, but there, there was, there was constant sexual innuendo and like, um, yeah. you know, d just incredibly risque stuff that like, no, you would not call your kid in with that. <laughs> Many parents, that did, you know, God, keep tabs on them <laughs> because it was, it was. And it wasn't even funny. They were trying to be funny about it. And it was just very sad. Vulgar. I yeah. Thank you. Go I on. think, um, uh, uh, Noreen Helphand was on there for a little while. Like, wasn't she playing Elf for a minute or two or something? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. She, she of course, provided the Elf in, you know, she came in as it's basically the sex elf, right? I mean, that was basically <laughs> kind of like... Uh, it's, it's, that was it, really. I mean, she was like, uh, you know, oh, here I am. Uh, here's the sex toys you asked for, some dildos, and, you know, I mean, I'm serious. It was all... <laughs> along those lines and it was uh yeah it was just stupid and and uh so there you have that and uh so uh, by the way we're not making fun of noreen here this is what noreen was just yeah. helping him out she was just you know dropping yeah. in to help him out and you know this is what they wanted so she was delivering and honest to god it's it's like um don't get me started on noreen either i mean, <laughs> I mean you know my fucking god don't ever well, want to go was presented it sounded like it was presented as like a Christmas revolution um, radio kind of like parte. Like everybody was going to stop in. That's why I tuned in because I thought you and Noreen were going to be on there and to doing and like, you know, there'd be random chit chats and guests and like, you know, it, it sounded like a fun Christmas roundtable. But instead it, it was it was sexy not sexy mr and mrs claus like talking to no one the whole time <laughs> oh god this is awful uh, i had better things to do with my christmas though i appreciate your sentiment in terms of thinking that this would be like a revolution radio kind of extended electronic family party because that would make yeah. sense 
and uh but it was just uh no there was no sense to be had uh and um oh god just sad uh it, by the way honey uh, uh anyhow i'll go into that later some people were asking some questions about the photographic image that's embedded uh within live stream of tonight's program uh i want to emphasize that uh we are in direct competition uh we haven't started yet uh but uh we're going to be in direct competition within a matter of a uh, little over an hour with George Takai of, <laughs> of Star Trek fame in the sense that he is locally going to be going on bandwidth uh, at uh, about 7 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. And uh, he's going on bandwidth with this little presentation that uh, you have to register for. It's free registration, but you do have to register. And that way you can uh, join and uh, even participate and ask him questions about his uh, revision of his uh, fairly recently published book that has now been uh, revised or rather expanded. And so he's very excited about that. And uh, it's, it's, how do I describe this? I'll, I'll get into that later. <laughs> but uh, he's, uh, I, I just kind of feel obligated to bring that up because of course this is actually all part of San Francisco's attempts to celebrate online the uh the pride month the the pride month festivities and normally we have one of the largest parades in the world uh here in san francisco san francisco is after all the mecca of uh alternative lifestyles even more so than new york city which also has one of the largest parades in the world but uh san francisco has you ones up it believe me and of course you'll see these kind of gay parades all over the world uh, on any normal year. This is not a normal year, but some people are coming out of lockdown and you'll probably see parades anyway. And um, normally when these parades happen, uh, you know, that community really cuts loose. And uh, in a sense, it's my community through my son, uh, through the Blood Boys, uh, but their lifestyles are very different. And um, many people in the gay community are, uh, it's changed, uh, I'll have to say this, it's changed quite a bit uh, because so many gay people have uh, really come out of the closet at all levels of society. And so many gay people are middle class and just a lot more, for lack of a better word, um, restrained. Uh, but, you know, normally all the while that I was growing up in San Francisco whenever I was here in the city in the event of such festivities. People, the, the floats that you would see uh, on the parade, uh, people would just be fucking each other on the floats as, as they were just floating down the street. <laughs> so, I mean, this is, you're not going to be seeing that this year. Um, so the parade is effectively canceled. As the month goes on, I'll tell you things people are doing to replace that. But one of the things that's going on tonight within the San Francisco Greater Bay Area Metroplex region in Alameda, what used to be the center of the Alameda Naval Station. That is uh, where George Takai is visiting the Friends of the Alameda Library. And he will, along with a San Francisco Chronicle journalist, a female who's been um, a freelance journalist with them forever, they're going to be, she's going to be the moderator and allow people to call him and talk to him about his book, which is about the Japanese internment experience. Um, and I'll explain kind of the nuances behind that. But basically, this is his story, but he's like me. He can't write. <laughs> Unlike myself, however, I can draw, uh, but uh, I don't prefer to storyboard, and storyboarding would kill me, uh, so I don't do comic books. Uh, but this is a graphic novelized version, meaning it's a comic book, as Americans perceive it, but a novel-length comic book. And, uh, and Jameson says, my drawing is awesome, bless him. And um, so in terms of the, uh, it, it is what is now known as a graphic, uh, um, God, what are they calling it? They're not calling it a graphic novel because it's historical, but basically an illustrator got together with two writers, one who interviewed and transcribed and the other one who actually wrote it in a storyboard format. And then the person who illustrated it. So you had three fucking people do all the work for George Takai to make this book. Okay. <laughs> 
right? And so George Sakai didn't do shit other than talk. Okay, not to not to denigrate his experience, because uh, this guy was a very young man in the camps. He's not, he's one upped by one guy I knew who was a Japanese neo-Nazi back before that whole movement became corrupted and polluted with just plain bigots and racists and, and idiots. But back when it was more connected to the actual Nazism, more true to Adolf Hitler's Nazism as carried out by George Lincoln Rockwell. And uh, so the man who was part of this George Lincoln Rockwell movement, but was of Japanese ethnicity, and I'm talking like pure ethnic Japanese, but born in America, was Vale. His name was Vale, and um, I can't remember his last name at the moment but uh vale was uh he was born in the american concentration camps he was literally born in them he has no memory of them but uh he was born in them and so he kind of one-ups george takai on that but george takai has actual memories he could talk about uh but uh with that um we turn back to uh our dear mandy because she can uh tell us about uh a little bit about what she remembers about the history of the pacific northwest or alaska and what she might remember about the japanese internment uh up there or um anything like that and uh you know uh, share that with us mandy or anything it brings to mind you know sure. or george takai any memories you have of you know star trek and the like <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, for the for the most part, for the longest time, I only knew of Takai about um, uh, because of Star Trek. <laughs> um, but we you had spoken about Takai and this was, you know, a, a while ago. Um, and and that's how I found out from you that he had been in the internment camps. And I had sent you a picture of from my high school of a it was a news article and it was about a student that the city was um had fast forwarded his graduation because he and his family were being deported to a concentration camp deport is not right being sent to um a concentration camp so it made the news article that um and i had told you you know that's that's the very gym that i graduated from um that he was presented with his honorary diploma uh, because he and his family were being sent away. And it, it just made me so sad and upset that an entire city would, would put up this, you know, graduation, uh, but they wouldn't stand up and stop this family from being sent away. And that was something that the entire country was um, guilty of. Um, Thank you. It's disgusting. It's not talked about. I never heard of the Japanese internment camps except for just a quick little, you know, blip maybe in high school uh, through my education. Um, uh, and it, it definitely needs to be spoken of much, 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 much more. We, we need to come to terms with it. Um, it's it's disgusting, actually, it, to, to think about. And it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking to think, you know. Um, I mean, this kid in this picture, it, you know, he's smiling, everybody's smiling, but I mean, God, that it's disgusting. And I was, when I was actively looking for other property to move, um, I had found this great property. It was huge. It was wonderful. I could do my annual res animal rescue property over there and my bamboo. And it was a ridiculous deal. And it was a historical grounds. And so there were many other benefits that came from that. Uh, but then with further research and something they were kind of keeping from me uh, was that it was a site of a Japanese internment camp here in uh, Oregon. And so I backed out of that very quickly because I just, you know, on one hand, yes, to rehab the property and to caretake it and give it its proper respects was, you know, is something I think needs to happen. But on the other hand, with small children and just the energy that I think is still there, I just wasn't in a place that I wanted to do that, Right. I right. suppose. No, I, I deeply appreciate that. 
Uh, and by the way, the term is internal deportation. That's the actual term, is internal deportation. And uh, so the uh, Americans, of course, would claim that this was evacuation, quote unquote, and uh, these horrible euphemisms uh, that they would use in uh, place of the uh, in, in place of reality. Um, and uh, of course, we were all confronted with the potential for Muslim internment. Uh, and uh, I'd like Salman Sheikh to speak, as well as Mandy, uh, both to speak to what they might know about Michelle Malkin, who was this little Filipina who was, uh, you, by the way, um, again, no disrespect to Noreen Helphan, but she, she kind of serves this purpose for, uh, for Revolution Radio. And, uh, and this is what keeps her on the platform, but she's at the point where she's, as, as far as I'm concerned, very indoctrinated in it, and I want to bring her back on, certainly. Uh, Selena Khan wants to bring her back on, but I just have to talk to her about being very careful about... <laughs> just going into it so passionately that she shouts. And because this is how they communicate on Revolution and Radio, their whole idea of communication is to shout to shout people down. Now, that probably serves her well on a roundtable because her show is basically a roundtable. And so this is how she maintains control of people who are calling in. She shouts them down. <laughs> this is not that kind of format. Uh, so when she did that, the one time I had her on, I, I knocked her off. However, she was kind enough another time to share with us uh, the fact that uh, she's uh, convinced uh, that she suffers from, uh, uh, oh God, what was it again? The, the, that horrible, Morgellon syndrome. Morgellon. And, yes, thank you. And oh my God, uh, before we turn towards um, asking about uh, some of the uh, Michelle Malkin stuff and what either one of you might know about that, what do you, what do you know about Morgellons, honey? What do, you, what do you know about this? And... Well, I think it's, I think it's being, well, so I do not think that nanotechnology is invading people the way that it's kind of being put out there. I do there are people who are seriously suffering from odd happenings in their body. It's described as feeling um, bugs or tingling pain or sometimes horrific uh, debilitating pain, um, sometimes just beneath the skin or targeted as at joints. Um, it's an unknown to doctors. Uh, some of the medical community, you know, who sees these patients know that their patients are in pain and cannot figure out the problem, this, the cause, the issue, the illness, the disease. Um, and others say that it is a um, psycho uh, psych, uh, issue where it's it's that mental... Psychosomatic. Thing. Go on. Somat, yep. Um, I forget what the name is, um, where it's, they have a term for when people really believe that there's bugs under their skin and it's not from a bad drug trip or, you know, too many hits on the bong or something. Um, but, you know, um, but I, I think it, more people tie it to the conspiracy theory of nanobugs being implanted in people and causing issues mm -hmm. by the way um, the, 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 uh, the 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 i'm sorry <laughs> as a medical someone ed educated in medical journalism with the credit equivalent of a master's degree in that field what you're referencing in terms of that mental disorder yeah. in which individuals have a persistent belief that they're infested with living or non-living pathogens such as parasites insects or bugs is known as delusional parasitosis. Uh, by the way, Jameson Reese also uh, has mentioned that he calls it uh, formication is another term he brings to our attention. Uh, this is, of course, your average doctor will tell you that there that no such infestation is present. Now, bear in mind, there are real infestations that do happen when bugs get under your skin. Uh, they're rare enough where, you know, unless you're traveling to certain areas and you almost have to be trying, you almost have to be seeking this bot fly is an example yes thank you uh jameson he's very good at this uh but uh in terms of um morgellons uh the, the medical community their main challenge is whether this is an infectious disease 
or a psychiatric uh, disorder. And uh, the common, um, uh, shall we say, fallback is, is psychiatric disorder because delusional parasitosis has existed for probably several hundred years by now. So we've had that in the Merck manuals before there was any concept of Morgellons. Uh, so the medical term of formication really is more specific. It refers to the symptom of delusional parasitosis, which is the crawling feeling on the skin. Uh, and uh, so these are the worms of the mind that were identified uh, when people began to manifest unshakable but false beliefs that they are infested with insects, worms, mites, lice, fleas, or other organisms. Uh, but they tend to occur in the context of other mental disorders like schizophrenia, depression, and dementia. Now, with Our Lady uh, Amanda Yoon, she works with animals, and uh, the biggest fear that I would have with someone who works with animals to the extent that she does would be rabies or some kind of, you know, mites or, or infestation that could come with the animals at some point. Now, has this ever manifested or how do you deal with this? And, um, and uh, like, um, certainly I'm the type who every once in a while, obviously, when I cared for a large amount of fish, when I maintained aquariums that were uh, basically magazine quality photographic level uh, landscaping in my aquariums that I was working with when my parents were alive to keep them occupied, to give them something pleasant to look at because they were largely becoming more and more homebound. Uh, even sometimes then with all the exotic uh, aquatic amphibians and animals I was dealing with, I would sometimes, you know, worry that I might have contracted something if I felt a sudden itching on the skin. Uh, so does this ever happen? It, uh, you know, it does. It comes with the territory. Honestly, the most issues I have is the garden with pests, you know, dealing with um, infestations of a, uh, little creatures eating my plants. Um, it, it is a worry and you do take precautions. I use cleaning uh, vinegar a lot and DE, diatremaceous earth. Um, and, uh, you know, treating the animals and keeping, keeping a separate sick room. Um, you know, uh, doing a lot of laundry. <laughs> um, you do have to be cautious. You do have to be careful. You and um, it's just kind of like with kids, you know, you never know what they'll come home with. And um, you just got to do your best to be safe and try to keep it under control. Um, there's there's but for the I, I've never had a, um, a rabies issue or a um or another outbreak or another parasite that that was really a, a problem that was not treatable and that was not, you know, uh, cautiously kept s separate from an outside animal that I was taking care of from uh, the rest of, of the animals. So, yeah, that's the, the, the biggest problem I had um, was when I thought Buddy might might squirrel that I'm I'm caretaking at the moment. Uh, when I thought that I might have had a a snapped bone, a a protruding bone issue that I would not dare treat alone. Mm -hmm. um, when I was seeking out vets, because right now in Oregon we're still pretty hardcore locked down on stuff. Um, so our wildlife rescue um, people that I go through, uh, they're on horrific hours and they are just stretched to the max. And so finding a vet that would not charge hellacious amounts for just rabies tests and whatnot before they would even treat Buddy was just horrific. So that's kind of the biggest issue I've ever had mm -hmm. as oh. far as uh, uh uh, diseases and whatnot and, and problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, and uh, so uh, I'll, I'll turn towards Jameson a little bit. Obviously, there must be times with, uh, for lack of a better way of phrasing this, obviously you and I both take a lot of drugs. So let's just put it this way. With all the <laughs> drugs you take, there must be times when you fall into this 
this delusion that there must be times when you 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 get this sensation or not it's a sensation but it's not a delusion uh, for some reason i seem to be very lucid no matter how what the doses is i seem to be uh whatever sense of self exists it seems to be strong enough to realize that you took something and you are you are not you you are probably having a psychotic uh episode because of what you took there's never a real belief like uh oh my god the freaking aliens from mars are gonna be are beaming me right now i got bugs under my skin i'm gonna die it's never been anything like that Mm -hmm. you know i mean uh the the closest that has ever you know, the closest manifestation I've ever had to something that was really, really uncomfortable like that was probably uh, back in the day when I did K2. That was during that was during a blood moon. And yep, tell us uh, what I the was, K2 is. Tell us about K2. It's it's supposed to be this artificial uh, cannabinoid. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, people were smoking it because, you know, that was when marijuana was still illegal that was all the way back in i believe 2011 um and what happened was i had a three-day trip where i couldn't sleep for three days um everything on tv looked like it looked like the people were actually in my living room rather than on the tv screen and uh Every time I closed my eyes, I saw this green, gray, pale skin zombie Jesus. And I, for the like of me, knew that I did not want anything to do with that guy. So I decided, okay, I cannot sleep. <laughs> and uh, the, the burning sensation under the skin was just uh, insane. Um, the only thing that comes close to it are the times when my muscle enzymes were elevated uh, due to the high CPK level. Uh, when the CPK levels hit like something like 3,000 or 6,000 or so, it feels like, um, literally feels like someone took a blowtorch to your skin. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's bad. <laughs> so, uh, can anybody hear me? I'm just curious. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes, the, the, the sudden silence there was rather disconcerting. Uh, so, um, Our Lady Mandy has gone to uh, get dinner going. Uh, for the kids and uh let me see she writes here in the chat room she says solomon from a teacher i want to send you my deepest and most sincere apologies for what that so-called teacher called you uh oh yes that's wonderful and um and of course she's part of this incredible system so uh solomon will um speak to her now she's still typing so solomon uh if you could respond to that thank you yes uh Thank you so much, Sister Amanda. That that means a lot to me. And knowing that there are great human beings like you, who are in that teaching field, it makes me feel it makes me feel like very welcoming, and very fortunate that there is the aspect of good and bad everywhere. And of course, we forgive those who who are ignorant, but we also continue our efforts of our education and awareness, so things like this don't happen in the future. So I send my love to you, your family, and I pray that God gives you all the peace and happiness and protection and prosperity that this world and the next have to offer. And I thank you very deeply for uh, sharing that with me. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, uh, you know, that's appreciated as well. Now, in in terms of, uh, as I said, we were kind of just going in that direction uh, before going into others. That was kind of a tangent that was rather irresistible because uh, whatever else one can say about Noreen Helphand, whether it's uh, uh, delusory or, or reality, and of course I tend to think that she's she definitely believes she's failing this and 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 experiencing it, but it's 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 very very hard to believe in terms of technology being that advanced uh for someone myself uh who has been the subject of human experimentation uh i've I've, i can tell people that uh when my parents were told that all that uh uh they could place their hopes on for me to survive what they were told was going to be the end of my life 
was this experimental nanoplasma. Uh, I can tell you uh, that it has had a profound impact on my survivability. And um, I've survived uh, many uh, a death, and I mean I have clinically died many times, uh, more so than, uh, than Daniel Brinkley, who, without any disrespect to him and uh, his experiences, was a man who made a career out of his, his deathing experiences, his, uh, his deaths. Um, now, I've chosen not to do so, uh, simply because that's a very private aspect of my life that I have gone into, but haven't really decided to make that my thematic, my, my elite, elite motif, my uh, life theme. Uh, so uh, when it comes to, however, this uh, nanoplasma, this doesn't work the way people get the impression of it working in stupid movies, where... Uh, you know, what happens to me, uh, the, the healing takes time. It, it takes, it, it takes time. And it, uh, is something that, uh, is, uh, otherwise, however, most people wouldn't heal at all from the kind of, uh, incredible injuries that I've sustained. Uh, but, uh, this is not something that makes it visible to the human eye. It's, it's not something that occurs within something that you can see happening. Movies are different. They've got a very limited amount of time. They've got two hours or less, especially if you want to keep people's interest. You can't really make a film uh, longer than two hours. And uh, aside from that, you're trying to show people things. So it has to be visual. So people are there to see things on screen. You're going to present them with something visual. So it's understandable why movies do what they do. Also, you want to be entertaining, etc. There's all kinds of factors that go into why they do what they do. So I don't necessarily damn them or condemn them for what they do. But understand, that's not how it works. Uh, and uh, it would be like just as you plant uh, a seed, you know, it's going to be a while before you see anything blossom. Uh, it's the same with uh, nanotechnology, and it's do it, it still oftentimes requires external help uh, to make certain that I recover fully. Um, so um, there you have that. With that being said, and without going into too much gory detail beyond that right now, and I can go into gory detail some other time when I feel I can stomach it, about uh, injuries I've sustained, what was going on. Uh, I do want uh, people to understand that what she's describing is like, you know, like a internal manufacturing assembly line, which people can say is what I've got going on inside of me uh, that has saved my life any number of times. But in her case, she's talking about like little mechanical insects flying out of her body and shit. So... <laughs> okay, at that point, it's like uh, you've got something that's not only manufacturing something within your body to impact your own internal ecosystem, you've got something that's ostensibly manufacturing something to export. <laughs> so once you get to the point where it's exporting, okay, the movies are just plain stupid because you have somebody, something like Bloodshot, which we've made a lot of fun of with Vin Diesel, and he's supposed to have nano plasma essentially this is what he's got in the film and he's being blown apart by machine guns and he's reassembling like a walking ambulatory walking talking lego construct that reassembles itself so you're talking about little blocks of semi-organic matter which is preposterous in and of itself that uh not not in and of itself per se but just the, the what's preposterous is that something like that would maintain a group mind or an aggregate like a colony of ants to reassemble itself now all of this whatever man can conceive man can ultimately achieve uh when it, it comes to something like that that's not necessarily impossible at some future time we're nowhere near that right now uh so you, you just can't have things that are like independently 
aggregate it to the point where like a colony of insects, which is what Vin Diesel really is, uh, to put this in the most blatant and repulsive terms. He's basically like a colony of insects. He's, he's more of an aggregate colony uh, than, than a human being at the point with what they're displaying in that movie Bloodshot, which is, by the way, is based on a comic book that was owned by Valiant Press. By the way, I know so much about comic books because I did professionally illustrate and because I followed some of my examples and heroes in the comics industry for years, both here and across the Atlantic and in Asia. So I was, I was very familiar with the international comics industry and they're all very separate from each other. And believe it or not, they have nothing to fucking do with each other. Uh, they're totally different worlds. You know, most people have never in America heard about any Japanese or American comics until extraordinarily recently. And Americans, by the way, are far more familiar with Japanese comics than they are with anything out of Europe. Uh, Americans know nothing about European comics for all intents and purposes. But um, my point is when we talk about the, the Valiant Comics, which owns the Bloodshot character, uh, they were owned by a retired Jewish admiral. And I could go into the whole story of that. But, uh, you know, he's American. He was in the American Navy. He's a United States citizen, but he was of Jewish ethnicity. So they were, it goes without saying, very anti-Nazi. But they had a very bizarre format in which their comics they produced were simply n not fit for normal consumption by the public because they were every story was so interconnected with every other line of comic story they were throwing out you had to buy their entire line of comics which was their strategy in order to get the full story of anything which nobody had the money to do <laughs> so it just it just didn't work uh which is why you never heard of the majority of valiant comics and uh they might still be around uh i i, I got a feeling they probably changed their their game i knew somebody who worked with them personally and uh the whole nother story behind that he was actually on the show more than once uh, his name was Keith Johansson, a uh, real son of a bitch. And there's a whole story behind that, you know, but, uh, so aside from that, um, when it comes to, uh, this kind of, uh, you know, technology, it's just, um, what, what Noreen is describing happening is something that, um, uh, she would have to have been, you know, it's, it's just, we're just not at that level. And, and these people are, 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 she, she, I feel she's been extraordinarily influenced by the internet and she goes on the internet and she just reads all this crap. <laughs> it's just, it's just, uh, it's not healthy. And, um, so there we have that. And, uh, with that, we, uh, go over to, um, Solomon and Jameson. I want both of you guys to buy me some time and I'm going to pull my head out of my ass and try to, you know, get some things together to talk about. <sighs> So I can buy time with our current astrological situation. Before you go into that, though, because I, I don't want you to start reading just yet, uh, we can get to that point when we feel that there's nothing else we can do. Let's uh, let's talk instead about uh, Salman uh, for now. I want the both of you to maintain more of like a conversation. So Salman, if that's possible, and you can talk about some of these ideas or maybe things that you've seen yourself that you know, what brings to mind, I, I want to address, you know, some of the things that we brought up about the Nyagas, uh, and um, I will unfortunately have to touch upon the ghouls again today, because this is the eve day of the death of Alexander the Great, who was the man who actually uh, was one of the major reasons that the ghouls retreated into the uh, earth uh, in terms of uh, North Africa. So uh, this is um, something that does need to be gone into to an extent. And again, what I'm feeling is just a lot of dread going into the subject. Uh, as people may have ascertained by now, um, this is not a pleasant subject. And it just, it just, it, it just, I, I, when I speak about it, it kind of kills me the rest of the night or it kills my ability to even speak about anything the rest of the night. <laughs> So, um, at, at any rate, um, both of you gentlemen go on for a bit and uh, carry on with more of a conversational tone. People do not like reading. <laughs> it doesn't matter how interesting it is. People just don't like it. So, uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, Salman, if you could kind of guide us with... Um, yes, de definitely, yeah. my brother. Thank you. 
Yeah, so it's a uh, it's interesting when you had uh, mentioned the ghoul and their appearance. Uh, it reminded me a lot of this Japanese anime that I used to watch, and they had Hassan Saba, the old man of the mountain, who is the uh, basically the leader of the assassins. And when he would show his true form, because he would appear as an old man, but when he would show his true form, he would be described as the one who would be the bringer of death, and his form looked exactly to a T, the way that you had described the ghoul. So that was, a, I, I had found that an interesting factor that uh, Japanese anime would have that kind of information in it. But then again, growing up, playing Japanese video games, watching Japanese anime uh, books, uh, comic books, and manga, and all that stuff, they display a lot of truth in there. And it's like, when you get to a certain level of perception, you would realize that all those games that I played, the shows that I watched, the anime that I watched, they were all guiding me and educating me in their own way. So, you know, my, my hat's off to a lot of those great brothers and sisters from Japan who have given us a lot of that education. And it just maybe now we realize it what they were teaching us this entire time. God bless you. Yeah. And uh, that is so important. And uh, if only Brendan Zogate could join us to hear you and interact with you about that subject, it would be um, it, w it would be so educational for all of our listeners. And uh, I'd like to know if you could possibly remember, um, if not, if you could do some research to recall it later, what the name of that particular anime was, because uh, that would uh, help a lot. I think it was, uh, from what I recall, Brother Douglas, it was a uh, fr uh, fate grand or something. It was like a fate grand order. It was something like that. So okay. if you search on the internet or YouTube, uh, Hassan Saba, the old man of the mountain, and fate grand order, it definitely pops up. And okay. there's a uh, a scene in there where you have these two, I think, these two children that are walking in the village, and they see this old man that's sitting in the alleyway by himself. And, and he, he tests them. Basically, they offer him a piece of bread to uh, help him with his hunger. And it reminded me a lot of the, the Sufi beggars who would do the same. Like some of them would be highly adept beings, but they would do that to me when I was in Pakistan. When I would walk past, he would be disguised as a beggar to test you to see, are you really who you say that you are? And it's, uh, I think, relative to the Salominari as well that they do the same thing as well. Yes. And it's 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 very interesting, Brother Douglas, that that's how Hassan Saba appeared to them in the uh, anime originally. And then he, he uh, when, when the boy basically gives him food, he admires him for his uh, his heart and his uh, the love that he shared for humanity. And he tells him that be ready. There's a storm coming for humanity. And then they fight this uh, this giant. Um, it, it looks like an anti-god that they fight. And the uh, characters are so frustrated that we did everything and everything possible, but we couldn't defeat this monstrosity. And the same kids that had helped Hassan Saba, the old man of the mountain, he, he, he pops out of nowhere with his uh, ghoul-like form and he tells them that now I'm here to destroy this, uh, this being. And what he does is he jumps into the air and with a sword he severs the wings of the creature and uh, he eats, he basically devours all of the, uh, the creatures that that giant being was sending towards Hassan Saba. So when you had mentioned the, uh, the physical characteristics, I'm like, oh my goodness, that's exactly what that was. That's, that's who he was in his, in his original form, the, the devourer and the bringer of death. Thank you. Very important. And uh, aside from that, um, would you say in the context of that anime, with the knowledge that the Japanese have of the occult, uh, that uh, they've never hidden from the public? Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, this is something that needs to be addressed. I don't know if either one, I know Jameson didn't see it because he can't access it uh, on the internet because it's pretty much scrubbed from easy availability on the internet unless you pay for it. Uh, everybody was approaching me for uh, about a year in which they were asking if I had done any consultation or professional consultation uh, without credit, as I tend to do. I, I tend to take uncredited consultation jobs with films or was certainly doing so throughout the period of time my parents were alive. And, uh, and, and when I was caring for them, it was a way to make money without drawing attention to our situation, which was extraordinarily vulnerable. 
But uh, in terms of uh, the film that many people thought I was a part of, which I was not, was Cabin in the Woods. And it turns out that there's two films by that title. And one of them is just a, a snoozer. <laughs> and the other one is the one that everybody remembers. And in Cabin in the Woods, uh, they show the Japanese as the greatest occult uh, rival to the United States. And uh, they, uh, they even say in the film, we're number two, this is the Americans talking, the, uh, the, uh, what you would call the deep state, uh, what Americans would think of as the deep state and, uh, and, and functionally would be. Uh, they're basically the American deep state is saying uh, to each other in conversation, in context of the film script, uh, one of them is saying, we're number two, but we, but we try harder. Uh, in their attempting to overcome Japan. So obviously Japan is, as uh, Peter Moon was grasping and wrapping his mind around and trying to figure out a way to communicate to people, he said that uh, if people understood Japan as a theocracy, in the sense that Iran is, but in their case, uh, functioning on the um, Shinto vision amongst uh, other uh, theologies, cosmologies, uh, then uh, Americans would simply not be able to deal with them at all. Uh, and um, so when they present the occult, it's taken almost for granted. And as Brendan Zogit has emphasized in the past, it's, whenever you see Japanese uh, cartoons or anime or manga, when it's translated into the English, all that shit scrubbed out. So what I'm curious about is the old man of the mountain, Pashin Saba, I'm presuming the Japanese portrayed him as essentially uh, benevolent, as essentially a benevolent entity. Yes, uh, Brother Douglas, that's exactly right. And I agree 100% that anything you watch in Japanese, watch it in its uh, original format. If, if it has like English subtitles, that's probably better than having the English dubbing of it. But in the aspect of how they portrayed him was as a benevolent being, even though he appeared as a ghoul in his form and as the bringer of death, as the the leader of the assassins. He they basically described that entity known as the old man of the mountain that you can't contact him. Only he comes to you when he deems you worthy to help you or to basically choose you, just like how a Sufi master chooses his disciples so it was a it was the same air respect that they gave him, and when all of the characters were being slaughtered by this anti god being that was um, being portrayed, that's when he appears because he knows that now that they're in grave danger and they won't be able to save themselves. So that's when he interferes, and that's when he um, basically brings a sword of justice and destroys the anti god being that was basically destroying everything and plaguing everything that was on the land. So that was very. That was very cool on how they portrayed Hassan Saba in that anime. Thank you. By the way, Sammy Romero says, Hi, Doug and Dietrich team. Sound is loud and clear. By the way, the ghoul subject last transmission was incredible. Thank you, Doug, for sharing your experiences with ghouls. I know you find no pleasure in revisiting these experiences. Thank you, Sammy. And my love to your brother, Isaac Romero, uh, whom I have not forgotten. And uh, I know that he's, of course, I want everyone to know he's gotten married fairly recently. And uh, and I've promised to speak to him. And uh, I'll, you know, do my best to do that. Hopefully he understands I've been overwhelmed with quite a bit of uh, issues to deal with myself. And uh, we'll be, uh, you know, hopefully finding some time to, um, you know, speak with him personally soon. But I have not forgotten him. And uh, he, like his brother Sammy, these are wonderful people, these two brothers. Uh, they've been uh, following myself and my experiences for quite some time, many years by now. And uh, so we are truly a extended electronic family and, and actually a real family in so many ways and uh, becoming more so. And uh, obviously, um, uh, Salman helps us with that. Now, Salman, when you hear us speak about things like this delusional parasitosis, uh, uh, these skin disorders of, of the mind, so to speak, uh, what kind of, how, how would you, how would you uh, tell people to, to deal with something like that? <laughs> these worms of the mind. <laughs> 
Oh, uh, I would just tell them my brother is to live a good, clean life. I remember uh, when I was, I think it was in the summer of 2014, I had a skin rash, which was itching and it was burning me very badly. It was on my back. And then later I had found out that it was shingles and it was, uh, it was so painful. I had to go to a medical professional and get it treated. But at that time, when I was searching, I had come across this term that you had mentioned, the Morgellon. And it reminds me a lot of uh, what I've heard in the villages, like when I was back in my country, of how they would basically tell you to be mindful of anything that's uh, mold or like fungi. And they would say that anything that's mold or fungi could affect your brain in some way, and it probably makes you go crazy. And uh, uh, if you play the, um, I guess, the Resident Evil games, which is, again, another Japanese creation, the seventh and the eighth one, it shows you how a lot of these monstrosity beings that are walking around, they're basically from the uh, different aspects of the mold and the fungi. And if people who have mold and fungi in their homes, they end up going crazy because you have this stuff that's entering in their brains and taking over. So th this is not verified. This is just something that I've, I've heard that Actually, relates that to is the true, subject. Uh, medically, those are myotoxins. Uh, the myotoxins of uh, specifically black fungi. Um, uh, black fungus is usually found around people's showers and things like that. Um, the myotoxins from the uh, uh, fungus can cross the blood-brain barrier. And so that's the reason why... Uh, you know, um, there people say that. By the way, just so that people understand what you're talking about, James, and the correct term is mysotoxin. Uh, so it would be spelled M Y C O uh, myso uh, would be the. Oh yes, yes, yes. My, my, my apologies for that. Yeah, so uh, yeah you, what, I, I, I mispronounced uh, it. The, yes, so if people are going to look that up, um, what Jameson is referring to is mysotoxicosis. Uh, so uh, mysotoxicosis would be spelled M-Y-C-O-T-O-X-I-C-O-S-I-S. And so mysotoxicosis would be the consequence of the ingestion of grains or forage uh, containing toxic metabolites that are produced by these kinds of fungi. And so uh, the fungi that produce these toxins, they, um, they often do so only under specific conditions of warmth, moisture, humidity. There's several different fungi that can produce different um, mysotoxins in a single mixed feed. So just uh, remember that you're also ingesting them by breathing uh, when they're sporing, uh, releasing spores. But these, these result in human or animal diseases. Uh, but uh, they're, you know, people presume it's all caused by consumption of fungal contaminated foods. But don't forget, this can happen by skin contact with mold infested substrates. The inhalation of the, uh, the spores, the, uh, uh, but um, the result is this toxic action of mysotoxins that's um, mediated through uh, any number of organs, notably the liver, the kidney, the lungs. You begin to wonder if something like that might have happened to Derek Talley uh, in terms of his his uh, kidney failure, it's simply because his kidney failure is so bizarre in the sense that he's younger than I am. He's not guilty of any of the excesses that James and Reese or myself are guilty of. Uh, so uh, it's... It is bizarre. I think of something like this uh, of a sudden as potentially responsible. Um, of course, I've got, uh, yeah, I think I know what happened to him, and um, I'll express that at some point. Uh, but uh, obviously, uh, we don't want to do that tonight. At any rate, uh, this is, uh, you know, something that results in immunosuppression. And, uh, and uh, that's kind of like what you would have with. Uh, toxic, uh, you know, end-stage renal failure, etc. But, uh, all right, uh, going on from uh, there, that brings us back to Salman. So, uh, Jameson uh, confirmed what you said is true. Uh, and as you were saying, this is kind of manifested in a very, uh, shall we say, extreme sense within the uh, uh, evil, uh, Resident Evil uh, gaming uh continuity and uh, of course are you a fan of the films with the uh, uh, my favorite 
Serbian actress. Uh, oh, oh my God, uh, Mila uh, Jovovich. Mila Jovovich. Yeah, uh, Mila Jovovich. It's, it's all oh, you know, oh, are all okay. pronounced with with as Y's in the Slavic oh, language. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, uh, I'm sure everybody who talks to her probably says something like that in America, and uh, she probably <laughs> just has to, you know, sniff and turn away or something. <laughs> uh, yes, Mila Jovovich has been around forever and of course she was extraordinary as Joan of Arc and uh, you know obviously has is very svelte very athletic looking and uh, and just has a taste for action films uh, and uh, so yeah aside from all of that uh, so are you a fan of the uh, the film franchise as well as the games uh, Mr. Uh, Shake and then uh, Jameson can <laughs> talk to you about the games as well I'm sure both of you have played them Oh, definitely. Uh, the movies are great and the games are great, too. And it's funny, um, even in the games, like even if you play the original ones from the 90s, the Japanese developers have put a lot of uh, truth in those games in terms of, I guess, a lot of the, uh, you know, the aspect of how, the things that happen in the world in terms of corporate corruption and these different aspects of how people usually operate from greed on these type of positions. So, their, their video games are like it has a lot of like entertainment and plus there's a lot of truth to them and it just uh, goes to show you that they the Japanese like most people don't often pay attention to the type of truths that they're presenting and in in America we grow up with the um, education that they give us even though as much as people might not like to admit it and the aspect of just how to clear yourself from these moles and fun guys, from like, you know, what I know from the Sufi Sheikhs is just to basically cleanse yourself in terms of the breathing and having a good, clean life in terms of your, I guess, what you eat and drink and those kind of things. And if you stay in a high spiritual prayer and mindset, then you do get those things out of your system. It's funny, Brother Douglas, that if you play the, the new Resident Evil 8, which is the newest one that came out, it takes place in Transylvania. And they basically you're the main character is stuck in this castle and he's being chased uh, around by this vampire lady and her three daughters. And later he finds out that they were like a product of the mold. If you like once you progress through the story. So I, I had found that interesting. I thought you might like that. Interesting. Yes. As, as a matter of fact, uh, I know that they've been uh, they've been gaining a lot of popularity i've seen uh in, in these these three ladies uh uh because they're so tall and they kind of uh they kind of manifest a kind of fantasy of uh a very large uh, uh matron figure that could almost be protective uh but in this case it's more the kali the devouring mother kind of archetype and uh so yes yes I, I know what you're speaking of i haven't acquainted myself with uh the names that they're used uh that are used to reference them or the like but uh the fact that it takes place in transylvania i think that they've they've taken the resident evil and they've decided to uh, put it into more of the gothic format almost as if they were taking its uh its horror and then uh, basically, um, you know, Europeanizing it into a Gothic kind of context, uh, which is kind of like an experimental. It's kind of like they've done everything they could with uh, American cities, right? So they've decided. Definitely. Yeah. So they've decided to take it to a more traditional horror format. So that's intriguing. It's uh, I, I would actually use the word cute. Uh, and uh, so there we have that. And um, so aside from that, um, uh, have, have you encountered this, Jameson? You, you played the game or was this ever a game that you... Well, uh, I, I played uh, Resident Evil uh, 2, Resident Evil Dead Aim. Mm -hmm. I was a fan of the franchise. And uh, it... it you know, I, I really love the way the monsters had, you could see like the sinewy, you could see like the muscle tissue and everything. I love that. Uh, that was one of the things I loved about the game. Yeah. I mean, of course. And uh, as Salman says, the Japanese designers are, uh, by the way, did both of you gentlemen know I brought this up before, so you probably remember it as soon as I bring it up. Uh, the uh, the labs in which the Japanese, uh, in, excuse me, the Chinese in Wuhan 
uh, <laughs> Communist Umbrella Chinese. Umbrella Corporation. Yes, yes. They, they, they oh had, they, 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 the labs in which the Communist Chinese, uh, the, where the Wuhan virus sourced from, was uh, these labs that use the symbol of the Umbrella Corporation. Literally, we're using its symbol. This is no joke. This And so uh, the, the, it makes sense because the Japanese would simply be taking the aspects of communist China they find the most uh, repulsive or reprehensible, and they would incorporate that as the villain in their gaming system. That that makes perfect sense that the Japanese would do that. And so they, uh, they probably... Uh, took this corporation on, uh, knowing that th there's enough of a gap between communist China and Japan in terms of their uh, interactions, where they're not going to really be capable of suing each other because their, their, their societies are just so severed, so, so separate, uh, that the Japanese could do something like that. And um, the Chinese could do something like that, too, with movies they produce, but we just don't have access to them in the West uh, as easily as we do the Japanese products. So uh, certainly J China has produced films, but most of the time Americans don't respond well to the communist Chinese produced films because the culture is different enough where most Americans don't fi find what the communist Chinese are projecting or what they're showing as really something they can relate to. Um, so um, uh, both of you men, if you would, uh, you know, take it from there. Oh, yes, uh, definitely, Brother Douglas. And I remember there was a um, another game that I had played. This was uh, when I had when I was fairly new to America. It was, uh, it was around, I think, the year 2000. Mm -hmm. That was when the PlayStation 1 was released. And there's a Japanese video game developer named Hideo Kojima. And he had released the game Metal Gear Solid. And in, the, in that uh, franchise, he would also display many of the truths in terms of, uh, I guess, the military and how history really worked. And it just sh it reminded me that just growing up playing these games, we would just take it as entertainment. But a lot of these uh, developers and producers and content creators from Japan, they would just be teaching us so much truth. And it, so it's, it's like what you said about the, uh, the lab with the Umbrella Corporation sign. And they've been basically teaching us through these video games since like the late 1990s about this uh, company that has this symbol and how they're basically against the people and whatever they're doing for their concept of greed. So my, my hat's off to them for all of this knowledge. And in, even in terms of the anime, when you had described what you did, I had connected it with the anime that I watched. And uh, recently there was another game that I had played from a Japanese developer. It's called Death Stranding. And that's from a um, from Hideo Kojima as well. And even in there, it, uh, it it shows you the concept of how you must have a childlike brain and heart because the main character he has a baby attached to his suit, and the baby's it's because of the baby he's allowed to see many of the unseen and seen entities that are walking around him that were trying to attack him. It was through the heart and mind of a child he was able to detect those beings. And I, I just found that fascinating how, how those little details that many kind of overlooked that but they would show it to you for those who had the perception or the eye to basically scope it out like, oh, this is what, you know, the developer or the writer of the story is teaching us. And uh, basically the characters involved in uh, in a post apocalyptic United States, he's like a, a, a delivery guy and he's delivering products because. Uh, you had these extinction entities that had popped out of nowhere to basically destroy humanity. And instead of the United States in the game, the United States is called the United Cities of America. And there's like a chiral network of, uh, I guess, an advanced form of Internet that connects all of these cities together. And as this delivery guy, you have to go around and deliver these products to make sure that the system continues to survive and people continue to survive. And you connect one network to the other so they could be more connected with each other in terms of uh, running the new country, the United Cities of America. And it's the aspect of that baby being attached to him. It's only through that baby he's able to identify many of the threats around him because of the, the heart, mind, and innocence of a child where if you do have that, 
even in adulthood, if you could achieve that, that's something that does save you in many aspects from uh, from the darkness and those that are, I guess, plotting against you or doing anything against you. So that was very, very great. And uh, I highly recommend that, that that game to whoever plays it. Thank you. Very important. And uh, one of the things that we are at least... Uh, uh, promulgating here is the fact that uh, as somebody who's very much into these games as a uh, teenager is not necessarily wasting their life and all their time with a bunch of first-person shooter uh, violence that just programs them to uh, become a, a mass shooter and uh, impact uh, negatively, uh, negatively impact the world around them. Uh, this is kind of an education which uh, enables people to develop a, a kind of sensitivity that they uh, otherwise would never um, have. So uh, that's uh, something that um, is important. Uh, also, um, as, aside from that, uh, when the two of you are um, relating these games, what else was it about the films that you might have appreciated, both of you, if you would uh, go into that? Well, about the rest? Um what I appreciate about, you know, Japanese films and uh, especially Japanese manga is that we have we're given an insight into the character's mind, what they're thinking. And this is something we don't see in American media. This is something we also don't see in American comic books very often. Uh, sometimes they do. Sometimes they do, but not. It's it's not as it's not as profound as it is in you know. It's not as looked at as it is in you know Japanese culture. You know, whereas whereas you know we get to see the characters analyzing. We get to see how they think, and we also get to see um, how they might exercise critical thinking. Which is something that we that's completely absent in <laughs> American films and culture altogether. I mean, so it's something that I've grown to appreciate. And I, and I say that, you know, anime, manga, um, and even the even some of the music, um, uh, n n not like the J Japanese pop music, but some of the some of the compositions that they have to some of the anime um there's a uh, one 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 uh composer in particular i like i think uh his name is uh oh my gosh um um I'll, I'll get his name uh in in a bit but um what i'll say is that there's a there's a depth to like the sort of classical compositions that are just that I find lacking in uh, the uh, sort of more European and American classic music and whatnot. Okay. Yeah, deeply appreciate it. And uh, so um, when you go to Pakistan, uh, Salman, uh, are, is anybody familiar with these games and films? Uh, obviously, Pakistan would, like India, have to have its own film industry. And uh, obviously, we don't see uh, many Pakistani films in the West. Uh, we see more Asian Indian films than we do Pakistani films because there's far more of a, I guess, a power emanating out of Bollywood. Or do, uh, well, oh, by the way, Jameson's got the name of that individual. Do bring him up, whatever you found out about him, and then uh, turn it uh, on. Yeah, his name is uh, Shiro uh, Sigisu. And he, I think, did a lot of the compositions that were in uh, on uh, Neon Genesis. Okay. Which, yes. Go on. And he, he also did, like, the compositions for, like, the Bleach anime and whatnot. So I really, I really just, I just love his music. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And, and uh, so, uh, turning it over to Salman again, and uh, let me try and regain my voice here and <laughs> see if that's all possible. Um, yes, my brother. Yeah, speak a bit about the it's, it's, Pakistani movies and, uh, and the like, you know. It it's, it's funny, Brother Douglas, <laughs> before, before I address that. Yeah. It's, uh, I noticed that all of the, the video games that program you to be a mindless mass shooter or to portray the American military in a positive light, yeah. are all games that are made by American game developers. So <laughs> Thank if you. you. If you Thank want, like, you. the truth. <laughs> yeah, so if you want, like, the truth, always, uh, and if you want a good story and good truth and a good direction and all of that, then always make sure that the game that you're playing is developed by a Japanese company or a Japanese developer because 
that is the difference that I was able to point out is that the games that were produced by American companies, they often had that aspect of just uh, ba basically they were just recruiting tools. And a lot of them are like sponsored by many of these things where they just want to program you to be a mass shooter or they portray the positivity of the U.S. military. And it, the Japanese games were the ones that were actually giving you better games and more esoteric truths in it. And, uh, you know, that said, with the what I've seen in Pakistan is they, Brother Douglas, often just listen to Indian music and watch Indian movies. I thought that so. That kind of like co correlates to the other side and it's the same language. They relate to it. They do have a Pakistani movie industry and they do have like a soap opera industry, but it's not as strong. They majority of the time they just watch whatever comes out of India. And it's hard in Pakistan to find uh I guess people who are more well read on Japanese cartoons and games compared to how it is in America. Over there it's like whatever they influence comes from India, that's what they're singing and what they're dancing to and enjoying. So there, there's a lot of ignorance in that community and that's why I feel lost within my community where because they don't they don't understand what I'm talking about in their eyes. I'm just a crazy person <laughs> because they they don't they don't understand. So that's why I'm glad that Allah has blessed me with uh, your brotherhood, JMO, and all of the great brothers and sisters that are on this path together, because you will always be with the people in your life who understand you and who are there to help you on your journey. So for that, I'm, I'm grateful to you, my brother. Oh, bless you. No, that's deeply appreciated. And I suspected that about Pakistan. And it's, it's uh, you know, that's got to be difficult because uh, obviously one would hope that this would lead to a kind of cultural exchange, so to speak, or a sense of cultural empathy when uh, these terrible things happen, like the COVID catastrophe in India or um, massive earthquakes that have taken place in Pakistan. There's outreach where the Asian Indians and the Pakistani people do help each other or they do their best to help. But the rest of the time, they live in this state of uh, true hostility and um uh, with that kind of hostility, it, it's it's a wonder that uh, the you know that the Pakistani state doesn't consider this kind of like a cultural threat or a, a kind of uh, you know just uh, the Asian Indian uh, media or, or Bollywood uh, uh, kind of uh, depleting their own sense of cultural identity or or uh, disabling, or well, I guess it doesn't disable it at all. I mean, the Pakistanis and, A and Asian Indians, when they go to war, they, they, they go to war with a vengeance. Uh, and, uh, you know, I guess all the Bollywood in the world hasn't diffused uh, <laughs> the ability to turn <laughs> that on, uh, that hatred on when, when it's needed. But um, it's just bizarre to me that somebody that they've had so many wars with, they, they would watch so many of their films. It's, it's kind of like... Uh, but then again, you know, you, you have this kind of thing going on in Asia where uh, obviously originally the Japanese media was extraordinarily influential on, on uh, the rest of Asia. And uh, the rest of Asia produced their own industries of a similar sort. And it's simply Americans don't see them as much. Uh, and, uh, but with Pakistan and, and all that, that's kind of, how would I say, it's, it's paradoxical to me. And, and what, does anyone ever speak to that or, or bring that up? Oh, they do, especially like the uh, the religious uh, fanatics that are there. Mm -hmm. They would often say that, OK, you shouldn't be watching this stuff. It takes away from your identity. Then they point out the factor that Bollywood uh, in the 80s and 90s was more family oriented. But when it got past 2001 or 2005, it became more westernized, more sexually oriented. And we don't want our uh, boys and girls in this country watching that. So there were a few, uh, I think, chapters uh, throughout uh, history, recent history, where the Pakistani government had banned a lot of the Indian channels, which would display Bollywood movies during like times of hostility when there would be like any kind of issue between India and Pakistan. But when things cooled down, like they would just, you know, turn it back on. So the, the aspect is that I guess there are basically the same people in many aspects, but you do have the caste system that also plays or it has influenced even Pakistan to a certain extent, even with my family. Like, you know, you're from the Sheikh tribe, you know, the, and if you if you don't if you marry somebody outside of that, then they look upon you with disdain. Or if you don't marry a 
female cousin from the mother's side or the uh, the father's side, you're it's, it seems like um, that you'd done something that was uh, very horrible. So they do have that <laughs> caste system mentality that falls into Pakistan as well, because at that time it was just if, if you go back before 1947, it was just one land. So it makes sense that they feel connected to their music, their culture, their food and their movies. It just it just makes sense. It's natural. And it's just like here, Brother Douglas, that they that they tell us all this stuff about Japan surrendering and all this stuff. And we grow up with them educating us with their movies, video games, books, TV shows, everything. And even <laughs> working at 7-Eleven, most Americans don't know it's all it's owned by the Japanese. That's the parent company. And uh, I thank you for sharing the truths that you do, because they're 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 not teaching us here in the history books but it's those that can put two and two together thinking oh this is how it really works and that's you know i i thank you for that for teaching us this education and this truth not just about the japanese history and about world war ii but about the uh you know the issue of the indian caste system which is also going to be an issue here in america if people don't heed to what you're telling them thank you Thank you. I, I, I definitely appreciate uh, what you're what you're saying. And uh, of course, uh, it's uh, one of these things that uh, hopefully will uh, begin to enlighten um, more people uh, of the younger age and uh, then uh, bring them into the uh, a, 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 well, it'll be a better world when more people know the truth. It's that simple. And uh, it, this is what people really mean when they say the truth will set you free. Now, I've spoken before about the negative aspects of truths, where it can do just the opposite and bind you uh, and uh, the constrict you, uh, the realities. Uh, but uh, this is one uh, example where it truly would set people free. It would set them free from the baggage uh, of their delusions and uh, the dangers that those delusions uh, lead to. Uh, so, um, obviously I don't expect most people in Pakistan would have the money or the technology available to lose themselves in video games like people here in the United States, but, mm, mm. but, uh, as, uh, Salman Sheikh has said, obviously there's these reactionaries who speak of Bollywood and, uh, its influence and, uh, but of course people need some kind of distraction from, uh, just the, uh, the kind of life that they might lead in Pakistan, which I think would be relatively hard. But as uh, Salman has tried to educate them, it really would be much worse for most of them if they came to America. Um, there's very few people who uh, really attain a kind of prosperity here, and I would suspect that most of those that did would already have been wealthy when they moved here. Uh, was that the case with the gentleman who was dealing with real estate in Texas, or was his more of a case of kind of a successful entrepreneurship? Oh, definitely, Brother Douglas. Um, you basically laid it out perfectly. The Pakistanis that I've seen successful here in uh, America and during my visit to England were like the fourth and fifth generational Pakistanis, the ones that had come and their families had settled in and they had become accustomed to the system because many do not realize that when a lot of those people come from those countries to the West, they still live with that same mentality, same expectation, same perception of life. And that doesn't help you when you're living in a society like America, like you have to know what you're dealing with. And I thank God that he had given me the education where at home I was getting educated in the Pakistani environment and culture and outside when I had to go outside for work or for school, anything. I had to basically deal with the American aspect. And it, it, it reflects me a lot on what um, Islam teaches, that any country that you're a resident of, you have to basically respect its system and conform to it. So most Pakistanis that are our first generation, it's very rare that you see that they have been established and they're not working at a gas station or a uh, 7-Eleven or driving Uber. So and some of them are successful business owners, but that's like very few. The ones who basically learn that balance between East and West and how to survive in a Western country as an Eastern person and to also maintain your values and culture and all that at the same time. But the majority of the ones that I've seen that are like 
successful and they established themselves with high positions and good salaries and all that were basically the fourth and fifth generational ones, which I believe as time had went on, they had kind of gotten used to the system and had found that balance between East and West and how to operate in both worlds at the same time. So that's that's very important for those that come to these countries. But like you said, the rest of them over there, they don't have the time for video games, nor can they afford it because they're just uh, working day and night just trying to survive and put food on the table. But at the same time, a lot of them still have a colonial mindset, thinking that coming to a Western country will be their uh, their golden ticket. But they don't realize when they come here, they're working twice as hard because over there, you, it's it's their own people. Some of them wake up when they want, sleep when they want. Even there's no danger of being homeless because one one of the families will most likely will take you in and help you. When you come here, you got to work or you're going to end up on the road. So that's one thing that they don't realize is when they come here, their degrees are useless. The system here doesn't accept their degrees. A lot of their credentials, they don't accept it. So they got to start from the bottom of the barrel. So those that know the balance of East and West and how to do things right and how to say them the right way, how to carry yourself in a proper manner, they kind of uh, establish themselves. But it's, you know, like I've noticed here and also in England, what I've seen, it's usually the fourth or fifth generational ones that are really, they're, they're good to go. Okay, thank you. And by the way, um, I know that you usually have to go to bed around uh, midnight. Uh, so uh, obviously, we're going to try not to keep you beyond that, at least not too long beyond that, which is uh, coming up soon enough about uh, the time right now would be about 7 to 8, 8 to 9, 10 p.m. where you're at. So we might have two hours of the gift of your company. Um, in the meantime, um, to get the most out of you, I want to stretch this out a bit and, uh, um, you know, maybe still have you around when I start on some of these subjects. Otherwise, you can catch them when I go into them the next day. But uh, certainly I do want to address the Nyagas because you brought up um, the very long... Uh, you know, I still haven't listened or reviewed to what you, what you said, but you brought up, of course, the one Sufi uh, who was buried next to a very long uh, internment, uh, meaning a very long kind of uh, burial site for a truly tall um, snake or person, uh, I believe, uh, thanks to Chris Collins, he emphasized, uh, at first I thought you were talking about this man simply was living with a snake because I only caught the last few minutes what you said. So like a very large cobra of an almost uh, supernatural size. But he was saying you were speaking about a Nyaga that this man was buried next to. So uh, that's uh, that makes much more sense. Um, I might go into a bit of that, but... Uh, the, the, the problem is once we get into these subjects, they're very interconnected. And uh, so if you might just review just a little bit of that uh, for our listeners, uh, because I'll, you know, try to touch on that tonight, you know, if possible. Uh, otherwise, I will in another, um, you know, in the episode uh, of next Sunday. But uh, after that, I want uh, James and Reese to address uh, We're Hyenas, because uh, it makes perfect sense evolutionarily that... Uh, uh, lycanthropes would adapt to their their regional environment, their regional ecosystem. And of course, the wolf ranges throughout North America and throughout Europe uh, into Eurasia. And this is why we have that concept of the werewolf that has come to us, which of course, as I said, uh, I shared the reality of it with Animal Planet when I consulted with them. Uh, without credits to earn money uh, to help care for my parents when I was taking care of them in, the, in their final decade of life. Uh, and what I shared was based on uh, my dear friend, my 3D graphics modeler, and uh, his experience in life as a lycanthrope, which is, of course, different from what people may think and in terms of film and, uh, and not at all as spectacular as film has to make it to be to retain visual interest. Now, uh, in Africa, of course, they have the weir hyenas, which makes much more sense. Uh, James and Reese might go a bit into that. Uh, but, uh, you know, if the two of you would start a conversation now about the Nyagas and the weir hyena, you know, they'll buy me some more time while I look around the Internet for other things to analyze in the current events 
uh, as well as, um, you know, the historical aspects of Alexander. And, uh, of course, I want people to realize this is also, um, oh, what day is this? Aside from Alexander's death day tomorrow, uh, today, as I said, will be a day I'll address a little bit of uh, what... Um, uh, George Takai uh, is addressing uh, tonight, and his uh, show just started now. Uh, of course, I'm not going to recommend people go listen to that. I can pretty much tell you what he's going to talk about uh, right here. So uh, in that sense, I'll be forced to go a little bit into what he's addressing, which is basically the internment and his childhood experience. Uh, and of course, uh, I want people to know, I'll go a little bit into this. He was personally disgusted with the fact that uh, the latest, uh, one of the latest Star Trek films uh, reintroduced uh, the uh, character of Sulu and they portrayed him as gay. They portrayed him in a gay marriage, which of course the real uh, George Takei is involved in, a gay marriage, uh, but in which he is the wife, essentially. But uh, yeah, I'll tell you. Yeah, what. yeah, I can understand his disgust to that because it's it's sort of like they're trying to uh, make the uh, the character of Sulu a character a, a caricature of George Takai. Thank and, you. And, and, <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and and that completely defeats. I mean, then again, J.J. Abrams. I mean, what do, what the hell do we expect? I mean, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Him and uh, George Lucas, you know, you know that they're they're from the um they're from that um old school, you know, worship the Jew kind of thing. Thank you. You know, and I, I'm not speaking about this from a anti-Judaic perspective Thank either. You. No, I mean, go on from from there if you need to qualify any further. But but, yeah. but the problem is, but the problem is, uh, what what he does is, is is they completely shit on people. Yes. They take the liberty to shit on people. Yeah. Unapologetically. Thank and, you. And 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 the minute you say anything about them, it's like, oh, you're anti you you're anti Judaic. Yes. You're anti Judaic. They, they they pull that card, yeah. and um, it, it's fucked up, really. Um, it, it, it's a good way to completely destroy a franchise. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Good way to destroy a franchise. Um, and I'm fairly certain that if, uh, I'm fairly certain, uh, if, uh, what's his name? Who's the guy who produced, who's, who, who originally came up with the mind of Star Trek again? Uh, Gene Roddenberry. I'm sure if Gene Roddenberry was alive, he would rip him a new asshole yes yes the most well that's exactly what uh george takai has said and uh that's uh the character of sulu was a ladies man but you know i'll get into that later a little bit yeah um, yeah and 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 what he could what he should have done no, what he should have done is is made him sort of like uh he, what he should have done is made the character of sulu you know have a sort of relationship with uh what do you call it? with uh ahura yeah. now that would have now that would have been very progressive yes. that would have been very progressive and that's the future i i believe that's the future of uh human humanity more or less well, that was certainly what Gene Roddenberry, he took it further than that, because uh, obviously if Gene Roddenberry had gone in that direction uh, where he uh, had portrayed uh, Uhuru and uh, or Uhura more properly, as, as you said it correctly the first time. And uh, of course, it's very easy to conflate her name with the South African word for freedom because it makes sense. Uh, obviously, um, her having a last name that would imply the African word for freedom was, would be it makes sense. But uh, in terms of uh, her own African background as a character, the characteress of uh, Lieutenant Uhura was uh, really supposed to be from the Swahili speaking uh, nations of East Africa. For those of you who don't know, more the, uh, the region of, uh, that I was in and uh, the region in which uh, Mr. Uh, Barack Hussein Obama was actually born. And uh, so uh, in terms of uh, if uh, Gene Roddenberry had gone in that, that direction where she had, um, if he paired up uh, Uhura and um, uh, the Sulu character, it uh, would not have been all that positive in terms of anything uh, uh, productive coming of it, 
because everybody would just say, oh, look, the, the colors are getting together. Who the fuck cares? Uh, rather, it was revolutionary that uh, he had her. And, uh, and of course, um, oh, God, I try to bleach him from my mind. The guy who played uh, William Shatner, <laughs> the guy who played oh, yeah, Captain William Kirk. Shatner, yeah. you, you know how yeah, it is. He, love, love the character. Hate the actor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he, he's now doing his own thing with uh, some kind of paranormal show. Oh, um, God. Oh, God. Which, 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 which is apropos. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He, he just he cannot. He cannot do it the way Leonard Nimoy did it, okay? No, when no. Leonard Nimoy... Leonard, yeah. Yeah, Le did, yeah, Leonard Nimoy has an art to him, you Thank know. You. Thank you. The guy has a... He has an elegance to him. Yeah, yes. It, um, it, Shatner is I mean, just my, funny. He's just funny. Yeah. That's the best thing you can say about him, right? I mean... You he know. would have been. He would have been a good comedian. Yes, yes, he would have been. Uh, he he at least has that. He knows how to laugh about himself. But uh, in, in terms of uh, Shatner and Uhura kissing, the white black thing was so outrageous to so many Americans. It outraged so many people. It was exactly what needed to happen. <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, yes, was, yes, 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 and, yes, and and that's yeah. and that was what Gene Roddenberry was a genius for doing. And very brave, very courageous. He was he was uh, that was you know one of the things that uh, got the show canceled. For those of you who don't know, it was like only a few seasons before it was canceled, and it was only kept alive by its fan base uh, demanding that it be brought back. Thousands of letters, thousands and thousands of letters. And then uh, when they brought it back, um, you know, that's uh, that's what gifted us the, the franchise in continuity. But um, aside from that, uh, it, you know, I, I do want uh, you to speak a bit about the We're Hyenas. Uh, and of course. Oh, makes, yes. Yeah, yes. Before I go into the We're Hyenas, there was also one other thing I wanted to speak about. Um as far as the Japanese video games, I noticed like in, in the Final Fantasy franchises, especially, you know, personally, I enjoyed Final Fantasy X too because I just like the battle system. But you, I, I, one, one can note that they have a lot of, uh, a lot of the monsters have like names of some of the Goetic demons and some of these other gods from other lands and whatnot. So I would say that if anything, when, when it comes to occultism, they're probably far more advanced than what we have here in the United States, which is a sort of watered down. I'm not going to say it's watered down because, uh, you know, magic is magic. I mean, if it works, it works. But what I'm going to say is that there's a sort of uh, oligarch. There's the, I call it the occult oligarch, mm -hmm. which, uh, which we have Peter Lavenda, we have... Um, you know, EA co-editing, and we have, you know, all those types who wind up on um, coast to coast and whatnot, you know, who are <laughs> running this what show. What you mean to say is oligarchy, <laughs> the oligarchy, which is a governance by uh, effectively an octagon uh, and a, a group of eight is, in other words, a, a monopoly of a cabal. Uh, so yes, yes, yes. Yeah. That's exactly what we have here in, in, in the West. We have a sort of cabal of... Uh, of people of individuals who are just like um usurping all the knowledge and you know anything you find in the books is just going to point to them or it's going to be whatever they put out or it's you know or and many of the things you're going to find in the books aren't going to put things into the proper context mm -hmm. and so you're going to be experimenting with things you're going to have a lot of fucked up things happen in your home and you're going to be like what the hell and then you're gonna you're gonna have to try to f have to figure out the shit on your own if you're you know I I don't know if that 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 happens in Japan I don't I wouldn't know because I I've never been there but well, I can um, I, I can tell you I was disgusted by the fact that I was cruising YouTube uh, just last night or yesterday uh it, you know the days fade into one another for me because of my sleeping pattern being not only different from any baseline human it's impacted by the fact that i've had to get up uh so early so often that it's been totally discombobulated i'm i'm sleeping in an inverted upside down schedule as far as i'm concerned because i have to get up so early to take these stupid 
uh, fucking, um, you know, COVID tests, which are only in the morning that, you know, you go there and get them for free, uh, but you're paying half a hundred dollars to get there and back. Uh, I made use of it by taking care of a bunch of other things I had to do. But, you know, while I was out there at UCSF to get this COVID test so that I could see the dentist on Friday, you know, and then I'll be getting up early on Friday to see him. There was that and several other things that got me up early, you know, over the past few weeks. Uh, yeah, I'm forgetting what day I'm doing what. But um, uh, other because I'm sleeping every chance I get when I get that opportunity as well. And when I sleep, you know, I can sleep for days if I'm left to my own devices. So when, when I do wake up, it's like, you know, it's, it's just it all begins to fade together. So all I can say is I, I don't remember exactly when I saw this, but it was sometime in the last 48 hours. <laughs> it was on YouTube and they have the entire Lavinda Necronomicon uh, in audiobook format that they're reading aloud for any idiot who can listen to oh it. And, 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 and just so anybody knows about magic, just understand this. Any idiot can call up a demon to ruin their fucking life. Okay? <laughs> there is nothing empowering uh, in magic for the overwhelming majority of people. Uh, yes, but it takes but it takes someone with an uh, incredible amount of skill to be able to cast a spell that doesn't call upon a demon's power, that rather hacks into reality and causes an event to happen. So just just make sure to let everybody talent. know that all I care about is you let everybody know that I do my best to discourage you from doing anything. Okay, <laughs> just well, let them. Yeah, know. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Douglas discourages me from doing anything because, well, um, it's just you know, it's uh, just you know, it's just good to be cautious and. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, it's good to be cautious, and I am not what you would call your most responsible adult in the room thank you thank you <laughs> just, just always remember people it helps helps if you're if you are doing magic helps not to be turfed all right you know yes, it's best yes, not to be turfed and uh not only that don't not only that be a responsible adult when you're doing magic yes don't yes. be emo uh yes. that said yeah. There we are. Thank you. Thank you. That's important. That's important. And uh, so um, before you go into Weir Hyenas, um, let's have Salman uh, because he has to leave earlier than you do. Uh, and I thank you, by the way, for being sober <laughs> tonight. Uh, and uh, d d deeply appreciate that. And uh, when I told uh brendan uh about uh yeah um the other night it was uh, uh you know uh our man jameson was was concerned uh it, <laughs> about how he was you know what he was going through and uh you know pretty much brendan said isn't he like that every episode and i, I said you know that's not i'm not gonna argue with that i'm not gonna, i will neither confirm nor deny that there's an element of that to many of the nights uh, that you're with us and i do appreciate the fact you've got a lot going on in your home and uh, so, um, you, you know, this is why, like I've, I've said before to Penny, it was irritating. And I, I was saying this, even though I knew Jameson was listening and lying down, because, uh, you, you know, I was just bringing up the fact that, uh, you know, I'm not going to. I'm not going to preach to Jameson about, uh, you know, don't do drugs. or something. It's, That just makes it worse for anybody. I mean, honestly, uh, one of the things that I get with... Uh, uh, v, the, the uh, medical cosmetologist that I, I you know, was uh, in a relationship with for years. And uh, she's someone who, like, if I display to her the emotion that I display to all of you as listeners, the kind of depth of emotion I express at times, uh, I, I, I display that to her in a telephonic conversation. And she'll just ask me if I've been drinking. And, and that's just so offensive. And it, it's just, what do you do with that? It, it, it's just people, so she has this, what, what is this? This kind of like uh, uh, like, okay, template. you've been drinking. <laughs> but, but, I'm sorry, what? I mean, I mean, I mean, my question would be, who cares if you've been drinking? It's your show. Uh, uh, no, 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 no. I mean, it's not, it has nothing to do with the show. It's like when I'm talking to her personally. And if I, oh. if, if when I display the kind of emotions with her that I regularly do on my program, 
then she'll ask me if I've been drinking, which is actually far worse than, <laughs> than if I were on the show and going to those levels of emoting that I do here on, on the, with my extended electronic family. Uh, because as I've told people before, uh, if you're not emotionally impacted by what you're relating, most people are going to ask, why should they be, right? I mean, that's the, that's the, the natural human way of responding. Uh, we, people relate to some level of emoting. Obviously, uh, the, there's, there's elements of overplay or something like that, uh, but we're not dealing with drama here. We're dealing with uh, the horror of the world we live in. Uh, and um, so I, I do want people to, I, I mean, you know, I could go into kind of an example of, of that that comes to mind would be uh, for um, uh, those of you who were, um, oh, uh, remember The Exorcist, and you think of the, the horrors of, of Canada uh, when it comes to what the Canadians did with those Native American children. Uh, and uh, just understand that there's nothing exceptional about the hundreds of bodies they found under a school for Native American children in Canada. All of the schools for Native American children in Canada have hundreds of bodies beneath them. Even uh, Trudeau, who has been lambasting the church as a strategy to just take deflect. attention. Yeah, to deflect. Uh, by the way, and to put this into some perspective for people, uh, America is, of course, uh, and, and, and so our, our lovely lady, Maria Michaela Gregoric, she asks in the messages, wow, so showing emotions can only be induced by drugs. You know, honestly, this is what V thinks of me. Yes, I know. She has a template, I guess, for how men should behave and that, you know, real men. Yeah, it would be like, um, you know, some kind of box of ambulatory meat uh, that um, their expression of anything is somehow somehow implies that they're they're narcotized or altered. Uh, it's, it's, it's just, you <laughs> yes, know, it's, we must all speak in monotone. Yeah, yes. Me feel nothing. Yes. Me, I'm just a logical. Yes, anyway, just, everything is just logic, logic, yeah. logic. <laughs> just, just yeah. disgusting and and uh but in terms of what i was trying to bring up about canada and our lovely lady who lives in canada is with us right now so she can hear me and add some details if she wishes and by the way i apologize to her right now for at one time saying her sister was part of a movement that i forget which movement i affiliated her sister with but just so everybody knows uh maria michaela gregorich's sister uh, is involved with the Padania separatist movement in northern Italy, which is, uh, if, if you go into the northern Italian Alps, much of that land was uh, developed underground by the Theod Reich to build the Alpenfestung, the Alpine fortress, which had all the potential for Adolf Hitler to retreat to if he had decided to continue his struggle on the surface world. In other words, it was deep, but not that deep. Very much a, uh, a miles of tunnels that were built from which the Third Reich could launch retaliatory forces. But they decided, why do that when they could just complete their exodus and uh, relocate the civilization and abandon the surface world to their enemy uh, and and look what uh, we've done with it uh but um as oh thank you honey so maria michaela grigorich um informs me it's her cousin not her sister it's her cousin so her cousin is part of the effort irina in slovenia thank you honey and uh by the way slovenia where the wife of uh donald trump sources from uh, is the northernmost part of um, Yugoslavia, what used to be Yugoslavia. And uh, they, during the time of the Holy Roman Empire of the First Reich and the time of the Third Reich, uh, they were part of the First Reich. 
And um, and James is going to grab some dinner. He hasn't eaten. He'll be right back. (laughs) Thank you, James, for informing us of that. But uh, they were, in, in, in terms of the First and Third Reich, Slovenia was part of Germany. It voted to become part of Germany uh, during the Third Reich. They voted for it during the time of the First Reich. They were simply part of the uh, Germanic Federation of the Holy Roman Empire. And uh, so both times they provided Germany a direct outlet, a direct outlet to the Adriatic Sea and therefrom to the Mediterranean. And uh, so when it comes to um, them, they were also part of Italy during the time of the Second World War, uh, or at least Carnolia became part of Italy, and uh, the it's a part of Slovenia. And then other aspects of uh, Slovenia became part of Germany, and uh, they uh, separated um, at the city of Trieste, which became an international city after the war for a period of time before it went back under uh, Italian uh, um, uh, jurisdiction. So it was actually a United Nations city that was uh, its police force, so to speak, was the United Nations. And uh, so it needs to go back to a, a more international status. Uh, and um, Padania would be that old Germanic Lombardy part of uh, Italy, which used to be called Lombardy. And uh, that is, of course, the Lombards were a Germanic tribe. And this is why everybody in northern Alpine Italy uh, looks very Nordic or very Aryan, very blonde haired and blue eyed, very different from much of the rest of Italy. So um, so uh, Maria Michaela Grigorich's cousin in Slovenia is part of this uh, Padania movement. So that would lead to a new nation state. And um, that that would be something I would personally support. And um, I, I can go into why at other, you know, another time. But anyhow, so I apologize to her when I, I brought up her sister's uh, uh, situation. But um, when Jameson returns, I might go a bit more into what I was going to bring up about Canada. But I guess I'll, I'll say it now. And by the way, um, uh, Maria says they changed a few times. My dad alone had birth certificates from three different countries. Incredible. And uh, so thank you so much for sharing that, honey. Uh, and by the way, Derek Talley says uh, that he was he dropped off because he was eating dinner and watching TV with his son and his son's girlfriend before he went to bed. He has been up since 4 a.m. So he has been, of course, getting his dialysis in the morning and apparently was so energized by that experience that, um, you know, he was able to uh, uh, to, um, you know, stay up till now and uh, is apparently going to go to sleep unless he wants to come back on. But um, I did want to get a bit into the church thing with Canada and put that into some perspective. So uh, without Jameson uh, being here, this is what I'll um, say, is that uh, in Canada, it's different from America in terms of how you hear about the church. In America, because we are are, uh, under the influence of a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant elite, uh, as represented by the Republican Party, uh, the Republican Party certainly doesn't represent you or I in in the sense of, uh, you know, Salman Sheikh or myself or pretty much anyone on Team Dietrich. It represents this white Anglo-Saxon pro- Protestant minoritarian uh, elite uh, cabal. And uh, because that has ruled America for 200 years... North America's uh, land that is under the jurisdiction of the United States as a constitutional entity. Uh, Their hatred for Catholicism has been pathological, and uh, their hatred for Catholicism as Protestants has been such that they've propagandized against the church relentlessly. Not to say that there isn't abuses and pedophilia and child molestation, But uh, in Canada, you don't hear any of that on the media to the degree you hear in the United States. You would never even think in Canada if you were listening to the majority of their media because uh, they have a heavy Quebecois uh, population of French Catholics. And because of that, they respect that fact and they kind of leave the church alone and they don't speak of it much. So uh, in Canada, 
uh, and Maria Michaela Grigorich can uh, correct me on this, they really haven't been hitting the church over these child molestation scandals like they were in America, because the Americans are simply using that to deflect from their own sins uh, committed by their own evangelical Protestants, uh, particularly Baptists, etc., etc. Et but uh, obviously the reason I say that is because one of the men I dealt with who was uh, responsible for so many crimes against uh, young children at the Presidio military base was the uh, ordained Baptist minister, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Gary Willard Hambright. So um, anyhow, uh, so all that aside for a moment, when it comes to the uh, Roman Catholic Church, uh, a good example of what will put this into some context for you, aside from what goes on in Canada, uh, would be, uh, the film The Exorcist, when you have a very positive portrayal, so to speak, of the Roman Catholic Church coming in to intervene in a uh, demonic possession. And uh, the woman who did the voice of Pezuzu, the, the demon uh, that's inhabiting uh, the body of this young girl named Reagan, of all things, uh, the woman who delivered that voice that you hear, you know, your mother sucks cocks in hell. Yeah, it's, that was Mercedes McAmbridge. And she had to drink bourbon and smoke cigarettes for her uh, to do what I think was an Oscar, to, for her to deliver what was basically an Oscar level pers performance. So um, she actually... Uh, was strapped down and uh, the types the straps were tightened whenever the young character of Reagan was at her most aggressive painful moments on screen so that's when Mercedes McCambridge would you know the very definition of a method actress uh, she she w essentially had herself tortured so she could deliver that voice for that young girl all the while drinking bourbon and smoking cigarettes to make certain her voice was the right uh, level of, of, of burn. And uh, she was herself a Roman Catholic. And she required her priest to be present because of her fact that she was speaking on behalf of a demon, an archdemon throughout the film. And so her, uh, on her breaks, she would read scripture with this priest and pray. Uh, and uh, also because she needed the bourbon to not only release her inner demon and it revealed painful memories in her mind to deliver this amazing demonic voice. Now she had a hotel near the studio uh, because some days or nights of filming, she was in no condition to drive. Uh, and uh, also she consumed about 30 raw eggs throughout filming and ate pulpy apples. Her lifelong bronchitis added to the delivery and she was also a member of AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, which was where her painful memories stemmed from during the dubbing. So she broke with her, her refraining from alcohol uh, for the sake of that film and uh, for the sake of getting her voice to that, to that point where she did. So she could shout the obscenities that Reagan was supposed to be shouting in The Exorcist. Uh, your mother's down here with us. <laughs> if you might remember that. Uh, there's no way I could do justice to that voice. Uh, so the point I'm making is that obviously she was with a priest because she trusted in the church. So the reason we might draw the conclusion she was able to do so was because she's a female. And obviously, many of these priests that were molesting children were, in the majority, homosexual predators. They were molesting, preying on young boys. So when it came to that kind of predation, most women do not have this negative memory of the Roman Catholic Church. And um, aside from that, we're talking about a organization that's thousands of years old, uh, of course, has thousands of people working within it. 
and you're going to get uh, all kinds of people who are in the supposedly celibate lifestyle that are obviously not going to be living up to their pledge. Uh, many of the nuns might be lesbians, you know, certainly not child predators in the norm, but uh, their, their release would usually manifest as lesbianism. Uh, the priests would usually become child molesters if they if if they have this kind of pathology that would uh, uh, basically uh, draw them towards predation. It would usually be towards young boys. But um, understand that uh, when it comes to this kind of uh, victimization of uh, of people. The uh, it's not every priest is not like that, and you see the positive priesthood personified, uh, portrayed, uh, presented by uh, Max von Sydow in the role of Father Marin uh, and the young priest uh, who also, like Father Marin, they die in their struggle to free this young girl from the grips of this demonic possession. So uh, in, in terms of uh, that, um, hopefully, um, let's see if Maria's left a, a message uh, about that, but um, hopefully she uh, she can correct me if I'm wrong about uh, what goes on in Canada concerning the attitude towards the church. This is the first time you've really had a high level, uh, well, the, the Prime Minister of Canada uh, starting to attack the church to deflect from the Canadian state. But nevertheless, he's also given the order that more bodies be looked for at other Native American schools in Canada because all those Native American schools have hundreds of bodies beneath them. Uh, and uh, it, this is their parents were just given vague bullshit when their child would disappear. And uh, obviously they killed them at the school and just buried them literally in the schoolyard. This is the horror of uh, the prosecution, the persecution of indigenous peoples. No matter what ethnicity you are, or what your history is, no one has anything on the suffering of the Native Americans uh, anywhere in the Western Hemisphere. So um, with that being said, uh, since our man Jameson is eating, he can talk about the weird hyenas after he's finished eating his carrion. And uh, we're our man. Uh, that's a joke, by the way, for those of you who didn't get it, because hyenas, of course, eat carrion. <laughs> but uh, we'll turn towards Salman Sheikh and he can go a bit into the Nyagas. And um, I might say a bit about that before he leaves or we'll see if I can you know, get the strength up to do that. So uh, we, concerning the Nyagas, uh, if you could tell us again, uh, this time with myself being here to hear it about uh, this burial site. And oh, by the way, our lady Maria Michaela Gregorich says in Canada, they keep it quiet, but the Roman Catholic Church is very corrupt at every level, not only with the indigenous peoples. Understood, honey. Yeah, I mean, you know, when you've got something that's been around that long, yes, and uh, you're going to have a high degree of corruption, some of it directly diabolic, because this is what they deal with. This is like police forces. You have very large uh, police forces, as I've said, and uh, Peter Moon says, send me a link and come on for a while. If you with from LA send him a link <laughs> let's see if we can get him on air <laughs> I think that's what he means to say and uh there we are let's call him and bring him on add him to the call so uh there we are and so uh Maria says the history of how the church ruled Quebec and each family had to devote a son and daughter to the church Fascinating. And by the way, uh, the Maria Michaela Gregorich educated me in that Margaret um, uh, Atwood, I think their first name's Margaret, because I'm beginning to confuse her more and more with Margaret Sanger, the woman who was responsible for abortions and uh, ethnic cleansing via the abortions. Uh, but Atwood of The Handmaid's Tale uh, Infamy, which I was going into at, in, in depth, uh, with one of our latest transmissions, she was a member of the Quebecois separatist movement, which uh, unfortunately has become very, uh, how would I say it, entwined with white supremacy in Canada, the idea of a white nation state, an ethno state, essentially, which uh, if, they if they had severed from Canada, then the Native Americans in Canada would have severed from them. And it would have uh, would have been a much smaller Quebec than what you see as a provincial uh, uh, 
map on when you look at it on the map it would have been much smaller than what you see um i think by the noises i'm hearing that peter moon might be with us but it picked up the phone is that so i am can you hear me oh yes so we're very glad to have you with us um salmon shake is with us uh jameson reese is occupied eating carrion <laughs> and uh i'm joking good but evening this, peter yes hi hi there yes and uh, we have other people who are, you know, like Maria Gregorich, uh, hanging on with us through chat and messages. Wonderful lady. God bless her. And God bless Amanda Yu, who was with us earlier. And she's taking care of the kids right now. But uh, we're so glad to have you with us. And um, by all means, uh, take the stage and tell us what's going on with yourself right now and how things are going with uh, the eulogy you read and everything else. Well... I've had a very busy time in in L.A. Um, staying with my daughter. If, if she's at the beach today, if she comes home, I might have to discontinue. I can't disrupt her her domestic tranquility with a Douglas Dietrich transmission <laughs> live in her apartment. But um, we've been spending. This is the first day we haven't been together. She had to go to some to the beach to see somebody, and I I visited with somebody, and we've had an incredible time of uh togetherness of you know my friend's departure from this world brought my entire family together not not for him but for my sister i get to see all our grandchildren separate environment most harmony i've ever seen uh her family in it was beautiful all these grandchildren gives you a lot of perspective on life um and it was very beautiful just harmony, uh, and and it w the gathering wouldn't have occurred if it wasn't for my friend's departure, because I wouldn't be here, and it wouldn't happen that way. It w so it was very beautiful to see, because there was some estrangement in the family, uh, and it it was uh, it was very beautiful. And then the next day, I did the went to the the funeral, and that was very one of the most touching movements in my uh, moments in my life because. Uh, I was saying goodbye to my friend of uh, 65 years. He's been my friend. And, it, you know, I, I went, you know, right in and sat right in the front row with family. You know, not the cousins, not the nephews, but, but the wife, the daughter, and the brother. That's where I belonged. Never felt so in place in my entire life. And, uh, did not break down, fortunately. Got choked up a little bit. I, did, I was really concerned about losing it. Mm -hmm. It was very good. I got to see people I hadn't seen 50 years. Uh, one of my best friends from across the street I played with every day. Mm -hmm. He was there. His older sister came. Uh, people I hadn't seen in 50 plus years. It was so beautiful. And then we went down to my his brother's house in Huntington Beach and traded stories and uh, made some very interesting connections. And, and uh, I mean, family stories, uh, oh, I didn't know that, I didn't know that. And it, it actually requires more investigation uh, of certain things that might even tie into bigger things. And that, that's not, that's unexpected. But whatever my friend left with me was, was you know, greatest gift in the world. Uh, to, to know somebody like that and, and it was just and, and the Catholic ceremony uh, was quite I, I thank them I thank the priests verbally Wonderful. to the entire congregation thank you for doing a nice ceremony because it it uh, acknowledges somebody's existence on this earth and even though I wasn't interactive with him in the last few years because he'd lost his voice box uh, and I you know we hadn't been everyday friends. Mm -hmm. uh, we'd talk on the phone, but it was like all those times you go back. Hunt, I mean, talking, I was with him every day from about 1957 to 1963, more or less. Mm -hmm. And then, but all that stuff, it means his death was more profound than many other people. His family, I felt closer to than my own family. It was really, really, really touching, really uh, never anything quite like it. And uh, 
I will do some healing for their family over the years. I, I know it's going to happen. So it you was know, that. And then I, I would also say what's very interesting about this trip, when I left, I was working on an article for my newsletter about autism. And I, I think I mentioned this earlier, that this woman had said I would have a cure for autism in the future. So I'm writing an article on this, and the, the, the therapy that I learned, I don't administer it myself, was, was uh, cleaning through the colon. Mm -hmm. And I'm coming out here, and I'm seeing autism everywhere. My friend who passed, his daughter works with an autistic child. As You know, she's not autistic, but she works with a professional. Uh, all I had a meeting with um, all these people in the film industry, mm -hmm. and all of them, with the possible exception of maybe one, and, he, and that may be because I don't know, they all have autistic kids. And it's like autism is everywhere. And what is autism? It is, in the most fundamental sense, self-absorption. That's the most fundamental etymological. Of course, there's many diagnoses and what they call the spectrum. To, to when anybody can be autistic, I mean, if they're too, they can't interface with the environment. Mm -hmm. Too much input, or, or what did I say? Input, does, output does not equal input. It's non sequitur output from what is the input. If I say, how are you, and you don't answer me, or you say bananas or oranges, it doesn't make any sense. And that's a very simplistic overview. But, and, and then much of this, if not all of it, is related to post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, one woman was telling me about um, her, the child's father being bipolar. He's the nicest guy in the world. And then he, you know, he turns into the Joker from Batman or something. He becomes completely horrific. And what this does, it cuts down all the, the circuits in, in the nervous system, the neurotransmitters. They stop functioning because you got to shut down because you can't process this crazy ass person right. who was your best friend and protector one minute. And now they're, you know, the banshee from hell. Right. And, and this is the problem. They shut down, they shut down, they shut down. So she was explaining therapy that helped her daughter a lot. Why You'll know it. It's um, anesthetic, uh, hallucinogenic. The psychologists or psychiatrists are prescribing psychologists are using it in conjunction with therapy it is called you know what it is douglas uh um well jameson reese says ketamine yeah. ketamine yeah 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 and saying that you know you get six doses of it it's it's done by injection like on a, for an hour so you're getting uh and it's it's like an anesthetic and you begin to hallucinate and there's six sessions after six sessions it tops off this is what i'm being told i'm not an advocate for this therapy because i have no experience with it i'm just just what i'm being told today and it not only helped this person his daughter who was into some serious depression including cutting it helped her as like a co sufferer because she had to deal full time with the daughter, right? Code, uh, codependent. Go on. Yeah, codependent. Yeah. So it was like I think uh, she said worth every penny. You know, it. I think it was six thousand bucks, maybe for the two of them. I don't know. Remember what it was I think? She, but whatever it was, she said it was worth a penny. She had to scrounge for the money. It helped the daughter. The daughter's on a plateau now. She still has. She's still on the spectrum. She still needs work, but but she's not like ready to kill herself and far away from that. And of course she had leveled out. This is person that she'd leveled out so much more than when I'd seen her tremendously intelligent individual, but suffered from a, a crazy husband. I mean, when I had met her several years ago, she was not, I mean, she was on the edge by reason of this crazy ass husband right. and father. Right. So 
it's like, okay, so she's, you know, singing the praises of this. She also told me about uh, the therapy for PTSD. You'll know this, the, uh, there's an acronym for it, uh, eye movement. What is it called? You, you know it. Eye oh, movement I, uh, I, direction. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm IMRD. I, right, 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 rapid right, 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 rapid eye movement and, and, uh, direction. Well, right. Uh, yeah. yeah. Go on. Now well, I'll say something interesting about that because what it is, is you're getting the person to look at memories that are not too painful, but you're distracting them with, by moving the hands in front of the eyes mm -hmm. so that the eyes are moving and that this would alleviate the the post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, very interesting to the therapy that occurs in Dianetics. In Dianetics, of course, when one is doing Dianetics, one does not just go back into the stress. It's going it, to, that can be too much for a person, depending right. on the amount of stress it is. The, you have to build them up first by looking at pleasure moments and then at less intense things like the time you bumped your knee you didn't have to go to the hospital you didn't even have to put a band-aid you just bumped your knee and went ah that sort of thing and you work down into heavy loss light losses you know you lost your wallet you lost your keys you lost your girlfriend you lost your mother you lost your father it gets heavier until finally you deal with the real unconscious stuff which is the the super traumatic when you were run over by a train whether it be in this life or another but as part of this process, it was very important that the person's eye movement be engaged in the recall. This was Dianetics. One of the things was scanned through to the end of the incident. You would move them to the beginning of the incident and they would scan through and inevitably they would have their eyes closed. And if anybody's honestly scanning through the incident in their mind, their eyes are going to be moving. You would see this routinely. Yeah. The eyes are moving because your eyes are watching what's happening. If they're not doing that, you're not really engaging the mind. So Dianetics would effectively do this. Um, we were never really told to watch the app r rapid eye movement. But when I think back to it, it was always there if, it, if the, the person was engaging in whatever he was looking at so it it you know one therapy is a mimic of the other um this type of therapy also deals with uh putting frequencies to to do things i'm not i don't really know that much about the therapy but she was saying it relieved ptsd mm -hmm. um she had had some success with it but i wanted to ask you as somebody who has suffered PTSD, if either of, if you've ever entertained these approaches or if your therapist has either entertained them or advised you for them or against them? Oh, uh, well, certainly when I was dealing with my psychiatrist, uh, Dr. Tao Tran, uh, this was integral to uh, her hypnotic therapy and uh, the hypnosis, of course, uh, required by my my starting to go into the deep memory recall. Now, you know that somebody is going into deep uh, memory recall when uh, their eyes go up towards the uh, upper left hand corner uh, and uh, their eyes will you know, they're entering a hypnotic state where they're um, entering that memory, where that memory is becoming the present moment for them, when uh, their eyes basically turn up towards looking up at the brain, and uh, that's how the eyes become white. So you see the whites of their eyes only because their eyes are looking so far up into their brain. This is when the person is truly in uh, that state of deep recall. So uh, that people understand this, uh, most uh, psychiatrists never deal with something at that level. This is something that the Scientology was using as a kind of uh, a therapy that dealt not only with what you're suffering in this life, but past lives where your various incarnations are like radiation. The Rontgens are piling up. So with your past lives, the traumas are acting, that they pile up so that this life carries the trauma of many lifetimes. 
my psychiatrist was working at that level. And um, so when she was doing what she was doing, she's dealing with, of course, the alter personality that she had been instructed to install in myself at that one point in my life when I was seriously um, uh, attempting to become a field agent, a spy for the United States uh, to be dispatched into United Vietnam, the Vietnam that's now united under under communism and uh, as a field agent for the United was States. This, excuse me, Douglas, was this before or after you had suffered your initial PTSD? Oh, this was, uh, in terms of the, the if you're referring to the PTSD that, um, you know, at that point, uh, honestly, my whole life has been an experience of PTSD. I, 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 I real I realize that, so it's it's a loaded question I asked. Yeah, yeah, it's it's there's no way to really answer that effectively. It's it's honestly it's it's certainly after PTSD that I had suffered to that point in time, <laughs> and it's before PTSD PTSD I suffered after that. Yeah, I would say that uh, y y this was pretty much uh, before. Uh, the Marine Corps, but it was after a childhood of uh, just exposure to uh, uh, what would be considered levels of hyperviolence, violence that no uh, average combat soldier would ever have experienced uh, in war uh, that I grew up with uh, on a day-to-day -day basis in the Tenderloin. Uh, and so uh, when uh, it, it comes to all of that, um, it's it, that's you know again as as Peter said, you there's don't, no point. You don't become yeah. immune. You don't become immune to what you experienced. It you become yeah. a little what you'd say desensitized to it. Yes, but, calloused. But then yeah. also the trauma becomes kind of embedded as a regular to be expected thing. So the point if now you're put out on a a golf course as a caddy and you don't have to worry about your support, you're going to be in a totally non sequitur environment, you know, where you just look at green, you know, greens and, you know, and don't have to worry about anything, but, but given a five iron or whatever clubs they, they want, you know, mm -hmm. it, it would be a total different reality when you're, you're totally being exposed to routine, repetitive, uh, trauma. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I, I really appreciate your saying that. So uh, w when it comes to uh, the, the what I'm pointing out to people is that, yeah, I've been uh, exposed to these kinds of uh, treatments to degree, uh, certainly um, a, a bit more of a controlled environment than maybe what um, Peter was exposed to himself uh, in terms of what this, uh, these people were describing to him, sharing with him. Uh, so I think that, uh, it, what, uh, what he's learned is, uh, very important, very useful. And, uh, I'm, I'm glad that he's been exposed to this and I'm glad other people are, are mainlining this kind of making this more mainstream and accessible, uh, for people who need it. And, uh, what he says about autism is certainly important and uh, I'm glad that he's investigating this phenomenon uh, the um, other thing that uh, comes to mind is of course I told everybody that later tonight I will address uh, the uh, UFO reports from the Pentagon I'm going to you know I finally forced myself to suffer through much of what they've released uh or a great deal of recently, it recently in the last in the last week or yeah is it yeah the, the last, last month it, it, the, the last few days really and uh because i have i haven't missed it i haven't watched tv i haven't seen anything on that on the internet but i haven't been looking it's mostly texting you know friends and family so on and so forth and so i have <laughs> not i've been not in tune with the news in the last couple of days. Well, in, in terms of, uh, I wouldn't expect you to even try to even investigate this because, of course, you and I know what it is. It's a panic release of damage control materials so that they can uh, deflect uh, from uh, what we're exposing. Uh, but uh, aside from that, uh, we're dealing with a... Uh, uh, well, I'll just tell people the, the details of it when I, you know, get to that point tonight. It's it's not going to take that long, really, because most of what I saw was just uh, 
it's just just pure crap in terms of the way that they're presenting it it's all out of context and of course it's uh and and the way they've announced it uh is with enough backpedaling that i'll describe tonight to uh, finalize pretty much uh the reality of uh of of the thousand year Reich in exile, honestly, uh, because the, these the, basically the government is saying these are not aliens. So this is where they finally come out with that after all this time, uh, and uh, so this was released. With oh, them. they they did say they weren't aliens. They yeah, said they yeah, weren't aliens. Yeah. And like I said, I'll go into detail into that later. There's no point in my unless you really want me to. I can start going into that now, but it's it's not. Well, something. Maybe we can maybe we can mosey about before we. Get get there mm-hmm. or before you get there but this um because people you know ask about this stuff uh the aliens are they're finally going to reveal uh and, and people like actually anticipate and expect this mm-hmm. like you know uh you know we're finally going to have spaghetti for dinner and, you know <laughs> and, and, <laughs> you know it's like they're they're saying we're going to have spaghetti it's like or or soldiers who have been getting a regular mess routine and some new food came in. Oh, they say we're going to get roast beef. It's like that's you know, of course they're going to get roast beef. But this is, you know, it's like people are listening to the news. And I would also say, I was mentioning to my brother about uh, um, the Romanians and this. Oh, and about Yasser Arafat uh, being a notorious homosexual, according to uh, this defector. Mihai, I think his name was Papu, but but I was mentioning this. So he's sitting there with his cell phone. He goes right on. He says, well, I'm looking at Wikipedia here. Like he went right to Wikipedia, like (laughs) looking at Yasser Arafat. He says, it doesn't really say much about his personal life. Like he went immediately there to verify or see what it said. Like, you know, there's no question in his mind that Wikipedia might be less than a credible source. Uh, <laughs> I didn't engage him on the subject. And he's not a stupid person, but uh, just like, okay, Wikipedia. It's it's almost as if you're going to the encyclopedia on the shelf. Right. Uh, right. That's which, how people used to do it if they had any sense of, uh, uh, shall I say, uh, intellectual acumen discernment yeah discernment. yeah thank you they would say okay let's go to the encyclopedia britannica or uh whatever encyclopedia was on the shelf and by the way for people who don't know this there was also an encyclopedia americana or and an, and there was an encyclopedia sovietica you know and and people don't know this but uh these different encyclopedias were uh, a turn to you know a go to source for people uh and uh but nowadays it's wikipedia nobody has as encyclopedias anymore and that's understandable i mean oh my god i was dealing with one of the last encyclopedia salesmen at one point who almost you know convinced my mother to buy them because she loved me she loved knowledge and uh and she still thought in terms of the old books as the source of knowledge and um uh this was uh even before the computers were really entering our lives but uh, i i told this poor salesman uh, no no we don't want that because we couldn't afford that and uh but uh it's it's simply something that uh, people would invest into if they you know love their families and wanted a legacy for their children. This is how people considered this, and you would get the latest edition, but it would become like a heirloom. And uh, and of course, since they were issuing a new one every year, um, you know what is the point? It became antiquated. Yes, it became antiquated very quickly. But that's how you sell encyclopedias. Yes, you know, you... yes, that's right. Uh, and uh, so no one um, that does that now, thank God. And uh, that's uh, it says the reconnection has been successful. So hopefully everybody hears us without a break. Uh, and Our Lady um, Maria Gregorich says she had the World Book Encyclopedia. And she says, by the way, what is that triangular shape in the sky they've been talking about seen in April? She says they make it seem like it's E.T. coming home. I saw it myself, and I'm not doing any drugs. I've explained the triangular uh, dirigibles in the past, and, of course, uh, these things were actually... uh, shown on an episode of Lassie where they showed them as a part of the U.S. Forestry Service, which they actually were. And they were using them for logging to actually take large amounts of logs 
uh, to uh, basically fly to other places or float to other places. Uh, and, uh, you know, I have to look that episode of Lassie up. Um, I remember people actually looked that up for me and found it. And uh, so it should be available on YouTube. Uh, but it's, uh, it, it's uh, of all things, they're attacked by a violent environmentalist, a environmental fundamentalist who takes on the a forest service, which is what Lassie's master was working for at that point in the series, one of her many incarnations and one of her many masters. At that at that point in time, she was working with a forestry service man. They showed the the goddamn triangular uh, uh, dirigible that the Americans had that they were flying around. And for some reason, this completely vanished from the American public mind or anybody in the Western world. And then when they see these goddamn things, they say, oh, look, it's aliens. It makes me sick. Uh, now, of course, if you see some triangular shaped craft that's going at uh, thousands of miles per hour, which most people, uh, you know, won't even, uh, you know, see. Uh, but if you do see that, then that would be something different. But uh, that takes us into uh, the Third Reich again. Uh, not, you know, if you take a look at some of these biological entities, they're not UFOs per se. They're unidentified creatures as opposed to flying objects. You could still consider them an object, but they're a biological object. It's more like an unidentified uh, life form. Uh, so uh, in terms of... Uh, uh, all of uh, this uh, all together so that people understand. And uh, God knows we might be assaulted at this point by incoming sound. Uh, I do want to check on the quality of sound. Once I start talking on something like this, something might happen to interrupt transmission. So, so we've already had that happen now with the online broadcasting software saying we were interrupted. So I do want people to confirm whether or not they can hear me. I'm presuming that they can going to take a look around in the chat room where I'm so well, gratified. Well, well, Douglas, yeah. well, while they, uh, while you check that out, mm -hmm. I want to say a couple things. One is the most, you know, convincing evidence you presented uh, in, in the new book. Yeah. I believe you put it, we put it in the new book, uh, or, yeah. or it's just common sense is that, yeah, you did put it in the new book, um, is that they claimed that uh, when, when they did the, uh, expose on roswell uh and said it was balloons and they said they were the air force was using you know dummies back in 1947 when the air force didn't even exist right. so you know they're they're saying the air force was using test dummies and not even realizing that the air force did not exist <laughs> Yes. Uh, I suppose they could cover their tracks and say, well, we meant the Army Air Force. Uh, I suppose they could say that, but uh, they just sounded, you know, completely disingenuous and completely idiotic. I would think that if they're going to come out and as they have and say these are not aliens, well, number one, that says that if they say they know they're not aliens that indicates they do know what they are. And how can you say they're not aliens unless you know what they are? Yes. So yes. so now I doubt very seriously they're going to say that they're the Third Reich in exile. No. I doubt very seriously they're going to even go down that rabbit hole. Uh, they're going to say something and make up some other story that'll yes. sound equally ludicrous. And it's just a game of bait and switch yes uh because the people the, it's all about gobels and saying you know if you repeat the lie long enough uh people will believe it yeah this is what we're dealing with well yes of course in this case they're they're not even repeating a lie uh in the sense of uh, something that uh, is redundant and getting people to believe it by sheer repetition. Uh, they've actually been responsible for changing the story multiple times, which, uh, of course, the UFO cultists have taken advantage of to uh, basically uh, claim that, of course, that means it's aliens. Uh, so they have their own agenda. It's the UFO cultists that are repeating the lie. And uh, they are the ones that are indoctrinating people through repetition. And, of course, many of them are 
government. And so that's the government that is uh, coming in as the alternative uh, media that is uh, basically presenting you with the uh, with the bullshit, uh, whereas the other government is presenting you with another line of bullshit that makes you believe the bullshit that is uh, forwarded to you by the other idiots. So uh, it, it's one of these uh, uh, things that um, you you have to learn to use discernment, but nobody in America is trained in critical thinking. By the way, I want to thank uh, both uh, James and Reese for uh, bringing to my attention that Isaac Romero has said that we're sounding loud and clear. I did uh, notice uh, he said that, and uh, God bless you. Isaac Romero is the twin brother of Sammy Romero. Uh, both of these gentlemen have been following myself for years and, uh, and, and have alluded that I have had a great impact on their lives. Isaac Romero, again, recently gotten happily married. God bless him. Uh, uh, and thank God for his wife. Uh, and um, I, he said loud and clear, Doug, thank you so much. So um, with that, let's, uh, you know, start getting into um, the meat of this while our man uh, Peter Moon is with us. Then hopefully we'll have enough time for um, our man, Mr. Um, J- you know, Mr. Salman Sheikh, uh, to talk a bit about the Nyaga. And uh, from there, we'll uh, go forward to uh, talking a bit about other um, things that I, you know, feel obligated to bring up because of uh, today's historic importance with Alexander the Great's uh, death day. Our man Jameson will speak a bit about the weir hyena. These men will be buying me some time so I can pull my head out of my ass and uh, speak more uh, coherently about uh, various things going on in the world around us that are current events. But right now, let's go towards the most immediate current event. And uh, that, of course, would be uh, basically what uh, the UFO uh, report is actually exposing and uh, what they, by their own language, are truly uh, telling us. Now, one of the things I will recommend people do is, uh, again, if you have not done so, uh, really... Start a Facebook account for no other reason. No other reason. Just a false Facebook account. If you're afraid they're going to trace your information, uh, just put false info there. Use a false name. Use it for no other reason. You don't, you don't need to interact with anybody. Just use it to see my promotional banners because they're very important towards outlining what each show is about. They give you a pretty good idea what the show is about, what it's going to be thematically uh, addressing. Um, now, on my page, I often have linked to it uh, by George Knight and other people, many important things. What George Knight was saying was why the government fears the thousand year Reich in exile. I added a comment to in thread of his post where I said, I will deliver debriefing per the Pentagon release within hours, uh, my noble knight. And I notice that neither his name nor Peter Moon's when I entered them in this message would highlight to link uh, to their Facebook timelines the way it normally would. And uh, it, therefore, it couldn't provide them any notification that I had used their name or called them out, called attention to them so that they could see what I was saying. Uh, fortunately, George Knight was able to see what I had entered in thread of his, uh, his, po- his post. Uh, Peter Moon hasn't seen it yet, but uh, hopefully Peter Moon will take a look at it, uh, where I said, uh, my son intends to transcribe my verdict which he will do now as I speak, because he listens out for this. Even if he's not listening live right now, he'll be reviewing it later and he'll uh, transcribe it. I will take that uh, transcription and I will, um, you know, basically send it to relay it unto both George Knight and Peter Moon and uh, Jameson Reese and uh, Salman Sheikh, you know, et alaya, uh, other people within Team Dietrich. And for Peter Moon, hopefully he can uh, take that and distribute it uh, via V his newsletter. Uh, and uh, it's not going to be particularly long because I'm just in for George Knight. He can disseminate it either in his on its own or as integrated into his own works as quoted in part or in toto. Uh, so uh, just to get on with it. Uh, excuse me, Douglas. Yeah. Uh, Douglas, excuse yeah. me just a second. Sure. Um, I, I want to. I want to ask you about that. The, the landlord just came home. Okay. So 
I, I'm going to go out to dinner with her. Okay. It's, it's how, how I pay my rent in her apartment as I take her out to dinner. Wonderful. Uh, okay, bless you. I'm, I'm being amusing, of course. Uh, okay. We're having a wonderful time together. But uh, yeah. um, you, you, this is a, so I was just, uh, you know, greeting her at the door. Yeah. Um, we're, uh, you, this is uh, with reference to this, this, uh, what you're, what you're talking about with this UFO business, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to clarify. I won't really be able to pay much attention to it until I get home on, uh, you know, Saturday, Sunday. Okay. Uh, I'll be leaving Friday. I might be able to join you. Probably will be able to join you on Sunday. Wonderful. And uh, it's, you know, uh, wish I could stay on longer. It's nice to say hello to all you people. Yeah. And uh, I'm looking forward to, to getting the book, you know, yeah. When I get back, I don't know how soon it'll be. I asked for an update, so I'm looking forward to the release of your book, and uh, I'll, you know, hope to check in with you Sunday. I look forward to it. All our love, and share that with all okay. your own. Take care for now. Thanks. Bye bye. Good night, Peter. That was wonderful. So, since Peter is leaving us, let's uh, turn towards James and, and Solomon, and I can get into uh, the. Um, UFO bullshit <laughs> soon enough. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, the blue chickens and the fucking, uh, oh my gosh. Oh, yes, yes. The and, chickens uh, and the Pleiadians are here to, um, Pleiadians want to uh, clone you because you're from a special bloodline. Yes. Yes. So, um, so be patient, James. What's that going on in the background? I have no idea. It's probably in Jason, James, it's, excuse me, Salman's environment. He's managed to tune oh, okay. out that noise. Yeah. And, uh, or maybe it was Peter before he tuned out. Probably Peter before he hung up, um, you know, where he was at. Maybe he forgot to hang up. <laughs> He's taking us with him. If you can hear us, Peter, make certain you hang up. Uh, so uh, it, it, should, it should be good. It, it, it was my fan. I had to turn it around. Sorry about that. Okay. And and uh, so we're still hearing that. Um, but um, so long as you're talking, I'm sure we can hear you. You sound, uh, you know, we can hear you well enough. So go ahead and tell us a bit about uh, the, I believe it was a Sufi buried next to a Niaga. If you could relate that to us again, and um, then I might respond to it. And then, um, you know, uh, our man Jameson can uh, go on about the weir hyena after that. Uh, so, uh, yeah, just uh, say what you can before it's time for you to leave at midnight, which is coming up soon enough. Oh, definitely, Brother Douglas. And, uh, you know, I want to thank you for also addressing the issues of the indigenous people because it's also yourself that's sharing that truth with the people no one else is talking about it so i do want to give you a lot of love and respect for that as well also to bringing that truth to light about the history of the indigenous peoples and their persecution by the church so in in the aspect of uh and, and the, the state na- it's the important natives. to remember <laughs> the state as well as the church and the you know in all these cases uh, you know when it was solely the church and still the state was involved was when the Portuguese and the Spaniards were taking uh, the Latin American hemisphere. Uh, but in the upper hemisphere of uh, both Canada and uh, the United States, uh, obviously the church wasn't involved in what the United States was doing. Uh, but uh, to an extent, it was involved in what the Canadians were doing. But um, you get my point. You understand. Thank you. Yes, definitely. Yeah. And in terms of the uh, the Negas, uh, Brother Douglas, yeah. there a lot of the Sufis that are there, and this particular Sufi that I visited, his name is uh, Hazrat uh, Abdul Sattar Chishti from the Chishti uh, Sufi order. And they're prevalent to the India-Pakistan order, uh, like the area over there. He's known as the Elder Brother. And this Sufi was such an adept being that it's how you describe my brother that there are those dervishes that are whirling in the desert and they are so lost in their love for Allah, God and the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him that any non-human entity or any uh, being or species that might see or register humanity as a threat or a food source when they come across a Sufi who has basically has lost himself so much in his love for God and the Prophet they don't they don't see him as a threat they actually respect his being so with this serpent being he actually became friend of this uh of the sufi master and what had happened was over time he started uh just being with him sitting with him 
And the serpent had loved the Sufi master so much that when the master died, so did the serpent. And they buried the serpent in the same Sufi grave next to it in the same Sufi tradition with the green grave. And, and that's what had that's what had happened. That's what had happened exactly in the aspect that they had buried the serpent right next to the Sufi master because their love was so prevalent with each other. And it just goes to show you that if your average person was there, I'm sure uh, him and the serpent probably wouldn't have gotten along with the way the Sufi master did. So it's just the aspect that if you find a uh, whirling dervish in the, the desert and he comes across a, um, or let's say he encounters a being that he's not supposed to encounter, like a ghoul or a jinn or other entities, the ghoul or jinn or other entities won't see him as a threat because that being has basically detached himself from this world in his love for Allah and the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So that's the uh, the beautiful thing that I've seen of this Sufi master, that he was able to withstand um, so much extreme pain and pressure. He, what your average human couldn't do by mastering the self and the elements around you. And also with all of the other beings that have started to basically offer their love and friendship to him and not uh, basically threaten him or attack him. And it reminded me a lot, uh, my brother, of, these, of this aspect of a lot of these uh, places that I went to in the border region where I visited these Sufi masters. Your average human couldn't live in those areas. And you can only go there if the master wanted you to be there. Like if there, someone in there could basically vouch for you in a way that this person is not a, not a threat. He's a good person. Or he's of a good nature and he's not basically he's not here for any malevolent means and that's how you can sit with them and get their blessings and get their prayers upon you and uh just goes to show you the power of islam which even hp lovecraft had touched upon like you explained that with these sufi masters they become superhuman in in, in their way with their uh, doing 10,000 zikrs or chants a day remembering allah remembering the prophet that that's all that's their life everything else like the world where we worry about like race religion about what's going on they have completely detached themselves and they say that god is the only reality for them everything else is an illusion their goal is just to become one with their beloved on how rumi had described too how he was longing to be united with his beloved which was allah to become one with god so that's basically you know the aspect of the sufi where any Sufi master you might come across, they could um, go to any place where your normal human can't. And you might be surrounded by jinns or other entities, but they won't register as a threat to those beings like your average human would. So that's one thing that uh, I'm so glad I had the honor to see that, to witness, I guess, the love and bond and the friendship that the Sufi master had with the, with the snake. And uh, it, it's so interesting, Brother Douglas, how they had buried, made a vertical grave on the picture that I had tagged you in. And uh, it's basically shows you the, uh, I guess, the reality of how even if ourselves as human beings, if we come together in harmony and realize that Allah has created everything with a purpose, because if you did not have a purpose, you would not be created. And that's the reality that we see, that whether you're in uh, a human being or any other non-human being or any sentient seen or unseen forces of this earth or any subhuman species, basically you all have a purpose. You all have a purpose, and if we all find that harmony within ourselves and with each other, we can become like those Sufi masters where other beings do want to interact with you. They do want to offer you their love and friendship. And... Uh, the aspect that we see of becoming one with Allah, God, and becoming one with the teachings, where we're not registered as a threat, where we're going around destroying each other and all of the stuff that's happening, greed, lust, power, control. So hopefully, as time goes on, we can create a world where love, light, and prevalence is more, more of a factor. And in terms of the Sufi master and his... Uh, being friends with the serpent has also reminded me of the Buddha who during the rainstorm he was protected by the serpent king yeah. so it just goes to show you that I think if you're on that certain frequency my brother that 
there are beings that they will respect you and they will honor you and basically not threaten you in any way. And if we all have that power as humans, but I think we just have to tap into it with our hearts if people are willing to do that. But, you know, the reality is of the 85 percent, like I mentioned, it is those 15 percent that hopefully will recreate humanity in a better light when that time comes. And um, I'm just uh, I'm just grateful for you, Brother Douglas, and all the love, light and knowledge that you're sharing that if we all come together and heed these solutions, then humanity can basically follow the aspects of the Sufi master where the Sufi could be in the middle of a, a place where humans can't even walk with jinns and angels and all the all of these other beings that the human mind cannot comprehend. But the Sufi has become one with everything for his love for Allah and the Prophet, that he's neither seen as a threat, nor as an enemy, nor a food source to these beings, but he's seen as a being of light that's there to uh, basically profess his light and his love. And they, they show you their respect in that regard. So most people, when you tell them the story of the, of, the, of the Sufi Sheikh who was best friends with the serpent, and how the serpent will never leave his side, and they even gave, gave uh, the serpent a Sufi grave next to the Sheikh, that most people would find that hard to believe. But if you go to that India-Pakistan border region where I had the honor of going because they allowed me to go there, you see these things. And for me to be able to take a picture of the grave as well. So that was uh, an, an, an honor and a privilege that I'm also professing that same, I guess, mission and light of the Sufi masters to bring people together that no matter what you are, who you are, what misunderstanding that... I guess Western society has put in your mind about different races or religions or species that we're all one. We're all created with a purpose by Allah and we all have a right to exist. So let us love and respect each other, whether you're angel, jinn, human, vampire. It's all love, respect, balance and order, because if you do not have a purpose, if you didn't have a purpose, you wouldn't be here. So if we honor and respect that within ourselves and each other, then there might be a chance, my brother Douglas, that we could see that peace prevail in our lifetimes. But until then, I stand with you shoulder to shoulder, working towards that process. Bless you. Very beautiful, and very poetic. And uh, so uh, Maria Michaela Grigorich says that uh, what Salman is saying is exactly why Islam has been turned into a threat. So there we have that. I'm sure you have a response for that. Oh, yes, definitely, because of the, the reason why Islam has been in attack all over the world for the last 20 years, because if you look at the true, deep, esoteric teachings of Islam, it has the power to bring people together. If you look at the Rosicrucians, the founder of Rosicrucians, Christian Rosencruz, he was taught by the Sufi mystics of Islam, and he brought that system to the West in terms of its esoteric teachings. If you look at the, uh, the Masonic Brotherhood, which I'm a part of, a lot of its main core principles are from Sufism and Islam. So a lot of the stuff that you see in the West uh, in terms of the esoteric teachings Islam and Sufism are the Eastern parents of it, and it has the power to bring people together and basically to bridge that gap between races and religions. So you do have the agents of chaos and the enemy and the darkness that have targeted Brother Douglas and also have targeted Islam for the last 20 years in terms of the misinformation and, and uh, the, um, I guess, the ignorance that's been spreading around, which even recently in Canada, we had the unfortunate tragedy of a person who was um, under the guise of ignorance and he ran over and killed the whole family of Muslims, including the mother and the father and the children. And the one that survived, uh, thankfully, there there will be a, a cousin relative or somebody from the mother's side or father's side that could take him in. But that child is now traumatized for life as the only survivor of the family. So we just have to work towards eliminating that ignorance and work towards bridging those gaps. And uh, I thank Brother Douglas in that regard, too, because ever since I've been listening to him since 2014 and 2015, he has always defended Islam against the bigots and the racists, including the defense of the prophet, which many accuse him of the aspect of the of the bride, of the child bride. And uh, I just 
I, I, I owe a, a debt and gratitude to Brother Douglas Dietrich for what he has done to defend my faith and basically show humanity the way for those who are willing to hear him out and take heed to his solutions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bless you. And Maria Michaela Grigorich says, I'm reading the Quran and it's not what we're told at all. So there we have that. And uh, Thank you. And uh, so uh, in terms of uh, the wonderful people in the chat room, I want to uh, say hello to Chris Collins, who assures us there's been no break in audio. Uh, of course, he's a few minutes behind in catching up at uh, one and a quarter time speed. Uh, and uh, he, our friend Daniel Arola uh, reminds us that autism is not an illness. It's a spectrum of mental and emotional processing that does not conform to mainstream and conventional familiarity, basically. Very good, Daniel. Thank you very much for that. That's very astute. And Sarah Thomas, God bless her, says, Great hearing, everyone. Much love. Was listening to Douglas with Andrew with Andrew Bartzi's part once again. Fantastic show. Uh, there was an individual here named Husky Travel Boy. A shout out to him. Uh, he said quite a bit, a bit. He did say that, uh, oh, by the way, Brandon Young was also with us. And, uh, and a wonderful uh, human being. God bless him. And uh, he says uh, he was just looking at Angel Island and China Cove, a uh, wonderful human being. And uh, so uh, in, in terms of Husky Travel Boy, uh, he was mentioning, of course, that uh, he had to take a break because apparently he said some, uh, some troll reported him uh, to housing. So he has to clean up his apartment. <laughs> so that's why he had to leave the chat room. Uh, so we'll miss you. Uh, but uh, he was sharing quite a bit about his travels to Germany, etc. So we thank him for coming in with us. Uh, and uh, so aside from all of that, uh, we still have some time uh, before midnight. And uh, honestly, this is one of those things that the more I think about it, uh, it this will take me some time to go into um, these details. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm really going to have to psych myself up for it to tell you the truth <laughs> and just kind of. But our man uh, Salman has been so good about this uh, when he reviews this probably tomorrow then uh, he'll, um, you know, hear, he, we'll look forward to his response to what he hears. And uh, in the interim, uh, what uh, I'd like to do while he's with us is just kind of, uh, you know, um, thank him for his patience and uh, his ability to relate uh, all of these uh, wonderful um, uh, facts uh, from uh, the world that he has managed managed to see with his own eyes. Um, understand that what he says is uh, very much uh, about the, um, the shall we say, um, well, I might as well get into it, or certain aspects of it. Um, understand um, this much, that um, my mother, of course, for those of you who are unfamiliar with her background, understand that she is the product of uh, a very ancient line of uh, the vampire, and um, these are in China, where they've managed to um, socialize only to an extent in a very isolated sense uh, through a kind of monastic uh, lifestyle. So when uh, the Magi are referenced, as I've brought up many times in the past, uh, about the revelation of the Magi, which is something that should have been Part of your Bible, but like so many uh, aspects, so many apocrypha, was not entered into the Bible. And this was all due to uh, political reasons. Uh, the uh, Bible was uh, a very um, political topic. It was the subject to political decisions. And uh, these uh, political decisions uh, often went in a direction that uh, is not even uh, accessible to the kind of logic that we use today. Uh, it uh, was, of course, always the logic of control and manipulation as people were transitioning from uh, Christianity to churchianity or the kind of uh, 
uh, dominance of the church, which, of course, as it uh, grew ever more powerful uh, through the next several thousand years after the original uh, uh, conventions of Nicaea and uh, various other areas where the Bible was assembled, agreed upon in terms of what could be included, what was not to be included, uh, the church, as it became ever more dominant, uh, was synonymous with the decline of magic, uh, because the church uh, basically subsumed uh, via its ritual uh, the functions of magic that were uh, before handled by uh, people, the practitioners, that were witches. And uh, this led, of course, uh, one of the factors was the prosecution of uh, the, the practitioners of the craft. Uh, and um, what we saw was a massive gynocide, the uh, annihilation of uh, many of the females uh, throughout Europe. Now, again, what I'm really doing is just psyching myself up to approach a topic that is difficult for me because it um, will have to take us back to the ghoul ultimately on this day of uh, uh, that we're entering already on the eastern seaboard um, Alexander's death day so I must speak about him and then I will uh, integrate all of these aspects that uh, will take us in what will be a hundred different directions well at least uh, half a dozen that I have to just draw together as efficiently as I can. So I have to kind of um, get my mind organized uh, and, uh, and through the legacy imbued upon myself, through my mother teaching me the traditions of what had happened uh, with these various sentient species and uh, what I knew of from the Department of Defense records that verified, confirmed, validated everything she had said. Uh, this is why, of course, Michael Aquino was so fascinated with my mother and uh, ultimately why she suffered what she did and ultimately died therefrom. A lot of this would take uh, hours to go into in that regard. I won't go into that tonight. Again, uh, just too painful to relive. So while I work myself towards that, kind of get myself together, let me get some calories in myself, so I'll last throughout the night. And I'll bring on Jameson Reese to talk about the weir hyena in Africa, which we'll also cover to extent tonight in terms of what I had brought up uh, before. And uh, yeah, I was so glad to be able to uh, validate uh, what uh, Salman Sheikh himself had learned on his travels. And if any of you have been listening for years, I really want to thank Justin White. Justin White was one of those people who responded uh, to the comment that I entered onto the post uh, that was published by George Knight. And uh, Justin White traveled to South Asia where he physically encountered the Cho and then encountered them uh, in a very physical sense, uh, no less physical, but in what, what people would, would consider a more supernatural assault sense later on uh, in Cambodia as well. And uh, this is something that impacted him to the point where he knew what I was saying about the Chochoa was true. Salman Sheikh's own travels around the world confirmed to him that what I've said is true. Uh, and uh, so most people who have never traveled and uh, just uh, attain all the knowledge they have out of the internet, you're the most ignorant people of all. And uh, these are the people who are the most skeptical of anything I have to say. And that's because they're fools and uh, they're, they're ignorant. And uh, if anyone has any sense of wisdom, you would have a true sense of humility and you would be able to learn from what I say. So um, if you listen tonight, you will likely learn something and uh, something important, something meaningful. Uh, not something in the negative, but rather something that uh, will be uh, along the lines of uh, everything else we've been sharing with you as of late, something that will give you uh, a greater and more meaningful uh, comprehension of the universe 
that the creation that you are gifted to live in and um, your own part in that creation, which is what everybody's seeking when they go on the Internet, really. And they're seeking all this conspiratorial crap that they're digging through. They're really looking for meaning. Mm. Because most people, their lives have none. So um, let me refresh myself. I'm going to go mute. I'm going to turn the stage over to Salman and Jameson. Jameson will start talking about the weir hyena. Uh, I will beseech Salman to stay with us until midnight, and he can respond to Jameson about that. Um, when I return, I'll listen, and I'll let people know I'm back, of course. But I'll be mostly listening for at least a little while till midnight when uh, around that time we say goodnight to dear Salman. And uh, yeah, aside from that... Uh, uh, just preparing myself for when I start going into monologue and taking it from there. So, um, Jameson, if you're with us, uh, do yes, take the stage. Yes. Thank you. All right. So, um, the Weir Hyena um, was was something that had uh, gotten its... Uh, we can find its mythology in uh, Ethiopia. Um, Honestly, uh, what it actually comes from is a sort of, I guess you would say, black on black racism. Oddly enough, because uh, they would say um, they would say that the blacksmiths were mostly uh, Ethiopian Jews would turn into were hyenas, and the reason why they would say this would be to sort of be, be would be because the Christian population has a sort of hatred towards the Jewish population. Um, however, the hyena is uh, often in Africa, sadly, demonized because of the fact that it eats it, it, it eats humans. It eats the human dead, primarily. Uh, what we do have to remember is that without um, without animals that eat carrion, like the spotted hyena, we would we would be rife with disease and pestilence and all types of other horrible things so um the hyena does uh serve as a sort of uh representation of the other to the african um i myself have more respect for the hyena uh due to the fact that it's a uh, matriarchal um mat uh, matriarchal um creature and uh, i wonder if that also does is also a reason why there's negative views of the hyena. Um, they are mostly nocturnal beings, and they will, of course, you know, eat. Um, they'll eat bone. I mean, they'll literally eat uh, eat through anything. And it's for that reason that you know they have a sort of uh, a bad rap. But uh, there is actually a terminology in another because 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 there are different tribes, you know, um, different regions in which the hyena finds itself, not just the uh, North African area around Mali, you know, around that area. There's a terminology that is set is, is that is called like a uh, boltungan, which uh, means and then I transform into a spotted hyena. Um, the were hyena is also associated with magic, and uh, it's also associated with, you know, the evil eye and sorcerers and things like that. This is quite interesting. Um, uh, for someone who's a practitioner, this is actually a, this is actually a, it's actually an interesting beast, and it's actually um, is also brought up in. Uh, Oh my gosh! What the guys? Uh, Kenneth Grant's uh, *Night Side of Eden*, when he speaks about the uh, arch demons of the tunnels of Set, and uh, there is one particular being in particular, I think, that does aid one, uh, or that is associated with the hyena. Uh, I believe the name of that being is Zamradiel. Um, of course, you know, not to not to go into the uh, not to take it into the occult tangent, but the uh, truth of the matter is there seems to be a sort of um, it seems to be a sort of uh, clash uh, within at least Ethiopia uh, where um, they they just don't 
they don't seem to like the Ethiopian Jews for some reason. And I, I again, it, it's fairly sad. It's very sad that it happens to uh, go that it happens to. Um, it's very sad that it happens to be the case. Um, this is one of the reasons why Africa is in the state that it's in, because uh, a lot of people they go to war with stupid shit. I'm I'm, I'm just going to be blunt about it. You know, it it doesn't seem stupid. It seems stupid to me. To them, it doesn't seem stupid because their belief systems are. But I mean, the th- at the end of the day, is it's not really worth going to war because we have different belief systems. You know, uh, it, it's just uh, it, it, I find it absurd. And uh, honestly, uh, I, I I think again, you know, this is why I I see the I I choose the hyena as my totem animal, and I and I pay reverence to the hyena because the because uh, I I associate the sun with being a sort of goddess, and so. The, there's a sort of solar aspect that we see in the hyena, and a sort of uh, matri- and a sort of goddess-like attribute. Well, that that was great, brother Jameson. I, I really enjoyed that. And, and you're right; everything has create, been created with a purpose, and that's probably the reason why the hyena has always been a uh, demonized animal. Where even in the cartoon movies. It's all often portrayed as an evil figure or a malevolent figure. So the aspect of the hyena, I guess you have in patriarchal society where anything that's kind of a female pack oriented might be demonized in some ways. But it does serve its, serve its purpose. And anything that God has created, it has a purpose, whether it's good or it's bad or it's in the middle. So that's the aspect that I'm glad that you clarified with your explanations and it's 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 right. I mean, I, I agree with you completely. In, in Africa, people go to war with each other, while they could be coming together and helping the poor of each other's nations. But instead, it's the same people who are basically destroying each other. India and Pakistan is the same example. In Pakistan, they're listening to Bollywood uh, songs and watching the movies. Same food, same language to many extents, where they could be coming together to help the poor people of their countries. But instead, they're divided by their religious systems, their caste systems. It just goes to show you um, the aspect of humanity, of how divided the whole system is, and how you really have to get the education. Because only education and awareness could really turn things around at a larger scale. And uh, that's, I, I respect the aspect of uh, the hyena that it, it knows its purpose and it knows what it stands for, it, and its assertiveness to make sure that it's doing what it's doing to maintain the balance of nature in its as- in its relation to the animal kingdom and its uh, interaction with humanity to a certain extent. And there are tribes who appreciate the hyena, and there are people who sometimes will feed the hyena scraps, and they'll see the hyenas as good because they eat much of the garbage that people uh, throw away. And uh, so th- there are areas, there are places where they're appreciated and there are places where they're not um the thing what what's very important about the hyena is that it's an indicator species because it is a it is it is much higher on the uh, food chain than we are it's 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 what you call one of the most it's it's one of the most effective hunters in africa yeah yeah the only the only uh, animal that surpasses it would be the uh, African. Uh, what is it? Oh my gosh! It, it I, I think it's called the uh, the black-footed cat, which actually kills ninety percent of its uh, which ninety percent of what it eats. Um, the uh, hyena follows with. <clears throat> I think like 75% and lions actually steal much of what they eat from the hyenas because they're larger and they can um, seem to, um, because they because they weigh so much, they're able to like uh, drive the hyenas away. Of course, if you have enough hyenas, they will eventually 
kill a lion too. So I mean, they're they're like uh, very very strong uh, rivalries there. But hyenas are also extremely intelligent. Um, they've been known to even be more intelligent than some of our primate cousins. Right. That's that's absolutely fascinating, and uh, thank you for sharing that. And it just goes to show you, I think it, there was a, um, a program that I had seen one time, Brother Jamo, where you had hyenas living with a tribe. So the tribe had raised, I think, these hyenas, and they were basically uh, coexisting peacefully. And I think it was, um, I think it was one of the uh, the TV shows uh, a few years ago. I had watched it on TV. I can't re- recall which exactly what it was, but it was so fascinating to see these tribes in Africa, especially the warrior tribes. And they had a lot of these domesticated cats or a lot of these hyenas, and they were all living and just walking around with their uh, their human friends and uh, the human families and tribes they were with. And it just goes to show you that if one goes to that spiritual level and that aspect of the warrior and the, uh, I guess, the, uh, the aspect of the spirituality within you and around you, then you can coexist with hyenas and the other beings that are around you. The reason why we see everything and everyone as a threat, because including ourselves, even within the human family, due to race and religion, is because we haven't reached that level where a lot of those people have in terms of their connectedness with the, uh, the spirit world. Yes, that, and that is very true. And it's something that we need to learn how to get back to. Because we're at the precipice where if we don't change something for the better, we are essentially done. Okay, so I've... Uh... It returned uh, momentarily because I wanted to be back before our man Salman Sheikh had to say goodnight and retreat into sleep for the evening so he could get up in the morning to uh, share his uh, baked goods with the birds. Uh, tell us a little <laughs> bit about that uh, baking, Salman. Uh, what is it that you bake? I mean, you do this as soon as you get up before you uh, turn that over to the birds. And, you know, once uh, you explain that and go off into the gentle night. Yeah, so... Yeah, definitely. So, uh, so what I, what I do is um, I, I bake it for the birds, and um, I just have it ready for the night before. Or sometimes I wake up early and I have the I have the bag ready for them. So it's just my uh, my love for a lot of the species of the earth and me trying to serve them. And uh, I just uh, glad that Allah gives me that opportunity, my brother, to do that to serve all beings of this world, and to basically show the love and light and example to others that we're here in this short human life to basically uplift one another and love and respect one another and that's pretty much it we're here today we're not here tomorrow everything else degrees titles monies it's it's, it all just fades away but what what doesn't fade away is what good did you do for yourself and others and that includes serving both humanity and non-humanity alike in the same manner from what I learned from the Sufi masters. And if we can all do that, then there's a chance that we can restore some harmony and love and uh, balance to this realm, my brother. And, uh, you know, with that said, I bid you all farewell for the night and give my greeting of assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you, my brother Douglas, J-Mo, Team Dietrich, Amanda, uh, Maria and all our brothers and sisters, Peter, my love, light, greetings, and peace be upon all of you. And much love to you, Brother Douglas. And I look forward to catching up on your monologue tomorrow morning. Bless you. And uh, thank you so much uh, for what you do and what you manifest. Uh, blessings be upon you. And uh, blessed be thy night. Uh, sweet be thy dreams. And uh, peaceful be thy slumber. Take care. Good night, my brother. Much love to you and J-Mo. Yes. Oh, and our lady Maria Michaela Grigorich will also be going to uh, bed. Uh, she's still sleep deprived. Uh, God bless her. And God bless you all. Thank you both. And uh, hugs. And to Maria Michaela Grigorich, love you dearly, honey. And uh, so, uh, so there we have that. And uh, so we're just waiting on JMO to return. He will take over a little bit again after that. And I will uh, then uh, uh, try and transition into monologue to the best of my ability. As a matter of fact, I'll have to because 
at that point, I'll be functioning fairly uh, on my own. Uh, and uh, it's, it's daunting when I think of a subject or this large, it's really a task. And it is uh, just one of these things that, uh, oh gosh, hopefully that's a, uh, let me see, an incoming message. Thank you. Uh, love you. Love you dearly, honey. And that was my fingernail scratching against the microphone. Uh, and uh, with that, uh, let's uh, give her a little, uh, how would I say this? Uh, just a, uh, there we are. This would be perfect. And uh, okay, sending her just some reassurances. And uh, with that, um, turn towards the people in the chat room just to provide myself some uh, a uh, way of burning bandwidth until you know I get back into the uh, the state of mind where I can uh, monologue. Um, Chris Collins, of course, was still with us last. Uh, he's welcome to add some nuggets of wisdom. Uh, and uh, uh, Husky Travel Boy was going uh, rest in peace, Dwight David Eisenhower, and he was talking about his. Uh, oh, he was declared dead three times apparently. And uh, he said that was due to his father throwing him into a tub of boiling water. He lost 80% of his blood. Holy fucking shit. Uh, his nurse mother told them to put him on ice and it saved his life. He was in Walter Reed Hospital for eight months. Holy fucking shit. Uh, oh, oh, oh my God. What? Oh, well, he's sharing some stuff with us that I'm not going to read out loud. <laughs> Holy shit. Uh, you'll see it uh, when you review the chat room yourself when this uh, is uploaded. And uh, that'll be available in the chat room. My thanks to all the people providing up votes. God bless you all. Wonderful people. And uh, yeah, so, um, oh, there we are. Thank God Jameson is back. So let me provide him the usual uh, instead of a thumbs up, I'll give him a heart this time. Of course, it's a rainbow heart because we are in Pride Month. And uh, I'll ask him to take the stage again. And uh, rest assured, Jameson, uh, I didn't even really get a chance to refresh myself. Honestly, I was cruising the internet for stuff to analyze if I am able to finish uh, tonight's um, histrionics, so to speak. Uh, by the way, for people who look that term up, that has many meanings. <laughs> but uh, it, it will be essentially historically uh, rooted um, uh, th subjects that I will be addressing to the best of my ability. And uh, it's it's just uh, it's just overwhelming. There's a lot of them. I'll have to try and cover tonight. And uh, they're intense subjects. And uh, they bring a lot out of me. So let's have uh, Jameson take the stage for a while. And he can go back into uh, speaking about his uh, hyenas. Are very... he, had a... he was part of a fundraiser for them for a while. And uh, he was doing his best yes. to educate people to understand them. You can tell us a bit about that. I'll be back. I'm, I'm going to go mute. And uh, now I'll All go right. refresh myself. And it's yours. Thank you. Yeah, that well, that fundraiser I think was years ago. Uh, I don't know if it's still uh, extant. Um, uh, since I covered the hyenas, what I will, uh, what I can do is go into um, what we can expect astrologically. Uh, right now, we have the sun and the moon in Gemini, which deals with you know travel, education, things like that. We have Mercury going retrograde in Gemini. That's communication and thinking. So i guessing that's not going to be a very good thing. I, I, I would guess that there's going to be a lot of slipped communications um, when it comes to uh, things that evolve, revolve around childhood, the environment, uh, the educational environment, I, I would say, uh, transportation, things like that. Um, we have Venus in Cancer, and we also have Mars in Cancer. Um, now, Venus deals with harmony and affection. Mars deals with confidence and energy. And Cancer, of course, deals with ancestry, roots, uh, one's external environment, uh, caretaking, and cyclical matters. So that would mean that uh, we will probably see some uh, good environmental things going on. And on that note, um, the Keystone Pipeline was officially canceled after uh, Biden revoked that permit, according to Reuters. So that's something I could uh, go into after this. Um, 
And so that does mean that we are seeing some good environmental things going on. Um, Mars, of course, is uh, confidence in energy. So we're going to be putting a lot of energy into the environment, which is a good thing. Uh, Jupiter deals with prosperity and fortune, and that's in Pisces, which deals with uh, uh, mysticism, seclusion, elusive uh, thinking, things that aren't so apparent to self but may be seen by others, uh, self-reflection, uh, sacrifice, uh, things like that. I mean, no, not self-reflection, sacrifice, but um, it deals mostly with, like, uh, imprisonment. So I, I'm thinking that um, my thinking on this is that we might not be really prosperous uh, where Jupiter is right now. I might be misreading uh, that, but we'll see. Uh, Saturn, of course, is in is retrograde in Aquarius. Saturn deals with limitations and practicality, and uh, Aquarius deals with uh, friendship uh, groups, associations. So I'm guessing this means that we are going to see. Um, hmm. I guess I, I'm guessing uh, we're going. It's it's going to be practical. I, I don't know how to read that honestly. I really don't know how to read that if it's going retrograde. Um, I'm guessing this is lifting limitations from friendships. And I do not know if I'm seeing that right. Um, now we have uh, Uranus in Taurus. Uh, again, folks, astrology is new to me. I am not what you would call a resident astro ast astrologer. Blah. Um Uranus deals with individuality, inventiveness, and uh, Taurus deals with material things, substance of substance, self-worth. So I'm guessing uh, we're going to see interesting things as far as innovations are concerned, uh, new um, inventions, new discoveries and whatnot, as far as uh, things like science, uh, you know, practical things. Uh, Neptune is in Pisces. Uh, Neptune deals with sort of sort of like uh, idealisms uh, uh, that being in Pisces Pisces deals with prisons mysticism the unconscious the unknown and enemies so uh, that doesn't strike me as a positive uh, Pluto's in retrograde in Capricorn Pluto is a transformer it deals with power um, and Capricorn deals with ambitions, career, governments, and authority. So Pluto being in retrograde in that respect can be seen as a negative. That means we're, uh, there's probably going to be some blockages in the government, or we're probably going to see issues with governments, with governments around the world, uh, including our own government. We, where we're seeing you know, Republicans trying to block uh, Biden at every turn. Um, now, Chiron is in uh, Aries, uh, and uh, Chiron deals with one's deepest uh, wounds, and um, Aries deals with one's outlook on the world. So I, I suppose uh, one's deepest wounds will be centered around how one sees the world, uh, if that makes any sense. I'm, again, trying to make sense of that myself. Uh, Maki Maki is in Libra, and so is uh, Maki Maki deals with one's connection to the environment, and uh, Haumea uh, deals with fertility and renewal, and those are both in uh, Libra, and that deals with uh, close relations such as family, lovers, etc., etc. Uh, so that's probably a good thing for the most part. Um, now, uh, as for this pipeline, uh, a $9 billion oil pipeline that became the symbol of the rising political clout of climate change advocates and a flashpoint in U.S.-Canada relations was officially canceled on Wednesday. This is the Keystone XL, which was proposed in 2008 to bring oil from Canada's western tar sands to U.S. refineries. 
Uh, this was halted by the owner TC Energy Corporation after U.S. President Joe Biden this year revoked a permit needed for a U.S. stretch of the pipeline. Um, this is a good thing because is this would probably have definitely trampled on American Indian land, which they always do that. They always do that for some reason, and it's very angering. North American oil pipelines, including Dakota Access and Inbridge Line 3, have faced steady opposition, opposition from environmental groups, which are concerned about spills, and rightfully so, because uh, um, the very colonial pipeline still has a spill in, I believe it's uh, South Carolina, if I'm not mistaken, uh, one of those. But they, they still have a spill that's that's pretty much uh, like leaking over like a mile of oil. If that's just hard, and and it hasn't been, uh, it obviously hasn't been contained yet. Uh, this is a landmark moment in the fight against the climate crisis, said Jared uh, Margalis, a senior attorney at the Center of Biological Diversity. We're hopeful that the Biden administration will continue to shift this country in the right direction by opposing fossil fuel projects. We are far past the point of fossil fuels, folks. We, we should be way beyond this, well, well, well beyond this. The Keystone uh, XL pipeline was expected to carry 830,000 barrels per day of uh, Alberta oil sands crude to Nebraska. But the project was delayed for the past 12 years due to opposition from U.S. lawmakers, Native American tribes, and environmentalists. Yep, just what I suspected. Uh, TC Energy said it would continue to coordinate with regulators, stakeholders, and indigenous groups to meet its environmental and regulatory commitment and ensure a safe termination of exit from the project. We remain disappointed and frustrated with circumstances surrounding the Keystone XL project, including the cancellation of the presidential permit for the pipeline's border crossing, Alberta Premier Jason Kenney said in a statement. The company swung to a loss in the first quarter, hit by $2.2 billion impairment charges to the suspension of the Keystone XL project. Wow, that's a lot of money. And uh, speaking of money, U.S. crude stocks are down. Uh, fuel inventories rise. Uh, U.S. crude oil stockpiles that include strategic petroleum reserve fell for the 11th straight week as refiners ramped up the output. But fuel inventories grew sharply due to weak customer demand. The energy information administration said on Wednesday and this is good because we don't need that shit anymore honestly we've got more than enough uh, we've got more than enough plastic to make more than enough plastic and we have more than enough uh, we have more than enough clean energy resources and other alternatives that we really don't need this stuff anymore. We don't need to be pulling the stuff out of the earth anymore. And uh, the very fact that we continually pull it out of the earth uh, also contributes to things like earthquakes and whatnot, because that stuff serves as lubrication between the plates of uh, whatnot. Uh, crude inventories that exclude the SPR fell by 5.2 million barrels in a week to June 4th to set 474 million barrels the third consecutive week weekly drop as refiners have boosted output as the economy recovers after the covid 19 pandemic and anticipation of more summer driving however fuel stock fuel stocks were up sharply as demand was weak in the most recent week with uh product shipping falling to seven by the way so uh just curious uh just coming back and uh Stabilizing a bit more, heading toward more towards, uh, you know, speaking about the uh, uh, the things going on in the world and historically and all that. But, uh, you know, uh, in terms of uh, the stories that you're reading, uh, certainly you can take it upon yourself to uh, 
you, you know, come up with your own observations without necessarily reading verbatim, right? Just a just a kind of experiment. Try try that a little, <laughs> a little uh, bit. Uh, uh. You, you know, because that that way the the voice becomes much more engaging, much more warm, much more, uh, you know, less monotone uh, yeah, and, that's, and robotic. That's that's yeah, that's a very difficult. Oh, uh, it's not. No, it's not. You'd, you'd be surprised at how easy it is. You I mean honestly, if you just kind of scan and uh, look around and uh, pick up pieces to emphasize i'm sure that uh, you'll you'll get the hang of it when you can do since you know the points of the news stories already is that you can tell what you think of the various points to be made uh and and i think that that's uh you know uh, you can, okay yeah yes just a thought just some experimentation here uh and uh it just uh uh you're you're otherwise i certainly appreciate what you're doing uh make no mistake about it honestly we couldn't do this without jameson and uh and i'm um, uh you know we were very fortunate to have derek with us for a long period of time i don't know if you caught the part where he said he uh Oh, uh, just, uh, you know, was eating with his son and daughter and dropped off because he was doing that. I find it interesting. He didn't notify anybody when he dropped off. I think he he probably, you know, how would I say it? He's he's, uh, you know, just uh, he, he says he was up since 4 a.m. in the morning. Obviously, he did have his dialysis in the morning and that left him apparently energized enough where he was up throughout the uh throughout the day uh but uh so um there you have that just a little insight into uh what he's dealing with and um oh yes certainly i need well, to here's, well yeah. here's an alarming story um uh this is this is a uh, san antonio base lockdown for hour after gunfire reported of course they didn't find a source of the gunfire <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh they were pretty much uh, saying real world lockdown 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 yeah um it's a military base why wouldn't there be gunfire uh, yeah just, it's full of, full of crazy stuff. i mean yeah. go on i i mean seriously um they do have a firing range i think at san antonio if i remember correctly um well uh, i've i've bleached much of that from my memory anyway because it was just a uh, really uh surreal experience to say the least uh and 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 that i didn't realize that there were that many stupid people in the world <laughs> That, 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 <laughs> Until you that got into the military, yeah. Yes, yeah, yes. No. That that opened my mind to you know how how low some people's intelligent uh, intelligence was, and I'm not talking like IQ intelligence. I'm talking like common freaking sense intelligence. Thank you. Like um, like it, 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 it's it, it's like you know. As a baby, you know, we, we had those little toys with, with, where you have like the circle, you have you, you have to place the, like little different shapes in, in the corresponding, you know, opening. And, 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 and some of these people were so dumb that I would swear you would see them trying to you stick a square like shape into a star star opening like, why is it working? Why isn't it working? <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's that level of... Um, that level of stupid it's 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 not even funny anymore it's 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 sad well actually it's very funny who am i kidding <laughs> there, there is some there is some amusement that can be taken from that uh, uh and uh, aside from that uh other uh, things you can uh, relate uh one of the um you might tell people a little bit about the it, whoa, how did you, did you, you didn't feel like you had to go to the hospital after you were on transmission with me, the latest transmission, which was only the day before yesterday, essentially, <laughs> you, you didn't ultimately go to the hospital, did you? And um, how was it you kind I of felt, balanced out? I felt, Tell us about that. I felt like I should have gone, but I didn't. Uh, I just drank a lot of water. I, I, I kept drinking a lot of water. Um and uh eventually i uh was able to lower the muscle enzymes on my own mm -hmm. and um i felt a lot better and a lot more normal and i realize now um not to do that again mm -hmm. and i haven't made that mistake since which is a good thing yes yes 
Thank you. And I uh, definitely appreciate your decision in that regard. Uh, now, this might be painful, but uh, I can't resist asking. So what was it that uh, inflamed you uh, to the point where you were considering, you know, disabling your timeline on Facebook and thereby disabling our ability to conveniently communicate and coordinate? It wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't what inflamed me. It was a really deep depression. It, it was a sort of self-reflective realization that I feel... Um, I was looking at the things I was posting and I was realizing like, holy God, do you have anything fucking positive to say? What's the point of letting this aspect of myself just go ape shit? You know, and I started to realize, you know, I, I mean, th there's a lot of other things that were of a sort of psychiatric, a psychological nature, mm -hmm. which I spoke to with my uh, psych uh, psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. You know, such as a realization that I've never really, and this probably has to do with getting my ass whooped too often on the computer games, but I've never really been good. <laughs> but it, it, it was it was a god awfully painful realization that I've never really been good at anything. And uh, to the sort of realization that I've never really been truly good or mastered anything in my life is is something that really made me question what the fuck am I spending all this time on Facebook for? Maybe I should go do something. Maybe I should be doing something. I, I should be finding a way to live life that doesn't involve being stuck behind a freaking computer. Mm -hmm. yeah, and, mm -hmm. and so with that, I also felt a desire to close up. I felt a desire to like not share as much about myself anymore. Mm -hmm. And... and, and um, and I don't know if that's a good idea or if it's a bad idea. Because I look back on a lot of the creations that I made as far as music that I created and I just didn't like it. I looked at a lot of things that I was that I was talking about this on YouTube what, yeah, and what, what, I what were you just discussing? didn't like it. Right. What were you discussing with uh Salman Sheikh earlier in the when I told everybody to kind of hold the round table while I was gone? And uh, <laughs> and I came back and Derek had dropped out the way Mandy had dropped out the other day when I started talking. And so uh, I was just curious, what were you talking about with Salman at that time? Did you open the show with? I don't remember, but it was a very it was a very organic discussion. I'm surprised Derek didn't jump in. Uh, holy crap! I don't remember. I honestly don't remember. Uh, uh, okay. There we well, have that. Yeah, these these moments happen. Uh, mm -hmm. These these are going to happen with someone who has you know has done the equivalent of uh, Timothy Leary to himself <laughs> with associatives. <laughs> so uh, aside uh, from that, let's uh, take a look at uh, the chat room again uh, one more time and uh, and, and see how uh, people are doing. See if there's someone else who's joined us after Maria G said goodnight, everyone. I don't think so. So um, give me a second here, and I've got to um, psych myself up. I'll probably have a lot more time to work with than I did the other night. Uh, it's not necessarily a good thing when I'm, uh, you know, kind of in this uh, the state of mind I'm in right now. Uh, let me check in uh, for a second here. Uh, in the in time, while I'm doing this, uh, you can um, go back to um, just reading a news story. Uh, if you're comfortable with that, just go ahead and hit back where you were. Okay? Uh, you. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, I, I just want to find something that's a little more interesting than the usual, you know. Well, I noticed, I, mean, that, I noticed that you pursue a lot of environmental stories, which is fine. I mean, yeah. Yeah, uh, those things do catch my interest. I don't, I, I don't know how much other people are, you know, interested in those things. But. Well, we should all be interested in uh, environmental affairs since we're all going to be impacted by them. Oh, yeah. Speaking of that, I, we had like a, a freaking uh, thunderstorm the other day on Wednesday. Oh, wait. Today's. Yeah. Yeah. Wait. Uh, not Wednesday, Tuesday, Tuesday, hmm. yeah, Tuesday, Tuesday. Uh, so Tuesday, I was leaving like the the center where I usually go to um, speak to my uh, therapist, and um, we had this freak downpour. Like the sky looked like it was just so 
the sky looked like it turned black and it was in the middle of the day. I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> and when it started to rain, all right, so I have water resistant shoes, of course. Uh, resistant doesn't mean waterproof, mind you. You know, even if they were waterproof, they would have still gotten soaked. I never saw a downpour like that on Staten Island before. I think I shared uh, the video on my ti- on my uh, Facebook timeline, where you can see like you could see like the water. Um, you could literally see it looks like a waterfall. Um, yeah, it, it was just like it was ridiculous. It wasn't as bad as now Hurricane Sandy, perhaps, but. Um, the last time I saw something this intense uh, was probably in 2015, mm-hmm. because uh, I'm, I go out so often that I can remember. Uh, I, I can literally remember details like you know freakishly huge rainstorms that I get caught in to the point where like my shoes are full of water. I shit you not. Um, I literally I was running to now I was running just half a block to get a car that was called car service that was called for me to go home Mm -hmm. within that period of time you don't usually do that do you i mean that's no 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 usually i don't do that so that shows you how 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 intense that storm was right and um by the time i entered that car by the time i entered the van that that came to pick me up and drive me to you know take me to my abode uh my shoes were full of water mm-hmm. like if mm-hmm. I had turned mm-hmm. them upside down it would have oh. been like a whole they would have been full of water were my mm-hmm. feet not in them that's I mean I shit you not in just that small span of time I'm talking this the uh, minutes mm-hmm. not even a minute like 30 seconds mm-hmm. okay. so uh, so that's so, pretty frightening yeah that's that's oh, very alarming yeah. I mean uh, it's very alarming. So, um, we are um, everything that the scientists said. Mm-hmm. We're going to see, which everyone was ignoring when mm-hmm. they had those science channel things. When I used to actually watch TV, that is. <laughs> I, I don't watch TV anymore. I, I but I did uh, recently get Netflix again because I want to see the fourth season of Castlevania. So, where do you watch that? Do you watch that on your computer? Yeah, yeah, I watch it on my computer, and and I'm quite enjoying it. I I love that series. Uh huh. Okay. And and, and, and and Castlevania. This is a is this live action or animated? No, it's animated. It's animated. It's 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 animated in like an anime like style. Uh huh. Okay. And um. Yeah. It's I, like uh. All right. Now I've, I've I've heard of it. So, uh, it's uh, it's definitely something I haven't checked into myself, but uh. You know, you can go a little bit into what it's about. Oh yeah, it's 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 about this guy who's uh, from this Belmont family, and he's uh, he's he, he just his family they hunt monsters and vampires, mm-hmm. and of course uh, Dracula, who's the uh, well they they name him Vlad in the series. Mm-hmm. They name him <laughs> so they name him Vlad uh, Dracula or something. Um, he he. He's basically trying to hunt that guy down, and uh, his so he and his son, you know, he and Dracula's son, which I guess is like a a a a damn fear. He's 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 like you, basically. Yes. Um, Well, that's all based on actual, uh, shall we say, the folkloric uh, wisdom, the understanding of oral history is that the damn fire make the best vampire hunters for obvious reasons and 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 the first first time i've ever heard of that terminology was watching uh vampire hunter d right which 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 was named after myself it was vampire hunter yeah i mean i mean how much obvious how much more obvious can you get thank you yeah but but uh you know it's it's i mean it's it's mind-boggling how how much the japanese know and how much they have as far as not only you know what other humanoid life forms live amongst side of, um, amongst us but also as far as you know occult how much of the occult literature that you know even mm-hmm. even things that you know we wouldn't be f- even things that you would have to be initiated to know about you know you would see in like the anime or the game or video games you know mm-hmm. And so, so it's baffling how anyone can, you know, think that, you know, 
uh, the most powerful magicians are in the United States of America. No, I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, it's not. I'm not going to say that. What I'm, I'm, I'm not going to say that there we're not that there aren't powerful people out here in America who are pow, who are good magicians. Because I've, I've, I've uh, worked with one who I think is uh, very. Uh, who I think is 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 a very good magician, but uh, I would say that as far as knowledge is concerned and what they know, the Japanese know a lot. Mm. They know a hell of a lot, and they and, and uh, I suspect that what's hidden, you know, the Inendo, um, as you spoke about, um, I suspect that that has things that probably surpass what we've been taught here in the West or what's available to be taught here in the West mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. by leaps and bounds. I mean, uh, I, I suspect there's something mind-blowing out there mm -hmm. in the East. Yes, yes. So, uh, in, and of course, we'll be returning to that in my... Uh, in my monologue tonight, and uh, in, in terms of, uh, shall we say, the uh, the Netflix. What do you, you again? You watch this on your computer, not on a television screen, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I yeah, yeah. I've got two computers, and the computer, uh, the uh, main computer, which you know, the computer I use to um, do Skypey with uh, is is a smaller computer. It's one that I used to carry around with me so I could like make music outside. I stopped carrying the laptop around at a certain point when mm -hmm. uh, I had this run in with these dudes on the ferry boat. Mm -hmm. I was going home at like three o'clock in the morning and I was like doing my thing on my laptop and these three black dudes come walking around <laughs> and they're and swaggering and I'm like, okay. I put my computer back in my bag and I'm like, these motherfuckers want to start something. Because, you know, I'm I'm so used to it, uh -huh. it's not even funny. It's like I know what cues to look out for. And sometimes I think that people throw fake cues. And that was at a time when I was more, when I was a lot less relaxed. Nowadays, you know, when I bump into that kind of uh, that kind of stuff, I just relax my entire body and I just stay absolutely still. And it, it sort of it sort of intimidates them because they don't know what you're going to do if you're just standing still and absolutely relaxed. Right. Uh, and uh, it just uh, received some communications from Penny Bradley. Uh, I don't think I'll be able to bring her on tonight. Uh, she says she needs an hour, uh, ten thirty Pacific Daylight Time. By that time, I'll probably be well into monologue. Yeah, uh, I am in into uh, monologue. So let me just tell her that. In the meantime, keep uh, discussing. I want you to know that uh, the live stream is responding positively. E B says hi. Love this podcast. Uh, and, uh, then, uh, Sarah Thomas says we had a wicked downpour yesterday too, flooding in areas. Uh, and, uh, so, uh, she said, uh, oh, she's mentioning her favorite vampire show, which is very cute. That's the word, uh, that, uh, I would use for, uh, what we do in the dark. Uh, I don't know if you've had to look at that, but, uh, you know, I haven't watched it myself, but I can certainly see, uh, why people would like it. She says, I like what we do in the shadows, what we do in the shadows. That's it on FX, three decades old vampires living in present day Staten Island. It's a comedy based on the movie. Uh, so that's oh it. God, it's Staten shows. Island. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. I, I have the privilege of living out here. Yes, oh, boy. Yeah, let her know that there's nothing. I uh, wonder. Yeah, there's nothing but oh, comedy yeah. where you're at, but you have to have a real black sense of humor. Anyhow, go on. Yeah, you have to have a really dark sense of humor to live out here. Um, I mean, it's 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 uh, it's a place where they still have um, on the uh, what do you call it? it's like on the north shore but more more like to the west like closer to new jersey um there's a area where they had like uh where they detected like radi radioactive activity because that used to be one of the places where they dump shit from the manhattan project back when it was actually taking place in manhattan okay. before they moved it before they moved out to arizona that's so bizarre. And, I mean, you know, because if you went to Hiroshima or Nagasaki uh, or any place where the bombs were uh, blown in Korea, you wouldn't find anything. 
you wouldn't find any radioactivity. So I'm not disbelieving you, but I'm wondering, you know, what the fuck? How is it that the radioactivity? It's, you know, I don't know. Is, what, is, I don't know what they it, did it's out just here. Has, it's has to do with something about the natural toxicity of Staten Island. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I believe that that contributes to it uh, significantly. Um, I mean, Staten Island is located in such a way that all the uh, all the air. Mm-hmm with the way the air currents flow we get all the air all the smog and bad air filthy air from manhattan brooklyn bronx or from all the five boroughs it just sort of congeals over staten island <laughs> and uh yeah one can actually research that it, it, it's it's pretty bad and then there was a time when we actually had a garbage dump out here um which now they've turned into a nature trail where people can run <laughs> and jog on. And I, I, I sort of, I, I, I scratch my head as to why anyone would want to jog in that area. But well, I mean, why, why do people damn. tour Chernobyl? I, I mean, people go to Chernobyl uh, on tour, and you know, why do they do that? Oh yeah, yeah. People go to Chernobyl on tours, and 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 they see, and apparently they get high tourism. Oh. Apparently. Because, you know, it's not enough that you get blasted with radiation on a flight to Chernobyl due to the fact that when you're higher up in the atmosphere, you're less protected. Um, There are actually hot flights. Um, There are flights where uh, you're more likely to get hit with radiation than other flights. And this is actually able to be confirmed if you go to a website called Space Weather, because they'll tell you which uh, which which flights are hot flights throughout the day. Um, so you're getting radiated with that, and then you want to go to Chernobyl and then get even more radiated. I mean, for goodness <laughs> sake. Um, this is one of those things where, and, and you know, forgive my French here. Um, I'm someone who's of mixed race heritage now, well you remember what um, our, dear selena but, said uh, no more f-bombs if you can help it it's uh we're yes to yes those yes for myself my god yes but um there are some things that we can say that only white folks would want to do <laughs> well there's plenty of things that uh, only white folks seem to want to do i mean most other people have common sense to avoid them uh, yeah, some, yeah. Some, and, and yeah somebody to has chernobyl to do this one shit. of them yeah what's that <laughs> yeah going to chernobyl is one of them yeah thank you thank you you don't see blacks or asians saying oh yeah let's go to chernobyl yes there's some things only whites do and you know it's it's like <laughs> shit like skydiving uh you know various other um you know, dangerous, what they call extreme sports. There's very seldom yeah. do you see blacks or Asians uh, in extreme sports. You know, uh, it, it's, no, life is extreme enough for us already. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we don't really. need any more extreme into our lives. Thank you. Uh, thank maybe you. Maybe it's. I mean, maybe it's because uh, maybe it's because there's a sort of boredom that they have with. I, I think you know, so. It has something to do with privilege. It's uh, honestly, it's, it's <laughs> like uh, you're privileged enough to just basically uh, do go out and do something stupid uh, to amuse or entertain yourself, or, or to give your life some sense of challenge or meaning, really. So um, honestly, that's what it kind of that's what it sources from. Uh, it may have been different in the days of the. Uh, uh you know vikings or something but uh honestly you know people have a you know the whites all have a warped memory of that anyway uh that they've got no no real concept of uh you know reality when it comes to uh that sort of thing uh you know when they think of vikings first off that you know the visual concept of vikings is way off uh and they keep thinking of oh thank god uh our, our dear uh Lovely Mandy is here. So, Mandy, come back out and say hi, will you, honey? Hello. Oh, bless you, darling. Love you dearly. Oh, 
Mwah, mwah. You have no idea. Uh, anyhow, uh, love Jameson too. But of course, what happens is every once in a while when he tries to hold the stage, he gets into story reading mode or rather <laughs> news reading mode. Yeah. And it just doesn't it, it, it doesn't do it for me. Um, and I, oh, I, yeah, for, uh, uh, yeah. I don't blame you. Uh, honestly, my, my life isn't a very interesting one. It may oh, be I think many people would find your life extremely interesting. <laughs> you seem to get oh. yourself in more well, trouble uh than most people do in a lifetime uh well, every I, other I'm, fucking I'm day uh, well i'm certainly i'm certainly no um pack one <laughs> <laughs> holy shit yeah pack one is like uh it's uh it's a miracle he made it to his birthday but by, by the way again just so people know today is the birthday of both lena shea and pack one Morellis. They're, they're probably twins separated at birth, right? And uh, one female, one male. I mean, uh, it was, as a matter of fact, Jameson got into a bit of an argument with Derek Talley at one point when Derek was saying, well, you know, the egg and the uh, the sperm, only one sperm can get into the egg. So, um, but uh, then the argument was about, you know, uh, Honey, what do they call it, Mandy? The uh, one twin, one twin is a boy, one twin's a girl. What's the name for those twins again? Oh, oh crap! Oh, oh no! <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what the parents say when they come out. Yeah. It, oh crap! Yeah. They find out it's twins. <laughs> yes, yes. Just to have twins, period. You say, oh crap! Yeah. yeah, I say, oh crap, with just one kid, let alone two of them come tumbling out. Yes. Then I, then I know I'm well and truly fucked. Uh, so, uh, in, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, let's see now. We can I can juggle twins? No. <laughs> no, that means they're fucking each other. off. Fraternal twins. Fraternal twins. Is that was it? You, you were mentioning that, right? Yeah. And uh, so, uh, fraternal twins. We can look that up. Fraternal uh, twins. Why would they call it fraternal? What does that that mean? Fraternal brotherly brotherly twins. But what does that mean? Meaning fraternal I twins. Oh, there we are. Know. Fraternal twins. One boy, one girl. They're uh, also called the correct name. Really, is uh, disgotic twins. So. Yep. Monozygotic is the the one the identical. Dizygotic. Yeah, so monozygotic is identical, and then uh, dizygotic. Yes, dizygotic is. Uh... Thank you, honey. There we are. Thank you so much. And uh, oh my God, I was I would feel horribly bad for any mother who has to carry twins. Oh, uh, well, imagine those with goodness. you know quintuplets or six tuplets. Remember Octo Mom? Yes. How can oh, anyone forget? Oh God, there is there is something unnaturally weird about that, but I don't know. Well, um, you know, she seemed a likable enough person, really. She was just always getting into the yeah. into trouble, and uh, so it's uh, yeah, it's, yeah. It's it, I mean, it's 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 just I I would I don't know. Well, I, maybe it's different for a uh, mother. I'm 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 a man, so I'm trying to imagine uh, tr the the uh, process of squeezing eight babies out. You know, but, but don't, don't, don't unless don't it's try. a cesarean. <laughs> don't even try. <laughs> That's, uh, uh, you know, it's it's one of those things where, uh, by the way, as uh, George Knight was explaining to us, is that, uh, you know, um, there's only so many cesareans you can do. And, uh, you know, that's what was happening with the wife of uh, that idiot. Uh, uh, oh, um, uh, Amanda, you sent us some photos that uh, David John West, his wife, was uh, forced into doing uh, cesarean. Uh, He's a cute birth. little fella. And, and then they, <laughs> then they um, you know, it takes a lot out of a woman to do that. And there's only so many she can do. Uh, so uh, where, where are we? Where, where are these photos? I'm, I'm, I'm looking in the text. Oh, there we are. Uh, so there's his, that's, um, what, what, Buddy, is that his name? <laughs> yes. Oh, adorable, adorable. There we are, Buddy the Squirrel. <laughs> adorable little uh, little fellow. Um, how, how, you know, forgive me, this is going to sound really stupid. You could <laughs> tell he was a boy when you originally were kind of befriending him years ago, or, or when you, was this years ago when you originally encountered him? 
the squirrel? Yeah, yeah, the squirrel. <laughs> oh, no, this was, this, I'm sorry. I was like, wait, this was, uh, no, he, we found him uh, just this last August. Okay, so, so a few he's not months even ago. a year old yet. Oh, okay, okay, because I don't know what the lifespan of a squirrel is. I'm assuming it's rather short because they move so fast. So I assume that the higher the metabolism, the shorter the lifespan, or that would be the stereotype that I would have. Uh, I don't know if that's the case, but uh, in terms of uh, 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 Buddy the, 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 the squirrel, um, so you knew he was a boy because I'm presuming there's a little penis that's visible, right? right? Yep. Oh, okay. That's so cute. <laughs> oh, yep. my God. Today was the first day he used his hand to, to eat, so... <laughs> Okay, I thought you were going to tell me to to play with his penis. <laughs> that's that's how you knew he was back in shape. Yeah, that's that's right. Yeah, like any ordinary male. Uh, anyhow, Jameson yeah. has. I'm sorry. Go on. Go on. Honey. That was all. <laughs> yes, I I'm terrible. Yes, my mind's in the gutter. Uh, um, he, uh, our our man Jameson had to go help his uh, own father, and uh, with that leaves just you and I, honey. And do me a favor and uh, take the stage and start talking a little bit about Buddy and anything else you want. I'm trying to buy some time for myself to get my head together and you know talk about some subjects that are just fairly intense for me and and uh you know dredge up a lot of memories in my mind that wouldn't be obvious to most people so it's hard for me to talk about these things and uh so um talk, talk about things that are pleasant for you to talk about things that you uh will help educate our listeners and uh and and uh, you know whatever you think oh the school you were mentioning how uh at the time of 9 11 the um uh, the school that you were teaching in was um of course this specific type of school that you've talked about before but what i'd like you to do is just kind of briefly summarize forgetting the woman's name it's named after Montessori school system? Montessori, yeah Montessori, almost like monastery but Montessori. and um i'd like you to try and contrast that i'm sure you could do this with the steinerian type of school system, the differences between these or some other experimental school systems. I knew uh, one uh, friend of mine, he was a husband of this dear lady who became kind of like my, um, what you'd call the um, uh, representative payee. That's the term for it, representative, representative payee. In other words, when I first got on social security disability insurance, because I was considered so damaged by post-traumatic stress disorder and because of my history as a basically an irresponsible adult, uh, uh, the judge said I had to go at least a year uh, with representative payee receiving my payments. And this dear lady, uh, Esther Fishman, became my representative payee for a year. Her husband uh, had been a product of a very experimental kind of school while he was growing up. So he was uh, my age, maybe a little older than myself by 10 years, maybe, uh, but my senior by about a decade, really. But uh, he was um, someone who had been a product of like a kind of a hippie type school, we would think of it these days. But in other words, the kids spent a lot of time outdoors and uh, very creative pursuits and uh, in touch with nature. And uh, so, um, well, what it produced was a man who uh, basically was a hippie at heart and kind of like, uh, uh, you know, it's it, it was just sad because he wound up, you know, working at the stock exchange in San Francisco to support his family. And he had to get up uh, in time to be in sync with the stock exchange opening in New York City. So he's basically working at three o'clock in the morning uh, and, and coming home much earlier. And But he is, his life's totally out of sync with anyone else in the universe. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, so... Uh, I'm thinking of schools like that, and I'm thinking of the Steinarian type schools, which are very different from others, and I'm sure you probably know enough about them to compare and contrast some of these different types of schools that are experimental. So if you would go into that, uh, please. Sure. Thank um, you. I, sure, and I, 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 I think I know the school that you're talking about, and the name uh, completely escapes me, but it is it's very centered on um creativity and natural environment it, it's a very artistic um uh c creativity led 
uh, curriculum, very free flowing, very, um, I, I was very a, artsy party. Yeah. Yeah. I was under the impression from him and I may have miscommunicated, but I was under the impression from him. It's no longer around. There, you know what, uh, the one that I'm thinking of could just be based off of it. Okay. Uh, okay. you know, um, cause there are, there are several different other names and, and methods and they all kind of, I feel, um, kind of take a lot from Maria Montessori, uh, okay. from her, um, outlook. She used to be her and her father were, um, uh, both Italian, um, physicians and scientists. Mm -hmm. And so the, the basic method the Montessori schools use is it emphasizes independence and that, with the coming into that children are naturally curious. Mm -hmm. They naturally want and are eager for knowledge and to know what their world is. And so the, you basically create a very prepared environment to allow them with the support of, a, of instructors and teachers to help guide them through while letting their natural curiosity uh, guide them to it uh, so I would like I would take my kids out on walks every day because we were very lucky we were right by an inlet to the ocean and we would go watch the whales reaching when they were coming in and out and um, just the conversations that you could have with the kids you know just walking along the beach um, uh, certain kids that in a classroom setting can't focus or or you know whatever, you can incorporate counting and science and history and uh, any topic that you want. Um, you know, uh, so it's, it, it's, a, it's a way that you allow kids to find themselves and find out their world uh, their way. Great. Um, Great. Yeah. By the way, before you continue, I uh, just wanted to say that uh, Veronica Berrera has joined us in the chat room. And I want to thank everyone else for the continuing input. Um, uh, Sarah Thomas uh, was still speaking where she said Staten Island, where uh, Jameson Reese lives. She says it needs a harp array to send the pollution back to Manhattan, which Jameson Reese was laughingly responding to. EB was saying, what about uh, certain Japanese? Japanese Buddhism isn't that a cult? Um, well, you know, that certainly goes without saying, yes. And uh, Penny Bradley, Nachtwaffen pilot, uh, the Night Force Aviatrix, says, Hello, guys. I was on the butcher's shop tonight, where apparently she was doing a lot of yelling to the point where she gave herself a headache with uh, two people with the um, names that uh, she provided me. I don't know whether these are like uh, pet names, quote unquote, she developed for them. I'm, I'm being facetious when I say that, <laughs> but she calls them Ramona and Jackal. Okay, this sounds like maybe some names that she would apply to people she doesn't particularly like, but uh, this is like, uh, so she does mention that uh, a lot of yelling to the point where she had to take a Tylenol. And so sorry she went through that. Veronica Perea says, Buenos noches, Douglas. And uh, hola a todos. So, yes, uh, buenas noches. Hola a todos, uh, señora Veronica Perea. Love you dearly. And uh, and Penny Bradley, Nachwaffen pilot, says, I wasn't yelling. Okay, so they were yelling. But it gave her a headache to hear them yell. Thank you, honey. Yeah, you don't strike me as the type who casually starts yelling at people. And uh, so... <laughs> And, and that's fine. But she's in the chat room, but she said give her an hour uh, before she comes on. By that time, I hope to actually be into monologue, which uh, our lovely Mandy is buying us some time for. But honey, what, what do you know about um, the, uh, as, as you said, most of these people are simply uh, kind of taking what this woman introduced to the world and expanding on it or, or just providing a variation thereof. Uh, and, and so Penny Bradley says, by the way, in terms of Ramona and Jackal, she says, those are their air names, their air names. So it'd be kind of like a stripper has a stage name <laughs> or wrestlers. I don't know what they would call their names. I just call their names stupid, you know, like here's the undertaker. <laughs> yeah. Oh God, your son's not into any of that shit. Is he, you know, watching people wrestle? 
no. No, thank God. Oh, thank God. I mean, that's so homoerotic. I mean, you know, and I never understand that. I mean, kids, when they buy action figures of wrestlers in particular, that to me is just, you know, uh, I, you know, when I go into uh, toy shops, because I'll tell you the truth, of course, I, I, I enjoy uh, toys. I enjoy what's, what's going, coming out there in the toy world. I like to look at new types of action figures. And when I saw the plethora of wrestling figures that were coming out, you know, about 10 years ago or a decade ago, it was just, you know, awful. It was just awful. Just uh, plastic man me, you know, all over the fucking shelves. It was disgusting. It was like, I felt that I had entered a gay sex shop in San Francisco. That's what it felt like. It was just, it's just awful. Uh, and um, so um, aside from that, honey, I'm just uh, obviously at this point indulging myself. Uh, you, what do you know, however, about Rudolf Steiner? Are you very familiar with him? I'm just curious, just curious. I'm not trying to, you know, push the subject or push you into talking about it. But, uh, you know, because I know that, the um, Steinerians, they, uh, there's, there's controversy about them in Germany because they have their own school system. And then there's this Steinerian tradition because Rudolf Steiner was German. And uh, they have this kind of tolerance in Germany because they resisted the Reich, so to speak. And uh, therefore, um, they, these mystics have their own kind of community. And uh, so their students, if they go to a German public school, because they have this very Christian background throughout Germany, uh, and uh, there's crosses on the walls or something, and then Steinarians will protest about that because the Steinarians feel that that's uh, a symbol that is binding, and um, they try to, you know, raise their students or their children in a, a kind of environment that's free of this kind of mind-binding, uh, what they feel is a mind-binding mechanism, so to speak. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's like Peter Moon said, you have to really be into it because he looked at the Steinarian stuff and like most people couldn't make sense of it. And uh, it is, you know, I see the sense in it, but it's just not necessarily the sense that I, that I want to get into. It's very mystical but very uh, fascinating in its own right. And I can see how people build their lives around it, just like they do with the Christianity of Emanuel Swedenborg, who Lena Shea was very interested in and, and resonated with, uh, which was wonderful. And I thought that that was organic and holistic. And, uh, and uh, you know, uh, it, it's her birthday today. So, you know, positive things, positive vibes her way. And uh, Pac-1 Morales and her being born in the same day. That's where we were coming up with the fraternal twins joke. See, that's that's where it came out. Of. See, there we are. Yeah. So uh, going back to uh, our, uh, by the way, uh, for people in terms of synchronistic birthdays, just remember there's only 365 days in the year, okay? <laughs> and there's billions of people on Earth, okay? There's going to be uh, millions and millions of people with the same birthdays, all right? Uh, far more important what uh, Brendan Zogit was able to notice about myself was that my mother strategized my birth. And uh, she, when she impregnated herself with... Uh, by the way, how, how familiar are you with um, basically my background in that regard? My mother impregnating herself with the sperm that she had been ordered to collect by the emperor and uh you you probably never even heard of that and and probably coming back in this is probably the first time you've heard of that right mandy or have you heard about that before um you know i i did miss uh your explanations of that i've only saw a few brief posts or something that you had done about that when i had um checked back into uh facebook okay. but I, I did not hear you um uh, go through that. And uh, as you're saying, um, people who share birthdays, there's only 365 days of it. Uh, my father and sadly, Michael Aquino share the exact same birthday. No, that's but right. Oh, that's they right. are definitely not alike. <laughs> no, no. And uh, did your, was your father aware of that or did he even know enough about Aquino where that would have even, you know, impacted his psyche? You know, did he, did he know of Akina? He, he probably did, though. We never brought it up. I mean, he, I had told you this before. He had um, brought home the book, The Necromonicon, and I had found it in a box of books. And he was like, oh, God, don't read that. Go burn it. 
<laughs> and I was just like shocked and horrified because my dad bringing up burning a book is uh, um, just unheard of, even right. if he doesn't agree with it, thinks it's evil, whatever, whatever. But for him to tell me, don't don't even touch it uh, and burn it, not because it was evil and truthful, but because it was bull crap. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. Uh, so um, I we've never spe- we never specifically brought him up, but um, that whole uh, uh area i i would be surprised if he did not know his name mm-hmm. um my dad was a e3 in the the military and over at the jupiter rocket um building site for the the moon he was an electrician over there um so i'm sure the name was aware to him mm-hmm. that he was aware of that name thank you thank you very important and uh uh, and, and I'm so glad that he, uh, truly a wise man. He saw that the Necronomicon was bullshit. Now this was the Avon paperback edition, the trade market edition, I'm assuming written by Peter Lavinda yeah. under the pseudonym of Simon. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, thank you. And, uh, I, I definitely appreciate your, um, you're sharing that, and uh, that's very important. So yeah, he he knew, and um, and and uh, aside from that, uh, you know, uh, a few things. I, I am getting some incoming questions. I do feel obligated to answer uh, while our um, lady Mandy is here. Is the time to do this while we're all feeling casual? As somebody was asking me about the uh, what I was saying about the Confederate States of Australia, the the rise of such a of such a uh, geopolitical entity and uh, anybody who's heard my analysis on Australia if you haven't uh, do review it and as a matter of fact just let me look up the uh, the date that I um, spoke of it uh, was uh, likely during the um, gun violence awareness uh, QM uh, uh, Chukan or uh, Midway Day Weekend Critical Omissions. Uh, so uh, when it comes to um, Australia, understand that uh, the uh, Australians are overwhelmingly of Irish descent, and uh, certainly the white Australians. I'm not talking about the Aborigines or recent immigrants, uh, but the what uh, people consider to be the baseline Australians are the European uh, displacement culture. These are people who, the difference between Australia and New Zealand is that the whites of New Zealand are overwhelmingly Scottish in descent, and they were voluntary resettlers. Whereas the overwhelming uh, white population, the overwhelming majority of them, and I mean like all of them essentially, uh, except for a few people who were uh, prison keepers or wards of the uh, uh, of the continent as a uh, prison. Oh God, Amanda, you needs to charge your phone. Should we back? Uh, thank you, honey. Yeah, do come back as soon as possible, and. Uh, but the uh, you know the majority of the white Australians were Irish who were deported uh, to Australia to depopulate Ireland, and uh, so um, as I mentioned about the uh, Solid South uh, Dixieland in the United States, the overwhelming uh, genetic strain of the white population is Gallo-Celtic, whereas uh, it's it's in stark disambiguation from the northern states, which were overwhelmingly uh, Anglo-Teutonic or Anglo-Dutch, Anglo-Dutch in, in terms of their descent. Uh, and very different uh, cultures developed in both regions, very distinct cultures uh, because of that. Uh, the Anglo-Dutch being a very Protestant, uh, very work ethic oriented, uh, whereas the uh, Celts, of course, are far more celebratory, uh, far more, um, in other words, they have a far more tribal kind of bonding with each other and uh, far more of a warrior kind of uh, society, very militarized in the sense that the, uh, was, there was a cult of dueling, there was a uh, sense of uh, militant honor, uh, you didn't have in the north, uh, and uh, this came from a Celtic background, and there was also uh, more of the tribal legacy of slave taking, which of course the Celts, in conquering any other tribes, 
would take slaves. Uh, Rome was a slave-based society when it uh, ethnically cleansed the Celts out of much of Europe and drove them into what became uh, the Isles of Anglo-Saxony, or the uh, British Isles, as they call them, even though they uh, are really Celtic Isles, uh, and the Celts have simply been driven to the fringe of the islands, uh, out of the heartland and into Ireland, Wales, and Scotland. Uh, so when you take a look at the Celts and their ancient uh, culture, uh, similar to the Vikings, who also took slaves, these are all slave-based systems that uh, went from one particular kind of uh, slavery based on conquest or brigandage, where in the South you had a kind of proto-industrial state based on agronomy or the agricultural economy. And uh, this agronomic slavery became racially based. This was the first time where you had a very distinct uh, solidification of the, uh, the slaves being taken as not just uh, prisoners of war or uh, conquered uh, families. Uh, it became a, uh, a ethnically uh, established uh, uh, chattel slavery. This is what I foresee a re-legalization of in Australia. Uh, something that would rationalize a colonization of the Philippines, uh, which um, I brought up uh, the uh, founding basis for the uh, super state that was actually envisioned by Steven Spielberg in his television series Sequest DSV. It wasn't really him that envisioned it, by the way. That was when his series was dying because it was all such cock and bull. Uh, it was such cockamamie bullshit based on the sex appeal of one young child star, uh, which is very Steven Spielberg ish. <clears throat> uh, when they finally said, well, we've got to transition into something that makes more sense. Uh, then they militarized the program and uh, brought in um, a different actor to become the lead. And uh, that was when they uh, brought in the um, state of war that uh, suddenly began to congeal and make sense of that particular world. And it was only a season long or a season and a half. And uh, then it was taken off the air. Uh, several reasons for this, uh, no need to go into them now, but uh, in terms of uh, what they portrayed, that was very uh, precognitive, very insightful. This was based on uh, basically some social models that the Pentagon had gamed out, and that was uh, something that essentially leaked through the Sequest DSV, uh, and um, this is one of the reasons it was taken off the air, even though there were two episodes that never aired and were supposed to, and no one's ever seen them that I know of, but I know what they're about. And, uh, and, uh, that was, they were taken off the air. The series was taken off the air before they could be shown for that reason. So I go into that some other time. I've hinted at it before, but, uh, they were, you'd see hints of it in the last episodes of Sequest DSV. And, um, just so people understand that is something that, uh, in terms of the social uh, forecasts that I used to conduct. Uh, I wasn't part of those social forecasts, but I took them into account with my own social forecasting. And uh, it becomes very obvious that with its monolithic media machine, uh, Australia's uh, Celtic uh, background, this has the, the transfer of culture uh, potential uh, that will likely re-legalize chattel slavery, uh, re-legitimate uh, colonialism. This is something that I'm not effusing or advocating. It's simply what I foresee as a contextual inevitability because of uh, the the murdocracy that rules Australia and, uh, and the cultural background that uh, is manipulated by that murdocracy. Um, matter of fact, it's rumored, uh, this is just kind of uh, the, the kind of social observation that's made by a lot of people that has not been statistically confirmed, but you know, it's popular, uh, popular rumor <laughs> that uh, many Australian women are lesbians and, uh, because their men are such assholes 
you know what when amanda you comes back she can address that you know with me but uh you know and this is because they fall for that murdoch crap hook line and sinker and uh you know and of course the radicalized right uh is uh loaded with misogyny and uh it just uh, complete uh, rejection of anything. Uh, so, uh, by the way, um, the Lay Rene encounter says, hello, Douglas. Hey, honey. Uh, again, honey, I'm not on uh, Instagram. Uh, Lena Shea abandoned me, and that's why I don't know how to use that stuff, and I can't seem to access it anymore. Uh, so uh, go ahead and, um, uh, again, I'm, you may have contacted me by email. I'll try and look for your email. I'll try and get in contact with you and hopefully we can get you on my program or um, get myself on yours. Let's try and plan for that. And uh, in terms of the uh, EB, he's saying, what's the best religion? Hitler was Roman Catholic, right? I, I'm not quite sure there's a best religion. <laughs> there's simply different religions uh, and uh, it's whatever you feel um, suits you. And uh, certainly... Um, I, honestly, think about your own background and what your heritage is, and usually that tends to be a hint towards uh, what's best for yourself. Uh, so um, there's a lot of neo-pagans now who are following Celtic or Nordic religions, uh, and I, I thought that that's what Odin was, uh, Daryl Neely. Um, I'm not quite sure. He may be that. Uh, yeah, I'll have to ask Our Lady uh, you know, Penny about that sometime soon. So, uh, and so the lay Renee encounter says, I miss you. Oh my God, honey. Gosh, yo, I'm sorry. I, I honestly, uh, I don't know what Selena's doing. She's supposed to be putting my stuff on Instagram. Should be going on Instagram. At least she's maintaining, you know, the, the baselines of the website. And, uh, so, um, yeah, honey, I just, uh, we'll try. I'll try and, I, I, I can't promise anything about Instagram. I'm glad you're checking into us here. We'll try and, um, like I said, um, a guest one another on each other's shows. We'll see what we can do to arrange that. So, yeah, if you haven't sent me an email, do so. And uh, this time I should be able to get back to you better than I was before. And, you know, just now beginning to kind of stabilize. And Friday, you know, uh, you will get this crown uh, done and then start dealing with a number of things, including, um, you know, trying to get back in contact with you and the um, seeing what we can do. Um, now, the Lay Renee Encounters is, of course, the name of program uh, hostess, hostess said by uh, the hostess Lay Renee. And um, I, of course, uh, recommend uh, people give it a try and listen to it. I don't know myself how to find it. <laughs> so she needs to give me a link. I, I think it must have a YouTube uh, channel uh we'll find out and uh aside from that uh all right so let me try and uh get myself together a bit more where let me see if there was some other questions that came in that people were asking uh and uh, certainly by the way when i bring up what i did about the celtic background and uh the irish being so predominant in australia uh this is not of course to vilify the Irish people as inherently Slavocratic, uh, in other words, slave, slave economic oriented or something like that. My, the man who raised and guided me, uh, George Joseph Henry Dietrich, was uh, at least a quarter Irish. Uh, so, um, and uh, spoke with a very heavy Irish brogue uh, that was essentially his acculturation to a great degree. Uh, because the Dietrichs were German-Irish, basically a German-Irish family. It's a very common combination because the Irish and the Germans were both struggling against England and the British Empire. So the Irish uh, and the Germans would often uh, ally and uh, the Irish people would wind up marrying Germans quite a bit. So uh, when uh, he was a product product of that kind of union and uh, fairly common in the American Northeast. And um, so with his uh, heavily Irish acculturated background, obviously there were many Irish who fought for freedom, though I hate that term because it's, you know, it's like the term respect. What does it mean? You know, it's, 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 it's like it, you can imbue that with whatever sense you want, but uh, they were struggling for independence. And uh, because of that, they often allied 
with other independence movements or people who they identified as downtrodden or uh, the like. So there are Irish who have done that throughout world history. And then there's Irish who have taken the path of uh, the ancient tribes of uh, slavery uh, through conquest. So um, that mutated in the uh, proto-industrial age to what it did in the South. I can easily see that returning in uh, Australia of the near future because they don't have enough of a population to maintain an economy uh, on their own. Uh, that would be like a logical outgrowth for um, the lack of manpower that they have in order to maintain their independence from uh, much more populous nations around them, such as Indonesia and ultimately uh, mainland China. So uh, with the largest Muslim population in the world immediately on their border, uh, the only way they can compensate for that would be uh, a, uh, a, a reassertion of colonialism uh, in which they would uh, develop a greater baseline population through essentially a form of conquest. And the Filipinos, of course, are looking for someone to align with with the retreat of the American empire. So all of this makes perfect sense. Uh, a geopolitical, what you would call geopolitical inevitability. And uh, that's uh, both in the nature of the cultures and uh, in the natures of, uh, you know, the peoples, etc. So there is a bit of genetic determinism in what I am speaking of, something that uh, uh, your modern liberal progressives would find stomach churning uh they would uh they they would simply reject any such concept and this is of course why they're always wrong so in so many ways when it comes to geopolitics uh they for instance many people thought for many years that if you could engage china that they would liberalize that they would uh and that the opposite has proven to be true so uh we're speaking of communist china of course and uh not uh china as in the historical sense or in the sense of Taiwan, of course, my birthland. Mm. Now, because Mandy is recharging, um, uh, let me see if I can, um, you know, poke uh, either Penny to come on a bit early or bring our man, uh, Mr. Jameson Reese, uh, on a little bit again uh, to engage in a little bit of talk and... Uh, uh, what else was there? Some people asking questions uh, that um, that I'll see if any seemed relevant to me. But um, while I'm doing that, also look around and get myself a bit more grounded. Um, Jameson, if you could take the stage for a little bit. Jameson. Yes, yes, <laughs> there yes, he is. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes. All right. So let's see what developments uh, we have going on. I need to do this in a way that's a little more organic. I I realize that, and unless it's a topic that I have knowledge of already, it's <clears throat> it's a little bit difficult for me to just you know um, uh, find a way to um, engage organically. Oh well, here's a good one. Um, honestly, uh, let me see. There's a lot of the same stuff I see going on. Um, I mean, I don't see anything that's particularly overly interesting as far as news is concerned. So um, let me see what I can dredge up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Uh, was anybody hearing me in the background? Uh, uh, no. no okay. I, you weren't. You weren't. Uh, audible in the background. Okay. Uh, and, uh, so, uh, I, I, I think it's uh, I incredible how uh, oh, these people in their phones, uh, they shouldn't rely on their phones. Uh, and uh, as for... Uh, That's know, why I've always been a fan of having a laptop. Yes, yes, it's so important. And, uh, Hell of a lot more convenient. I so, mean, I, I, I... Mm -hmm. go oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah, yes, you might want to check on uh, again what's going on in Canada with those uh, tribal schools where all those bodies were found. See what new has developed in that area. I think that's important. 
And uh, I think he's pursuing that now <laughs> based yeah. on my suggestion. Uh, and uh, oh, okay. Is that somebody in Messenger or somebody sending me a message? What, what was that sound? Was that you? Uh, no, that was not me. Mm -hmm. Uh, all right. So we have, well, yeah, it's, it's basically all I was able to find is the same article from uh, CBS news with the 200 bodies. That, that found. Should, yeah, that shouldn't be the case. There should be more on it by now, uh, but nevertheless, okay. Um, moving right along, uh, and, uh, see what else, uh, you can find, uh, the, um, Ah, <sighs> okay. Uh, what about, uh, you said that there were some other things that, I, I mean, there's plenty of things we've had, like, what, uh, a lot of things going on. The weather, the weather, you, you, it was rainy uh, throughout the south or, or something. What, what is it? Everybody's going through, uh, they've best, just been inundated with rain, the weather. Yeah, it's, it's like, a, like another deluge uh, happening whenever we get these uh, flash storms. Uh -huh. Okay. I mean, they, they, they just they just dump mm -hmm. they, they they dump so much rain within an hour that you would swear it was raining all day. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And uh... Uh, I have an article. Okay, I have an article from Democracy Now that oh. says there are many others. Two hundred and fifteen bodies found at Canadian Residential School for Indigenous Children. Uh, the, the 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 problem with me reading any of this stuff is that you summed everything up. Or, or we, we summed everything <laughs> up already. I mean, there's there's not much more to say about it, uh, other than the fact that you know, uh, again, the no one has been treated worse than the indigenous American on the face of planetary history. Yes, yeah, just awful. there you have it. I mean. Mm. Okay. And uh, so it's, it's, Penny it's Bradley hard. says hello, so she'll come in for a little bit with us. And uh, all right, so let's... she could, yeah, she please do pick her mind about something. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> as far as conversations concerned, I don't know what to discuss with her oh. per se, an organic level. Oh, I think both of you but... are quite organic. You both are quite organic, and so so we're calling her now. And uh, she helps because uh, Mandy is recharging and uh, this will kind of, uh, you know, once I get started on monologue, of course, I suck up all the oxygen in the room and everybody has to leave or they'll suffocate. And uh, so let's see. Uh, let me tell her that I'm calling. Let's see if she gets that message. Let's see now. Uh, there she is. So, Penny, thank you so much for joining us. So you had that headache after Hi. people were yelling. So tell us a bit about what that program was about and why everybody was yelling. And uh, Ramona and Jackal, they sound intriguing. And Daryl Neely was hosting, I presume? Or was that not the case? Was this uh, Daryl was hosting, and it was a discussion about race relations <laughs> in the United States. Okay. So, so and yeah, and and who's that white guy had, that that we had a was broad with earlier? Mix. Uh -huh. Yeah, go on. So, um, I'm very white with a little bit of Native American, and Daryl is mixed African and European, and um, Jackal is Hispanic and has a mixed race family and um ramona mm -hmm. considers herself african-american but she also has native american so it was a bunch of mixed race people talking about race relations in america mm -hmm. and ramona is very liberal and jackal is very conservative and they just kept screaming okay <laughs> It, no, 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 Jackal's not that older white guy I saw Daryl talking to earlier, right? It, there's him and this other white guy were talking black and white. It was earlier today. They were on. Was, no, that was someone else. So what's that? Was what's that about? What what's that guy's uh, shtick, so to speak? Uh, they're basically on the same page. They're both very conservative, and and they're just talking. They're talking from the point of view of of their racial experience. Mm -hmm. on 
whatever topic they bring up for the day. You mean Daryl and the white guy? <laughs> yeah. That seems to be a popular topic. In fact, I heard <laughs> yes. you discussing it earlier. Yes, yes, very much so. So, yeah, it's a popular topic these days, and it, it's, you know, it is what it is. Uh-huh. It, yeah, and it's, uh, y- you know, obviously something that, as I said, is really uh, becoming the topic. It is the narrative. So with everybody kind of shouting about it, that's uh, it kind of shows me I'm in the right space at the right time to, uh, you know, force people to confront this. And uh, we'll um, we'll we'll see what, um, you know, comes of that in the uh, in the future. But uh, in the meantime, uh, you now that you're with us, um, do us a favor and kind of uh, take the stage. Give me a chance to pull my head together and uh, talk about things that you feel are relevant. Um, by all means. Ah, there is an article I was interested in uh-huh. from the Detroit Free Press. Uh-huh. And it's about, if I can get all the X's to go down. Mm-hmm. Okay. I can read you part of it, and it is about Michigan's first human hantavirus case identified in Washtenaw County woman, and this was as of the 7th. Okay. Um, Hantavirus is something that's, that's actually pretty common to my part of the world. Um, southwestern the United States, um, any area that has a wet season followed by a very dry one. And when you have a really, really wet season, you get a lot of, of vegetation growth. In my area, it's mostly grasses, but can be weeds and other things. And um, hantavirus is indigenous to this part of the United States and points south. It goes all the way into Central and South America. And what it is, is a virus in the Ebola family. It causes hemorrhaging. It's a hemorrhagic fever. And it mostly hits young, healthy people. And the reason being that those are the people who are cleaning houses and are exposed to the virus. The natural, the natural vector for this disease in this part of the world is deer mice. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know, I don't know if deer mice make it all the way to Michigan or not. If if not, then there's another vector involved, which means that this beastie is spreading. Mm-hmm. So um, when they talked about the Spanish plague mm-hmm. that hit the Native Americans, mm-hmm. it was because it was hantavirus, mm-hmm. and you get sick and you get a huge overreaction from your body to the virus <clears throat> and the healthier you are the worse the reaction is and you end up bleeding out and and if you can get medical treatment right away you can survive it but a lot of people don't this is something to be honest this is one of the things that scares the shit out of me okay um I used to clean houses, and I used to be the janitor for the local limestone quarry. And they had some buildings that had been abandoned that they asked me to clean. And they completely freaked out because I showed up in hazmat gear to do this. Mm -hmm. And they were laughing at me. Well, I had microbiology at at San Diego State. That Mm -hmm. was my major. So I'm coming in decades later and I'm looking at three inches of mouse droppings 
all over this entire building and i'm saying i need hazmat gear yeah yeah the, by like, the way um there was some poor bastard who was hired in san francisco uh to uh clean the uh roofs of city hall at, that were loaded with pigeon shit and uh that stuff's some of the most vile shit in the world pigeons are rats with wings and uh so yeah pigeons carry a lot of things that you really don't want to catch yeah and he wound so, up being paralyzed for life he, he not because he fell off the roof but because he inhaled all this powderized pigeon shit yeah powderized pigeon droppings yeah. that resulted in uh you know uh para paralyzing him uh, total body paralysis uh, then, then Jameson joins in by saying, uh, just say it out loud, Jameson, something about morons feed or <laughs> what is it you're saying? Yeah, moron. morons feed them in New York. Yeah. Oh, morons oh, the pigeons. Here yes. too. Yeah, like feeding um, rats. Yes, go on, honey. Yeah. And, and so I had to deal with the board of directors of this company. Uh -huh. Why did I want hazmat gear to clean this place? And I said, fine, I'll pay for it myself. And I did, you know, disposable overalls, the, the, the head mask, um, and proper breathing stuff. And it was over 100 degrees Fahrenheit here. It was hot. And inside of that thing, I thought I was going to die. But I knew that breathing that stuff, I would, I would literally die. Yeah. So I, I came in with a flat tipped shovel and I was literally shoveling this stuff into a wheelbarrow pouring bleach all over it and then taking it and dumping it mm -hmm. <clears throat> the bleach killed that particular virus so that's something people should know is that if you're pretty sure you live in that region that's affected regular chlorine bleach will kill it mm -hmm. so um but you have to wear gloves, you have to wear breathing protection, you have to wear something to keep your clothes out of it, and you have to wear something over your shoes. Because th if, you take off, if you take off everything else and you've got your shoes dirty, you're tracking that into your own house. Yeah. Yeah. So there are ways to beat it, but they're preventative because once you've caught it, you're in trouble. And if this thing has spread to Michigan, uh, yeah. Oh, in the article it says, and white-footed mice. Mm -hmm. So um, where I live, it's deer mice. And it can also be spread here by our local squirrels. So these pretty, <laughs> these pretty little rats with fluffy tails <laughs> all over oh, the Sierra oh. Nevada, they not only carry bubonic plague, but they also carry hantavirus. Mm. So, you know, people need to think about what their disease vectors are in their area um, and what kills them, mm -hmm. what gets rid of the bug. So um, folks back east that have to deal with deer ticks and Lyme disease, they should be really good to their possums because the possums will, will eat the ticks okay. and not catch the bug. So, um, Great. you know, you have to think about things, mm. not just. Go off half cocked. Oh my god, I saw a possum. <laughs> oh, there was a possum that was in the trash can yeah. cut oh, the, that's... at the limestone quarry. And I'm pulling out the trash bag and it wiggles. And I look in and I'm greeted with eyeballs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just let the I let the bag down gently and left it open and let him just walk away. And apparently I screamed. I don't remember screaming, but the guys that worked there teased me about it for almost a year. Okay. But yeah. That sort of thing happens, yes. And uh, so uh, in terms of... Uh, other things that come to mind that you'd like to address. Uh, so we're concerned about the uh, 
uh, the, the Junta virus uh, becoming an American mm -hmm. phenomenon. Uh, what else is on your mind? Becoming a Northern American phenomenon because mm -hmm. I live I live at the basically the same parallel as DC. Mm -hmm. So it's already indigenous here. Mm -hmm. You really don't want this stuff going further north. Okay. So, um, but yeah, there are there are real diseases out there that people should be concerned about, and that's one of them. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. Okay. And but uh, I ran across that today and put it on my Facebook wall and thought, you know, that would be something to bring up. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, so uh, aside from that, honey, what, what else uh, is on your mind? You're going to be on my show in a couple of days. Oh, that's right. Yes. Yeah, aside, aside from, uh, you know, whatever you're preparing for the... <laughs> oh, I, I tend to be extemporaneous and go with whatever you want to talk about. Yes, uh, organic. No worries. Yes. And, uh, yeah. I, I, organic, I, fresh, n nothing forced. Oh, shit. I was just told by Sammy Romero, his mom had three sets of twins. Oh, my God. Yes, twins do run in families. Twins do run in families. Uh, yeah, they do. And and um, so thank you, Sammy, for for sharing that. I appreciate that. And um, we were talking about fraternal twins earlier because we were talking about two people that I know who were born on the same birthday, and uh, one was male and one was female. What what about uh, yourself, honey? Uh, without uh, going into something too stressful necessarily, but I imagine thinking about your kids would always be stressful. Obviously, if they were born with these challenges. Uh, it seems like, well, they're independent adults now, right? I mean, they're not, they're not living with you, so they must have adapted they're, fairly well. They're independent adults. They're meds dependent. Mm -hmm. um, all three of them are married. Uh, my middle son has two kids of his own. Um, my granddaughter is of age, and my grandson is still in high school. Mm -hmm. And they recently moved to Texas. So. Okay. And uh, uh, so, so. The other two live in San Jose with their spouses. Okay. So but, they're, they're being cared for as much as they can be. They're living normal, responsible, working class adult lives. Wow. Well, uh, that's quite the achievement. And uh, uh -huh. so. Okay. Uh, Danny, Danny runs a forklift at a warehouse mm -hmm. and Stefan is a overnight stalker and cashier mm -hmm. for a grocery chain mm -hmm. and they're both making relatively decent money for the area okay overnight stalker I, I honestly thought you said overnight stalker <laughs> People who put cans on the shelves. <laughs> okay, that's great. Uh, and uh, maybe he can tell us why we're, we've run out of everything and why all the shelves are empty. <laughs> He's uh, in San Jose. He's not in San Francisco. Okay. So I, yes. um, I'm going to guess that the high prices of gasoline have something to do with that. Okay. And the fact that during the shutdown, they went through and killed off lots of animals that were on farms. And there were a whole lot of farms that basically just plowed everything under. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and California has been sending the water into the bay instead of using it to grow vegetables. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to argue the wisdom or not of that particular policy, but I will say that it's increased vegetable prices dramatically. All right. 
And uh, so, um, how about your diet? Uh, this is you've mentioned the chicken livers, but other than that, I I would assume it's heavy in vegetables, really. Usually, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm type two diabetic. I really shouldn't be eating much else, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> except I have pernicious anemia, so I crave certain foods. Mm. Okay. And uh, it's it's one of the quote unquote royal blood diseases. Right, right. And uh, you were talking about your blood type before. And no, of course we don't no. want to overdwell on these sorts of things because they can get very self absorbed. But uh, in, in terms of uh, other things that come to mind in the current events, uh, what's uh, what's on your mind about what's been going on lately with current events? There must be some other things aside from uh, you know the disease monitoring. <laughs> That comes to mind. Um, <clears throat> I've been trying to not go too deeply into partisan politics because I really don't think that the people that we the people that we see their faces are puppets. I really don't think they have a lot of say in what actually happens. So um, I try not to dive too deeply into that stuff mm -hmm. um there is a game being played and it's about control of the population and all of the signs that i've been watching through treaty treaties and other things over the past couple of decades um population control is a big part of that and I think that's part of why we have such high prices for everything right now. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, I mean, of course, the supply chains are all fucked up everywhere. Uh, it's, uh, but, uh, yeah, so uh, aside from... I believe it was FDR that says nothing happens unless it's planned. Well, that I, I I don't accept. It's just uh, it gives everybody too much credit for foresight. <laughs> There's just not enough foresight for that. It uh, just depends on how far back it was planned. Yeah, it's uh, in terms of FDR, of course, he had his own shortcomings, uh, which I've gone into in some depth. Uh, but uh, you know, aside from uh, all of that, uh, so speaking ahead about uh, some fun with uh, the people and what they were yelling about. So uh, give us some hint of what everybody was yelling about today, what you might have heard also Daryl Neely talking about, you know, with what's the old white guy's name again? It was Daryl and and him. They were doing the black and white thing. And uh, I keep blanking on his name. Okay. Uh, we've got some interesting people on, on the network these days, though. Uh -huh. we, ha we have Leo Zahami. Well, I noticed you got this probably, one one woman there who just deals with domestic subjects like all things um, in the home or something like that, right? It, it's, uh, uh, she's not talking about domestic subjects. She's talking about how to make money. Oh, okay. Yeah. All things in the home? With a title like that? Mm -hmm. It sounds like home economics. You would think so, but it isn't. Okay. So, so and... she just talks about stuff you can do to, for financially... You know, broadening your horizons, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And um, there's some politics involved. Uh, most of the most of the hosts on my network, mm -hmm. Daryl ne Neely's network, mm -hmm. most of the hosts are political. Okay. And there have been times that I've gone political because my guest had. Um, I do basically follow the drift of what's happening mm -hmm. okay but i'm i am what used to be called an eisenhower republican uh -huh. and both parties are to the far right of me and i'm at this point more of an observer than a participant and a lot of the analysis that I come up with, people get mad when they hear it. Mm -hmm. Because <clears throat> when you don't have a horse in the race, 
you start becoming more objective. Okay. When you have a horse in the race, you're all emotionally involved with your side winning. Mm -hmm. Well, you must have some horse in the race concerning your own survival, right? Or say for things like women's issues, women's rights, I would think you would have a horse in the race concerning that. Okay, my personal beliefs are that there we should all be on an equal footing regardless of race or gender or gender preference. That's obviously not what the majority practices, but it's still what I would what I espouse. Um, I espouse freedom of religion, that you can be whatever you want to be as long as you're not hurting others. Um, I espouse freedom of sexual orientation as long as you're not touching underage kids. Uh, um, I have very much a live and let live kind of thing. My personal survival. Um, I've been dead seven times. Mm-hmm. And I hurt a lot of the time. <laughs> that, and I'm that's that's how you know point, you're alive. Yes. Yeah, that's how you know you're still alive is the body hurts. And I'm, I'm kind of almost to the point of I wish that they would just let me stay dead. I don't understand why they didn't. So it's it's okay. I I am here and I apparently have a job to do. So I'm still plugging along and I'm not engaged in suicide, but you know, if if it happened, I wouldn't be opposed to it. <laughs> what, suicide? No, just not waking up in the morning. Mm-hmm. Um, um I will tell you though that being put back into the body hurts oh. just as much as being taken out of it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it can. It can. Mm-hmm. So I would just assume that next time they let me stay gone. Mm-hmm. So, um, but I'm not planning on rushing it. So um, I do take care of the body to the best of my ability, but I'm not. I'm no longer sweating the small stuff. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense to you? Of course. I mean, I'm 65. I've watched a lot of shit go down. I've watched the entire world change. And not some things were for the better, but not all of them were. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's just... <sighs> when you tell... When you're looking at the world, and I still believe in there is an objective reality, and I'm seeing so many people that want to slide into their subjective reality and and pretend that's all there is, and I'm getting to where it's like, you know, you really believe your subjective reality, do us all a favor and don't don't test it by stepping out in front of a Mack truck. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. You know, mm-hmm. I, I have acquaintances who believe that they can do that and survive it. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, please don't. <laughs> 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 you know, seriously, it's it's not good for the truck drivers. <laughs> No, no, it's it's not. And it makes the insurance go up and all the rest of that. Our man, Derek Talley, could help us to uh, uh, explain all that. And uh, he would, uh, you know, talk a bit about the troubles of being a truck driver, dealing with people who jump out into traffic or something of that nature. Mm, uh, Yeah, uh, I I have a, well, my partner's daughter is mm -hmm. married to a truck driver. And I've heard some real horror stories from him. And I have the utmost respect for these people. It's a tough job. Yes. Yeah, very much so. And uh, so um, you've uh, been here for a while and you've uh, talked about a number of things. Uh, I'm almost getting ready to talk, but honestly, I don't think I've uh, really gotten together enough of uh, 
an idea of what's going on in uh, the world around us. I'm, I've certainly been looking through a lot of my old books and uh, drawing forth a lot of uh, materials on some of the history of uh, today uh, that I'll be uh, covering. But, you know, do us a favor. And uh, Jameson, which, which are you old, with us? Which, which yeah. old books? Oh, too many to count. I'll give you the title soon enough when I begin the monologue. But uh, yeah, yeah, Jameson, uh, if you're with us, I want you to hold an organic conversation with uh, Penny. I think the two of you are okay in terms of your chemistry. And uh, so uh, why don't you, <laughs> yeah, why don't the two of you do that? I'm going to take off my earbuds for a few minutes, and I'm sure the two of you can handle this. Uh, and uh, you actually do quite well. Most of the time, keep the numbers up. So, uh, in fact, you you have so far uh, done so. Uh, so just keep doing that. Uh, I'm, I'm here. Uh, just the earbuds are off for a little bit. Breathing, going to do some breathing exercises and get myself ready to, you know, like I said earlier yeah. before you came on, Penny, when I start talking, I suck all the oxygen out of the room and everybody has to leave or they're all going to suffocate. So at that point, you know, the <laughs> people have to maintain their safe distance at the other end of the uh, bandwidth and listen. And uh, that's about all they can do because I'm steamrolling everything. So, so while okay. I build myself up, psych myself up to do that, um, you guys take it away. Hello, Jameson. Ah, shit. Oh, shit. That's inspiring. Jameson! Ah, shit. Oh, oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, the, uh, what do you call it? The, um, the button on this, uh, on this headset was blinking and I had no idea. Uh, but you oh. could hear us, right? You, you could. Yes, hear, yes, yes. I could hear you. There we are. How's okay. It? Yours. <laughs> Keep. All righty. How's it going? It's actually going pretty well. I'm just tired. Ah, uh, we have well, this, uh... it's it's uh, it's ten minutes to eleven here. Oh, okay, and it's, uh... I I already did one show. Yeah, uh, it sounded like uh, well, race relations would always get people shouting. It's it's one of those things where um. Uh, it, it's it's one of those things that does that that does that politics seems to do that and mm -hmm. oddly enough religion seems to do that which I mean, and, and gender relations also does well yeah oh yeah. yeah yeah that does as well yeah good point so yeah there's there's four categories that I generally try to avoid on my own show because people become overly emotional and don't interact well well yeah yeah there's well again it's 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 sort of difficult i guess uh for some <laughs> at, at times for people to keep a objective mindset about certain things because you know i suppose these things are part of people's physical identities <laughs> so so i mean it, it's understandable um but at the same point, you know, if, if, if one's trying to drive home a point, it, it pays to, you know, be as patient and let the other person speak and not, you know, well, I'm sure I it was. Haven't, I haven't found that I've made any headway at all once people start yelling. Oh, no. Once once people start yelling, it's 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 over. It's um pretty much. Yeah. At that so, point, they're lost in the rage, and that gnosis of anger is just is just flowing through them. Yeah. And at that point, it's just war. It's just I'm going to win, you're gonna, or you're gonna lose, and it's just it's just trying to drive the other person down. And and that's I guess that's just part of uh, the idiosyncrasies of being trapped in these human. Uh, tombs, if we will. <laughs> you know, I've I've been public for five years, and I've I did counseling years before that, and before that I did home health care, which involved a lot of counseling, and people once they get angry. They don't even hear what you're saying. It, at that point, it becomes a simple dominance. 
And that seems to be our core level that when we get to the point where we're backed against the wall and we think we have no other options, we go straight for wanting to dominate. This is true. And I suspect some of this has to do with how young consciousness as we experience it now is, you know, if I, I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, idea of the uh, theories of the bicameral mind and how that's broken down within the last thousand years. And we just sort of recently developed what we would call consciousness as we know it, where we can refer to things as I and me. So, um, I, I've been watching, well, I've been reading a lot of the ancients, but in English translation, and reading a lot of their work, I think the culture as a whole has gone downhill, that, that the ancients had a more conscious awareness of themselves as part of reality and more of a gestalt of themselves as part of the human human race and I think a lot of that has been lost now it may be just that the books that are left are by their top people and that the masses were just as ignorant as the masses are now. I think that might be the case. Um, because uh, I think uh, back then the elite were the ones who were the educated. Uh, most people just had to be able to push, sort of plow, uh, you know, basically work fields and stuff. So mm -hmm. I don't, yeah, I mean, I, but I would tend to think that, you know, we can see a sort of, uh, well, there are some examples that stand out, like, um, for example, where um, I think one of the, one, one of the, uh, one of the things cited is usually the Iliad, which is, which they say is one of the oldest, uh, one of the oldest things they were able to translate. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and what they find is that it seems like the people, um, the people are always uh, interpreting the gods as make, making them do things. Whereas now, you know, we have sort of like a conscious controller or, or like a conscious control. So I wonder if a lot of the degradation we're experiencing might be part of the, you know, nuances or, or might be some of the quirks that of a consciousness that's still real in a very real sense evolving within us. Because I, I, I mean, yeah. Um, ancient man and modern man are as different as night and day, comparatively speaking. Um, in that context, <clears throat> there was an article in a in an online magazine several months ago about the uh, Russian Federation was taking DNA from some of these Scythian burial sites and were trying to clone them. Yes, and, I recall and that I, article. And I thought about that at the time of those people are going to be so disconnected from time because if nothing else, they, ha they have no genetic resistance to the diseases we have now um, because the, only the survivors reproduced. That's true. And uh, not only that, their brain structures are going to be very different from uh -huh. what we see in, in modern man. So having be, them trying to communicate with these so-called uh, ancient super soldiers that they wish to create is, is going to be yeah. something for the world to uh, marvel at. You know, I, 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 I honestly think their idea is idiotic. Uh, I think it's cruel. 
it's cruel it's idiotic and it borders on the blasphemous honestly it's it's just uh it's beyond cruel but the the problem just, is, just because they can doesn't mean they should yeah and this is the problem and this is something that we need to drive home to the audiences again and again about russia is that well, if it's if it's the, cruel and they can do it they will do it <laughs> well the articles about about DNA modifying humans to become super soldiers. Those have also come out in the last few months about um, France, China, and now the United States. And when you start looking at these articles and you think about, you know, if they're talking about they're doing it, then it's been in the works for at least 20 years. So how long have they actually been producing these people? and if the American media is blaming it on the French and the Chinese how long have the uh, Americans been doing it too good point because America loves to project its flaws upon other states exactly um, and, and, and that, that I'm is... glad you picked up on that <laughs> oh, oh yeah we, we have a history uh, well, I'm not going to say we because uh, in this conversation I'm an observer. Not, I'm not mm. going to consider myself a the epitome of America. I'm certainly not. I'm here by circumstance, not by choice. <laughs> uh, I was born here. <clears throat> I was as well. I was as well. I was born here. My parents were born here. My grandparents were born here. My ancestors immigrated in the 16 and 1700s. My family has been here a very long time. Uh, uh, we were exiled, I believe is the proper term. Where were you exiled? Where, uh, where was your family exiled from? Scotland. Ah, Scotland. Well, some of them were Scots, some of them were Jacobin, Jacobites. They were supporters of the Stuarts, um, which was unpopular when Cromwell was in charge. And uh, others that managed to stay behind became part of the Scottish Covenanters. And they also went through a period of time where they were unpopular and were asked to leave. Some of them went to North Ireland and came to America from there. So my father kept swearing he was Irish and he looked Hispanic. And I did, he's actually why I did the family tree was to figure out where his dark skin color came from. And I finally found it um, in about 1700, um, there was a man named Charles Parks who was, um, he was a fur trader, etc., and he became a representative for the English government of the Virginia Commonwealth or whatever they were calling it at the time. And he was their representative to the Cherokee Nation. And to live there, he had to have a Cherokee wife. And I'm descended from her. Ah, oh, interesting. So that's where my dad got his dark skin. And yeah, I did finally figure out where it came from. So... Uh, yeah. Uh, now, when you did your uh, family genealogy, did you use like one of those? Uh, would you? Did you? Uh, did you like pay thousands of dollars, or did you use? One yes, of those? I have paid thousands of dollars. Wow. I started on ancestry in two thousand five, and I have paid thousands of dollars for my membership, and I did the medical DNA last December and finally got my results last month. 
and the DNA backed up the family tree 100%. So my family didn't lie about who daddy was. That's because uh, I actually... That's had actually one. really unusual because most families do. Ah. Now, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> my, my mom actually used Ancestry as well, but we only paid like, it was only like $80 for the test at that time. So I, uh, I, I wonder if the more expensive ones are, are going to be more accurate. Uh, they test for more things. Um, I wanted the medical version because I know what my family tree said I was, and I know there are certain genetic diseases that go with that. And so I wanted to know which variant I had, which variant I had passed on to my sons. The genetic disease that my kids have comes from the Stewart family, of which I am one of them. So um, that's why my family were Jacobites, is because we were stewards. Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, the deposed it's... king's family. So. so so you're able to trace your family heritage back all the way to the, uh, I, I guess I would say the ruling bloodlines and whatnot. That's interesting. Yeah, there are there are records of the ruling bloodline going back quite a ways. I'm not sure how accurate hmm. they are farther back, but um, yeah, um, I have traced it far enough back that deity names have shown up. Um, and I sat there and I just stared at it and go, uh-huh, okay, that person is supposed to be in my tree. So I'm going to assume that that's a human person that was named after the deity. Yeah. And, just, <laughs> and just leave them. <laughs> well, they, I think they did do, they did, they did do that in, in, in uh, ancient times. Uh, I guess some well, rulers would be named after certain deities. Well, how many guys named Jesus are there, you know? Oh, Mexico has tons of them. <laughs> I have. Because royals married other royals. That's a concept that, you know, I had to deal with. Okay? Because yes. my Scottish royals married other royals. I ended up with ancestors all over the place. All over Europe and the Middle East and as far east as India. And those people, actually, the people in India actually showed up on, on my DNA. Surprise, surprise. The Native Americans didn't, but the people from India did. <laughs> so I'm looking at it and going, okay, I've already tracked these people. That so and so married so and so married so and so whose father was from such and such, and you go back four generations, and they married this princess from Gupta, India, and that princess from Gupta, India, her DNA is still in me, three thousand years later, and I'm like, okay, but the twenty American Indian mothers in my tree none of them showed up at all why you know apparently it's luck of the draw so when you have a child they get half from mama and half from daddy and it may not be a representative section by the way, I'm just uh, hearing you speak about this. When you had um, all the children born with hyperplasia, did it ever occur to you that uh, your genes had been uh, violated uh, in some way uh, by uh, the powers that were exploiting you? 
I didn't then, and I did not at that time know what my family tree was. As far as we knew, this one in 5,000 people gene just happened to match up with me and the dad. And I didn't even know what my family background was at that point. Now, the first time that I had regression hypnosis, it came out then that my DNA had been modified by something called military laboratories. Mm-hmm. And they are a branch of the OSS. Mm-hmm which was supposed to have been shut down 10 years before I was born. Mm -hmm. But probably hasn't been. Probably just went dark. (laughs) Yes, off the books. It's very common. Mm -hmm. So, um, for listeners, Military Laboratories was the OSS version of the CIA's DARPA. So, um, the, and oh, oh, I, wait, I'm, I'm, uh, oh, oh, you mean the OSS became well, it began to function as the CIA's DARPA, yes. So. Uh, my understand, remember, we talked about the, the, the lady who uploaded my file mm-hmm. came on my show, mm-hmm. she said, she said that my packet came from the OSS. Okay. In the 1970s. Right, right. Uh, but by the way, we're we're back on your biography again. Not that I'm uh, not that I'm antithetical to that. But how did we get here again? <laughs> Talk, talking about the DNA stuff, family trees. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in, in, in and questions, and I'm answering, and I'm haven't talked about the other stuff. The other stuff. Oh, by the way, so um, did Jamie tell have, you about his have... DNA test? Oh, Not yes. yet. Oh yeah, I didn't go into that yet. Um, yeah, I'm. Uh, well, it's it's. I, I I can easily just show you guys. Um, of course, that's on the other computer. Oh. Uh. Okay, what I can do is I could send an email to myself and I'll retrieve the email on this laptop and then I'll send it to you, show it to you guys. <laughs> which 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 is uh, easily doable, I think. It's okay. The audience isn't going to see it anyway. Well, I mean, like, uh, why, why would he care about the audience seeing it? I mean, he doesn't give a shit. I mean, this, <laughs> this no, is I like, really don't. We're, yes. we're on air. We have how many people listening? So what? I mean, like, hey, look, all our enemies are listening anyway. Uh, his uh, gang stalking has increased by orders of magnitude since his affiliation with myself. Uh, they know everything yeah, about it. That's surprising. Yeah. It would have happened if he'd been affiliated with me, me too. No doubt. And, uh, so, Arguably, it happened before my affiliations with either of you. Right. Well, take a look at... Awesome. Um, you yeah. can't blame me then. Yeah. Yay. Yeah, yeah. I'm just one of those poor random fuckers whose name they pulled out of the lotto hat. And they were like, okay, yeah, watch this guy because well, we got nothing better to do. <laughs> Dr. Yeah. Duncan said that the folks chosen for that program were people that were nobodies that would not be missed. And he tried really hard to convince me that that was why I was chosen. (laughs) Uh, There there we have that. And so, uh, okay, let's uh, take a look at the chat room before I dive into uh, monologue. Dr. Duncan's a real person. Totally unrelated. Dr. Duncan. As opposed to, did you think I was thinking about Somebody else <laughs> named Duncan, like Duncan O'Finian or something, or yeah, <clears throat> who knows? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's no, no, I, not really. Uh, the um, uh, you, how would I say this? It, it brings to mind some other stuff that's going on, but I'm not, you know, not going to discuss that right now. The uh. How would I say this? Uh, you know, there's there's a lot that you bring up that brings a lot of things uh, to my mind. 
Uh, it, by, by the way, well, you we, know, we, we have we have kind of overlapping territories. Yeah, of course, of course, this goes without saying. What uh, did um, did uh, did you ever run into Lorian Ann Fenton? No. Oh, okay. Does the name even ring a bell? It sounds vaguely familiar, but I can't place it. Okay, no big deal. Just asking. Just curious. And uh, so uh, aside from all of that, uh, I, I want to thank both of you. I'm going to do my best to uh, live up to my responsibility from this point in time for the rest of the evening. We have a little less than six hours left, about uh, five and, uh, y you know, uh, three quarters of an hour theoretically something like that and uh i guess i'd best uh start and um what i'll um start doing is uh getting into an incredibly difficult subject for me and uh it's just something that i've been trying to avoid but before i do that of course i'm going to have to uh do the average solicitation and uh at some point of okay. course i'll start uh, i'm sorry I just said, okay, Yes. if you'd yes. like for me to leave now. Oh, I? oh, oh, no, I mean, uh, what I will, uh, you know, I, I'll certainly um, welcome you to retreat into slumber because certainly you've earned it. You've yeah. earned your rest. Uh, and Jameson Reese is providing us an image. I presume this has something to do with his uh, with his uh, genetic test or something. Oh, uh, what oh, is it? Yep. Okay. Yeah, that's that. Yeah, that's the genetic test. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, the my, my my folks can't figure out why the hell Eastern Europe and Russia is even there. <laughs> so it's, what do you make of that, honey? And why or why the Baltics is there? Because they don't. Because my mother and father both don't have that, and they are my biological parents. Mm -hmm. So um, it's it's probably just uh, if you're not paying a thousand dollars for the test, they give you the shit version. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, and uh, so, honey, why don't you respond to that and talk about what that brings to your mind? It'll give me just another break for uh, <laughs> another excuse to ward off living up to my responsibilities to my listeners for a few minutes. Okay. Then I'll be back and, and take over. Okay. All right. I get so to find mine and pass it along right but burn bandwidth while you do it uh, talk while you do that or Bur jameson you oh can burn you bandwidth. mean talk yeah okay. yes that's right okay yeah. and, and jameson you can make up jokes um, about how you were considering putting a cat's dna in and sending it oh to yes, yeah, yes 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 that's right i wanted to um did you really do that i wanted to because 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 what happened was uh my mother had gotten a test and she wanted my either my she she wanted my sister to do the genetics test. My sister was like, "No, I'm not going to do it." And so she actually, my brother wanted to do it. And he said, "I do. Oh, no, I don't want to do it. I don't believe in that stuff." So, <laughs> so um, long, so long don't story short, don't believe in that stuff. Oh well, yeah, he he just doesn't want to do it because he doesn't think that you know the government can be trusted with that information or whatever. I I, I really I figured I, I, that the government already had it. It was my turn. Yeah, yeah, I. That's 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 the logic I would attribute to it. You know, they already have it. They they really, and they probably don't care to be quite honest. Um, but uh, so my idea was going to be um, just to see if this test was accurate. I was going to send like one of my cats um, spit or spit up from one of the hairballs <laughs> and, and put it in there. That's a lot of money to test the cat. <laughs> Uh, and I was going to put it in there as if it was human spit and whatnot, you know, maybe mix it with some human spit and see and see and see what they pull up in <laughs> as their uh, genetic estimate and to see if they could, uh, you know, to see how accurate what their testing was. You know, it was just something I was going to do that was going to be quirky because my mom had already spent the money on, the, on getting the test sent to her. So I was like, we might as well test something. Yeah. And uh, it it would it would be funny to see what they came back with if they even said this is not human. <laughs> Honestly, that that was what I was hoping to get when uh, <laughs> when they did the original test. I was hoping not human, you know, or something else. But that was back when my 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 mind was really messed up. And it was uh, it was so messed up that it 
that I honestly believe aliens and shit like that. Well, that was a very dark time for me. Okay. Yeah, well, mine, mine, the initial stuff came back all British mix and Northern European. So. Ah, I see. Yeah. And the ancient ones, it came back Scythians and Persians. So that's consistent with the family tree as well. There were traces of other things, um, North African and India, and I think a little bit of, of Native American. But uh, I had ancestors in the tree from Spain, so North African is not unreasonable. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Because so, there were the Moors. The, re the results I got were consistent with my tree, which is saying, you know, the mamas didn't lie as a general rule, which I understand that to be rather rare. So, um, something... Something like uh, uh, at least a quarter of the babies are not actually the husband's child. And I personally think that's pretty sad. Wait, wait, a quarter of whose babies aren't the husband's child? The babies in the hospital, babies born, almost a quarter of them are not the husband's child. Yeah, that, 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 that's that, life. <laughs> that may be life, but it... it it's pretty sad from my point of view. Um, well, I mean, unless the husband's a really nice guy and doesn't mind taking care of raising someone else's kid as his own. Um, and, and, and there are cases where that, that is the case, you yeah. know, and, and that's, and that's a good thing. Cause, uh, um, yeah, the man I'm with now helped me finish raising my youngest. So, and you know, that, I was really grateful for that. I had a 16-year-old when I moved in with him. Ah, uh, teenagers. So, oh, that had to be a, a challenge. A teenager that was intersex and hostile. <laughs> so he earned his... This man earned his keep. <laughs> yeah, I could not imagine what raising a kid would be like. And I don't want to... Oh man, that's that's uh, that, that's something I would. I well, you definitely have bravery. Yeah, well, I raised three of my own and four, helped raise four stepkids, and ended up divorcing the last husband whenever my youngest was sixteen. And I ended up moving in with Lou, and I've been with Lou for twenty years. So he's a very brave, strong man who has gone through hell with me, and I'm grateful he's here. Wonderful. And so happy for you that you have that. I mean, it's so positive, and I'm glad the two of you were able to exchange your genetic recipes, so to speak, and uh, kind of see where both of <laughs> Yeah, we, we exchanged our genetic recipes in chat where the public doesn't get to see it. But, uh, <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> though, of course, I, I see no reason why that would be necessarily an issue. That's that sounds like you have an actual uh, confidence that uh, what your uh, genetic uh, composition is, is of uh, some importance in the sense that it can be used against you. I certainly don't. Uh, they, they can they can. Uh, well, I know you can... don't. I, I, yeah, <laughs> by, by me. <laughs> no, um, With... I did not have contact with any secret societies until after I did my family tree. Uh-huh. Okay. And, and then suddenly, so, so that all triggered them? The fact that you were looking for your roots kind of triggered them to, to you or something? I, I was looking for my roots, and I connected up with a line that was being watched. Mm -hmm. And... From that point on, I have been contacted by eight different groups. Mm -hmm. And um, some of them have been kind of scary. 
I can imagine. Yes, you've you've alluded to that before, but uh, it definitely. Uh, thank you for sharing what you have uh, on this program and buying me some time to get my act together and uh, love you dearly. Uh, so uh, we'll be um, speaking again, obviously, on Saturday, and uh, mm-hmm. we'll see where our conversation organically goes. Always understand, of course, that's the middle of my night. And, uh, and of course, uh, you'll be calling me on Skype, or Daryl Neely will be calling myself on Skype. I'll uh, make yes. certain that I'm available uh, about a quarter of an hour, 15 to 10 minutes before the program so we can make certain everything works out as well as it can, considering. Mm-hmm. And uh, if past is prelude, everything's going to fuck up anyway. <laughs> and you and I will. That is probably to be expected. And hopefully at this point, we will have some sort of, of disposable computer we can use. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> and uh, so... <sighs> All right. And uh, as it is, I'll just roll with it and um, we'll just. Uh, and what, whatever I can rescue of salvage of the recording will be uploaded to my YouTube. OK, right. And you were able to salvage most of it last time. Pretty remarkably. Right. I mean, wasn't that yeah, the case, James? I, yeah. You, you yeah, were listening. Yeah. To, yeah. Yeah, I was able to uh, I was able to access it in parts and I was able to hear the entirety of the uh, broadcast. Right. Yeah, well, I think there were places where we lost about five minutes twice, mm-hmm. okay. and that that wasn't bad. You there was continuity to the the dialogue. Mm-hmm. Yes, and uh, there we have that. Well, love you dearly, honey. Mwah. You have a blessed night. We'll be speaking again yeah. soon, and uh, thank you again. So with that, I'm going to start solicitation. We'll be counting on uh, James and Reese to uh, uh, break myself if needed. Uh, hopefully, um, he'll just uh, inform me whenever he takes off and uh, let me know when he's back. Now, we have, uh, at this point, uh, more like five and a half hours left. And uh, so let's start with solicitation. One among the creepiest true crime tours in America is the Tucson Murders' True Crime Tours. The Tucson Murders' True Crime Tours provide us historic crime investigation into forgotten lost crimes in Tucson, Arizona. These small private tours are hosted by the Mr. Baron, well, Ben Baron Astenius, a true crime researcher, or the Baron Benistenius, actually, true crime researcher and uh, in, uh, enthusiast who will personally take his thee to real historic crime locations related to these crimes in Tucson. Relive these events and hear the untold stories behind the stories. The Baron Ben specializes in the seemingly ever-developing case of the late serial rape killer Charles Howard Smitty Schmid Jr., alias the Pied Piper of Tucson, an aftermath to her. Uh, see theunfinishedman.com for excerpts from the yet-to-be-published book by that very title, The Unfinished Man. And, uh, of course, uh, there you can also review excerpts from the screen productions of, uh, the cinematic productions, rather, of uh, Mr. Uh, Ben Astenius. And uh, that is all available at theunfinishedman.com. But... Other cases, such as the strange case of Morris Brady, the Dr. George Marvin Tejadin case, and the Red Rapist are also within his repertoire, as in fact are all the crimes that uh, shocked the Southwest throughout the 1960s, the very decade I myself entered this veil of tears. These devastating crimes stained a city so deeply... They may never be removed. For tour information, contact the Tucson Murders.com. Mm. Spell that like Tucson, T U C S O N, and put the word the in front of it. The Tucson Murders.com or telephone the Baron Ben uh, privately to personally guide your tour at 1 520 forward slash 323. 323- Three four zero six. That's fifteen twenty three twenty three thirty four zero six. And uh, aside from that, subscribe to the Man of the Soil YouTube channel. 
And again, uh, we dedicated the latest transmission uh, before tonight's to Joel Tai for the wonderful contribution of 250 United States dollars out of Albany, New York. Uh, the same general uh, urban vicinity, well, the same city that uh, Lena Shea lives in. It's her birthday today, so a shout out to her and happy birthday. Uh, and of course, a shout out to Eric Lastick, who uh, gifted myself 25 United States dollars, and he donates a quarter of 100 United States dollars regularly, once a month. And a uh, very wonderful individual, and I thank him for his dedication in that regard. He's effectively a sponsor, and I invite other people to join him to maintain myself in the months and years to come, uh, well, months at least. <laughs> and uh, with that, we uh, want to give a shout out to our dearest brother in battle, Pac-1 Morales, uh, the man with a story that rivals any reality television indeed. His uh, biological father is a reality television star uh, that uh, was in Shark Tank for his inventiveness. Mm. And um, that wonderful individual mm, shared so much with us on the Mother's Day episode that um, it's one of those things that um, as you'll just have to listen to it. And so uh, let me um, take a quick look at the uh, date of the Mother's Day episode. And that will, of course, uh, bring us back into a kind of um, reality that... Uh, is, uh, how would I say it? Um, it's very hard indeed. Uh, that um, has close to a thousand views. Bring it up to a thousand and beyond. And that was streamed uh, four weeks are gone. Um, and uh, you'll see the um, photographic image uh, embedded in the thumbnail of live stream on that episode of my late and sainted Cyrus, the woman who delivered me into this veil of tears. Uh, from out of her uh, womb. And um, uh, that uh, lovely lady is, of course, Diana Dietrich. And um, she's wearing Manchurian uniform. Uh, don't think of it for even a moment as some kind of Soviet uniform. That is a Manchurian uniform. Uh, and uh, with that, of course, uh, you check that out. And um, the exact date is... Uh, um, May 9th of 2021. That's when it was live streamed. And so um, yeah, just look up the episode from May 9th of 2021. And we've got Father's Day coming up soon enough, which just brings tears to my eyes. And oh my God, I've got to prepare something for that. Oh yes, people were asking about the um, uh, photographic uh, image that's embedded in thumbnail of tonight's live stream. And that, of course, is myself uh, wearing my mother's clothes and uh, giving yourselves a, uh, a look at uh, myself with my eyes, of course, uh, very red, uh, the Kawasaki syndrome manifesting very strongly these days, almost constantly at times, and uh, certainly for far longer periods of the day and actually into the day and under some sunlight, which it's never done in the past before. But my mother warned me this would happen as I took up uh, more blood drinking or, or made blood a greater part of my diet. And uh, so uh, let me check here. I got some uh, wonderful messages coming in. One of them from Ziggy Ram Daz. And you know, I should give him more of a, a shout out uh, more often because Ziggy Ram Daz is one of the best. And he uh, has always uh, been following myself for ever and uh, a wonderful human being and uh, so he says triple d dropping truth bombs thank you for that uh, wonderful comment and uh, that of course uh, we had a show very recently that was very popular and uh, that was two weeks ago uh, and uh, that was simply a day that was of no particular historical significance as uh, came to mind in terms of its date. Uh, every date, of course, there's only 365 days in the year. Every day is of some historical significance. It's simply some are more accessible than others in terms of their significance historically. But I couldn't think of anything consciously that day. And uh, so that episode is, uh, its subject matter is somewhat lost to my mind. 
but it's a very popular. And I know I was talking to Peter Moon for quite some time during that episode. Now that Jameson Reese is back with us, I will um, certainly get to the business, to the task at hand, live up to my responsibilities to my listeners and uh, just get with it. Now, of course, I want to uh, remind people uh, we are now entering in half an hour here on the Pacific Coast, the death day of Alexander the Great, historically. Um, everywhere else in the United States, uh, to the uh, uh, east of the Rocky Mountains, is uh, already in uh, Alexander's death day as a uh, dated uh, affair. Mm. And, of course... Uh, Jameson Reese says we have the devil's moon to war- mourn him with, the eclipse. Thank you for reminding us of that. And, of course, tonight was the night where I doubt that they're still on. We were running up head uh, to head with uh, competition with uh, George Hosato Takei. Uh, he was uh, born uh, as such. He uh, later changed his name uh, to... Uh, simply um, George Takei, or that's how people know him. But his middle name is Hosato, just so that you know. And uh, he was, of course, the Star Trek franchise character Hikaru Sulu. So I'll explain a bit about what he was up to uh, tonight, what he was talking about, and hopefully that will give everybody a, a kind of a um, uh, an idea of what they may have missed and, um, y- you know, and what you didn't miss. But I did promise everyone that I would speak about the UFO reports. So we will mark this time, 11.33. This is uh, what we're going to uh, timestamp, and uh, that will be uh, several hours into um, the transmission. And I'll remind myself to uh, present that to Peter Moon uh, as the um, so that he can review that at his leisure, which it won't be long. And then um, soon enough, uh, within a day or two, I'll be handing the transcript to uh, both uh, George Knight and Peter Moon and everyone else in Team Dietrich, and they can work with that. Now, um, it, this deals with the secret that this UFO report exposes. And um, uh, all, all that's called this UFO report, um, y- you know, this consists of just reams of materials. But to condense it in terms of what their uh, basic message is, the bottom line of their message, uh, remember that you're going to be hearing it sometime later this month when Congress is expected to receive a detailed report from the uh, Defense Department. And by the way, our man Jameson Reese has the perfect acronym uh, for what UAP really stands for, not Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon, but United Allied Propaganda. And that makes perfect fucking sense. That's how to take this. But... um, In terms of um, what it really is, well, they're really preparing you for war against the Thousand Year Reich in exile, because what they're opening up you, what they're opening you up for, is the fact that these are not extraterrestrials, and um, so, um, as I said, later this month, Congress is expected to receive a detailed report from the Defense Department and the Office of the Director of National Intelligence that provides, in far greater detail than ever before, what our government knows about unidentified flying objects, UFOs, which they are now uh, changing the title of to UAPs so that they can integrate interdimensional or extra temporal, not out of space, but out of time, uh, visitations where they come out of the fourth dimension and cast shadows in the third, meaning casting three dimensional shadows, but shadows nonetheless, uh, like a holographic image. And uh, this is what uh, we can shoot missiles at and cause no damage at because we're basically shooting at shadows. Uh, This is uh, the kind of um, thing that they will likely expose. Uh, Not the fact that they're dealing with extra 
temporals, but the fact that these are extra dimensional. They will at least uh, y y release that much. And uh, aside from that, they will explain that some of these are biological in nature, and that would include these very amoeba-like creatures that, of course, I've identified as uh, the, the organic dwellers of the skies uh, that uh, have been part of our ecosystem, but mankind has never seen because for all intents and purposes, like uh, airborne jellyfish, they are translucent and transparent. They really become visible only when they're dying and are near death. And uh, so I've gone into some depth about these creatures before. So all of this will likely be brought to the attention of the um, Congress, or maybe not. Maybe they won't tell them shit, and it'll just be a whole lot of uh, flash and bullshit, all talk, and nothing of substance. But um, from what I was able to ascertain myself, the New York Times uh, got an early look at this report that will be delivered before Congress. And uh, so the New York Times uh, wrote what I can only say is a real humdinger of an opening to their story. Let me read their opening paragraph from the New York Times concerning this report. American intelligence officials have found no evidence that aerial phenomenon witnessed by Navy pilots in recent years are alien spacecraft, but they still cannot explain the unusual movements that have mystified scientists and the military, according to senior administration officials briefed on the findings of a highly anticipated government report. Okay. So, based on that information alone, we know that first, there be no evidence that the various UFO sightings or UAP, if you want to go by that acronym, over the years are aliens in the extraterrestrial sense of the word, the non-human intelligence sense. And uh, by that I mean, um, well, fuck, just take, it, take that much <laughs> for now. Uh, second, we know that the United States government is fronting the stance that they have no idea what these aerocraft, or to use another term, uh, aeronautical phenomenon, in fact, are either. <laughs> you don't know. They don't know. Yet, there be no evidence that the various UFO sightings over the years are aliens in the History Channel sense. Hmm. Now, in terms of the point, the two conclusions we can draw based on what the New York Times opened with, it's beyond sort of sketchy. This is what we can say is outright bullshit so discombobulated that there'd be nothing to be gleaned from this or more obviously ask yourself the question how could the government conclusively rule out the possibility of alien spacecraft when they know the sightings did not originate from any American military or other advanced U.S. government technology and they have no way of explaining the movements of these UFOs. Well, your average answer to that from almost anyone, scientifically trained or otherwise, would be, they can't. 
they cannot conclusively rule out the possibility of alien spacecraft when they know the sightings do not originate from us. So here is where, to the average person, the plot thickens, or at least even more than it's been thickening over the past decades since World War II, when everybody began seeing this shit. So when I consult CNN's reporting following on what the New York Times wrote, It reads, U.S. intelligence officials have found no evidence confirming that unidentified flying objects encountered by U.S. Navy pilots in recent years were alien spacecraft, but also have not reached a definitive assessment as to what these mysterious objects might be, according to five sources familiar with the findings of an upcoming report on UFOs that is expected to be delivered to Congress later this month. And it follows that up by saying, according to three of those sources, the report does not, however, rule out the possibility they are alien spacecraft, which candidly, would make us a lot more sense. Uh, Because if the U.S. government, A, does not know what these craft are, and B, does know that they aren't any sort of technology, secret or otherwise, that they themselves have been working on, then it's a very, well, then it's very tough to swallow the conclusion that they cannot under any circumstances be alien or extraterrestrial in origin, the product of a non-human intelligence. But always remember, never allow yourself to forget, none of that means, of course, that these crafts are alien in origin. It's possible that they are the work of a foreign power like Russia or China, but no, really, it's not. (laughs) Or it's possible that our own government is simply not willing to fully open up about the technology it is working on and why. Remember that the government engaged in a massive disinformation campaign over decades aimed at tamping down even the mention of UFO sightings. Now, of course, to be candid on my own part, everyone knows that I am beyond skeptical that there be aliens in the popularly misconstrued sense of the term extraterrestrial intelligences, that is, manning these UFOs that have been seen over the skies over these past many years. But the attempted spinning of this report by the government, and make us no mistake, that's what be happening here, to suggest that we can conclusively say These spacecraft are, or these unexplained, potentially inexplicable, aerial or aerospatial phenomenon are not extraterrestrial in origin. The spinning of that... And as I said, this is the kind of spin George Norrie used to do working for the Navy. To suggest that we can conclusively say that these spacecraft are not of extraterrestrial or non-human intelligent origin does in and of itself seem suspicious, as it is consciously meant to. The truth that this report seems likely to lay bare by anybody working off this and trying to draw as definitive a conclusion as possible 
is that, yeah, as Jameson Reese says, <laughs> that they know what the UAPs or the unexplained aerial phenomenon are, or that there be limits to what we know. And we're going to have to get used to that. But what I can tell you is that it really simply brings us back to, as George Knight would say, why the government fears the thousand-year Reich in exile. So let me read from the post directly that was written by George Edward Knight, in which he says, and this is posted on my Facebook timeline. For those of you who are interested, simply go there and you can review this yourself. He says, why the government fears the thousand year Reich in exile with a question mark. I suppose the title would better be why does the government fear the thousand year Reich in exile? Or he could simply say all governments on earth or most governments on earth. Now, here's how he opens his post. He says, Every single government on Earth is contending with the reality of climate emergency. The Earth is warming up, and our magnetic core is weakening. Our own atmosphere protects the Earth from lethal solar radiation. The magnetic core disbands around the Earth from both poles. That's why we have the northern aurora lights and why all compasses point north. The reality is, the Earth's surface will no longer be habitable in decades to come for life to sustain itself on the surface of our planet. Temperatures will be too high for agriculture and for life to thrive on land. So there be only three alternatives to tackle climate emergency. One option is to counter the effects of climate emergency by reducing carbon emissions using alternative, well, alternative energy sources and free energy that are intuitive and friendly to the environment. The second option is to relocate the human population off the planet and locate itself on other habitable planets with an atmosphere where life could sustain itself. Now, few massive problems with that option our capabilities for relocating vast populations onto another habitable planet, either in our own solar system or another. This option is considered literally impossible by every government on Earth. It would cost extortionate amounts of money and resources even to start and run a program, let alone execute such an operation. And thirdly, he, George Knight uh, says, the only viable and feasible solution is to conduct an operation where every species on Earth has done for billions of years to evade a global extinction event, which as the Permian extinction, which happened some 280 million years ago. This is, of course, the global extinction event. What he's saying is, and thirdly, the only viable and feasible solution is to conduct an operation every species on Earth has done for billions of years to evade glo a global extinction event, such as the Permian extinction, which happened some 280 million years ago. And here, George Knight says, the species and life forms that survived relocated under the ground to escape the deadly atmosphere on the surface. The species have been living under the ground for billions of years. These are referred to as sentient or relic populations. According to paleontologists, this option is the only option every government has concluded is the most efficient and viable. There is only one massive problem every government fears more than anything else and uh here is where the rubber meets the road and our 
dear friend, uh, George Knight says, that um, when he says there's only one massive problem every government fears more than anything else, that is the thousand-year Reich in exile, which has already established itself in these underground cavern systems, which are frequent throughout the Earth, throughout Europe, Asia, Eurasia, the northern and southern uh, Americas, and both polar continents. Now, I wouldn't necessarily say that this is... Yes, and as Jameson Reese says, and that's why our governments teach us to shoot Nazis. Yes, very much so. Of course, as I said, I wouldn't say that there's uh, all that common uh, a uh, manifestation of these lacunae or super cavities in the earth um there's enough of them but um they're uh the ones that are uh habitable uh that are conducive to uh, uh with all the amenities of life this is where the reich has settled and of course uh the thousand year reich in exile uh has sustained itself into an intraterrestrial civilization with a fully functional economy. This exiled governmental power is a true breakaway civilization. The government is contending with the Thousand Year Reich in exile ever since the Reich established itself in exile. The Thousand Year Reich is a power no government on Earth has the technological capability to confront, or rather what he's saying is uh, no government on earth has the technological capabilities to confront the thousand year Reich in exile. The government truly fears this enemy, which we are all still legally at war with. And recently, with the Pentagon report on UAP slash UFOs having forced the government and the military junta to backtrack on itself, Eventually, the government will be forced to admit the reality of the thousand-year Reich in exile. This is inevitable because your government uh, recognizes climate emergency because your world is being destroyed by your government. So this is forcing your government to contend with the enemy, which is the Third Reich in exile that has existed ever since World War II. This is why your government is funding billions into research into global warming and funding scientific organizations into investigating the detrimental effects of fossil fuels and the effects of CO2 and carbon emissions. And uh, he adds, this is why climate emergency is heavily propagandized in the media pumped at you through government agencies because of the reality of the climate crisis and the inevitable effects it will have on the earth and the reality of the enemy the government is well and the reality of the enemy the government will be forced to confront in the future uh, the legal and recognized enemy which is the thousand-year Reich in exile. Unfortunately, this is a fact the world will have to realize and contend with in the future. It does not matter if you believe this or not. What you believe is completely irrelevant. The uh, uh, reality is this is a true fact, which your government recognizes. And reality, everyone will come to terms with in the future, the purpose of me posting this is not to scare anyone. This is not propaganda or a disinformation campaign. This is to educate people on the reality of the world around you and the world you all live in. So, I really am so grateful to our man, George Knight, for that. So, uh, obviously, um, my son's not going to need to, tran to transcribe that. Uh, that's what our man uh, George and I published, and of course, I can talk with him later about a few little spelling errors and maybe some errors in grammar or syntax. But other than that, he did quite well. I'm proud of him. And uh, let me turn towards uh, Sulu, since uh, Sulu was a victim of uh, American internment, and he is a person who can uh, 
with his hopes for man establishing himself in space, he is a man who kind of uh, has everything it takes to serve as kind of a, uh, well, an inter-realm em- emissary. An inter-realm emissary. A goodwill ambassador of sorts. But before I turn to him, let me get our man, Jameson Reese, to come back on so I can just uh, provide myself a little more time for refreshment here. Let me finish chewing on this and get some more calories into myself, make certain I have enough liquid to hydrate myself. Uh, and so, Jameson, come in and uh, speak about some of your observations and what you... Uh, All right. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> so I was... Um... So, so, so I, I, I now remember what me and Salman Sheikh was talking about before Derek uh, cut out. <laughs> um, and, and I was talking about how the uh, person who came closest to making aliens alien, I think, in the true sense of the word, were arguably H.P. Uh, Lovecraft and Arthur Conan Doyle. H.P. Uh, Lovecraft, because these are, because the entities are often. Uh, and instead of being presented to us as as like animate beings like people some of the entities are 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 uh introduced to us as being an entire realm of yes. madness uh, a, a realm that by even gazing upon them they disorient the mind so much as to drive the person viewing whatever it is mad and 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 so i think that makes perfect sense and and I I think that's also why I was so drawn to Lovecraft as far as you know horror is concerned, because I used to really love horror. Um, I grew up reading horror stories, <laughs> so it, it was only natural. And um, I think that was one of the reasons why you know as I mean, despite the fact that he's overly verbose you know, unnecessarily, um, so. Uh, the the fact is he does give us a um, he does give us something that that borders on uh, it's it's something very perceptual it's, it's it's something very like almost interdimensional you know sometimes some of the uh, beings that he he gives us and and so that's something I never saw before um, growing up and watching horror movies and seeing this and that so so seeing that was like a fresh breath of air when I was younger and I was uh, first just first starting to get into his work deeply appreciated and um, I thank you for that and uh, very important and you say oh some of his beings border on the extra dimensional well well that's the very point of his his stories is to show us extra dimensional beings that these are beyond our uh, three-dimensional world really and um, and therefore, the mind is unable to comprehend them any more than if we ourselves were to enter that kind of extra dimensional space or null space, and then uh, where would we be? How would we uh, adapt? There's no up, no down. Of course, there's none of that in hard vacuum. But anyhow, go on. James. Yeah. And then the question is, how would our senses be able to orient ourselves or re- how would our minds be able to reorient uh, what our senses are taking in if our mind is used to dealing with three special dimensions. Now, granted, I'm one of those people who enjoys watching those, you know, extra dimensional math videos where they show you like what the sixth dimension would look like in, in mathematics. And, and you see like the, in, 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 and these things always fascinate me. Um, in fact, that was one of the reasons that drew me, that was one of the things that drew me into chaos magic um, when I was younger was the fact that, you know, they had the Tesseract, and the Tesseract was this mathematical construct that's, like, four-dimensional, and it's like a hypercube, and I was like, oh, that's so awesome, you know? And and so I would, like, I would literally stare at things like that for hours, you know, transfixed, you know? Um, there was even an exercise where, well, I'm, I'm not going to go too much into the uh, chaos magic stuff, but um, j- uh, just to say that, you know, Something, uh, reading something where, you know, you have someone trying and actually, he, the thing about Lovecraft is he was able, he was actually able to articulate it in a way where, while while I'm reading it, I can sort of 
see that this is a that that okay this is something going on this is something extra dimensional and so it's like you know it's ah man it was just like a whole experience reading you know because uh, I'm, I'm one of those people who when i read all of a sudden i'm not looking at letters anymore all of a sudden it's like i'm watching a movie um i don't know if you know some people some people can do that. I've spoken to people who can't do that. And, and, and the fact that they couldn't do it baffles me. But I recently found out that there are a group of human, there are groups of people who, for some reason, do not have the capacity to visualize. I think it's called anastaxia or something. Uh, I can't. I can't quite recall what it is. Let me let me see if I can look it up because it, it 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 was it was something that fascinated me. You know, because you know, for me, it's always been when I was a kid. I uh, sometimes when I was bored, I was I was in punishment so often because I was just a, a bad. I was just a bad brat. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I'm face it. I, I was insufferable as a kid, but, <laughs> but but because of that, I was punished a lot. And you know, when I'm punished a lot, and there's not much to do when you're punished. But you know, especially when you don't have access to your toys and stuff anymore. So I would spend so much time daydreaming, and I would have to create my own worlds in my head and whatnot. So, oh, so that's for very me, similar it, to somebody who's bedridden, like a child who's bedridden because of. Um, being uh, disabled or um, uh, something of that nature. And they spent, um, uh, if they're really bedridden, you spend um, days, hours and hours during your waking days staring at the ceiling. And then you trace out all kinds of patterns in the ceiling and you turn it into a landscape of adventure in your mind. Uh, it becomes, uh, you're like a fly crawling on the ceiling uh, because that's where your mind um, sees and stops. Uh, this is kind of like, um, I, I, I can't say I've had similar experiences per se to an extreme, but I've certainly been there to degree, to degree. And um, in terms of the um, kind of uh, uh, extra dimensionality, the hypercube, uh, Carl Sagan, of course, had his television series Cosmos, where... Um, he introduced myself, along with everyone else, uh, you know, many millions of others. Uh, remember, this was a time when there were only so many channels, and um, you were stuck watching what everyone else was watching. So we all uh, saw Carl Sagan, and uh, he spoke of the Hypercube. He spoke of uh, the fourth dimensions, um, the four-dimensional beings, uh, they could do to us what we do to two-dimensional beings, which is anything we want. Uh, two-dimensional beings to us, um, they have no uh, dimensionality in the sense of uh, depth or height. Uh, they're two-dimensional. So if their circles are squares and their homes, their abodes, their uh, buildings would be simply lines, lines drawn on their two-dimensional world that they could not penetrate their walls. And uh, yet we, uh, if they were between the four lines or more representing their shelter, we could reach into their shelter at will, uh, uh, rip them apart, um, transport them to another part of the flatland in which they inhabit and dispense with them there. In other words, like an alien abduction, uh, take them, uh, transport them uh, to another part of the earth, uh, drop them off, and uh, they're left wondering what happened. Everyone around them is left wondering what happened. Uh, the unfathomable nature of a fourth dimensional being um, in our dimension would be like us over that board of flatlanders. Um, we can put our five fingers on that board and they would appear to these flatlanders as uh, five separate entities and then we could flatten our hand on that board and suddenly they're all one large entity. This is what happens with the extra dimensional craft or rather the extra temporal craft traveling through space and time. Uh, these uh, entities, uh, elements of their craft uh, manifest within our reality and uh, yet they're changing shape, uh, are holographic uh, and uh, anything we shoot at them does no harm. 
No, because it's passing right through them because they are just shadows from a different dimension in ours that is changing shape uh, with every moment, just as we can lay down an arm, an elbow, a hand, any body part on that flatland, and we would be changing shape infinitely as well. Or we could lie down on flatland and uh, just crush everybody and uh, as well, uh, you know, uh, form one supermassive shape that occupies their entire world. This is like the horror of uh, extra dimensionality. And uh, this is something introduced to us by Carl Sagan, who also introduced the hypercube to popular culture and uh, the different directions. Now, before I get into George Takai, uh, just finishing up this tea egg, um, I'll let Jameson get back to saying what he was saying as well about... Um, uh, well, on that tangent, uh, I will say that um, that's... When I first saw those documentaries uh, as a... Uh, I must have been in my teens. And when I first saw the, the documentaries on, like, uh, cattle mutilations and whatnot, you know, when I was probably much older, probably like around 19, 20, whatnot, I was thinking, you know, wait a minute. This, what, what if this is something from, what, what if what's happening is something from a higher dimension just reaching down and messing with these cattle? Just, just, just to give people, you know, just to, just to mess with people, you know? Or, 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 or what if it's some kind of technology that's being used where that utilizes, uh, that's able to go up and, go up a dimension and just pull everything out and you wouldn't see any incision or anything of course not it makes perfect sense and a place where you can see footage of this sort of thing is um uh the channel known as slapped ham of all places uh can show you many such things uh, that will uh blow your mind um a, a lot of it of course is fraudulent and cgi you can tell when the footage is real if you have any sense of expertise in these areas. And uh, certainly I have enough of a sense of expertise in security camera footage and the like where um, there is very real footage of um, automobiles coming out of nowhere in uh, uh, tunnels and just crashing into other automobiles. I mean, literally, like um, changing, lanes, changing lanes from one dimension to another. Um, resulting in head-on collisions, like uh, simply closing your eyes and gunning it. You know, the, the people who are in these accidents aren't uh, intending to cause such, but they've crossed the dimensional barrier. Uh, there's bodies that just drop out of nowhere. You couldn't even say out of the sky, uh, but um, it's uh, very disconcerting and very uh, stressful uh, to review <laughs> that sort of thing, you know, for too long a period of time. Uh, and it's addictive, of course, in its own right. You, you wind it up is. And it makes you realize how unsafe reality is. Yeah. Well, basically, as a construct. What what people what the way people would interpret it these days is they're they're too stupid. So all they can think of is what they see on the two dimensional screen, and so they think of. Uh, you know, the Matrix. And they say, oh, this is reality is a virtual game existence. And uh, this is all the glitches in the Matrix. OK, that's um, uh, it's a useful parallel or analogy when you're performing magic and you're trying to change the world around you. These are, of course, the cheat codes that help you rewrite the fabric of reality itself, since it's all Maya or illusion anyway, uh, which is what you're going to assume if you're practicing magic. So you can rewrite it in your image, uh, but uh, it's it's not that's that's where you take Maya. That's where you take illusion. That's what the word Maya means. Uh, yeah, is, I, is a, I, I like I, honestly I like that analogy better than the than the glitch in the Matrix because I right. think that well, why I hate the glitch in the Matrix so much is that it just plugs the the, the Wachowski brothers. Yeah, thank you, like, thank you. It's, it's, like, it's, it's, it's like those those creatures don't need any more of a plug. Thank Come you. on, thank you. They already made their billions. Mm -hmm. Can we stop? Can we stop riding their coattails? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, so aside from the evil Polish twins, as I call them, <laughs> the twin sisters, yeah, the uh, twin uglies, uh, what, what you've got is a um, situation where you, you, magic uses that parallel to good effect. If, but if you're looking at um, reality, quote unquote, 
uh, then what we see is not a glitch in the matrix. Rather, it is a profound reality of the matrix of uh, of reality, uh, matricial reality. We're in a we're in a matrix of Maya or illusion in the sense that we have to have shared. Uh, uh, consensus of um, of reality or reality itself would conceivably dissolve. That is the argument, of course, of chaos magic, and of the chaosists. And uh, but um, since they're all intent on uh, broaching our consensus reality and have succeeded to such a great degree, um, in that sense, reality is becoming more vulnerable to such. Um, uh, uh, invasions from a uh, other parts of reality or beyond reality where you see that manifest in the footage you see on the Slapped Ham channel, which again, incredibly stupid name. And it's almost like they're just trying to provide you a moment of light fun with the, the pig, the pork being slapped, uh, the, the slap pig that is part of their shtick uh, so that you don't become suicidal watching all this shit uh, because looking at it can to your average person be extraordinarily if not depressing it would at the very least be oppressive and um, so um, the footage that you see of course um, some of this is going to be quite solid people who are uh, maniacal and lost in the wilderness I mean literally physically maniacal people lost in uh, the wilderness of the world um, sometimes presents itself. Other times, um, the, the footage, if you're watching that channel, um, it's, it's far more um, foreboding. And uh, so what you see is simply the, um, the bleeding of our reality, the bleeding. And uh, you begin to realize it's the tenuousness of reality. Uh, but yes. make no mistake, we, we have a reality and uh, whatever... Um, uh, tears in the fabric, whatever, um, um, however threadbare reality is becoming as we have less and less of a consensus of what reality is, uh, then we get these invasions from other dimensions, and that includes bodies dropping out of nowhere, etc. So, uh, yeah, you, you know, Charles, and, yeah. yeah, Charles Fort did a lot of, of cataloging things like that. So, make, and, make this um, point then when you go to Charles Fort, the point to be made is that. Obviously, this has been going on forever. It's yeah, only yeah, now this has we're... gone on. Yeah, this so... has gone on even in medieval times. They had um, uh, they had incidences of things like like raining bodies or yes, raining yes. just the, weird the stuff. The difference is only now we can film it. That is yeah. the difference. And and you know the the best footage you can get is security camera footage and, and and that's usually the best i'm mean, now granted anybody can take something in and, and uh, you, you just fuck with it with cgi d you know there's what they call deep fake but you know none of the stuff on slapped ham is deep fake because that that implies like you know taking somebody's face and putting their face on someone else's and making it look like they're doing something they never did that that's deep fake so that's almost like uh Documents alteration is basically what deep faking is. But um, when you see what you see with, uh, say, for instance, some people just, they just can't accept it. They just can't accept it. And there's things like one of them footage of uh, nighttime security cameras. And uh, the only thing suspect maybe was that there were a lot of security cameras in a single home. But it could be because strange things had been happening and they put the security cameras out everywhere. But this one girl who's a sleepwalker and um, the, I took it as real. She was just basically um, obviously possessed, probably uh, what in classical terms would be diagnosed as a demoniac, meaning possessed of uh, the, uh, the demons. And... Uh, so this young lady was like, uh, well, if you just see the footage, I mean, she's going, walking around in her sleep, but around her, you see like uh, glasses shattering and shit. Okay. That is something like, uh, when I saw that, it was just, it's just too much work for, for people to be hoaxing. It's, it's, it's just too much work to make it worthwhile. 
uh, as far as I'm concerned. And most people don't even think that far ahead. They do something stupid and, you know, when they're faking things, like Doug and Dave, okay? Doug and Dave with their stupid boards, no matter what they do, there's nothing they do. And here's where, <laughs> this is where, what's his name? Uh, Carl Sagan came out as rather stupid, you know? And he says, oh, it's all Doug and Dave doing the crop circles. If you've ever seen Doug and Dave, that what they produce is pure shit. It, it does looks nothing like crop circles. Real crop circles are symmetric. They're uh, the 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 grain or or the crops are not damaged. They're they're just simply bent, not bent like broken bent, bent like you know gently bent, you know as if in the wind, uh, a wind that's not there. But they're bending as if in a very strong wind. Um, but they they're simply. Um, as if the plants were warped so that they are um, folding themselves. And um, that uh, creates these intricate patterns that Doug and Dave could never do. I mean, you it, it's, it's just... Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and there, there's sometimes there's footage where you can see uh, some kind of anomaly in the sky. Um, and it, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it weren't something like a uh, something extra extra dimensional going on, but they could also be spirits of the air. Mm -hmm. I mean, same I thing. <laughs> yeah, really. And um, as I said before, Terence McKenna actually thought of the most logical uh, and appealing uh, concept that these are bookmarkers for time travelers that obviously you create these different intricate patterns in the grain and um that is your bookmarker you know every time you see that you're in the right time and therefore ah. yeah this is how time travelers uh, mark which um what they're what they're aiming for in terms of their uh the their time objective their temporal ob objective so that makes perfect sense and as far as I'm concerned, is uh, uh, explains quite a bit. Now, um, again, still chewing right now, so I don't want people to hear that. I'll go mute for a few minutes while I tend to that. James and Reese will keep us entertained. Uh, well, what I will say on Terrence McKenna is he's worth listening to. Uh, some, I mean, I mean, for a guy who's on shrooms all the time, the guy has some pretty profound insights that I would say. Uh, that I would say uh, make a lot more sense than what people in you, who are trying to be like these new age spiritual spiritualists and whatnot can possibly come up with. Um, he's 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 obviously was a very pretty uh, smart guy. Um, well, in other words, he was, he was still following a logical train of thought. He wasn't going all yeah. over the place and. Um, the whole idea of somebody who's shrooming or uh, engaging in consciousness, expanding drugs is to gain profound insights. That's the the rationalization. So he was probably one of those few people on Earth that accomplished that, <laughs> as opposed to yeah. most people who use it simply for escapism. Yeah, well, most people wind up fizzling out, and then, then they... Uh... Well, they're deluded into thinking they have grand insights. But, of course, whatever they share with you is just shit, you know. With, with most oh, yes, I've, I've met some like that as well. Yeah. I've met some like that as well. And, 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 and what's so interesting is that they would have everyone else around them, like, thinking, oh, my God, this guy is just so magical. And I'd be like motherfucker just give me the weed and let yeah, me go yes yes there you are. <laughs> let's go get a pizza yeah it, 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 it's basically at that level of um dismissal um all right now i'm gonna choke to death on this so let me go mute uh it, it's the um what is it the powder that i use the uh, turmeric inside of the tea once i get to the dregs of the tea um then i'm choking on it so give me just a second to get this uh, de detritus out of my throat uh so james do some talking there we are all right folks i am going to do some talking oh well look look at this um June 1st, 2021, Popular Mechanics. This conspiracy says Hitler had a secret anti-gravity UFO and the U.S. stole it. 
Are they serious? <laughs> <laughs> Did, isn't that something oh, you saw wait. something like that before uh, a long time ago with Popular Mechanics? And it was behind a paywall, so no, so I couldn't see it. Whatever it was, you provided me a link. Oh, oh yeah, that was something else. I think uh, something it, similar. It, it, yeah. it was something similar. Yeah, um, they they just love this. Um, uh, we'll, 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 let's see what they say about it. Um, okay. A new video from military historian uh, Mark Felton included oh, below. Oh shit! Oh, that piece of shit! Jesus Christ! That's that. That's the guy who, uh, when I was talking about uh, the British uh, attempt to bomb Japan with nuclear weapons or their attempt to participate in nuclear war against Japan, that was the guy who was listening to everything I said and stuck up a video while I was talking about it, uh, saying he produced oh, it. That, oh, that's okay, I see. Yeah. That's who. So he's just basically stealing all my t material anyway. It's just you know he just throws up you know all kinds of stock footage that he assesses and uh you know it, it, it's 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 something like uh and he'll he'll just cover any topic he'll, he'll just like take anything like oh here's an interesting weapons development oh here's a little ring here's all this and since he just keeps throwing this shit out uh i think all you need to do is take a look at some of his photographs of himself where he's standing next to a bunch of star wars stormtroopers and really, I think that tells you everything you need to know about the guy. I mean, this is where the guy yeah, is really that's, coming from. It's yeah, just this, you know, he, he doesn't yeah. he doesn't look like a very trustworthy guy. Yeah, anyway. yeah, it's it's just mass production shit that he's 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 tossing out, and uh, he's touched on every subject I've ever brought up, uh, you know. But uh, he just uh, takes it out of context and uh, puts it into these little digestible bits, and without a context to threaten anybody. And besides all that, uh, he's he's Japanophobic, so uh, you know he throws up stuff out there for all of his fans to shit all over the Japanese about how they were oh they were worse than the Nazis, worse than the Soviets, worse than anybody, and, and shit like that. So you know the kind of shit Derek Talley was feeding us when he uh, was coming on that one time uh, to uh, do a book report uh, which was supposed to be about the cult of the constitution and uh, the second amendment freaks uh, and uh, they're going gung-ho about uh, turning it into a, a gun cult religion uh, a religion of death and Moloch that we need to sacrifice so many uh, hundreds of people every year to uh, the great god firearm uh, and uh, instead he came out talking about the Nanjing massacre uh, based on the, uh, the, the work of uh, Iris Chang uh, and then when I started talking about how her husband killed her and he goes oh yeah yeah that's right he started like bringing up the fact that the guy you know, claimed he was finding suicide notes everywhere and shit. You know, like, that's what people do, right? Naturally leave suicide notes everywhere and just kind of change their mind. I mean, that, you know, before they finally off themselves, you know, just bullshit like that. Uh, so what? what's Mark Felton saying, you know, cut loose with it? What the, what's the fucker he, saying? He looks like he would steal your shoes if yeah. you're not. Ha, 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 yeah. <laughs> All right. Adversaries considered the achievements of Nazi scientists and engineers to be so advanced. Uh, oh, wait a minute. I, I, I just skipped like half the freaking uh, story. Um, let me see. Uh, basically, he's going into Operation Paperclip. Mm -hmm. And uh, somehow he's uh, trying to say that. Hmm, let me see. All right, this, some UFO conspiracy theorists believe U.S. forces captured Nazi scientists and even Kamler himself and put them to work on developing Diglock's anti-gravity technology. The last line sums everything up. As the legend goes, this culminated in the so-called uh, Kecksburg incident when a bell-shaped UFO allegedly crashed outside of Kecksburg, Pennsylvania Diglock, in December bell. Yes, go on. 1965. Yes, that was uh, uh, that was one uh, uh, example of the bell. That was a uh, a, a, a bell uh, propulsion unit. Uh, the bell itself uh, propelling and crashing down to earth outside of Kecksburg. So go on. 
Uh, does any of this check out? It's extraordinarily unlikely. For starters, there's one obvious hole in the theory. If U.S. really had access to anti-gravity technology, then where are the anti-gravity planes? Okay, that's in that in the... Yeah, they're all over the skies. They're just German, okay? I mean, this is the whole point yeah. that... What he does is, you see the red herring here. This is what's called the red herring. Is basically when somebody will give you an argument that is obviously uh, not the point of the reality we're witnessing. For years after World War II, we're seeing definitively mechanical craft. We're not yeah. seeing all the biological type alien kind of uh, manifestations we saw later. We're not seeing the extra dimensional stuff mutating in midair. We're seeing mechanical craft. Yeah. Um, all of that is not being uh, reverse engineered by the United States. They didn't know how. It's simply they're too technologically primitive and backwards to uh, reverse engineer what the Germans had produced. So the breakaway civilization... If anything, the first people who would be able to back-engineer it would probably be the Japanese. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It would uh, be them or... They or the Taiwanese. Uh, and and um, for reasons that I've articulated concerning chip technology as an example. So what we have is uh, just basically uh, the Americans just can't touch this shit. The Russians can't. The communist Chinese can't. And so it is where it is. So when someone says, oh, where's all our anti-gravity craft? Well, you know, they're not there because we don't have them. Uh, the Germans do. The, not the Germans on the surface of the world, but those beneath the surface. And so, um, all right, um, just, uh, you know, go on with whatever else the fuckers, right. you know, coming up with. Plus, all right. Uh, plus, many of the SS officials purportedly involved in the quote unquote secret UFO program weren't in any position to actually run it. And NASA attributes the Kecksburg incident to re-entry of a failed Soviet Venus probe, Cosmos 96. Uh, yeah, they, you see, now they're attributing everything to Soviets. That's yeah, really in other words, giving the Soviets everything. all this great power, this great power. They're empowering the Soviets and having people feel that they... Have. Now, uh, the Kecksburg incident, um, what year was that again? Uh, this is 65. Si 65. 1965. Yeah, I mean, really? Really? I mean, the Soviets <laughs> were throwing up just, you know, junk into the sky. You know, Venus probes. Okay. Uh, you know, really? Uh, it, that's like, uh, do you, you can look up when the Soviets sent a Venus probe, and we're talking about the 90s, maybe. It was the 90s when the Soviets sent up a Venus probe that, uh, you know, basically broke down on Venus immediately. Uh, as soon as it uh, got to Venus, it broke down. Um, matter of fact, they sent up uh, uh, satellites to Mars that were taken out immediately approaching Mars. And uh, uh, for the longest period of time, anything approaching Mars was, uh, was taken out. Uh, people can look this up. And so this is why they thought that there was a third moon of Mars, like Fomo, Phobos and Deimos. Very small, very fast, and uh, it was a killer planetoid that was uh, taking out everything sent near Mars, which, of course, is pretty far-fetched in the sense that not, not that there would be another kill, you know, little moonlit of Mars. There's probably more than one, but uh, aside from Phobos and Deimos, but uh, uh, the fact that it would just be on the right orbital track every time to take out anything that came near Mars. Yeah, it's just it's statistically impossible. Yes, yes. And uh, so, uh, but um, uh, aside um, from that, uh, you know, anything else this idiot is saying? Uh, nope. That's about that's about all they got out of him. No. Wow. Yes. It's basically it's, a regurgitation of what everyone knew already. Yeah. Uh, what you, what you're saying was uh, he was pulling everything out of his ass. Well, especially yeah. when it came to the Soviet shit that he's and the government are cooperating on trying to push. Uh, see, this is the Soviets were so powerful, you know, can't keep up with them. Uh, and uh, so, um, 
aside from all of that, I guess I'd better just get started and back into my responsibility. Thank you very much for that. That's actually deeply appreciated. And uh, it is relevant. Let me finish the last of the dregs of this TV. Let's see if you hear me cough while all the uh, turmeric powder and, uh, uh, of course, the you know dust from the tea itself uh <laughs> the, the bottom dregs of the tea we'll see how my throat responds to that mm. Mm. all right and um i can feel that in the back of my throat let me drink some water and, oh. mm. <laughs> so <sighs> all right Let's uh, try and uh, get myself into the um, headspace for this because, of course, when, uh, when I'm talking about uh, <clears throat> uh, George Takai, this is uh, not something that uh, where, of course, I'm attacking him, and hopefully people understand that or, um, you know, arguing with what he has to say. But while I gather my thoughts about how to express this, um, see if you can um, dig up a little something else to fill in airtime for a second and uh, and uh, take us on to that. All right. The numbers Let's... are going up, by the way, so people are enjoying you talking. <laughs> Not that they were down, uh, but you know what I mean. They're, they're going up, so go on. That's strange. It's just, it, I, I find it strange that anyone enjoys me talk. I, I, I definitely don't enjoy me talking, but all right, let's, let's see what we can, uh, let's see what we can pull out of the depths. Uh, it's probably, it's probably because it was, uh, something more organic than me just reading off the, you know, stuff or me just getting straight to the point of the, um, articles, which are usually at the bottom of the articles. So now that I know that, I can just, you know, hit right, hit right down to the bottom. <laughs> that, that sounds awful. Uh, I can hit right down to the bottom, yes. Uh, Actually, yeah, yeah, that does sound pretty bad. Uh, 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 I could he head right to the end of the article. <laughs> there we are. Yes. There we go. Okay. Much, more, much more precise. Okay, um... There's a lot of stuff going on all over the world. Uh, I, I could just like pretty much the headlines seem to sum up everything that they're going to be talking about anyway. So, I mean, we have uh, Biden Johnson to stress close ties, manage differences as of eight minutes ago. Uh, Biden to lay out uh, vax donations, urge world leaders to join. Um, yeah, they sh probably could have been doing that a long time ago, but. Yes, but I mean, at this point, um, by the time by the time uh, India gets any vaccines, uh, there probably won't be very many people left. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> well, they, it's Asian India. I mean, you know, honestly, the, 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 yes. they'll always have a lot I mean, left. Yeah. Well, yeah, Bill. Uh, well, well uh, not, not a lot left would be like maybe hundreds of millions. There we are. There we are. And uh, so. Uh, and <sighs> um, anyhow, so go on. Uh, we have a, a Louisiana police unit probed over black driver arrest. Um, interesting. All right. The same Louisi Louisiana state police unit whose trooper stunned, punched, and dragged Ronald Green on video during a deadly 2019 arrest are now under internal investigation by a secret panel. As to whether they were systematically targeting black motorists for abuse. Well, gee, I mean, what, would common, <laughs> what the hell would common sense tell you? And uh, someone, someone's saying, every time I told him to stop, he'd hit me again, said Aaron Bowman, whose flashlight pummeled. Who, whose, whose flashlight pummeling left him with three broken lit ribs, a broken jaw, broken wrist, a gash to his head that required six staples to close. I don't want to see this happen to nobody, not to my worst enemy. Uh, okay, I guess they're talking about the cops. Um, the cops who... <laughs> The panel began working a few weeks ago to review thousands of body camera videos over the past two years involving as many as a dozen white troopers, at least four of whom were involved in Green's arrest. 
Uh, this review is focused on what Louisiana State Police Troop F, a 66 office unit that patrols a sprawling territory in the northeastern part of the state and has become notorious for alleged acts of brutality that have resulted in felony charges against some of its troopers. Gee, yeah, they, they sick the most uh, vicious... Uh, racist criminals they can on black motorist yeah, thank yeah. You. and and um that and 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 they're try they need an internal investigation to figure that out <laughs> and it's secret <laughs> it's secret yes uh you like that part that's uh and they can secretly come to some kind of conclusion where they draw ranks and say nothing bad happened right I mean, uh, yeah so. yeah i mean i mean I, I i i watched the video of the guy's death i mean he was actually pleading pleading with him and 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 i i swear i heard i i heard them uh bleep out when the uh uh, when the cops were using the N word, mm -hmm. so I mean, I mean seriously, um, it's not, and and they need someone to question whether this was a, a racially motivated. Thank you. I mean, this is, uh, it's awful, and um, yeah, it, I thank you for stressing that, and uh, of course, uh, we need to confront this as a society. In the meantime, uh, I'd best get back to um, it, it, where, so, oh, here we are. Uh, Penny Bradley tagged me in a post. And so um, let me, uh, you know, permit that onto my page. And uh, so let's uh, go over there. Penny Bradley tagged me in a post. And now I have to give permission to add that to my profile. Okay, there we are. And uh, <sighs> there we go. And, um, okay, and already that was hearted by one person, which I presume to be her. Uh, okay, there we are. Oh, Veronica Bartolini. Okay, uh, add her as a friend. <laughs> and uh, uh, with that, she used a the San Francisco's Chinatown gate. Cool, how cute. What a lovely little lady. Uh, and, oh, God, what happened to Mandy? She fell asleep or something? Uh, no, uh, she was charging her phone. And, and she never said uh, anything about uh, what I said about the ghoul the other night, uh, whether she heard it in the background or anything that, uh, you know, it was weird. It was like uh, she didn't want to go there. Of course, I can't blame her. I mean, yeah, I noticed. Uh, I was actually tempted to try to draw a picture based on the dis descriptions you gave. And I, I found it, I found it fascinating, but I figured, you know, I wouldn't show it to you because it brings up such a visceral, you know, traumatic reaction. So it's just, it's just like, yeah, you know, I, I mean, I respect, I, I respect that you're able to go into experiences that, you know, have, I mean, I'm, I, I have no doubt that, uh, um, being, seeing something like that would, would traumatize the hell out of anyone. Shit. Thank you. I wouldn't want to see that. <laughs> okay. And the, um, in terms of the uh, what uh, people I hope will understand is the fact that uh, uh, we are dealing with something that even after all that I expressed, um, our man, uh, Mr. Salman Sheikh, understands that there, this is still a, a sentient species that has been part of our ecosystem, part of our ecology. And uh, that is uh, the best way to understand them. There are people who in the past understood that. And uh, in the ancient past, before um, men came into a greater awareness of themselves. And this is where the book on the bicameral mind has helped uh, James and Reese understand um, so much about our, our processing. How far have you gotten in that book, by the way? Uh, I'm up to the point where they had uh, they had already talked about the Iliad. Um, I'm moving relatively slow because I spent the last few days literally in bed. Mm -hmm. I, I, I kid you not. Mm -hmm. I was just uh, depressed as all hell. Well, this isn't a graded exercise, so <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm just asking how far you have gotten. So my point is that what have you learned about man's processing? before his minds united and he had a greater awareness of himself as a... Well, I learned that 
I learned that that was the role that was taken on by the gods. Uh, so um, the the process of one hemisphere of the brain trying to communicate to the other. The voice is in him, the head. Go yeah, on. Yeah, would convince him that the gods were telling him to do this. He was, uh, or, or that the gods instructed him to do this. And and so the, these were these were very real hallucinations, uh, to the point where you know. In, and this is what I was trying to um, get across to Penny Bradley when I was speaking to her, um, based on what I learned from that. And um, and she said, no, it seems like they were they were more conscious back then, but in fact they weren't as conscious. Con and and this is what I was trying to bring across: conscious is a consciousness as we understand it is a very tiny thing compared to all the unconscious processes that go on to allow us to carry out even the simplest of tasks. So um, consciousness, as we know it, is a relatively novel thing, and I think that a lot of the problem, a lot of what we're going through, as far as the species is concerned, are growing pains to something that's relatively uh, new. I mean, it it, it had to uh, basically it couldn't it couldn't have came into being until we came up with language first. That had to be the driving. That, that was the driving catalyst of, of the development of consciousness as we now experience it. And so I'm, 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 I'm hinging on the idea that um, this potential, that this thing is, whatever it is, is still evolving. Because now we have uh, a new levels of sophistication such as technology to deal with. So I have no, um, I have no doubt that consciousness in the next uh, 100 to 1,000 years, if human beings last that long is going to be something radically different than what we even have now. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, so in, in terms of my point that I was going to make about this, and I thank you for that context, uh, in the days before human beings uh, began with a greater sense of self-awareness, which was present even at the time when we were hearing voices in our head, which we interpreted as the gods speaking to us, uh, there was a time when there wasn't even that level of sentience or communication of the hemispheres of the brain with each the other. Uh, and uh, in that period of time, uh, humanity was in more of an ecological balanced state, ecologically balanced state, uh, Oh, with the ghoul subspecies or the sapient species, and they would give them their dead for them to devour as a, a way of waste disposal. Uh, when we became conscious of ourselves, we began to respect our dead in a sense that we never had before, because the dead represented um, what these people were when they were alive. Now, uh, in terms of our dear friend George Knight, he says, much love unto you, Douglas. So uh, thank you, George Knight. And of course, I really didn't say much about the, the uh, UFO report because there's not much to fucking say. <laughs> Basically, uh, George Knight's exposition was much longer than what I had to say, though, of course, it could use some some spelling corrections and a little bit of uh, clean up with editing for, you know, the semantics and syntax of its various sentences. But other than that, his uh, point is well made. God bless him. And uh, so uh, thank you, George Knight. And uh, with that, of course, in the time we have remaining, holy shit, again, it's kind of like the other night, four and a half hours. We'll see what I can cover. And I may not even get to current events tonight. We may have to uh, save that for next Sunday. So let's get back into something that, uh, like I said, always difficult to dive into. And uh, even though I'll be approaching it from a rather more academic perspective tonight, I'll, I'll get to points where I'm just bringing up shit. <laughs> I don't want to remember. Uh, it'll be coming back into my mind uh, where, you know, inescapably, just unavoidably. The very subject matter will do that. Um, all right. So uh, with everyone who is with us now, don't forget to uh, extend your upvote. God bless you. All of those people that do. I, I thank you all so very much. Uh, all the people who listen to us and in general support us, you're all such wonderful people. And we far, far outnumber uh, those uh, cultists of the uh, Kings of Edom. Uh, who uh, show up just to put their downvotes in and uh, 
uh, and then uh, spend the rest of their night uh, plotting against me. Uh, these are just the, the wretched of the earth and the detritus of creation. Okay. Uh, in terms of what was uh, being discussed by uh, Mr. George Takai tonight, basically, uh, I, I do want people to know that uh, when he got the uh, news of the gay Sulu in Star Trek Beyond um, and uh, said it was really unfortunate, uh, bear in mind this was five years ago, half a decade ago gone by now. It feels like yesterday. Uh, but uh, he, he is, of course, not just an actor. He is, at this point in his life, a director, uh, an activist for, on behalf of the Japanese-American community, what little there is left of it, which is comprised of himself and, you know, uh, a few very old people who are uh, in uh, hospice, <laughs> you know, palliative care. Uh, and uh, I know because yeah, I would take my mother to activities with them after her catastrophic brain injury in the last few years of her life. And uh, so the, um, at that time, uh, Sulu felt that the um, development for his character was completely out of step with what uh, Gene Roddenberry would have wanted. And uh, so that, of course, was the creator of Star Trek. And um, so in terms of his reaction to uh, Gay Sulu, uh, let's hearken back to some context. When in the summer of 19, the summer of 1968, and as everybody might remember, uh, well, older people will, that was the summer of love. And uh, again, very much the epicenter was San Francisco that go as San saying that was when the song was produced when you come to San Francisco yes and all the hippies and flower power all that shit that um shows up on those videos you see when you uh play that song uh that was when George Takei attended a pool party at the Hollywood Hills home of the Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry and he was 31 years old at the time, and he was already famous for his role as Hikaru Sulu, the helmsman of the USS Enterprise. And uh, he swam up to his boss in the pool, had a conversation with him, a very private one. He was still closeted, uh, so he didn't want to come out to his boss. Uh, the god of his universe, uh, at least in terms of uh, the man who decided uh, what happened in Starfleet, so to speak. Mm. And nevertheless, George Takei, who finally announced that he was gay in the year 2005, which is like, you know, that may seem like a long time ago, but... Think of how, you know, he spent a longer period of his life in the closet than he did in the open. And uh, so he was at that time when he was undercover. He was, like all such gay men, fully aware and attuned to the gay equality conversation gaining momentum at the time because he was part of it. Uh, there's a conspiracy for you. They all were part of it. <laughs> and uh, talk about a conspiracy. And uh, that's there are positive conspiracies and there are negative conspiracies. And depending on how you feel about gayness, uh, this was either a positive or a negative. I, for one, find it a positive because uh, I find the gay community to be generally overall positive. Uh, but believe me, more than any of you, I, I've seen the negative side of gayness, having grown up seeing all the ugliness uh, that uh, gays can muster and, uh, and, and project into the world around them, uh, just as I've seen the worst aspect of blacks. There is no reason for me to be uh, pro-black based on my experience growing up in uh, the Tenderloin ghetto. Uh, you know, I, I have no reason to be uh, positive towards anything. <laughs> I saw the negative aspects of everything and everybody. But uh, at that time, 
uh, Sulu was in a very different world, and uh, he felt that uh, gay equality was a topic worth exploring on the socially minded science fiction series that Star Trek was, which had already tackled issues like civil rights or the civil rights movement, the, the Vietnam War, uh, through very astutely observed allegory. Uh, but the show had already seen its lowest ratings ever for the very reason where we had uh, that James and Reese and I were talking about the episode featuring television's first ever interracial kiss. And I don't know if you knew this, Jameson, when Captain Kirk and Lieutenant Uhura, when they kissed, did you know that that was the first interracial kiss ever seen on television? Did you know that? I think so, yeah. I, I, I remember seeing something where they were doing a, a History Channel show about it or something. Okay. So he, he did break a lot of barriers with that. Yeah, already. And, and, and it reached the point where she was actually thinking about leaving the show. And I think it was Martin Luther King Jr. who himself. had to like... Who had to who had to write to her and tell her you know stay on the show? Yes, that's all true. That's all true. I brought that up before. I'm sure that it's out there for people to read themselves. But um, I was one of the first people to broach these subjects on Revolution Radio and talk about them because Lieutenant Uhura, or um, fuck, what's the name of the actress who played her? <laughs> if, if somebody looks that up for me, I always forget that, and I'm so ashamed, so ashamed about that. Uh, that uh, my my mind uh, obviously. Can't main you can only maintain so much information. The human brain is a fishbowl, and there's only uh, so many marbles. Uh, it can uh, Nichelle, uh, Nichelle Nichols. Yes, thank you, Michelle Nichols. Not the most memorable name in the world. Uh, uh, I do remember the name of her character, Nayota Uhura. So that's why that's memorable. Nichelle Nichols, that's right. And uh, you do know that... Uh, of course, she was stunning when she was younger, and uh, what many people may not know, but everyone should know by now, uh, she was sexually involved with uh, Gene Roddenberry, for those of you who don't know. I, I, did you know that? Or is no, that, uh, that I didn't know. Yes, yeah. Um, so she wrote about that in her autobiography, and uh, yes, so... Uh, yeah, talk about crossing all of the barriers. And uh, it was one of the reasons why he... Uh, it, it, Captain Kirk is, of course, uh, Gene Roddenberry's own projection of himself. And so when he had Captain Kirk and Lieutenant Uhura kissing, it was his way of validating his relationship with her. Does that make sense? That does. Yeah, and, and so... Uh, now, bear in mind that episode, all the NBC affiliates throughout the Solid South refused to air that episode. And uh, so, well, um, when uh, our boy, Mr. Uh, George Takei, swam up to uh, Gene Roddenberry uh, and uh, brought up gay rights, uh, you can imagine with everything that Gene Roddenberry was through, he wasn't particularly um, enthusiastic. He was sympathetic to his star's pitch. But Roddenberry felt he was in no position at that point in his life to take those kinds of risks. That he had already taken uh, the show to the point where they were, um, you know, he was getting death threats. And... Uh, that would have killed him. Uh, and uh, but uh, George Takai, and remember now, the guy's like uh, about 80 something now. He's getting to the age uh, my parents were when uh, they both died. And uh, so uh, it's it's amazing these people are still with us and it's important that they are. But um, uh, when it comes to uh, George Takai and uh, uh, the age where he's at now, uh, my fear is that, you know, he's 84. And so um, it, it, it's, it's very, uh, we're very lucky he's still able to articulate. There are people who get to that age and they cannot. So um, anyhow, uh, because uh, George Takai at the age of 84 uh, can relate stories like this, um, he is able to share with us that uh, 
George, that Gene Roddenberry said he'd been pushing the envelope and walking a very tight rope. And if he pushed it one more time or took just that extra step along that rope, the show would be off the air. And the show was canceled for that very reason. It was canceled the following season at any rate. Anyway, because of all the complaints about uh, how far he was taking it. But Star Trek, of course, has since lived long and prospered uh, by coming back from the dead, by reanimating uh, for, you know, Studio Home Paramount. It spawned well over half a dozen TV series and uh, and well over a dozen, uh, at least 13 feature films. Uh, no, it's got to be more than that by now. You know, pushing 15, 16 and true to its title, uh, the latest, uh, well, the big screen outing was, I, th I think the last one that I was aware of was Star Trek Beyond, uh, the one that uh, I, you know, before I kind of started tuning out, you know, it, it went where none other have gone before, uh, because it had the star John Cho, who's Chinese for God's sake assume the Sulu mantle and uh, that was for the third time in the reboots at that point and uh, that's when his character was revealed to be gay um, you know and and uh, honestly if the guy's Chinese they had a Chinese actor in uh, Star Trek Voyager you know couldn't they have chosen a Japanese guy to play Sulu well they couldn't because guess what there's no Japanese Americans around to do that or rather there's so few japanese americans none of them are involved in acting isn't that horrific talk about a crime that's because all the japanese left america and america is much the poorer for it imagine if all of those japanese were here had been reproducing and their community were around in america today how much ahead America would be in technology and science at the least and economically. What you Americans lost by just everything you do in your auto-destructive spiral. <laughs> it's, it's, it's beyond me. Uh, I don't even need to resort to terrorism. Americans destroy themselves. But as for the gay Sulu idea, that sourced from Simon Pegg, who plays Scotty, or was doing so in the new films for a while, and he's the one who penned The Beyond screenplay, and the director was Justin Lin, uh, also Chinese-American, and they both wanted to pay homage to Take's legacy as, uh, as probably the most recognizable gay rights activists that there is and so a scene was written into that film very matter of fact in which sulu is pictured with a male spouse raising their infant child after all you remember it was two men who raised darth vader and you see how he turned out <laughs> back when he was anakin skywalker he grew up to blow up a planet yeah that's right nothing but good can come of that uh, I'm sorry, I can't resist my smart-ass uh, commentary on this. But uh, Peg and Lynn assumed, uh, reasonably perhaps, one would think, but no, I knew better. They thought that Take would be overjoyed at the development. You know, a manifestation of that conversation with Roddenberry when they were both in swimming trunks in that pool so many years ago. And uh, as Jameson Reese said, uh, somehow a ladies' man raising a child with another man just doesn't fucking work. Well, a ladies' man, you know, it's hard pressed to imagine him raising a child because ladies' men, uh, like myself, we're usually quite irresponsible and not worth a shit when it comes to being a provider. Uh, anyhow, Take was not overjoyed. He had never asked for Sulu to be gay. In fact, he much preferred he would have stayed straight. Uh, of course, he's delighted there's a gay character, but it's twisting Gene's creation uh, into which he put so much thought, and that's really unfortunate. And so uh, it, Take has explained before that Roddenberry was exhaustive 
in conceiving his Star Trek characters. Uh, and of course, the name, the very name of Sulu was based on the Sulu Sea off the coast of the Philippines. Uh, it was not to render uh, Sulu's Asian nationality indeterminate, as many people have thought. Rather, that was uh, Roddenberry's, uh, his rapprochement with the Filipino people uh, and the Japanese people simultaneously. He was bridging two rapprochements with that because, of course, he, as a person who served in World War II in the Pacific as a pilot uh, who commanded uh, a medium-sized bomber, uh, he was someone who understood uh, the uh, attempts of the Americans to exterminate the Japanese people. He was trying to carry out such orders during the war. And uh, he knew that there was a very large Japanese population, one of the largest outside of Japan, in the southern island of Mindanao in the port city of Davao, which is essentially the capital of Mindanao and the semi-autonomous uh, nation unrecognized by the rest of the world of Bangsamoro, which is the Philippines and the several southern islands and uh, part of, uh, well, Sabah in the island of Borneo. And uh, these are parts of a kind of Filipino uh, Katagalugan kind of ethnos that is all religiously Muslim and uh, where they have maintained a deep and abiding hatred for the United States based on the American ethno-religious extermination of three million Muslim Filipinos, uh, mass murdered throughout the archipelago, but of course, predominantly in its southern uh, island area, where the infamous Hux, H-U-K, that ethnicity, uh, would overrun the American soldiers and Marines, and this was why they developed the Colt 45 with enough man-stopping power uh, to uh, stop them in their charges. And, uh, of course, the, um, uh, the Sulu is the central sea of the Philippine archipelago, and uh, this emphasized both the Japanese population that had been there uh, until World War II and uh, the, um, the Filipino Muslims who had been exterminated there defending their home territories. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was a Muslim Filipina who married Terry Nichols, who was the partner of, uh, not alternative lifestyles partner, but partner in crime with, um, oh God, Timothy McVeigh. And for those of you who remember the Oklahoma City bombing, Timothy McVeigh may have carried it out, but the man who built the bomb was Terry Nichols. And Terry Nichols has never been interviewed. You might remember they interviewed Timothy McVeigh at some length before his death and uh, his execution, I mean to say. And the man they never interviewed was Terry Nichols. And this was because Terry Nichols had been married to a Muslim Filipina and could have given you the motivation for the bombing. Everybody kept saying, why, why, why? Well, this was a... Uh, a delayed uh, Muslim Filipino counterattack for the American genocide that killed three million people in the Philippines that they have never uh, let the world know about. And uh, so this Filipino Muslim bride of Terry Nichols, uh, he learned of the full story through her family, uh, the survivors of the American Holocaust, and uh, then uh, he struck back against his fellow Americans because they were, he struck back against a federal building because it's the, it's the manifestation of a genocidal criminal state. And uh, this is why no interview will ever be conducted with him. And he sits in a concrete hole, unable to express the motivation behind the bombing. So hopefully that puts that in some perspective. It was that that Gene Roddenberry was trying to attest to and ultimately educate Americans about through the character of Sulu, who is a Japanese out of the Philippines, a ethnic Japanese out of the uh, Filipino region. So uh, you'll see that in the movie. Uh, the It's called Krakatoa, east of Java or west of Java. <laughs> uh, look up at the subtitle, and uh, as a matter of fact, I can look that up right now, Krakatoa, the movie, and you'll see Japanese pearl divers 
these women in uh, that film uh, that are all uh, entirely Filipino in their acculturation. They're even doing uh, the, the kind of dance uh, the Filipinos uh, do. But uh, let me see now. Krakatoa movie. And uh, yes, East of Java. There we are. Uh, and he, even though in reality, Krakatoa is west of fucking Java, they said east of Java because that sounds more exotic. Everybody expects it. It's in the Orient. It's got to be to the east, right? That's the level of mentation or mental processing we're dealing with. Anyhow, uh, that was released in 1968. That was released the same year that Sulu was talking to Gene Roddenberry about gay rights. And uh, it's in that film that you see these uh, Filipino acculturated ethnic Japanese pearl diving girls. So, um, you know, take a look at that sometime. And uh, uh, so... Uh, in terms of uh, Itake and what he had to say about this, when uh, it was, um, let me see now, if, uh, uh, yeah, he, he definitely wanted people to understand that Gene Roddenberry had always envisioned Sulu as not just heterosexual, but very much uh, almost a serial lover, uh, a kind of... Uh, uh, he, he, uh, almost a sex fiend, <laughs> basically a ladies man. Uh, of course, uh, proving that is not necessarily uh, easy. Uh, Sulu never had an on-screen love interest that was allowed during Star Trek's initial three-season run because of uh, the American hostility towards Asian men. And the idea of empowering them by showing that on screen rather than just hinting at it was just too much. Of course, Sulu was very much a muscle man. He was very well uh, maintained in his physique because, of course, he's gay. And you know how gay men are about their, uh, their vanity. Uh, he maintained a body. Y you can always tell the straight guys because they're just never in as good shape as your average gay guy who actually cares about how he looks. Uh, but, uh, you know, the only thing they allowed the character Sulu to do was to mention a daughter, Demora, who appeared in 1994's Star Trek Generations, which was the seventh film in the series, played by Jacqueline Kim. But the only reference to how Demora was conceived... Uh, yeah, there you are. Jameson Reese says, guess when ladies think I'm gay, I should take that as a compliment. Yes, I agree. Yes, very much so. That's, that's true. Uh, anyhow, um, the, um, uh, yeah, the only reference to how Demora was conceived, it appeared in a secondary canonical source, the 1995 Star Trek novel entitled The Captain's Daughter. And, uh, and the way Take explains that, because, of course, he's had to voice over these novels uh, doing the audiobooks. Uh, his observation there was that he said it was, to put it crudely, a one night stand with a glamazon, a very athletic, powerful, and stunningly gorgeous woman. That's Damora's mother. So, uh, Take uh, was first informed of. Uh, Sulu's uh, same-sex leanings in about the year 2015. And when, that's when Cho called him to reveal the big news, you know, like a pregnancy. And Take tried to convince him to make a new character gay instead. And uh, the way George Takei said it was, I told him, be imaginative. Create a character who has a history of being gay rather than Sulu, who's been straight all this time suddenly being revealed as being closeted. Like, what's he fucking these strong, tall, athletic woman for? Uh, to try and make people think he's not gay? <laughs> what the fuck? How would he get it up? How would he maintain an erection with someone he had no interest in? Uh, you know, just common sense. And besides, Take had had enough negative experiences inside the Hollywood closet and uh, thereby strongly felt a character who came of age in the 23rd century would never find his way inside of a closet. It would be the stupidest thing in the world. 
the kind of liberal progressive future that Gene Roddenberry was envisioning was one which would obviate the need for anyone to go undercover. Uh, now, the timeline logic, of course, uh, in and of itself is enough to befuddle even the most diehard of uh, Trekkies or Trekkers, as they prefer, the Star Trek enthusiasts, because that rebooted trilogy in which all of this took place uh, is it's chronically placed as before the action of the original series. In other words, assuming canon orthodoxy, the storyline in which Sulu comes out of the closet suggests that Sulu would have to have first been gay and married to another man or woman, if he's producing the daughter, which was supposed to be a one-night stand, like, damn, she's so sexy, I'll go straight for her, uh, only to come out of the closet years later. It's just plain stupid. <laughs> and so, not long after Cho's bombshell call to George Takai came another, and this one was from Lin, again informing him that Sulu was indeed going to be overtly gay in Star Trek Beyond. And I guess they by that they meant overtly gay. What does that mean? It means like he's flaming in, in the sense that he's actually walking like a bitch, so to speak, and shaking his ass. Anyhow, Takei uh, again emphasized he was steadfastly opposed to the decision. Uh, he said, this movie is going to be coming out on the 50th anniversary of Star Trek, the 50th anniversary of paying tribute to Gene Roddenberry, the man whose vision uh, it was that carried us through half a hundred years, honor him by creating a new character. Uh, and Takei said he was adamant. He urged them with all emphasis. Uh, he, 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 he was actually left feeling that that was going to happen. And after that, all was quiet from beyond until then uh, a few months later when Takai uh, received in the year of uh, 2016 an email from Peg praising him for his advocacy for the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender movement and for his pride in Star Trek. And uh, he thought to himself, how wonderful, it's a fan letter from Simon Pegg. Justin has talked to him. And he was certain at that time the creative team had rethought their decision to make Sulu gay. That is until this month, this month in, uh, of June, half a decade ago, five years ago, uh, the June of uh, 2016, when Takai received an email from Cho informing him that the actor was uh, about to embark on an international media tour for Beyond. And Cho said it was bound to come out that his character was gay. And what should he do? And so, <laughs> uh, very disappointed, George Takei told Cho to go about his promotional duties, but that he was not going to change his mind on the matter. Uh, so Takei said, I really tried to work with these people when at long last the issue of gay equality was going to be addressed. I thought after that conversation with Justin that was going to happen. Months later, when I got the email from Simon Pegg, I was kind of confused. He thinks I'm a great guy. Uh, wonderful. But what was the point of that letter? Uh, I interpreted that as my words being heard. And uh, so Takai is hoping that he himself, or he was, you know, the last time I checked in, he was hoping he could take Sulu in new directions. Uh, he was hoping for CBS's then upcoming Star Trek series, which was slated to premiere in January of 2017. That was co-run by Alex Kurtzman and Brian Fuller, who is an openly gay man. Uh, and, uh, you know, at that time, Sulu was saying... Uh, Leonard Nimoy made two cameo appearance, appearances, two cameo appearances in Star Trek films. There's no reason why an ancient, wizened Sulu, Admiral Sulu, can't appear, or maybe an alien creature who sounds like him. Uh, that would be fun. And, um, uh, of course, he has his own famous basso profundo laugh, 
And uh, it's not one that I consciously imitate, but apparently I sound like when I myself come off uh, with my laughter, my barking laughter. Anyhow, so what he was doing uh, earlier tonight, uh, well, earlier last night by now, because it's 1.15 a.m. here in the Pacific, was he was recalling his time in an American internment camp via v his graphic novel. It's not a novel, of course. It's a, uh, uh, you know, how the fuck do they refer to a non-fiction uh, graphic storyboarded, meaning a comic book format to you, all you lay people out there, though we all hate those terms. There's nothing comic about most of what is formatted in storyboard form these days. Uh, but uh, when he was uh, uh, promoting his uh, book, it is known as a graphic memoir. There we are. It's a best-selling graphic memoir. It's a New York Times best-selling graphic memoir, as a matter of fact. So, um, you know, don't forget to get yourself a copy of that as well. And so his graphic memoir is titled They Call This Enemy. It's been recently expanded. Understand that it's transcribed by Justin Isinger, uh, written into storyboarded format by Stephen Scott and illustrated by Harmony Becker, uh, a female, I would presume. And so uh, what um, uh, one of the things that's emphasized in that novel is that shame is a cruelty. A shame is a cruelty. And uh, so in his memoir about his childhood years in an American concentration camp uh, throughout World War II, uh, that's where George Takai uh, draws the conclusion that shame should rest on the perpetrators but they don't carry it the way the victims do. Now, this irony becomes most evident at the conclusion of Takai's book, where he depicts the U.S. government's tardy attempts to establish a sense of collective shame about America's wartime internment of Nikkei Amerikajin, or Japanese Americans. And uh, President Reagan is uh, illustrated uh, and quoted from his 1988 speech, in which he said, Here we admit a wrong. Here we reaffirm our commitment as a nation to equal justice under law. But no matter how polished Reagan's words are, how many zeros on the restitution check that Take finally received in 1991, and there weren't many, I can guarantee you that, all such attempts at official remorse ring hollow. What the government of the Constitutional Republic of these United States did to George Takai and some 127,000 other Japanese Americans can never be undone, no matter how many speeches public officials deliver or how many checks they send, which, of course, they sent only one. Mm. And that wasn't worth shit. Now... The very structure of Takai's narrative in his graphic memoir, it underlines that fact more than a political speech ever could. So it's the young George Takai's point of view that shapes that story, imbuing it with childlike energy. And even as the Takais are wrenched from their home, transported hundreds of miles and forced to live in camps, young George's openness and curiosity are unflagging. His outlook provides a striking contrast to government officials' stale attempts to explain, excuse, and ultimately seek forgiveness for the evil that they've perpetrated. In fact, despite the grimness of its subject matter, They Called Us Enemy is essentially because of its uh, formatting as a graphic storyboard. It's lively and it's vibrant. And after years spent acting on stage and on screen, uh, of course, he'll always be known as um, for his role as Star Trek's Lieutenant Sulu. Uh, Takei uh, clearly learned about a, a lot about shaping and directing his audience's emotions. So he uh, was helped in that regard in terms of f reformatting it. Uh, by his co-writers, uh, Justin Eisinger and Stephen Scott, and the artist Harmony Becker. Now, I would say it's a, the biggest shame, to use that word, of this 
of this work is that Becker's artwork is not in color. But uh, she provides a master class herself on what one could do in black and white format. And by incorporating textures ranging from fine hatching to bende dots, as they're called in the profession, she demonstrates how digitally created drawings can have all the dimensionality of work drafted on paper. And uh, Becker also helps dramatize the contrast between George's and his parents' experiences of their ordeal. Now, it was spring of 1942 when Takei's family was first taken from their Los Angeles home and allowed to keep only what they could carry. Takei's parents had to sell off all their belongings for next to nothing. And at one point, they were forced to sleep in horses' stalls. You know, George Takei was viewing this as an adventure. Uh, You know, we get to sleep where the horses sleep. Fun! For his parents, of course, it's no such thing. And uh, Takai himself uh, writes through his transcribers what a devastating blow it was to them. They had worked so hard to buy a two-bedroom house and raise a family, and now they were all crammed into a single smelly horse stall. Now, that's the first of numerous occasions when young George's innocence protects him. When everyone is forced to wear tags to keep track of them all as cattle, he thought it was just another train ticket. And so he remembered seeing people crying and couldn't understand why. Now, at one camp, another boy told him that the barbed wire was there to keep dinosaurs out. And for Takei's parents, meanwhile, This was a constant struggle to maintain any sense of order and humanity. Take's father helped other families settle in and served as a translator and a mediator, while Take's mother sewed clothes and made curtains and rugs. But the family's ordeal didn't end in the camps. Once the Take's were allowed to return to Los Angeles in 1945, they had to live on the street. Now, George was enrolled in public school where he endured discrimination from a racist teacher and began to finally feel the shame his parents felt. Uh, He remembered, well, the way he relates it, he said, I was old enough by then to understand that camp was something like jail, but still could not fully grasp what we had done to be sent there. And so when he grew up to become an actor... He was fighting a two-pronged battle to overcome shame and to reconcile his experiences with America's stated ideals. And, of course, that's all they are. They're stated, but they're, they were never meant uh, to be realized or even lived up to. Uh, so it's a struggle that can probably only be fully understood by a survivor of internment and probably never by politicians seeking exculpation for such acts of bureaucratic evil. But Teke is hoping that some of those politicians will try. And uh, so he truly concludes or finalizes his work They called us enemy with a critique of our, well, what our current government's policies of treating certain people as enemy uh, is still ongoing. And uh, so his last closing uh, writ into the book itself uh, is a quote from President Barack Obama saying, in part, that history must be a manual for how to avoid repeating the mistakes of the past. Now, it may be too late to undo what was done to Japanese Americans almost, well, at this point, over 70 years ago, but Take suggests it's not too late to learn from it. Now, of course, where I could never uh, agree with him is uh, where he has said, uh, you know, of his own accord, uh, how I learned to love the country that 
betrayed me. I mean, this is something I just could never relate to, is that uh, uh, here you have George Takei being uh, what, well, going through what he went through, and uh, for him to um, say, uh, I, I, I learned to love the, uh, you know, the nation that betrayed me. It's, it's, it's just too much. How, how can you? How could you ever <laughs> to love them? Uh, let me see if I can get that presentation title right, uh, because he did this whole TED talk on it. It was like, a, it was like a, his thing, and uh, it, it's just something that, um, again, uh, who knows? Uh, maybe someday I'll have another opportunity to speak with him, and uh, and uh, we can clear that up. Though I I don't think we ever can. Uh, after all, he was a guy who was. Uh, these are people who felt that being American was the end all be all. Uh, of course, most of his fellow Japanese didn't because they left America after they were so abused, and uh, they took all their skill with them, all of their uh, everything that would have truly made America great went with the Japanese who evacuated America as far as I'm concerned. So, uh, okay, all of that being said, now that that's out of the way, uh, I had best uh, tend to um, what um, you know, what I've been avoiding, which is really getting into the subject matter of uh, the... Uh, just all that is brought to the fore by what we were discussing uh, concerning uh, y y the ghoul and everything else. Let me uh, grab a drink so I can steal myself for that. By that I mean S-T-E-E-L, not uh, steal as in steal something, but to steal myself up for that. Let me gird my loins, as they would say, for this, uh, for undergoing this, this experience. And so while I do that, Jameson, if you'll be kind enough to hold the stage for me uh, for a little bit, and uh, I'll be back in a few minutes and just get started into a very challenging subject. Okay? All right. Going to grab some steel reserve. Thank you. I'll do just that. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, it's a good point. Um, I, I don't honestly grasp how anyone can love a country that doesn't love you or sees you as the enemy it, even if you're a citizen uh, you're a born citizen here uh, I mean if if you're not treated with respect or love why the hell would you love that which hates you or why would you love that which destroys you certainly you can try to ch and 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 honestly if you people People like to say, love it or leave it, but honestly, the people who uh, love it never change anything about it, because it works on their favor. It works in their favor. They have the privilege of being part of that status quo uh, that is benefiting from it. So they can love it. Uh, for the rest of us, we have to work our damned hardest to change everything about this, because it's not lovable because it's not lovable um and, and I, I mean and you know there's what happened to there's the experiences of george decay there's what i went into earlier about these uh, ku klux cracker cops who are just beating the shit out of people of color because they can and wearing it as a badge of honor because apparently uh that's that's all they're worth i mean it's and there's, you know, I mean, the state of affairs is, uh, it, it, it's enough to make anyone cynical. It's enough to make anyone cynical. Um, um, that said, I, I'm hopeful that there's, you know, I'm hoping that with the next generation of people who are stepping into politics, at least the people who are more progressive, that we can see something uh, that works. Uh, and it's for that reason that I recently decided to, you know, vote for, um, uh, I believe his name was Andrew Yang, 
since he also did speak about the universal <laughs> the uh the you know the universal income which would be nice for every american in fact uh it seems like uh we have a whole group of people who quote, consider themselves conservative yet they have no idea that every policy that they are in support of is destroying the country economically in in other words it's almost these these people are claiming themselves to be uh what is it they they, they, they call themselves patriots. Well, they are patriots you know, because uh, the only way they get asses from their uh, father, who probably should have never had them, honestly. Uh, but that, 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 uh, that aside, not to bash every conservative out there, but uh, for them not to see. No, honestly, yeah, why not? I've, I've bashed people for less. Well, for them not to see how auto destructive it is is completely absurd um and it's 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 uh we should be concerned honestly that you know trump is still alive and breathing to the point where he can uh possibly try to run for re-election in 2024 and so you know for anyone who's a real quote-unquote patriot or really considers themselves uh, loyal to this country, there's a hint of a problem that needs to be taken care of. Wink, wink. I didn't say anything. Anyway, <laughs> I, had to, I, had to, I had to give that a shot just for the hell of it. Uh, that said, let's see what's going on in this sick, sad world we call... Uh, all right, let's see. Uh, we have allies uh, trying to hope to hope to bond. Look beyond virus at G7 summit in UK. Uh, why the fuck is Donald Trump there? What the hell? This is an article from two hours ago. Why are they? Oh, okay. That's a that's an, that that's a picture from uh, 2019. That's why. This guy always looks like he has a stick up his ass. I noticed that about Trump. He always looks like he has a stick up his ass. And 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 of course, uh, on this on this page, they have like an advertisement for a Donald Trump coin. Are they fucking serious? Why would they? Why would they put his face on a coin? Oh my god. Oh, this world is mad. But uh. Since the G7 met two years ago, the coronavirus pandemic has killed more than 3.7 million people. I'm guessing the number is more accurate numbers, probably 4 million, or probably way more than even 4 million, honestly, at this point. Um, a planned G7 meeting in the United States last year was postponed and then canceled, of course. That goes without saying. Look who was in office last year. So when Prime uh, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson welcomes U.S. President Joe Biden and the leaders of France, Germany, Italy, and Japan, and Canada to the cliff-ringed Carbis Bay Beach Resort in southwest England, pandemic recovery, uh building back better, quote-unquote, that's in quotes, uh, in a phrase both Biden and Johnson like will top the agenda. Uh, we'll see how that works out. Uh, Johnson seems to think the meeting will help move from a miserable period of competition and squabbling. Uh, yeah, I hope so. Um, that said, uh, I should also note that uh, British is being hit with the variant from India, which they uh, have recently decided to halt their um, lifting lockdown restrictions. I thought you were going to say. I thought you were going to say they were hit by the variant from India, which uh, has decided to export <laughs> its virus uh, as revenge oh, 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 for the well, Raj. Right? Oh, it's I, 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 I get the feeling that it will export itself 
to these United States, that's the next place it's going to hit. Yeah, which is why, yeah, the, which is go. why you know everyone thinking that the virus is over. Uh, I, I hazard to, I shudder when I think what's going to happen. Well, let's hope for the best. But I get, I get your point. It's uh, certainly we can't be stupid about this. And, yeah, uh, um, I, I can only base I can only base this on past models. <laughs> so uh, we, uh, things might be different. With the uh, with the fact that a lot of Amer- most a lot of Americans are vaccinated now, mm-hmm. but again, you know, even with that, even even with that being in motion, uh, I'm I'm fairly certain there's going to be an uptick. It's, it might not be as drastic as it was because of the amount of Americans that are uh, vaccinated, vaccinated at this point. But we're, we have to remember that uh, think of the millions that refuse to be vaccinated because the Republican or quote unquote yeah, libertarian and, or. And, and yeah, and they're intermingling with the people who are vaccinated. So who knows what the hell is going to happen? And uh, so, uh, yeah, it, it's definitely just uh, profoundly upsetting and uh, that pe- people have not been, you know, our, our governor here in California, Gavin Newsom, he uh, basically uh, has tried to provoke people or inspire them to get vaccinated with a lot, a lottery, a state lottery. If you get vaccinated, you're entered into a state lottery where every week 15 Californians win $50,000 each. Uh, and uh, so, which is like the uh, equivalent of my Marine Corps life insurance if I, uh, if someone ever cashes it in. Uh, and uh, so in, in terms of that, uh, you know, it works in other states as well that are trying this sort of strategy. Uh, in uh, what is it, Virginia or Carolina, someplace like that, they're using lottery and and guns or something, giving away free guns of all things, crazy shit that you know these red yeah, states. Yeah, I think. mean, but, I mean, yeah, yeah, they're gonna give away guns. They're just gonna wind up killing their own families anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Why even bother? Uh, you, you, you're going to give them the guns that they're going to kill their family with. Oh, well, at least they weren't killed by the coronavirus. Uh, yes, uh, there we are. <laughs> and uh, it, 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 it's, it's, you know, but at any rate, um, when uh, Gavin Newsom was drawing the, uh, drawing out the, um, uh, you know, the prizes, and you look inside because they're they're the state. They don't bother to you know uh, cancel uh, commentary, but maybe they should. Uh, you notice uh, all of the videos of uh, Salman Sheikh. He uh, doesn't allow commentary on his videos. I don't know if you noticed that. And um, yeah, I, I did notice that. Yeah, and uh, the um, state should probably consider that because all that you see is all these assholes saying oh this just shows you it's like a dystopian future yeah where they're giving you lottery results for the people who take the vaccine or entered this really shows that it's all a show if you didn't think it was all a show before this ought to show you it's a show now in other words they don't even believe the virus is real all these idiots that are entering comments there uh and uh i I don't think there you go yeah uh, my people will die because of a lack of knowledge. A lack of knowledge? How about a rejection? <laughs> oh, well, a rejection of knowledge is even worse than a lack of knowledge. Yes. Because yeah. when you because when you reject knowledge, that means you have the capacity to discern. <laughs> and that means that you really, really, um, you don't even have an excuse at that point. No. No, it, it, it's just uh, wretched. Uh, and um, uh, let me check a little something here, a headline that I'm, I'm seeing, uh, the homeless crisis in uh, California. Yeah, that's uh, something that, um, you know, like anything else, California's fires, between its fires and its homelessness, you know, that would be indicative of, of, of a post, post-apocalyptic state uh, <laughs> more than our, you know, governor, uh, you know, drawing a, a lottery for those who bother to get vaccinated. Uh, but, um, you know, th- this is uh, the, um, the, the shit that we're dealing with. And uh, God knows, it, it leaves me just shaking my head. Um, so uh, in, in terms of... Um, 
uh, what I've said before about the revelation of uh, the Magi, uh, and uh, of course the uh, uh, Star of Bethlehem, the wise men from China, uh, usually go in depth into that uh, during the holiday season. And uh, of course, uh, I uh, could go somewhat into that tonight, but I'm going to try and uh, leave, uh, you know, try to just brush over it. If you haven't heard me talk about this, uh, just take a look at my channel and you'll see the most popular video that I have is on Christianity, and that's when I speak of the Chinese context of Christianity and how Christi the Chinese were Christian before there was Christianity. And um, so, in terms of the Magi, they are descendants of Adam and Eve's third son, Seth. And this has nothing to do with the Temple of Set and uh, the Sethenism, from which we derive the very term Satan. Uh, this is, uh, has to do with uh, Seth was the righteous third son of Adam and Eve, and he did as he was told, uh, and uh, he, when he was old enough, traveled to the East, to the Orient, to spread the word of uh, Christianity, which is Father Adam had a vision of the Messiah coming to redeem mankind from the fall. And uh, that's when he went to spread that to uh, the Chinese. And that's when the Magi order, or rather what um, Americans would perceive as a kind of Jedi order, was established of martial artists. Uh, of course, Americans would imagine Shaolin. And of course, the Shaolin are pagan and they are um, completely human. And they would not be considered magicians. Uh, the Shaolin would be considered healers, a kind of a uh, miracle worker to an extent uh, whose physical feats border on the supernatural to the point where they're believed to be uh, practitioners of arcanism or a sorcery of their own, but they're not really considered magicians. Uh, the very term magi uh, implies uh, magicians. So, uh, when we take a look at all of the, uh, the revelation of the Magi, that rediscovered ancient uh, text that, uh, that tells us about uh, the Magi leading basically an invasion of uh, the ancient uh, state of Israel or Palestine as it was under the, uh, uh, under the Romans. Uh, but led by uh, the enemies of the, uh, of the Jewish people, the man who would have killed your God had he been provided the opportunity to do so, Erod. King Erod was an Edomite. He was uh, the very word Edom. Here's the irony. Adam, of course, derives his name from Rudd, ruddy, as in a ruddy complexion, as in the blush, because... White people are the only ethnos which can blush. And when they blush, they blush all over. It's not just in the face. If they're naked, the entire body, it's a bodily blush. The, uh, the skin is uh, light enough in melanin where there's no uh, camouflage of the blushing. And so this is, of course, uh, what is known as uh, the blood in the uh, making itself show on the surface. This is something that no other ethnos does with a darker shade of melanin. And uh, so in terms of uh, the culture from which Adam derived uh, his name, that they derived their name from him, uh, they all derived it from the land that they worked in the Caucasus Mountains region uh, in the north of uh, Iran, what is in today's uh, Azeri region of uh, Iran. And that is uh, south of the Caucasus Mountains, but not that far south. And uh, in that area of the world was the beginnings of the agricultural revolution. This is, of course, what uh, distinguished their civilization uh, from all others before them was the beginning of uh, cultivation of the land. And the cultivation of the land is what changed all humanity from a hunter-gatherer state where uh, the idyllic or Edenic existence, it wasn't idyllic, <laughs> but it was Edenic in the sense that uh, man was very much working with nature and uh, as was woman and they were hunting and gathering 
And uh, this is where we get this kind of gender roles forming, where generally speaking, we assume all men are hunters and all women are gatherers, though they're finding anthropological evidence that wasn't the case at all and that plenty of women were hunting and uh, probably means that plenty of men were gathering. Uh, so it, there was obviously much more balance among the sexes. And uh, during that period of the agricultural revolution, this is when we began to bind ourselves to the concept of time because agriculture requires Unlike hunting and gathering, where you're simply all time passes only in the sense of seasons, your experience of the world is seasonal. It's uh, and based on how you travel, that can mutate and change as well. Um, uh, most people would stick with solid hunting grounds and be and they travel for gathering and then come back to hunting grounds again. Or they'd go hunting in a different area when once one area was hunted out, um, let the game replenish itself. This is uh, something that uh, all changed with Adam and his tribe working the red earth, where the uh, red of the earth and the ruddness, ruddiness of their complexion, hence the term Adam, which is just uh, from the ancient um, languages that uh, were being used long before Hebrew or Aramaic or any of those languages were spoken. Uh, Adam meant red earth, red man, uh, in the sense of covered in red earth from mining it, working it, tilling the soil, tilling the soil so that you would uh, plant the seeds. And then you had to uh, develop a concept of seasons in terms of working your planting and harvesting and cycling that you developed a calendar. And at that point, the brain becomes slave circuited to the concept of time. And at that point, everything changes. And all innocence dies. <laughs> that is the death of innocence. That is the leaving of Eden. That is, uh, that is what is manifest in Adam. And therefore, Adam is known as the father of man in the sense that he introduced agriculture to the world. And that's what made us... That was childhood's end. That was childhood's end. And so uh, when it came to uh, his son, Seth, he carried on the agricultural revolution into China and he carried with him uh, Christianity. Now, the men who were able to preserve this were Vivanthior that the Chinese had learned to accommodate in their society by helping to uh, basically isolate them in the hermetic lifestyle of a monastic uh, monk. And they were considered magical because of their vampirism, uh, their greater longevity, their uh, uh, resilience. And uh, that is one of the reasons I was able to uh, tolerate the nanoplasma transferal of the full body transferal of uh, nanoplasmic transfusion was because of that vampiric bloodline, um, my vampirism, the uh, downbred vampirism that I have from my late and sainted mother. And uh, if it weren't for that, I wouldn't have survived and the nanoplasma wouldn't have taken it all. Um, they gambled on that and it worked. Of course, I died and um, then reanimated through, for all intent. Uh, I was clinically dead and then recovered when the nanoplasma finally interacted, was uh, adapted by my baseline gene structure. Now, in terms of the vampire of most other cultures they are always peripheral they are essentially homeless these are people who would be considered at an autistic end of the spectrum which for all intents and purposes is uh, almost incommunicado uh, and speaks in simply the simplest terms to interact with people as a necessary part of seducing them uh, into accepting their presence before they strike, um, not seducing them necessarily in a romantic sense, though uh, a come on or something of that nature is not, of course, uh, out of their realm, uh, something they would practice in order to uh, get the blood they need. Um, so in terms of China, they were able to have these people isolated and rather uh, make offerings to them uh, on a regular basis so they wouldn't deplete the population. And these uh, were the mage kings. And these mage kings uh, were known as the magi in the West. It was these who led their armies 
or armies of uh, those who followed them, who were, shut for lack of a better word, baseline human. They led armies of baseline humanity uh, on their expeditions into Israel. They conducted this massive expedition, an invasion, a foreign invasion across uh, Central Asia, taking the Silk Road uh, to reach Israel and, uh, and then uh, baptize the Christ child. Remember that Christ was not his name. His name was, of course, Jesus. And it was only through baptism he was anointed the Christ, which is a title. It is not a name. It is a title. Uh, this is why it is illegal. You can look this up yourself. It is illegal to name your child Christ. You cannot name your child Christ in the sense of uh, as we understand it. Because it is a title and not a name. Now, Christ was given that title because of, well, Chinese vampires of a monastic order from which my mother is descended or was descended. And uh, that is, of course, how I learned so much from her about the reality of many of these so-called mythical entities and their place in the greater order of creation. And so, um, again, we can go deeply into the story of the Magi at another point in time, but hopefully that provides enough background for now uh, to, to work with, so to speak. Uh, understand that when, if you're doubting that text I'm referencing, it is called The Revelation of the Magi. You can purchase a copy of it. Uh, that will be an American translation, or excuse me, an English translation, a translation into the English from the ancient Aramaic. It was rediscovered not that long ago. And it, uh, it is the most complex, the richest, the most strange, the, the strangest story of the wise men to come out of Christian antiquity. It was translated by Brent Landau, uh, who's an expert in ancient biblical languages and literature. He was the man who translated it for the first time in all of human history into English, into the English language. He teaches religious studies or the religious studies program at the University of Oklahoma. And he translated the text from Syriac, which was a language extant along with, it was coeval, existed at the same time as Aramaic, the language spoken by Jesus Christ. And um, his book, again, is uh, titled The Revelations of the Magi, and it's subtitled The Lost Tale of the Wise Man's Journey to Bethlehem. Now, the ancient text's original authors are, for all intents uh, and purposes, unknown as individuals. But it was, of course, uh, the Magi themselves who wrote it. And uh, it is from their point of view. Landau tracked this book down that they wrote in the Vatican archives. And the copy that he found there was 1,700 years old. Yes, they dated it, and it was 1,700 years old, the copy that he translated from. Mm. And um, so, again, understand this. An incredibly grand story. Uh, the Magi are revealed in that text to be the descendants of Adam and Eve's third son, Seth, and therefore, that was the original SS, the sons of Seth. And uh, this righteous third son of Adam, his name is mocked or inverted by Satanists or Infernalists or Diabolists into Set without the H necessarily, but still properly pronounced with a Seth N, that from whence we derive the word Satan. Think of this. Many girls in Brazil, in particular, where the language is Portuguese, are named Lucifer. And uh, this is because they are bringers of light. They bring light into the family. So the short name, of course, the diminutive would be Lucy. Uh, but uh, if you found out their full name, it would be Lucifer. And so young girls are named Lucifer. It's not a bad name in Brazil. They're light bringers. They bring light into the world. 
there is no uh, evil seen in them as intrinsic to their names. That is the case with Seth. It is a name that uh, is more like a commitment, it means. And uh, this is uh, inverted in the sense of the diabolic contract by Seth Ann. Uh, but uh, other than that, the, um, the name is an honorable name until inversion by an infernalist. So uh, this is something that has given people uh, the fear of truth. It uh, is probably the greatest triumph of Diabolus would be the fear that the baseline ignorant public has of the truth. Uh, the Magi were very much hidden from much of history, and this book was not incorporated into the Bible because of the racism of the men who helped to form the Bible, uh, the Council of Nicaea, the men who decided that they would uh, excise the story of the Magi who baptized uh, Jesus into the, his position as the Christ, the men who made him king of kings. And this is because they were not baseline human. They were vampires, and vampires out of China. So this is uh, why uh, the communion, of course, represents the blood of Christ. The bread represents his flesh. This is what you could decry as a form of vampirism and cannibalism in the sacrament itself. But uh, it comes from that background of the vampires who recognized Christ as not being human either, but rather more like Hercules, uh, the son of God, half human, half divine. So, in the text itself of the Revelation of the Magi, they live in this far eastern land, the text references as Shir, and from other ancient texts, the place is, of course, China. And uh, so the rediscovered text uh, describes the Magi as practicing religious rituals, waiting for the star of Bethlehem to appear. When the star finally does, they embark on their journey to the city of David. And, uh, of course, this uh, reality, the in-depth exposition of the wise men's story, is strikingly different from the one you get in the Bible, which is told in only 12 verses in the Gospel of Matthew. In the Revelation of the Magi, the star of Bethlehem not only led the wise men, the vampire, but actually became the Christ child. Uh, the cave is filled with light. They are actually hesitant about this uh, because of any vampire's uh, just aversion to strong light in general. But eventually, the star, its light concentrates and reveals a small luminous being, a human being, a star child, which is Christ. And so, this is a lost message from the early Christians, the true Christians. Christians, before there was a Christ. And uh, the star child spracketh to the Magi. You can read this in the text if you were to assess it yourself. And uh, Christ tells them. And what he says is, the star child, Christ as the star child, says, this is one of many occasions on which I have appeared to the peoples of the world. So what this text is saying is that there are no non-Christian religions because Christ is the revelation behind everything. So, that is the lost message about the true Christians from the earliest of all Christian communities. So, the scope of Christ's revelation is literally beyond your comprehension. Now, if one were to travel to Bethlehem to track the journey of the Magi, as Shimon Gibson, a biblical archaeologist and the author of several books, did, he's the author of The Final Days of Jesus, uh, subtitled The Archaeological Evidence, there are roads coming from the east that lead directly to Bethlehem. One road goes all the way to China, the Spice Route. 
It uh, came up through the desert. It would have been a common sight in the time of Jesus to see tradesmen coming along with their caravans. And the landscape described in the Gospel of Matthew is similar to what one sees in modern Israel. And, of course, uh, the tradition is linked with reality. The elements of the familiar nativity scene only make sense uh, when based on the historical and archaeological data of the time. If you were arriving in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago and someone said, we're going to give you the stable to sleep in, it's not being rude, uh, it's the warmest room in the house. Very different than the story of uh, your Sunday school approach. And the wise men, the vampire, they represent blessing. So... The destination of the Holy Land uh, should continue, well, it should continue to inspire awe and wonderment for Christian pilgrims. As a matter of fact, the day before yesterday, at this point in time, what would have been yesterday when I started this transmission, was the day when King Richard the Lionhearted arrived in the Holy Land. And uh, so there's a historical date for you there of continuity. Now, according to the Israeli government, uh, their tourism figures, one and a half million people or 1.4 million people have visited the sacred grounds of Bethlehem. Uh, you know, they do so within um, the, uh, well, I'd say once a year, every year. It's about at least that much that travel there. Uh, millions more have been coming for centuries. And uh, in ancient times, travelers from the east would cross miles of desert for months to reach Bethlehem, as the wise men did in the Gospel of Matthew. Most of all, as an invading army, they're the men who saved your God, the man who would be recognized as the salvation of all men on earth. These were the men who made certain that he wasn't taken by Herod the Edomite and slaughtered. Herod took out his wrath on every other boy in the land that he slaughtered in place of Christ. But the vampire, they're the ones who saved your God and coronated him the king of kings. The vampires out of China. Coming from the east into the land of Canaan, into Israel, where tourists... Well, if you were to travel there, you would, it, it, in a sense, truly brings you home, a place you're supposed to be, coming to a place where you belong. That feeling is because of this subspecies of humanity that you consider predatory on that very essence of your own life that pulses through your veins. So, uh, just remember that about the Magi, and you'll never see Christmas the same again. Now, in terms of uh, other aspects of this that's important to understand about the uh, Revelation, uh, understand that uh, only uh, China and uh, Korea make us mention of seeing any unusual star in the sky when it appeared in the fifth year before Christ. Half a decade before Christ uh, even walked the earth. By the time they reached him, he was a young boy. He was not an infant. And they coronated him as a very young man. And in the Revelation of the Magi, it's revealed that he laughs, which you never read of Christ laughing at all in the Bible itself. So, uh, when it comes into a simple navigation check, understand that uh, if you were to interpret the Star of Bethlehem as uh, a fixed point uh, where only those on the same latitude would see the exact same sky... Then Bethlehem sits at 
31 to 42, 11 degrees to the north, by 35 to uh, 11, uh, well, 44 degrees east. So when you start looking east from that point for capital cities that the wise men came as through from the east, well, there were a lot of cities, but no capitals until you come across Yan, the ancient capital of China, which sits at 34 degrees, about 16 degrees north, by 108, uh, uh, the latitude versus longitude to 54 degrees east. At the time of Christ's birth, that was the capital city of China known as Chang'an. And, as I said, only China and Korea even make us mention of seeing an unusual star in the sky five years before Christ was born. And Chinese traveled regularly west on the Silk Route, reaching even Rome itself, where silk was a big seller. And ironically, some of the Roman men complained, calling the Chinese silk decadent. The city of Damascus was a major intersection on the Silk Road. From Damascus, it also went south to Egypt. Now, at the time of Christ's birth, there were three particularly high-ranking officials under the emperor Ai of Han, who reigned from 27 to the year that Christ was born, from 27 years B.C., until the first year of our Christian calendar. And those three officials who served under him were Huantan, the Athal, the official and philosopher, uh, Liu Jin, later known as Liu Zhu, the astronomer, historian, and editor, and Yang Xiong, who was an author. All contemporaries. And uh, those men uh, may have taken the trip, uh, as well as their representatives, they would be referred to as wise men. Uh, kings only in the sense that they were direct representatives of the emperor. And, uh, of course, they were accompanied by traders and soldiers for protection. Uh, at that time, not only was China a major trader, they were developing a major think tank and studying other civilizations. So, the three wise men of ancient Feng Shui, known as Fuk Luk, Fuk Luk Sao, now, these would have been brought to the emperor. Fuk brings wealth or good fortune and harmony to the family. Luk, as in luck, brings power, a high government official, and holds the Ruyi, or the scepter. Sao carries nectar or a peach and a walking stick, which represents longevity. They make statuettes of these characters to buy and bring harmony to the home, but they must be placed correctly. And to escape a rod's murderous squads, Joseph, Mary, and jo Jesus himself journeyed to Egypt with these travelers, so they were protected from killers, marauders, and thieves. Uh by the Chinese vampires. Understand that much. Very important, and uh, it is what, uh, of course, must be understood before your history even begins to make any sense. It uh, does not until you actually take us this into account. Now, of course, ever since that book was uh, released, I have been teaching uh, the, uh, the average layman as much as I could about this. It's only tonight that I'm bringing up aspects of it I've never brought up before. It's very important to understand that because now we get into the position of trying to understand for the average person the Nyaga, which were brought up by, of course, our friend uh, Mr. Salman Sheikh. Now, in terms of the... Uh, Naga, uh, and there are different pronunciations for the Nyega and exactly what um, they represent in their battles against uh, the 
draconic or uh, the Hachurui, the serpent folk, and uh, the uh, uh, various other reptilian races that uh, don't necessarily get along. The uh, people might imagine or fantasize a coalition of reptilians that would be antithetical to uh, humanity. And, of course, this is what represents the alien aspect of the Japanese to so many uh, American peoples. As I brought up, uh, the descent from the Hachurui to a great extent from the sunken continent of uh, New Zealandia, which you can look up, of course, and when you find out information about the Zealandia undersea, it is that hidden seventh continent that is scientifically uh, been proven to be that sunken continent which many occultists reference as Mu. And uh, that uh, is a revelation that uh, gives some people an aspect as to the quote unquote alienness, the alien nature of the Japanese too. There's so many other cultures on earth. Now, the reason that that's important is because when we think of these various serpent folk, which, as Noreen Helpan, a follower of Buddhism, explained to us, are noted as being able to achieve enlightenment themselves, just as a human being can. Uh, this is something that uh, she expressed in an interview with myself when uh, she was... Uh, uh, talking about her Buddhist faith at the time. I don't know if she still adheres to that. But she was bringing up the fact that other sentient or semi-sentient species can attain their enlightenment. Our friend Brendan Zogit was looking at a cat that uh, was very much a, a mascot of the Buddhist church in Taiwan and how it is at a point where it can it eats vegetarian food and this is like um, something that you never want to do to your cat do not try to force it into vegetarianism it will die cats are true carnivores but this cat has attained a state of enlightenment and prays in front of the buddhist statue with its paws together brendan zogate can relate that story and you can find footage of it on youtube so um, that would be the Taiwanese Buddhist cat. You can look for that. Uh, it, because these different species can attain a form of enlightenment, the one species of reptilians where that seems to be most common in terms of reptilian sapiens would be the Nyaga. And so the Nyaga uh, would be primarily seen as the human torsoed uh, serpent people. And uh, they would have a serpentine body and a, a more of a human-like torso that uh, would not necessarily be a true human torso. Matter of fact, it's more a symbolic representation. But to influence history, the Niegas need to find people who can do what they need, where and when they need it. And they prefer people who would... Uh, serve their goals willingly, but they don't consider this essential. Yegas can look forward to a person's timeline to find points when he might make decisions that benefit or hinder their own plans. And when they find such people, the Nyagas can suddenly create situations that encourage the person to make the decision they want. And finding a suitable moment of decision in the manifold possibilities of the future that would be an indication of their precognitive abilities. And this, of course, is something that would drive a normal man mad. To be able to see the future is not necessarily a positive. In fact, it's not positive at all. Man lives for the unexpected. Now, in terms of Vinyaga, understand that the Lord Buddha himself was said to be of serpent lineage. A very important point to make in that regard. And as Salman Sheikh said, he was protected by the super serpent, 
uh, through the storms. And this is, of course, but indicative of the fact that he was recognized as one of them. In a very real sense, at least partially of their bloodline. So when you look back on the Buddha and you see the enlightenment that he offered the world, remember that in a sense he is but another form of Nyega, a Nyega unto himself, a, a serpentine or semi-serpentine uh, humanoid who was also very much a human Aryan warrior of the supreme caste of the ancient Vedic system and the ancient Vedic hierarchy, which I've gone to in depth in the past when I spracketh of the Buddha as the warrior who survived multiple assassination attempts, uh, not some effete and, uh, and, and just basically fat and bloated um, uh, humorous looking chubby character that uh, he was caricatured into by the Chinese uh, to make him more palatable. Rather, he was the epitome of the Aryan warrior that had came in and conquered India, a member of that ruling caste and very much a sufferer of post-traumatic stress disorder from his combat experiences. And that's when he... Uh, sought enlightenment and found it and uh, and was aided by the Nyaga and therefore they helped to steer him in the direction as in a very real sense one of their own that enabled him to ultimately find enlightenment and thereby share it uh, with others. Now if you want any textual evidence for this uh, the the uh, best book that I would um, recommend would be The Popular Religion and Folklore of Northern uh, or Aryan India. And uh, The Popular Religion and Folklore of Northern India is published in two volumes. And it was first published in 1896. It was authored by the British Orientalist William Crook, surname spelled C R O O O K E of the most eminent order of the Indian Empire and fellowship of the British Academy, who died the very year my late and sainted mother was born, 1923. And uh, so um, in his book uh, is where you find uh, the fact that the Buddha himself is said to have been of serpent lineage. And of course, to the ancient Chinese, twas the divine empress, and the Bible says that God made people and thereafter caused the universal flood, whereas in Zhonghua Ren, or Chinese mythology, the half-human and half-serpentine mother goddess, uh, creative ambitions, uh, led her to make the earliest ancestors of humanity by shaping people out of clay, but... Rather than causing the Ur flood, she stopped it by mending a hole in the sky and repairing the Pillar of Tian, or the Pillar of Heaven itself. So uh, the differences in the Western and Eastern mythologies is striking. The nurturing serpent mother, which is considered diabolic under the uh, Christianization of the concept with a vengeful desert god, the patriarchs of uh, Judea, uh, created for humanity. So, um, in terms of uh, these Nyaga, uh, understand that um, thanks to them, uh, humanity never stood alone against uh, the threats of the anti-gods. And for countless millennia, the Nyagas have served as helpers and advisors. Um, mythology speaks of serpents, dragons, and snake men as bringers of wisdom, prosperity, and civilization, as oft times as it portrays them as corruptors and destroyers. The Nyaga have refused to disclose their own origins, but they have existed as long as the dragons of uh, yore and certain secret traditions. <laughs> 
such as the one my mother was a part of, say the Nyagas and the dragons founded the first civilizations and used them to make war upon each other, a war for the future of humanity, a war that continues to this day. Only nowadays, the Nyagas stay in the background, bound by an inscrutable code of conscience, raising empires and casting them down, but never meeting force with force. Unlike uh, the dragon, the Nyagas do not compel people to do anything. Instead, they create situations where the right person is in the right place at the right time to do what the Nyagas want. And pay the personal cost. Now, uh, the Nyagas are a bit more straightforward with mystics who show concern for humanity. Uh, they oftentimes warn super mages about major plots uh, by the cultists of the kings of Edom, the Erodian insurgency, but even then, they give only the information a hero absolutely needs to stop the plot. And uh, if one were to ask the obvious questions of what are the Nyagas, or from whence did they come, uh, why do they oppose uh, other reptilian races or the anti-gods and the cults of Edom, the masters of occult lore would agree that solving the mystery of the Nyagas would also solve the mystery of the dragons and the anti-gods, the adversaries of both, or vice versa. But, of course, no one seems to know those answers. But the Nyagas themselves, and they would never share. They only say that until humanity can master the anti-gods, or contain them, or expel them on their own, on its own, they must follow their duty. Now, despite their commitment to human destiny, the Nyagas are pacifists in general. They, uh, any truly desperate situation, of course, would prompt them to act directly, and even then, they would attempt to avoid violence. They may help humanity's champions, but they insist that humanity must solve its own problems and fight its own battles. But uh, from what I knew, from what my mother said, certainly confirmed by what Salman Sheikh found out for himself to degree when he visited the grave that he did. The name Nyaga, of course, when you analyze the Sanskrit word from the original Vedic text, it simply means serpent and has become a symbol of wisdom in Indian culture, as opposed to cunning as it is in the West. But of course, its true origin is based on the existence of the intelligent serpents that came into our dimension millennia past and then found themselves trapped when the tide of dark matter ebbed and light came into the world. Now they live as gods in isolated temples, all but forgotten by modern civilization. As our man Solomon said, where no normal man could live. Now, in physical reality, not the mythic representation or the symbolic illustrations that we see of this human torso and head coming out of a serpentine body. Really, the Nyaga appears like any other extremely large snake. You would think of it as something like the super snakes of prehistory that uh, we still hear of or sometimes see photographs of in the Amazon rainforest. The most famous one, quite real, and taken before there was any such program as Photoshop, and when uh, alteration of such photographs would have been impossible, was one of a supremely large snake in the Amazon that reared its head up to attack a helicopter. 
That photograph that was taken, you should be able to find on the internet. Again, that's quite real. Think of a serpent that size. But like a cobra, it can expand the ribs in its neck. Though, in this case, not to necessarily create a hood, though the effect is somewhat similar. By contorting its muscles and ribs, the Nyaga can simulate the appearance of a human face, albeit one covered in scales. Now, despite their vast wisdom and their legions of worshippers, the Nyaga are not particularly well disposed towards human beings. Despite their helping humanity understand that they find our species savage and ruthless, and they feel that only through several lifetimes of prayer and meditation can humans ever begin to truly understand the lessons the Niega teach them. And consequently, the Niega do not react favorably to humans who are not part of their temple. A Niega accosted in its sanctum would automatically assume that the strange humans wish it harm and reacts by trying to first separate the intruders, and then dispatch them one at a time. Now, by using its obvious telepathic powers of suggestion, where from whence we get the myths of snakes being able to hypnotize their prey with their eyes, the Niega would lure interlopers into the labyrinthine passages of their temple, waiting for one to be alone and when that opportunity arises, the Niego would basically stare down and paralyze the target, enwrap it, and constrict it. And by the time the victim would be able to react, it's too late to escape the Niaga's coils. And of course, the other attack it would be loath to deploy would be its poisonous bite. That, of course, would be... Well, its fangs would inject a very milky venom that would act as a powerful neurotoxin. Now, anyone dying in that matter, which would probably be the next five minutes, uh, would experience wild hallucinations and visions while dying. Now, in terms of the Nyaga that are in the world, Almost all can be found in remote temples in India, Pakistan, and Nepal. Now, I understand there's only nine that my mother knew of. And she told myself that this might be the last nine on earth. And they've lived in these sanctuaries for centuries, tended by human servants to whom they impart the wisdom only millennia old creatures can. Well, this wisdom is dispensed in their venom. Just as venom is needed to curate an antitoxin for snake venom or as a cure for other toxins, the venom is a double-edged sword. When an ounce of this substance, known as Nyaga milk, is properly prepared and imbibed, it graces the human uh, psionic, uh, psychic, or psionic ability. The psychic would mean a passive radar kind of uh, understanding of the world around you. Precognition, prescience. Uh, psionic would mean your ability to impact the world around you. Moving objects. Uh, starting fires with your mind. Now, in terms of what happens to you, really, the choice is up to the Nyaga. And is supposedly they'll entertain suitably humble requests. Now, many of the Nyaga's human servants live out their entire lives waiting for a taste of Nyaga milk.
but never touch a single drop. The Niega are particularly susceptible to fluctuations in the aether. And when it is exceptionally low in terms of vibratory resonance, they enter a kind of hibernation. And their sleep can last for centuries, during which time their followers wait faithfully for the reawakening of their divine masters. When Anyaga first awakes, it sheds its old skin, a process that requires several days. And during that time, and for approximately uh, a fortnight, 14 nights, to our weeks thereafter, the Nyaga is particularly vulnerable, having effectively no armor and only half its usual strength. The legends among followers sayest that in times past, ruthless individuals took advantage of the Nyaga's weakness and forced them to give up their milk in those periods. And those legends further state that these people were driven irrevocably mad by the precognitive dreams they suffered thereafter. Now, my mother learned about this during the time she was operating in liaison with the Japanese Kempeitai. Emperor Hirohito's own Gestapo. They were asking for an audience on behalf of the God Emperor, Hirohito himself, with the temple's master in an area between Pakistan and uh, didn't even exist then. It was more towards India, may have even been, from the way she described, I would venture it was probably Nepal. But I remember that um, some of the areas she described, in terms of where they were forced to travel, must have been through what is today's Pakistan, through the Kashmiri region at least claimed by both India and Pakistan. But there was a 10,000-year-old monk that they were told was expecting them. When they arrived, the temple worshippers told the Kempe Tai, which is no mere police force, it's a military force in all but name, they were told by the followers, the temple worshippers, that evil men had arrived and carried off their lord in what they said was a vimana. Well, that, of course, was their way of referencing in the Vedic sense a, a flying machine, an arrowcraft. And they were, these worshippers, begging the Kempe Tai to find their master, and bring him home. Well, it was then that the Kempe Tai, on returning to civilization, learned that it was Franklin Delano's expeditions, Franklin Roosevelt's expeditions into Asia, the same ones where they were searching for the Christ child. His incarnation, that they could murder him, as the Americans ultimately did. They learned that the American communist industrialist, Mr. Wallace, vice president of the United States, was searching in that area with the teams that he had dispatched in this flying machine. An experimental gyrocopter 
what today we would call a primitive helicopter. That was essentially a reconnaissance tool. But the Vimana they were discussing was an American helium super dirigible, which the Americans had a monopoly on, a stable blimp of the rigid airframe that had traveled into Nepal to take this so-called 10,000-year-old monk, the Super Serpent, into their transportation, their containment unit, which they airlifted out of Nepal, obviously in a scheme to milk their venom because he was found by the Kempe Tai that Vice President Wallace of the United States was seeking the reputed temples of the other nine known Yaga in a scheme to milk their venom for his own use, something that he could industrially synthesize. He already had one, the Niega, that he had captured. America was well equipped enough to capture more. When the Kempe Tai recovered the Niaga, perhaps something more important than the saving of the manifestation of the Christ child that was killed in Mongolia. My question was to my mother if the Nyaga had rewarded her or any of their party with its milk. And she never answered that. But this is the war, the real war of World War II that none of you have ever learned of or ever dreamt was taking place. The Americans strove on behalf of the anti-gods to bring an end to all creation, to rape the Niega, or the protectors of humanity, of the very essence of wisdom that Americans seem entirely empty of. This is the kind of struggle which people need to learn of so they can better understand the world they live in. Now, in the few hours we have remaining, I'll try my best to bring that all together, and this may have to continue into another transmission with the nature of the ghoul. How this connects to the Great Wall of China. All of you might think that that movie that came out back in what year was it? 2019? Uh, called The Great Wall. Matter of fact, we can look the movie up. Okay. Uh, Great Wall movie when it was released. This was a movie that had many failings in terms of it being a what we used to call in commercial illustration when you get two artists to work on a project or multiple artists, you get what's called a camel, which is an ugly thing. The Great Wall was essentially a cinematic camel. Now, it was released in the same year, 2016, that I was talking about that George Takei was uh, confronting the fact that they were going to take his character and turn that character into something totally discombobulated someone who was supposed to have a daughter with this extraordinary glamazon queen 
uh, who was doing that for reasons that remain totally inexplicable since he's supposed to have come out as gay, uh, all the while that uh, he's hiding in a closet in the 25th fucking century when uh, no man needs to do that. All of that, of course, is a camel. That's a camel. This is what happens when you get too many artists working on the same project and you create an ugly thing. Hmm. The Great Wall was that as a film. However, what you may not understand, I forget the mercenary warrior Matt Damon imprisoned within the Great Wall. Remember wave what? after wave of those marauding beasts besieging that supermassive structure? All of that is based on a real Chinese mythos, the Tao Te, the manifestation of greed and gluttony in China that goes back to all the ages before time. You can look up the ancient Chinese bronze vessels, and there are these angular vessels. And uh, they portray the creature you see in those films. The Tao Di. The Tao Te. It's this elusive creature with bulging eyes, gaping mouths. The design is on those bronze vessels, those urns. And uh, it represents this bottomless jaw. If you take a look at the design of the face, it is comprised of animal profiles that together, these animal profiles facing each other, symmetrically create a face with a bottomless mouth, a mouth that has no lower jaw. In other words, there's no sating. It's hunger. Now, before its appearance in written history, the Tao Te existed in the documented form of these ancient ornaments, these bronze items, the precursors to written storytelling throughout the Bronze Age, where you can look these items up and you will see these non-human creatures that dominate the bronze art as early as the Shang Dynasty. Uh, enduring uh, throughout the Zhao dynasty. Now, all of these animals form what's known as a central zoomorphic image, meaning a beast. As I said, no lower jaw, heavy eyebrows, ears, sometimes horns. This Bronze Age iconography, uh, what it was created for, the purpose, the represented obvious narrative. And of course, scholars will argue about this throughout the ages. And one of the first things they found through their arguments and investigations was that this goes back to earlier ages, to the Neolithic age, when we were barely human, where the images of the Tiao Te beast face spans multiple artistic forms including jade, and hence their ancient jade objects. The jade was used because it most resembled the color of the beast, and this is why the creatures are jade green in the film, The Great Wall. So these Dao Te depict the animal helpers, what witches in Europe would call familiars of both male and female shamans, Chinese witches and warlocks, who aided communication between the living and the dead. And, of course, they represent what became prosperity. Because the Bronze Age artisans created these Chinese vessels under the employment of the rich and the powerful. Thus, the Tao Te, the universal figure on such items, so pervasive as to be almost universal, 
served as a status symbol meant to evoke the owner's social class. Now, that interpretation from scholastic investigation holds up when you consider that the beginning in the Warring States period, which my mother studied the history of more than any other, was when these bronze vessels were changing in their status of what they represented. And instead of representing prosperity and status, came to represent unmitigated greed. It's like when Elon Musk says, I'm taking you to Mars. And it's exposed that the son of a bitch pays zero income tax. Not a goddamn cent in income tax. And he says he's going to save humanity. That was the fall in status these beings represented. Originally, they were commissioned, these bronze works, the jade, the urns, not just for any wealthy patrons, but for the Shang Dynasty kings themselves. These kings, believed to have gods as their ancestors, maintained their power through conquests and battle and successful harvests. With, of course, sacrificial offerings to the king's ancestral deities and to the supreme deity. D. D I is how it would be Romanized in the English. D would represent the god of gods. Allah. Yahweh. The god of hosts. And, of course, from that you get concepts of men of great power, as Jameson was relating, Vampire Hunter D, the representation in the Japanese of the echoes of that ancient Chinese religion. All of these were collected, these sacrifices, collected from lesser nobles in the form of processions, spoils from hunts, and, of course, animals uh, to either be sacrificed or eaten. The bronze vessels used in such tributes to collect the blood. They were adorned with the early images of the Jiao Te. And, of course, they were of utmost importance, being fundamental to the rituals and thus instrumental in politics. And even the overall economy. In fact, bronze-making skills were honed almost exclusively around ornamental pursuits, rather than functional ep efforts or, or mobilization towards something like weaponry or uh, agricultural tools. They were strictly symbolic, ornamental, religious, oft-times blood containers. So, we can infer from this that the image of the Tiao Te upon them with its fangs and its horns and its large eyes was an integral component of early Chinese ceremonial and religious life. And over time, the Tiao Te bronze vessels developed connections to food for humans also. What's good enough for the gods is good enough for the kings. And the feasts of ancient China were notorious. In the Zhao Dynasty, from 1,045 years before Christ was born to 256 years before he came into this veil of tears from his mother's loins, which was after the Bronze Age. He was estimated for that period of time, which must have seemed an eternity that some 60% of the ruling kings and servants were dedicated to food-related duties, even uh, to the point that the majority of the population lived with chronic deprivation and even starvation. And the filling of these bronze vessels with sacrificial food 
or food for a feast. Food for the gods or food for the kings was associated with the Jiao De. And thence, that motif of abundance underscored that having enough to share was a sign of good fortune, good manners, really, and social inclusion. That emerged in this period through the last three periods of the Zhao dynasty. And uh, that's when the outbreak of all-out war, total war, among the kingdoms meant that feeding one's soldiers became more of a priority than feasting for the nobility. And further strain was placed upon all food supplies. The Jiao Te motif on the bronze vessels then became seen as a sign of overindulgent extravagance to be avoided at all costs during wartime. It's no surprise then that the artistic rendering of the Jiao Tai face ended up inspiring mythology in the form of the Jiao Te monster one of the four legendary monsters, or the sins of Chinese culture. And in Chinese mythology, the portrayal of these monsters served an instructive, even protective purpose. Could be portrayed as repelling evil or helping Humans avoid real dangers, like the gargoyles on the churches of Gothic Europa. The Gothic cathedrals were adorned with the gargoyles who fought off the demons and rendered the churches a safe haven for Christians. Creatures like the Tiao Te were considered real and mythological, capable of occupying either or both states. That said, the mythological version of the Tiao Te, with its insatiable appetite and incredible greed, definitively inspired fear as it offered instruction. That is to say, well, they were man-devouring beasts after all. You need merely watch the film... The Great Wall, the narratives of the Jiao Te, which you might have thought was some stupid indulgence of CGI, which, of course, it is CGI that represents them on the screen. They're not a product of any modern mind. Their first written records begin to appear around the 4th century before Christ, starting with the Zhao tradition or Zhao's commentary, Zhao Zhuan who happens to be, that happens to be the first complete narrative work in Chinese literature. And uh, as the story goes, in ancient times, two of the ruling gods had eight virtuous sons each, and three other gods had one worthless son each, Hundun, or chaos, Chongji, or complete deviation, and Diaowu, or the benighted trouble or ignorant malevolence. And these in turn became as the three evils, the three malevolences, the three sins of China passed down through generations until the time of Emperor Yao, a legendary ruler in Chinese mythology. And during Yao's reign, a fourth evil son was born to the ancient Jin Yun clan, a monster of infinite greed, of infinite hunger and thirst that could never be satisfied. And he hoarded food and refused to share even with those most in need of charity. 
to the point where he ate other human beings who came to beg for all the food he hoarded. Rather than share with them, he made them food as well. He was called Tao Te, and he became the fourth malevolence, which is considered the number that rhymes with death in China and Japan, the number to be avoided at all costs, as 13 is in the Western world. Now, all these malevolences, Emperor Yao's minister expelled the four malevolences and their entire clans to the four edges of the earth, one in each cardinal direction, tasking them with warding off the anti-gods, the extra-stellar or extra-cosmic entities that consistently seek to bring our world to decay, destruction. Of course, there's variances to every myth. There is, of course, one from the Ming Dynasty scholar Yang Shen that wrote in his own text, Sheng An Waiji, that uh, Jiao Jie is one of the nine children of the dragon who could think of nothing but devouring and slaking his thirst and hunger. Now, of course, there's many other Chinese classics that mention many similar sounding creatures that are uh, terrifying. In terms of one of these comprehensive texts, that uh, comes to mind. The geography of nature and a bestiary, uh, the guideways through mountains and seas is the title of that particular work that comes to my mind that uh, is uh, representative of uh, so much of Chinese culture. The classic of mountains and seas. It's known as Shan Hai Jing. It's a comprehensive text, as I said, of Chinese mythology, geography, nature. Uh, it's zoography. It's animals. That's when uh, they basically, it's composed between the fourth and first centuries before the Christian era. All of the strange creatures of China are portrayed in it. They're depicted pictorially, but it's instructions uh, for humanity to live among them safely. The text conveys them as all being extant and quite real. Now, the earliest Tao Te bronze images may not uh, resemble the creatures in that book, but the philosopher and scholar Wapu, who lived 276 years after Christ. He was born then, and he died 324 years after Christ had walked the earth. He was considered an expert on the text, and he insists that this same Tao Te mentioned in Tao's commentary was the same in that comprehensive zoography of China. And, of course, the Jiao Te have since appeared long before that film in some games and card games like Yu-Gi-Oh! or video games manufactured in Asia or even China itself. But that film, The Great Wall, was when the Jiao Te graced the silver screen for the first time in history, portrayed as that alien reptilian uh, species that species with dark green skin, the color of jade, its sharp teeth, the body markings similar to the pattern seen in ancient bronze Chinese vessels. And, of course, you can roll your eyes at Matt Damon's man bun, but that movie is exemplary in its graphic portrayal 
of the Jiao Jie themselves. That, of course, is the only reason you're seeing the film and the only thing that makes it worthwhile. All of that based on 4,000 years of Chinese history. But that great wall that's exemplified in that film brings us back to the four perils of Chinese mythology. In Chinese astronomy, the four evil creatures, the four perils, the four fiends, Zi Zhong, there is a group of these four creatures exiled by the gods, antagonistic counterparts of the four celestial animals, the azure dragon, vermilion bird, black tortoise, and white tiger. These four evils are still out there. Just remember that apart from protectors and godlike creatures, there are also evil beings in Chinese mythos, Si Xiong, the four evils, being among the most famous. The four evils again are Diao Jie, Hun Dun, Chong Ji, Diao Wu. Each holds evil characteristics such as encouraging greed, distorting truth, making wars. The evil beast's names are still oftentimes referred to as metaphors out of superstition. And, of course, there are some legends that suggest the four evils were born from four evil and rebellious tribe leaders after they died in ancient times. San Miao, Huan Do, Gong Gong, and Gun ruled, well, they all ruled in the reign of the Shun Emperor, who was defeated and exiled in the end. But there are many other stories as to the origins of the beast, as for the Dao Te, the symbol of greed, as described in the Shanghai Jing, the classic of mountains and seas. Dao Te is also ooh, a manifestation that was said to feature a sheep's body, tiger's teeth, human face and hands, very similar to the beasts of the book of Revelation in the Bible. Its eyes are hidden under his armpits, and yet it has a baby's voice, but still eats humans. In fact, in the folk stories, Diao Te eats everything. The monster is so greedy, it even eats its own body, which it regenerates. Therefore, the patterns of Diao Te are found in those ancient cooking vessels yet only with its head, because it's eaten all of its own body, which has yet to regenerate. The Jiao Te Sheng Yan, the feast for Jiao Te, is oft times used in Chinese to indicate an extraordinarily grand banquet with delicious food. And, of course, the director that used this Rich Mythos, to generate those movie monsters in the Great Wall, Zhang Yimu, was remembering and hearkening back to the legend suggesting that when the Yellow Emperor beheaded Qi Yu, his head fell on the earth and became his Yao Di. That was why the Emperor had to build the Great Wall. Of course, there was Hun Dun, the other malevolence, there's different variant versions. The version of Hun Dun in the Shen Yi Jing, the classic of gods and strange animals, writ in the Han Dynasty of 206 years before Christ through to 220 years after Christ walked the earth is the most common. And in this version, Hun Dun is a monster that cannot distinguish right from wrong. Hun Dun is shaped like a huge dog has bear's palms, yet no claws. Its eyes, well, it has eyes, but cannot see. It can walk, yet cannot move. It has ears, but cannot hear. It has a belly, yet with no organs, such as a heart, liver, spleen, lungs and kidney. It has intestines, yet cannot twist. Anything it eats passes through the intestines directly. This is something you would see in the human centipede. It's capable of human emotions, yet it cannot distinguish 
right from wrong. And when encountering noble men, Hundun will have conflict with them. But upon meeting evil people, it will follow their instructions. Xian Jing, on the other hand, describes it as a god bird, colored red and shaped like a bag. Six feet, four wings, yet no face. Living in Jiangshan Mountain, singing and dancing. Now, as recorded in Zhuangzi, the book by the Taoist philosopher Zhuang Zhao and a student of his, Hundun was the emperor of central China with no apertures like eyes, nostrils, mouth, or ears. He treated the emperors of South Sea and North Sea well at his place. Intending to repay his hospitality, the other two emperors offered to dig seven apertures for Hundun. They dug one aperture a day. Yet when all the seven apertures were done, Hundun died. Now, in terms of the other malevolence, Zhongji, as recorded in the Shan Jun, Zhongji looks like a tiger with wings and always eats humans from the head. It can speak human language. It's good at confusing people's minds and making wars, or rather starting them. Shen Yi Jing elaborated its character more in detail. When hearing people quarrel, it will eat the reasonable one. When hearing about people who are loyal and faithful, it will bite their noses off. But when hearing people are unreasonable and atrocious, it will offer them his food. There's also versions describing it as a rare animal that eats gu, the legendary venomous insects that harm people. Chongqi is often used as a metaphor for those who act in bad faith and defame those who show loyalty. As written in the Shiji, the historical record, there was a bad offspring of Emperor Shao Hao, who behaved atrociously and resented all loyal people. He was called Chongqi. Dao Wu is the other malevolence I have yet to mention, and according to Sen Yi Jing, Dao Wu is a tiger-like beast with tiger's feet, a man's face, and a pig's teeth. Its hair is two to three meters long, and it has a tail more than 315 meters long. It lives in the remote regions in the west. Tao is often used to label a man who is fierce and stubborn, a bullheaded man. And as recorded in Zhao Zhuan, which be a commentary on the spring and autumn annals, there was a bad offspring of Zhuang Zhu, one of the five great ancient emperors who could not be taught. He could never learn, was unwilling to do so. He was called Dao Wu. All of this ultimately relates to the unclean peoples, the Imondes Gentes, who ate human flesh and had other equally vile traits. The children of Cain, the world's first murderer, were enclosed by God through Alexander the Great in his great wall. It was said, from this people, that is, from the tribe of Don, Antichrist, or his arbinger, shall emerge. Now, Alexander the Great was the baddest man alive. It would take a man that mad to wall in the ghoul, to better them at putting the fright in others. The monster of Macedonia. Of course, on his death day today, which we are in now, I only honor the history by bringing you the truth of Alexander. Something beyond his greatness is the great malevolence he himself manifested. 
something which needs to be appreciated in terms of his accomplishments with which he be credited. Historians have always told us the battlefield atrocities of the Macedonian king were part of his brilliant military strategy. But they were really born of his personality. Alexander III, the king of the ancient state of Macedon, is often heralded as one of history's greatest military commanders. Undefeated in battle, he unleashed his army on countries great and small to forge an empire that stretched over three continents, from Greece to India and as far south as Egypt. He did all this in a little more than a decade after taking power at the age of 20. But the man known as Alexander the Great was also one of history's worst monsters. He was a murderous, rage-filled, paranoid, alcoholic, religious fanatic, who, on at least one occasion, showed a fondness for what today might be considered necrophilia, a physical love of the dead. He murdered often, at times indiscriminately. He assassinated rivals a dozen at a time, slaughtered innocents by the thousands, and exterminated entire races of people. It's no exaggeration to say that Alexander killed off a generation of Macedonian officers, veterans he needed to run the army he inherited from his father Philip. Nor were friends and family spared. Within days of taking the throne, he killed Philip's most recent wife and her new infant, so that that child would never rise to challenge his rule. Recent scholarship has added detail to many of Alexander's atrocities, but there's still little to explain them. Some historians write the horrors off as the excesses of a megalomaniac and alcoholic. Indeed, he was drunk when he ordered the burning of the Persian capital Persepolis in 330, one of the greatest crimes against humanity in terms of cultural genocide. Other scholars argue that Alexander's barbarity stemmed from a strategic decision to systematically destroy his enemy root and stem. But these theories don't always add up. Alexander's atrocities, for example, often did more to stir opposition than to quell it. He was too smart to pursue such a failing strategy for long. But there's at least one other explanation worth exploring. His penchant for atrocity and violence may have been rooted in deep-seated fears that he did not have what it took to be a soldier and commander. Although the most formidable figure of his time, he grew up estranged from the culture of the Macedonian warrior and came to power ill-equipped to command an army. Marginalized and perhaps insecure about his abilities, he seemed angry and intent on proving himself through violence. Many accounts of his most heinous crimes describe him as flying into a rage, his anger begetting violence. It is, of course, risky business to plumb the psychological depths of such a complex historical figure as Alexander, particularly because antiquity provides scant data. Yet the exercise proves valuable, if only to suggest a different way to understand the enigmas that Alexander's life presents us. The Macedonian society of Alexander's day was based on values and practices that were Homeric in origin, form, and function. (sighs) 
In terms of, uh, well, let's just say that unlike most Greek city-states, where the male-dominated warrior society had actually died out, Macedonia was still a land of clans and tribes bonded by warriorhood, dynastic bloodlines, and powerful kings. Alexander's world was one in which the Iliad was not an epic tale, but an illustration of how men still lived, riding, drinking, and fornicating with rude energy and enthusiasm. As in the Iliad, society valued power, glory, bravery most of all. On the field of battle, warriors were expected to demonstrate their bravery to win honor and the esteem of their fellow soldiers. Men were required to prove their courage at a young age. The Macedonian rulers considered themselves descendants of the Greek hero Heracles, Hercules, in the Anglo-corrupted renaming. And the single-handed killing of a wild boar, linked in Macedonian mythology to one of Heracles's Twelve labors was an important rite of passage for all warriors. Until a man killed a wild boar, one of the most dangerous animals on earth, and in some ways smarter than most people, capable of beating you in a game of checkers, it was rumored. Uh, that was, of course, well, until a man killed one of them, he simply was not permitted to recline at the table and eat meat with other soldiers. Instead, he had to sit upright for all to notice. In another Homeric custom, a Macedonian youth who had not yet slain a man in battle was required to wear a cord round his waist to mark him as unbloody, and only when he achieved his first kill could he abandon the cord and join the ranks of warriors, thus symbolically cutting his umbilical cord tying him metaphorically to his mother's pussy. That was how they viewed it. The sons of Macedonian nobles attended the Royal Page School, the Macedonian West Point. Cadets entered at age 14 and graduated in four years at 18 years of age. About 200 were enrolled at any one time. Besides receiving a typical Greek liberal arts education, the students were put through rigorous military training, rough living, horsemanship, fasting, endurance training, hunting, and weapons proficiency were required, and ultimately, if you survived, acquired. Senior cadets sat at the king's table, cared for his horses, served as his bodyguards, and accompanied him on campaign. Some fell in battle, protecting their sovereign. The Royal Page School was the proving ground for Macedonia's combat officers and administrators. Aristotle called it a school for generals. Alexander seems not to have met any of the requirements of a young Macedonian warrior. There is no suggestion in the historical accounts that he hunted and killed any wild boar. Nor did he even attend the Royal Page School for any significant length of time, if indeed at all. Instead, he was sent at the age of 14 years from the court at Pella, the capital, to a private academy set up by Aristotle at Mieza, several miles away. There, Alexander studied poetry, philosophy, literature, and learned how to play the lyre a skill his father belittled because the lyre was an instrument of the Athenian aristocracy. You know, them Greek fucks, the boy lovers. Military studies at the academy were limited to a reading of the Iliad. The historian Plutarch tells us that Alexander carried a copy of the work with him throughout his campaigns. By attending Aristotle's Academy, Alexander missed the opportunity to mix with young warriors and royal princes who would become Macedonia's military elite. Students at the Royal Page School typically formed bonds of comradeship, trust, 
and loyalty with their classmates, bonds that later served them well in war. When Alexander assumed command of the Macedonian army in 336, he was, in essence, an outsider, a soldier as unknown to his officer corps as they were to himself. Alexander had only limited exposure to combat before becoming king. At 17 years of age, he served as temporary regent while his father campaigned in Perinthus and Scythia. Between the years 340 to 339 BC. Mm. When the Maidi, the Maidi being a tribe living on the upper Strymon River in present day Bulgaria, revolted, he mounted a small expedition, put down the uprising, and established a city or a small fortified outpost named after himself. Alexandropolis. At Philip's decisive victory over Athens, Thebes, and uh, other Greek city states at Chaeronea in 338, Philip placed Alexander, who was then 18 years of age, in command of the cavalry on the left flank, according to the Greek historian Diodorus. But it appears that the king did not have full faith in his son. He stationed Alexander alongside his key commanders, including Parmenian and Antipater, whose very name means anti-father or anti-pope. Diodorus notes that Alexander and his men were the first to force their way through the enemy line, but this may only, well, it may mean only that Alexander commanded one of the wedge-shaped cavalry squadrons that struck all along the line, creating gaps for the remaining cavalry to burst through. Interestingly, Alexander apparently did not chalk up his first kill in either of these two early ventures, Records make no mention of such an achievement. Alexander also stood apart from the warrior culture in his physical appearance. The Macedonians, well, they were a big people, thanks largely to their land's plentiful meat and grain. The men were tall, robust, dark-skinned, they had thick cropped hair and wore beards. Not so, Alexander! He was at best average height, perhaps only five foot two inches. Remember, people were a lot shorter in those days. But still, his hair was blonde and tousled, and it is said he wore it long to resemble a lion's mane. He was fair-skinned and clean-shaven, a sign to some of femininity. His teeth were sharply pointed, like little pegs, according to Alexander's biographer, Peter Green. Now, Alexander's voice was high-pitched and tended to harshness when he was excited. He was given to scurrying about in a fast and nervous manner, and he carried his head to the left, either out of some physical defect, perhaps torticollis, or mere affectation. Some people said that that was, that he carried himself like a girl. So when I read Peter Green's book, well, let me read there from a single sentence. There is something almost girlish about his earliest portraits or busts and coins, a hint of leashed hysteria. Well, that's an awful thing for a man to say about females, but... I can understand what he's saying about Alexander. And then there is, of course, the touchy subject of Alexander's homosexual proclivities. Philip and his wife, Olympias, worried early on that their son's apparent lack of... Well, they worried about his lack of heterosexual interests. The Greek scholar, Theophrastus, said they feared that Alexander might be turning into a gynus. Or a womanish man. Olympias went so far as to procure a 
Thessalian courtesan named Calizena to help develop his manly nature. That's how Green puts it in the book. <laughs> the effort was apparently unsuccessful. Plutarch wrote that Alexander did not know any woman before he married other than Barsine, a Persian noblewoman with whom Alexander is supposed to have had an affair in 333 BC, when he was 23, which, by the way, is considered super fucking ancient in the world of his time. That would be equivalent to his, you know, being a half a hundred year old virgin today. But Alexander had had many male lovers over the years, notably his friend Aphasion, who also attended Aristotle's academy and went on to become a general in Alexander's army. When Hef, uh, well, Hephaestion, the Alexander used to call him Hef, when he fell sick and died in 324 BC, Aldeon says that Alexander's grief was so great that he flung himself upon the body of his friend and lay there nearly all day long in tears. Many Alexandrian scholars, notably the British scholar William W. Tarn, in his influential 1933 biography of Alexander, published the year both my biological father ascended to the Reichskanzlerie in uh, Germany, and uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt took the power of the presidency on this side of the Atlantic. Yes, that year, uh, Bill Tarn, the Brit, saw homosexuality as well within the mainstream of Macedonian culture, but Tarn and others wrongly assumed that Macedonian Moors reflected those of Athens, where sexual contact between men and boys was accepted as a part of mentoring. Macedonia, a society that valued manliness, bravery in war, the sexual conquest of women, and the fathering of children, was far less tolerant of homosexuality than Athens. There, man-boy sexual relations were seen as more of an occasional fashion, Long-term sexual relationships between two grown men were frowned upon. This was particularly true in the military, where you can imagine the effect that would have on discipline. Theopompus, a Greek who wrote in the 4th century before Christ, said that soldiers who were homosexuals were considered whores and harlots. Although they were men-slayers, they were by nature men-sodomizers. Whatever Alexander's status within the military elite, his ascension to the throne was complicated. <laughs> when Philip was murdered in 336 BC, Alexander was one of at least three surviving sons. In Macedonian practice, any son, legitimate or illegitimate, had an equal claim to the throne. Alexander killed at least one rival, the son of one of Philip's concubines, the sons of other branches of the royal family also presented the challenge, but Antipater, the only one of Philip's senior officers who was close to Alexander, quickly persuaded the Macedonian assembly to proclaim Alexander king. Now, such speedy action was essential. Attalus and Parmenion, two of Philip's generals and leaders of powerful branches of the royal family, were away from Pella on a campaign, an absence that made it possible to crown the untested Alexander as king. Mm. It's hard to imagine that Alexander was confident about his ability to lead combat veterans and gain their respect. With so little military experience, he had no alternative but to rely upon his generals for advice and guidance. The relationship between the Macedonian officer corps and the king was open and democratic, a soldier's standing was based upon demonstrated courage or, well, on the battlefield, and not upon birth or wealth. Every warrior had equal rights of speech, and the Roman Curtius wrote in the first century Anno Domini, and Alexander's men apparently didn't hesitate to exercise that right. 
They disapproved when he appeared before them wearing the white robes, jeweled slippers, and upright tiara of the Persian king. The royal secretary, Eumenes, had the temerity to suggest that Alexander neglected affairs of state because Alexander was too fascinated by Hephaestion's thighs. Alexander was well aware of his men's doubt. His men criticized his decisions publicly, often during drinking bouts that the king frequently attended. To compete with his officers, big men who had been drinking for years, Alexander often drank far more than his small frame could tolerate. And Alexander likely didn't take their critiques lightly. As an outsider to warrior culture, he may have felt that their questions, however innocuous, directly challenged his leadership. He may also have suspected that they disapproved of his homosexual activities or questioned his very manhood. Now, did their criticism fuel his feelings of inadequacy? That's hard to substantiate, but Alexander was certainly eager to prove himself to his men and earn their acceptance. To that end, he fought bravely, often to the point of recklessness. He was wounded many times, and though descriptions of these injuries are often embellishments that defy medical possibility, unless, like myself, he was a vampire or descended therefrom, because if he were truly vampiric, uh, all statistics would say that he would be too autistic to have functioned in any socially constructive manner, he clearly threw himself into battle with abandon. At the siege of the Citadel, at Multan in 325, during the India campaign, Alexander grew annoyed at the lack of progress and grabbed a scaling ladder from a soldier. He then climbed the citadel, well, the citadel wall, and jumped inside. A near suicidal maneuver, according to Arian, but an act that Alexander, if he died, would wear as the crown of an exploit that would live upon the lips of men. Horrified, his comrades jumped in after him. In the struggle that followed, Alexander was struck in the chest with an arrow, a grievous wound that nearly killed him. Such seemingly foolish acts of bravery may have been a bid to win the respect of his officers. But did resentment and feelings of inadequacy fuel the violence that would become Alexander's trademark? Beginning in 335 with the conquest and burning of Thebes, one of Greece's oldest and most renowned cities. Alexander's record on the battlefield is punctuated by massacre, murder, torture, and disfigurement. Some historians describe these atrocities as part of Alexander's empire-building strategy through dramatic displays of death and destruction, they say. He hoped to snuff out each enemy and deter others from ever mounting a challenge again. But in many cases, the accounts of these incidents do not describe Alexander making calm, rational decisions in pursuit of a strategy. Instead, they portray a man boiling over with a blind rage that's disproportionate to the situation and seemingly without cause. Consider Alexander during the capture of Gaza in 332, after a two-month siege in which some 10,000 in the city were killed. Betis, Gaza's Persian governor, was brought before him. And though threatened with death, Betis remained silent and unbowed. And with this defias, Curtius tells us, Alexander's anger turned to fury. Thongs were passed through Betis's ankles while he still breathed, and he was tied to a chariot. Then Alexander's horses dragged him round the city while the king gloated at having followed the example of his ancestor Achilles in punishing his enemy by his heels. And Alexander displayed a similar lightning-quick outburst of fury in 328 when the Scythian cities of Persia revolted. He destroyed at least one of the cities to keep the others in line, according to Curtius or Curtius, the more correct Greek pronunciation, but at Chiropolis, the largest of the towns, resistance of its people so inflamed his rage that after its capture, he ordered it to be sacked. 
of the 15,000 men defending that town. 8,000 were killed outright. Citizens of another town took refuge in a fortress, but were massacred to the last when they surrendered for lack of water. The next year, during his India campaign, Alexander showed how quickly his anger could flare and spark violence. In the Swat Valley of Pakistan, after beating down opposition from a people called the Assassinians, he agreed to release a group of mercenaries who had fought with them at the siege of Masaga. The mercenaries left and encamped with their women and children many miles away, but Alexander apparently had a change of heart. He followed with his army, and falling upon them suddenly wrought a great slaughter, according to Diodorus. Alexander nursed an implacable hostility towards the soldiers, or so the historian Diodorus tells us, and to satisfy that anger, all of the 7,000 mercenaries were killed. None of these accounts, of course, proves that Alexander's monstrous acts were born of deep-seated insecurities. We can never probe his psyche deeply enough to know the truth. But these episodes suggest that the many portraits of Alexander as a military genius have clouded our understanding of him. We've been told again and again of his battlefield greatness, but that doesn't mean his every move had strategic purpose. Indeed, some of his most anus crimes appear to be rooted in his personality, not his generalship. He was Alex the Great, but he was also Alex the Monster. Now, in terms of the books, I told Penny I was reading how... Uh, there are three authors, E.J. Van Donzel, uh, Andrea B. Schmidt, and Claudia Ott, two women and a man, who in 2009 published the book entitled Gog and Magog in Early Syriac and Islamic Sources, Salam's Quest for Alexander's Wall was the subtitle. Now, in 2011, the author, or authoress, Faustina Dufikar Ertz, a hyphenated name because she married somebody, this book was published in the year my mother died, entitled Dog Faces, Snake Tongues, and the Wall Against Gog and Magog. Now, on pages 37 through 52, in this book that I'm also referencing that was, well, it was a team of editors, really. Uh, Ashgar A. Sayed Gorab, Faustina Dufikar Ertz, again, teaming up with Sen Miklin. All of them put together this book entitled Embodiments of Evil, subtitled Gog and Magog. So, you've got these interdisciplinary studies, uh, and um, one of them is actually a reissue of a work originally entitled Gog and Magog, subtitled The Clans of Chaos in World Literature. That was released the year my father died, 2007. There is uh, a magazine that uh, I got a hold of. There's an article in it, a review, by uh, Jean-Charles Duquesne, or, yeah, Duquesne, basically, D-U-C-E-N-E, -E, with an accent E in the middle. And this one, uh, again, published 2012, when we all thought the world was going to end. Gog and Magog and Early Christian and Islamic Sources. Salam's Quest for Alexander's Wall. This is in the magazine Central Asian Survey, Volume 31, Issue 1. Another work 
is The Great Alexandrian Romance, uh, authored by Richard Stoneman, published in 1991. Uh, this is all bringing us to Alexander's Wall and his Gates. One of the many books I've been enjoying this <sighs> springtide into summer, which will be upon us all too soon, is a book entitled On Monsters by Stephen T. Asthma, surname spelled A-S-M-A, not asthma like the breath disease. It's an extended look into where formal deviation occurs in the world and what unexpected, often emotionally disconcerting shapes and forces can result. Now, as I've talked about Alexander's Gates being at the Dariel Pass in the Caucasus Mountains in the past, as where it's often attributed per what understanding we could derive, this is going to take a lot of explanation into the walls. That'll take us all the way back to the Great Wall of China. That will culminate in that in many ways. Now, I want people to interact in the chat room. Let me know that they're hearing me. Let me know how I'm coming through. Let me know if what I'm saying is coherent. And uh, hope you're all listening. Hope you're all learning. I need to get as much done tonight as I can. And uh, we'll see what I can do. We've got basically an hour left. And uh, I can't do much, but I'm going to do what I can. By the way, when we were speaking of the Hachurui and the Serpent People and the Buddha, this is why I used the photograph I did tonight. Uh, do understand, of course, this is my mother's clothing, but if you ever wanted to see what uh, snakeskin pants look like, they're in this photo, the uh, photographic image embedded in thumbnail of uh, tonight's live stream, and uh, you see my crotch over uh, my, uh, well, my hand over my crotch, uh, basically, but you can get a kind of a look at the snakeskin pants uh, that are somewhat infamous from a few other photographs. Uh, these are some of my mother's favorite clothes that I always feel most comfortable in myself. And, uh, of course, uh, basically, um, we had, of course, the um, holidays that were on recently, and uh, uh, my son took that photograph while I actually had a hard-on uh, in expectation of the escort that... Um, he had uh, established uh, for my relations uh, that weekend. And uh, so um, he catches me hiding that. Uh, and that's the only reason I can upload that photo on uh, on uh, YouTube without uh, getting knocked off is because I'm covering that hard on. So uh, aside from all that, uh, maybe it's too much detail. But um, other than that, most people wouldn't appreciate certain details anyway. Uh, now, according to Asma, the author of um, this book on monsters, Stephen Asma, measuring these swerves and abnormalities of, you know, well, human social history against each other and against ourselves can shed much needed light on the alternative developmental trajectories by which monsters come into being like the Tao Tai, that I was providing you their arc of development in terms of human con conceptualization of what they are, what they represent. This is the monsters of the mind as opposed to the monsters of history like Alexander. And the speculative monsterology, as Asma describes it, would thus uncover the rules by which even the most stunning mutational transformations occur, allowing us to catalog extraordinary beings according to what Asma calls a continuum of strangeness. First, non-native species, then familiar beasts with unfamiliar sizes or modified body parts, then hybrids of surprising combination, and finally, at the furthest margins, shapeshifters and indescribable creatures. Now, Asma specifically mentions mosaic beings, beings grafted together or hybridized by nature or artifice. So, in the book's fascinating first third, 
easily the book's best section. Asma spends a great deal of time describing ancient myths of variation by which monsters were believed to have originated. And from the mind-blowing and completely inexplicable discovery of dinosaur bones by ancient societies with no conception of geological time, to the hordes of monstrous races believed to exist on the imperial perimeter, there have always been monsters somewhere in the world's geography. Of specific relevance to an architecture blog, however... <laughs> would be Alexander's Gates. The wall of Dul Kernin, the mythic isotope to Alexander's Gates, is pictured most famously in Persian art. Now, Asma writes that Alexander's Gates were the ultimate wall between the literally Caucasian West, the White World Order, and its monstrous opponents, dating back to Alexander the Great. Now, Alexander supposedly chased his foreign enemies through a mountain pass in the Caucasus region, and then enclosed them behind unbreachable iron gates. The details and the symbolic significance of the story changed slightly in every medieval retelling, and it was retold often, especially in the age of exploration, where people feared to find these gates and open them, ushering in the end of the world. The maps of the time, the mappe mundi, the maps of the world, almost always include the gates, though their placement is not consistent. I'm reading from the book. Most maps and narratives of the latter medieval period agree that this prison territory, created proximately by Alexander but ultimately by God, houses the savage tribes of Gog and Magog, who are referred to with great ambiguity throughout the Bible and sometimes as individual monsters, sometimes as nations, sometimes as places. In other words, beyond this wall was a Monster Zone. Now, think of the geography of us versus them. In a 12th century map by the Muslim scholar Al-Idrizi, Yeyuj, Y-A-J-O-O-J, and Mayuj, M-A-J-O-O-J, Gog and Magog, appear in Arabic script on the bottom left edge of the Eurasian landmass in this image that I'm looking at in this book entitled 12th Century Map by the Muslim Scholar Al-Idrizi. And I'm reading the Arabic, which he does not translate. And this Yajuj and Majuj appear in the Arabic script on the bottom left edge of the Eurasian landmass enclosed within dark mountains at a location corresponding roughly to Mongolia. Interestingly, a variation of this story is also told within Islam. Indeed, in the Quran itself. In Islamic mythology, however, Alexander the Great is renamed perhaps even replaced by a figure called Dul Kernain, who might also be a legendary variation on the Persian king Koresh. You call him Cyrus with Anglo-corruption in your language. C-Y-R-U-S. It's pronounced Koresh. This is whom David Koresh of the Branch Davidian Church at Waco named himself after. The man whose cult was annihilated at Waco, or at least massacred. Some survivors. Now, even more interesting than that, however, the Quran's own story of geographically distant monsters entombed behind a vast wall, the border fence as theological infrastructure, appears to be a kind of literary remix of the so-called 
Alexandrian romance. To quote that widely known religious authority, Wikipedia, because I tried to look this up and the first thing that comes up is that shit. They say, the story of Dul Quernain in the Quran matches the Gog and Magog episode in the romance, which has caused some controversy among Islamic scholars. That is, the Quran, supposedly the exact and holy words of God himself, actually contains a secular myth from 3rd century Greece. The construction of Dul Karnayan's wall against the non-Muslim monstrous hordes can specifically be found in verses, well, the book is 18, the verses are 89 through 98. Mm. Exemplai Gratiae. Lend me a force of men and I will raise a rampart between you and them. Come, bring me blocks or iron. He dammed up the valley between the two mountains and said, Ply your bellows. And when the iron blocks were red with heat, he said, Bring me molten brass to pour upon them. Gog and Magog could never scale it, nor could they dig their way through it. Think of it as a kind of religious quarantine, a biosafety wall through which no moral contagion could ever pass. But as with all border walls and all imperial limits, there will someday be a breach. For instance, Asma goes on to cite a book published in the 14th century called The Travels of Sir John Mandeville. There we read how Alexander's gates will, on some future day blackened by the full horror of monstrous return, be rendered completely obsolete. Reading from this book on monsters, this paragraph. In the end, Mandeville predicts, a lowly fox will bring the chaos of invading monsters upon the heads of the Christians. He claims, without revealing how he cometh by such specific prophecy, that during the time of the Antichrist a fox will dig a hole through Alexander's gates and emerge inside the monster zone. The monsters will be amazed to see the fox, as such creatures do not live there locally, and they will follow it until it reveals its narrow passageway between the gates. The cursed sons of Cain will finally burst forth from the gates, and the realm of the reprobate will be emptied into the apocalyptic world. In any case, the idea that the line between human and not human has been represented in myth and religion as a very specifically architectural form that is, a literal wall built high in the mountains, far away, is absolutely fascinating to me. Further, it's not hard to wonder how Alexander's gates compare on the level of imperial psychology to things like the Great Wall of China, the Berlin Wall, the United States-Mexico border fence, or the Dew Line. D-E-W, the Distant Early Warning Line. Even London's Ring of Steel, let alone the Black Gates of Mordor in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. By the way, the Distant Early Warning Line is that line of radars in the Northern Pole. Uh, one end of Canada to another. Their radar dishes pointed towards Russia crossed the northern polar sea. They manifest an electromagnetic Alexander's Gate in the new Cold War. Perhaps there is a kind of theological hyperborder waiting to be written about the wall of Gog and Magog. 
Or could someone produce an architectural history of border stations as described in world mythology? I would sense myself an amazing PhD, uh, philo philosophie doctorate research topic there. Uh, of course, PhD can also stand for piled higher and deeper. But without piling higher and deeper, well, without piling higher, we're certainly going to go deeper. This is where we come upon Iran's Wolf Wall, the second longest wall in the world, ultimately connecting to the Great Wall of China. Still shrouded in mystery, the Golestan province in northern Iraq is a unique landscape. And sandwiched between the temperate forests of the Al Borj Mountains and the Caspian Sea, the narrow corridor that connects Persia with the desert steppes of Asia is where the Garden of Eden is found. The passage measures 120 miles across from sea to mountain. It's made of fertile rolling plains rising to windswept hills. The ancient name for this place was Gorgon, meaning land of wolves. And wild wolves can still be found there, along with roe deer and bounding goitered gazelles. For centuries, Golestan lay at the northern border of one of the world's first superpowers, the Sassanian or the Sasanian Empire. And for nigh half a thousand years, 400 years at least, from their ascension in the 3rd century until they fell to Muslim conquerors around the year 600, the Sasanians ruled a vast stretch of the ancient Near East from their capital in Stesiphon, just south of Baghdad, while the Western Roman Empire struggled in Europe. The Sasanians brought a golden age to the region, now covered by Iran, Iraq, Syria, and Turkey. That's what brings us to the Wolf Wall. Because there in Golestan, the scope of that empire's ambition left its mark on the landscape in a remarkable way. Across the plain stretches a mighty border wall, surpassed in size and scale only by the Great Wall of China. It's known as the Wall of Gorgan, and unlike its Chinese counterpart, much of its construction remains an unsolved mystery to this day. Powerful as it was, the Sasanian Empire also had formidable enemies. Chief among these were the vast horse-borne armies of the Huns, who regularly menaced their northern borders. And the most dangerous were the Hephthalites, the so-called White Huns. They left no record, well, no written records behind. So, who they were, what language they spracketh, and where they camest from is all a mystery. We do know as though that their swift armies routinely made forays out of the harsh desert lands deep into the Sasanian Empire, the flat, fertile Gorgon region was the main corridor which they mounted, well, through which they mounted their attacks. To counter this threat, the Sasanians undertook an engineering project of immense ambition beginning in the 5th century. They began to construct a wall that would span the entire length of the Gorgon Lowlands, a sinuous barrier of mud bricks that would ultimately stretch farther than the combined length of Hadrian's Wall and its more northern cousin, the Antonine Wall. And for a thousand years, until the extension of the Great Wall of China, under the Ming Dynasty, 
The Gorgon Wall was the longest wall in the world. 121 miles of it have now been unearthed, and it follows the line of division between the rich plains and the hardy desert almost exactly. An engineering marvel. The archaeologist Warwick Ball has called the Wall of Gorgon amongst the most ambitious and sophisticated frontier walls ever built. That's especially high praise given that the wall is made solely from mud, with no trees or stone available on the Gorgon Plain. The only building material was dirt from the river basin itself. The 5th century, Sasanian engineers attacked this problem with characteristic ingenuity, effectively creating an immense mobile brick-making industry to produce the millions of fired mud bricks that makest up the wall. Along its entire length, archaeologists have found the remains of temporary kilns, each designed to an identical blueprint, which would have been moved along the wall as it was built. Mud bricks need water to be molded. So as well as kilns, the ancient engineers had to dig hundreds of kilometers of canals that brought water from the region's rivers to the construction site. Once the wall was completed, the engineers joined up the canals and turned them into a moat on the wall's defensive side, an enormous earthwork that is still visible today. This may also have been used as a water source for soldiers and workers in the arid plain. The wall's design reveals the immaculate planning that went into its construction. Along, the, along its entire length, there is very little variation. It remains 10 meters wide and 3 meters tall for over 100 miles. Each brick in the wall is of uniform size and shape. 16 by 16 by 4 inches. 16 times 16 times 4. And the distinctive red color of the bricks gives the wall its local name, the Red Snake, or Kizil Elan in the Turkoman language. The wall even crossed rivers, where engineers built dams and sluices, sections of which are still visible in the silty waters 1,500 years later. To add to the wall's length, or rather its strength, 30 forts also bolstered the defenses, spaced at intervals between 6 and 30 miles. To have been effective, the wall must have been constantly garrisoned with a standing army, and indeed excavations of possible barracks buildings in the area suggest that between 15,000 to 36,000 men were stationed in the forts along its length. Organic material found in the forts shows the Sazanian soldiers consumed a rich diet including fish from the nearby Caspian Sea and crops from the wall's verdant hinterland. Despite all this, the exact details of the Gorgan Wall story are still wreathed in mystery. In 2008, Current Archaeology, that's a specialist magazine, reported that no ancient textual source refers to the wall, no inscription, and no coin has ever been found on it. Though many theories propose to explain who ordered it built, the wall itself still refuses to give up its secrets. We can only wonder at the wall. We also don't know why the wall was abandoned and left to crumble. 
around 200 years after its construction, something changed. All activity at the wall suddenly and mysteriously ceased, and it was no longer manned or defended. Archaeologists speculate that maintaining its enormous standing garrison might have become too expensive, or the threat of Hunnic raids simply faded. Perhaps the troops were needed to support dynastic feuding or an attack on the rival Eastern Roman Empire. After its abandonment, the wall began to break down as natural weathering processes ate away at the bricks, and it has been covered in places by the shifting sand dunes. Human needs have taken their toll as well, as successive generations have digested the walls' constituent parts for building materials. Even today, people continue to plunder the wall for its perfectly shaped bricks, using them to furnish their own homes. But the Gorgon Wall has made its mark on legend, too inscribed in the popular imagination as deeply as it leaves its mark on the Golestan landscape. In the Quran, a hero called Dul Kanein is said to have built a wall encased in iron to repel attacks from the savage people of Gog and Magog. In the book or chapter of Surat al-Kaif verses or pages 83 through 98 I read help me therefore with strength and labor I will erect a strong barrier wall between you and them at length when he had filled up the space between the two steep mountain sides, he said, Blow with your bellows. Then, when he made it red as fire, he said, Bring me that I may pour over it molten lead. Thus were they made powerless to scale it or to dig through it. While the historical accuracy of this description has not been verified, many Quranic scholars believe that the wall of Dul Karnain and the Gorgon wall are one and the same. Dul Karnain, in fact, is oft-times rumored to have been none other than Alexander the Great, who is supposed to have built just such a metal wall known as the Gates of Alexander. Now, some might claim, conventional scholars, would uh, continue to insist, assert that little evidence for the role of Alexander in the construction of the Gorgon Wall has been found beyond this legend. Today, the Gorgon Wall is a stark reminder that the history of the world is not just the history of the West. Its breadth is a testament to the ingenuity and determination of ancient peoples, and illustrates how, at a time when the order of Western Europe was collapsing, great powers elsewhere were achieving marvels. Now, in terms of revealing one of the world's greatest frontier walls, the Great Wall of Gorgon and how this serves as a a link between Persia and China and ultimately Alexandrian Greece. We have a situation where I can do my best only to iterate and reiterate if need be. Again, for emphasis, understand this is longer than Hadrian's Wall and the Antonine Wall taken together. And it is over a thousand years older than the Great Wall of China as we know it today.
It is of more solid construction than its ancient Chinese counterparts. It is the greatest monument of its kind between Central Europe and China, and it may be the longest brick or stone wall ever built in the ancient world. And yet, you have never heard of it. Indeed, few have ever heard of it. This wall, known as the Great Wall of Gorgon, the Great Wall of Gorgon, or the Red Snake, there's been an international team of archaeologists at work on that snake-like monument that have reported their findings on which I base what I relate to you. Now, this red snake in northern Iran, which owes its name to the red color of its bricks, is at least 195 kilometers long. And a canal, five meters deep or more, conducted water along most of the wall. Its continuous gradient, designed to ensure regular water flow, the regular flow of the water upon it, bears witness to the skills of the land surveyors responsible for marking out the wall's route. Over 30 forts are lined up along this massive structure, the combined size is about three times that of those of Hadrian's Wall. Yet these forts are small in comparison with contemporary fortifications in the hinterland, some of which are around ten times larger than the largest wall forts. The Red Snake is unmatched in so many respects, and yet an enigma in so many more. Who built this defensive barrier of awesome scale and sophistication? When and for what reason? Even its length is unclear. Its western terminal was flooded by the rising waters of the Caspian Sea, while to the east it runs into the unexplored mountainous landscape of the Elbrus Mountains. And so it is that an Iranian team, under the direction of Jabril Nokanda, has been exploring this great wall since 1999. In 2005, it finally became a joint Iranian and British project. Mm. Their aim being to answer the fundamental questions of when, who, and why. As I've said, no ancient textual source refers to this wall, no inscription, no coin ever found upon it. With respect to the when question, rather than basing their dating on historical guesswork, they felt that they needed to obtain independent scientific dating. So, in dating the enigma, when was this wall built? Some thought it was erected under the Macedonian king Alexander, who reached the area in 330 BC, but died seven years later. Indeed, the wall is also known as Alexander's Barrier. Others suggested it was built as late as the 6th century AD under the great Persian king Khusrau I, who reigned from 531 to 579 on the Christian calendar. And owing to his 1970s fieldwork, Mohammed Yosef Kiani and many scholars thereafter have favored a second or first century BC construction. Who was right? Fortunately, the wall's engineers had used construction techniques eminently suitable to modern dating techniques and running mostly through a landscape of wind-blown loss and in sections, treeless steppe, there was no sufficient supply of stone or timber for construction purposes. The loss, L-O-E-S-S, however, 
was an ideal material to produce tens, if not hundreds, of millions of fired bricks. Each of them was square and of standardized size. 37 centimeters diameter in the west of the wall, 40 centimeters in the east end, some 8 centimeters to 11 centimeters thick. These huge bricks were produced on an industrial scale. Surveys indicating that brick kilns line most of the wall. In some areas, they found kilns under 40 meters apart, in others, almost 100 meters. Overall, there were probably several thousand brick kilns built for the sole purpose of creating the ancient Near East's greatest linear barrier. So, could these kilns, these kilns yield the evidence they needed to date the monument? If they used wood fuel, they would have left charcoal, a material suitable for radiocarbon dating. Furthermore, a kiln seemed a promising candidate for a second independent technique, OSL or optically stimulated luminescence dating. Each time sediments are exposed to direct sunlight, or in this case, heated up by fire, the luminescence clock is set back to zero. This allows for them to be OSL dated, which in turn promised to reveal when the kilns had last been used. With these possibilities in mind, in September of 2005, they ventured to the vicinity of the wall's easternmost known point in the foothills of the Elbers Mountains, where a kiln had been located in a previous survey. Their chosen kiln seemed particularly suitable. It was just 13 to 20 meters away from the wall, and it was on a slope without traces of settlement of any other period, and so steep that it was sometimes difficult to gain a foothold when excavating it. They could thus be certain that it had been constructed specifically for burning bricks for the wall, and it be unlikely anybody would have reused it at a later date. Soon they established that it had virtually identical dimensions to a kiln excavated in the 1970s, over 60 kilometers further west and also next to the wall. Their kiln and the others known thus far were designed for 10 stacks of bricks sideways and 17 to 18 lengthwise. They were all replicas of a single prototype. Powerful evidence that the wall builders were behind the standardized design. Now sediments washed down the steep slope had preserved their target kiln remarkably well. Its 11 arches survived on the hillside to their full height of 2 meters, not counting another meter of superstructure. Two collapsed arches offered an opportunity to dig a sondage into the interior without destroying any preserved architecture. Eventually they reached a dark layer of charcoal, and, immediately underneath, the kiln's fire-reddened bottom. They had achieved their goal. And Dr. Jean-Luc Schwenninger and Dr. Morteja Fatahi of the universities of Oxford and Tehran flew in to take OSL samples in October of 2005. They also sampled various sections of the wall itself and of a second shorter wall further west, the wall of Tamashe, as well as a kiln next to it that they had also ex excavated. And they impatiently awaited the results, of course. The OSL and radiocarbon samples demonstrated conclusively that both walls had been built in the 5th or possibly 6th century. That brings us to the White Huns. With the benefit of hindsight, it is easy to see why the walls would have been constructed at the later date. It was near the northern boundary of one of the most powerful empires in the ancient world, 
that of the Sasanian Persians. Centered in modern Iran, it also encompassed the territory of modern Iraq, stretched into the Caucasus Mountains in the northwest, and into Central Asia and the Indian subcontinent in the east. The Persian kings repeatedly invaded the Eastern Roman or Byzantine Empire. Yet they also faced fierce enemies at their northern frontier. Mountain passes in the Caucasus and the coastal route along the Caspian Sea were closed off by walls, probably to prevent the Huns from penetrating south. Those further east may have been directed against the Hephthalites or White Huns. The ancient writers, notably Procopius, provided graphic descriptions of the wars Persia fought in the 5th and 6th century against its northern opponents. We know thereby that the Persian king Peroj, who reigned from 459 through 484 on our Christian calendar, when campaigning against the White Huns, spent time repeatedly at ancient Gorgon, next to modern Ganbad Kavis, which is the site of the archaeologist's base camp just south of the wall. Eventually, he had to pay with his life for venturing into the lands of the White Huns. It would have made perfect sense for Peroj, or perhaps another Persian king shortly before or after, to protect the fertile and rich Gorgon Plain from this northerly threat through a defensive barrier. Then there was the discovery of massive buildings. All these important questions uh, still remain unresolved. Was the wall a heavily defended frontier for centuries? Or an ambitious engineering project, perhaps abandoned after no more than ephemeral use? Fort 4, some 14 acres, or uh, five and a half hectares large, was selected for magnetometer survey in 2006. And to their amazement, Roger Ainsley's highly sensitive equipment revealed three buildings of 228 centimeters length, or circa, around 228 meters length, I mean to say. So much detail was visible on the plots that they could see individual rooms. The regular layout suggests that they served as barrack blocks, and they started to excavate. And where the magnetometer survey had pinpointed a room division, they found a massive mud brick wall, 1.20 meters wide, and surviving to a height of circa around 30 meters, 3.30 meters. Originally, the buildings must have been much higher, as their collapsed remains still form distinctive mounds today. Satellite images show that Fort 4 was not a one-off, but that numerous other forts on the wall, and originally probably all, contained collapsed barracks blocks as well. This quantity of pottery and animal bones from their two trenches in Fort 4, excavated in 2006 and 2007, right up to when, or even through, my mother's death, which also, well, my father's death, my mother didn't die till 2011, which in 2007, as my father died, also yielded some glass and metal, demonstrates powerfully that the fort's interior bustled with life. Radiocarbon dates indicate that the fort remained occupied until at least the first half of the 7th century. It is too early to tell whether or not the wall was abandoned then, perhaps because troops were needed for a final assault against the Byzantine Empire, fighting off the Byzantine counteroffensive or against the Arab invasion from AD 636 onwards. 
The evidence is mounting, however, that the wall functioned as a military barrier for at least a century, probably closer to 200 years. Oh, let me take a look at my notifications all piling up here. Hmm. Sammy Romero left another comment. Let's see what he has to say. Good night, Doug. I'll catch the rest tomorrow. God bless. Yes, God bless you, young man. Thank you so much for letting me know. Ah, and uh, here we are. This is, of course, the hippie dude that I'm responding to. Our friend uh, Robert Campbell thinks he's a comedian. That's fine by me. It's all right. Everybody forgive me. As soon as I'm done with transmission tonight, God knows, uh, just a drink and I'll be back to sleep. <laughs> oh. All right, we got half an hour left. See if I can finish describing the enormity of this to you. Now, as I said, Originally, the buildings must have been much higher, as their collapsed remains still form distinctive mounds today. Satellite images show that Fort 4 was not a one-off. There's numerous other forts all along the wall. Uh, and probably, originally probably, all of them contain collapsed barrack blocks as well. The quantity of pottery and animal bones from their two... Archaeologist trenches in Fort 4, excavated in 2006 and 2007, which also yielded some glass and metal, demonstrates powerfully that the fort's interior bustled with life. Radiocarbon dates indicate that the fort remained occupied until at least the first half of the 7th century. It is too early to tell whether or not the wall was abandoned then, Perhaps because troops were needed for a major assault against the Byzantine Empire, fighting off the Byzantine counteroffensive, or against the Arab invasion from Anno Domini 636 onwards. The evidence is mounting, however, that the wall functioned as a military barrier for at least a century, uh, probably. Closer to two. Now, in terms of the wall as a military garrison, it was powerful. If you were to wonder how many soldiers guarded the Persian Empire's most elaborate military barrier, if we assumed that the forts were occupied as densely as those on Hadrian's Wall, then the garrison on the Gorgan Wall would have been in the order of 30,000 men. Hmm. Models. Taking into account the size and room number of the barracks blocks in the Gorgan Wall forts and likely occupation density, produce figures between 15,000 and 36,000 soldiers. Even the lowest estimates suggests a strong and powerful army, all the more remarkable as the investigations focused on just 200 kilometers of vulnerable frontier, a small fraction of the thousands of kilometers of borders in one of the ancient world's largest empires. How many soldiers may have been stationed in the hinterland? Well, in the year my father died, 2007, hmm. They launched a major geophysical survey, followed by three trial trenches in Kela Karaba, a square fortification covering half a square kilometer, a little over a mile south of the wall. Analysis of the pottery from Kala Karaba by South Priestman suggests that the fortification was occupied for a short period, perhaps in the earliest phase of the wall's history. 
Small brick, well, small mud brick houses seemed to line its central roads. They excavated one. An analysis of the material therein indicated that its occupants consumed a rich diet, including fish, presumably from the Caspian Sea, some 45 kilometers further west. Yet, they do not even know whether these erstwhile gourmands were soldiers or civilians. The regular square layout of the defenses and the neat rows of rectangular enclosures inside suggests, in any case, that the wall builders had created it. So was it a failed urban foundation? Was it a temporary camp for the Persian Field Army, reinforcing the wall's garrison during the war? Or was it sudden abandonment, linked to the army moving from the hinterland to the wall forts. Now, a geophysical survey at Fort 16 suggests that there are brick kilns underneath and that this fort was no part, well, not part of the original design. Begging the question, is it possible that some or all of the forts were only added to the wall at a later stage? and that troops had originally stayed at sites like Kale Karaba. In terms of the wall and its landscape, the wall did not exist in a vacuum. The dense occupation of its fertile hinterland explains why it was built and how the garrison was fed. The project was thus confined to the wall itself, but included a wider landscape survey. The scale of such a survey is ideal for understanding the works of ancient empires, because both the landscape itself and the public works of empires cover vast areas. Because of the large areas that needed to, needed to be covered, field work of the Gorgon project proceeded at three different scales. At the regional level, they used satellite images to map the entire area of wall and ancillary structures. Individual structures, forts, sites, and kilns were then mapped using geophysical structure to recognize hidden and underground structures. Finally, details were carefully targeted for investigation. Within this framework of the landscape, well... Within this program, the landscape itself was studied using the capability of satellite images to map the entire region of the wall and beyond. Clearly, the circa 195 kilometer long Red Snake required a huge amount of labor for its construction. But what was generally not known until Nokanda, Omrani, and colleagues discovered a large dam and associated canals was that the process of wall construction was even more labor-intensive. This was because a huge landscape project was initiated at the time of the wall construction to capture and divert water into the ditch that ran along the north side of the wall. And this exercise in water management appears to have been part of an integrated approach to wall construction. In such a semi-arid area, the water required for manufacturing bricks, as well as for use by the inhabitants of the forts, was not readily available. Water was therefore brought to the building site via a series of at least five canals that, when directed the water into the ditch, well, in terms of the kinds of canals, the way they were impacting the uh, water management, the integrated approach required for the manufacturing of the bricks and the inhabitants of the forts. As I said, that water wasn't readily available. It was brought to the building site via via the series of at least five canals that then directed the water into the ditch on the north side of the wall. And although that ditch was evidently a defensive feature, it must also have been used as the source of the soil for the bricks in the, used in the wall. And initially, field evidence implied that the water was impounded behind 
massive earthen dams like the so-called Sadi Garkaz. However, field work in 2007, the year my own late and sainted sire died. <sighs> has demonstrated that the water was instead gathered from much further afield by a major canal that collected water from a river located in the southeast of the Gorgon River. Water was then led across the top of the dam, which was actually a huge earthen aqueduct, into a canal which led water northward towards the main ditch along the wall. In addition, this canal supplied a second canal located to the south of the wall, and parallel to it, perhaps to supply the ubiquitous brick kilns. And although the precise mode of water capture of the other canals is less clear, these appear to have received their water directly from the Gorgon River, presumably via a water diversion offtake as is customary with major canals in alluvial plains. Now, not only did the Sasanian kings create a new landscape by the construction of water supply canals. They also cut through the pre-existing Parthian and earlier Sanzanian landscape like a knife. This resulted in the wall severing pre-existing landscape features such as canal that had probably provided the essential supply of irrigation water to the massive site of Tokmak a few generations earlier. The Gorgon Wall, Gorgan Wall, appears to have cut through at least some, well, one other major earlier canal system, again cutting off its uh, recipient settlements. There is, however, nothing to say that a massive and wholesale abandonment of land took place at a time of wall construction. Rather, our site surveys, as well as studies, the associated poetry of Seth Priestman suggests that a considerable area of arid steppe to the north of the wall, which had been occupied intensively several centuries earlier, was abandoned long before the wall's construction, with the result that it was a redundant landscape that was severed by the Red Snake, this being a model that that requires some testing by future work. So, to finalize, they're searching the wall under the sea because the Red Snake is by far the longest and most elaborate Persian defensive wall, but it has several smaller counterparts. And... The land corridor between the Caucasus Mountains and the west coast of the Caspian Sea is closed off by a series of walls. The most famous is the Wall of Durbant in modern Dagestan, that area in Russia which be Muslim and from which everyone's favorite mixed martial arts fighter, whom our man Daniel Arola can name, sources from, where he still teaches today. As a matter of fact, um, let me look him up because Daniel wouldn't have it otherwise. Okay, and we should get the champion here in terms of, uh, I think it's, uh, good God, what is this? Fighters flock to Russia's Dagestan where wrestling is a way of life. I keep getting X videos. You know, I know I cruise for a lot of porn. I'm looking at, uh, you know, uh, MM. <laughs> I'm getting mixed uh, martial arts wrestling. <laughs> or, uh, oh God, even worse, guys, uh, jerking off. Let me say fighter on this. Uh, martial art fighter. Fighter. And uh, see what the guy's name in Dragestan is. Uh, UFC fighters, there we are. This should be it, and uh, this might uh, ultimate fighting championship. There we are, and uh, see if we got the guy's name there. That is, uh, uh, oh god, there's a few of them here. I can't really identify which one is which. I'll leave that to when we've got Daniel Arola with us. 
Uh, uh, of course, the biggest name is probably Habib uh, Nurmagomedov. Nurmagomedov. Okay, so uh, back to the task at hand in the few minutes we have remaining. Uh, much closer to the Red Snake is the contemporary wall of Tamish, uh, which runs from the southeast corner of the Caspian Sea into the Elburz Mountains. The Caspian Sea is the world's largest inland sea and depends on inflowing rivers for its water. Its water level has thus fluctuated much more over the centuries than that of the oceans. In 2006, they excavated a test pit in, into a Sazanian brick kiln next to the Red Snake, and though it is now seven kilometers inland, it is overlain by marine shells. Radiocarbon dating revealed that the kiln had in fact been submerged under the waters of the rising Caspian Sea in the 14th or 15th century. Whereas when the wall was built, about one millennium, a thousand years earlier, the Caspian Sea's water level had been a few meters lower than it is today. Today, the Durbent Wall runs into territory currently flooded by the Caspian Sea. And, according to a report by the 19th century, British traveler Charles Edward Yate, so too is the Red Snake. The only wall, however, so far explored by underwater archaeologists is the Tamisha, the Tamisha Wall, which was discovered by an Iranian team involving the underwater archaeologist Hossein Tofigian. A joint Iranian and British team followed in their footsteps and dived into the murky water of the Gulf of Gorgon in 2007. That year, my father was thanatized as the VA, so terms it. Despite the shallow depth of around two meters, visibility in the uniformly greenish to yellowish water, all cloudy water, that, well, that visibility within that soup does not reach as far as a single foot. The divers, notably Julian Jansen Van Rensburg, relied solely on their sense of touch. Yet the knowledge of local boatmen, a satellite image, and a depth survey allowed them to precision target promising features. In some areas, the seabed was so densely strewn with fragments of Sazanian bricks that one hardly ever touched the seabed without concentrations, not all in one line, suggesting that there must be more than just the wall running into the sea. If future work may tell what other monuments the Caspian Sea conceals, perhaps a Sasanian fort, or perhaps a harbor. Whatever is to be found, what we have found is an ancient superpower. This project is seriously challenging all our traditional Eurocentric worldview. At the time when the Western Roman Empire was collapsing, and even the Eastern Roman or Byzantine Empire was under great external pressure, the Zazanian Persian Empire mustered the manpower to build and garrison a monument of greater scale than anything comparable in the West. The Persians seem to match, or more than match, their late Roman rivals in army strength, organizational skills, engineering, and water management. Archaeology is just now beginning to paint a clearer picture of an ancient superpower at its apogee. Now, of course, in the few minutes we have remaining, uh, yes, Ragnar Lodbrok, bless him, is joining us. Thank you so much for your support in the chat room. Everyone who's here, I always encourage interaction. And, uh, okay, checking around at whatever messages might have been left by all these wonderful people. 
God bless them all. They're so supportive. Okay, in the time we have remaining, which is uh, very little. Yes, Ragnar Lodbrok says the Sasanian Empire was incredible, uh, just as the Han Empire in China from 200 years before Christ to 200 years after his death. He says, incredible Oriental empires. Oh, Bizarre HD gives a heart. God bless him, George Knight. Oh my God, I'm seeing a message from him now. Um, honestly, I had to get this done, however. Really had to get this out there. That way we have some continuity of narrative, bring everything together with our next transmission. Uh, we've basically got now maybe 10 minutes remaining. <laughs> uh, I might as well just solicit and when we bring the transmission on next time, I can start with how the Gog and Magog, uh, Alexander's Wall, uh, has led to the Great Wall of China. The Gog and Magog behind Alexander the Great's Wall in China. This is uh, what I need to come to with the next transmission and basically explain to people some of the very... Uh, incredible impacts of uh, of all of the movement of of peoples in ancient Eurasia, the Chinese cosmology, and Jewish and Christian scripture, and uh, the uh, just some of the sources that I can bring up of Alexander the Great using genies, the jinn, to build a great great wall. Uh, and uh, what all of that uh, can teach us now uh, about demonization and xenophobia and the comforting fiction of a wall and uh, what uh, that has to deal ultimately with the ghoul and Alexander the Great's salvation of humanity from the unclean races that were forced into the bowels of the earth and ultimately the impact that that had on the Christians who disappeared from the surface of the earth when the Ghazia, the warriors of Islam, swept North Africa. So that, as painful as it is, I am now obligated to pursue in the next transmission Hopefully, already, the sentient and sapient, or pseudo-sentient, pseudo-sapient entities that I've brought up tonight have educated people to a great degree. And WTF, uh, oh, Bizarre HD says, thank you so much, Douglas. Oh, I love you dearly, George Knight, and your family. God bless them all. Uh, Ragnar Lodbrok gives a thumbs up. Uh, uh, George Knight gives us a heart. WTF says, good evening to Douglas and all. Mr. What the fuck says, a little late for the transmission. Long work day. And Ragnar Lodbrok says, thanks, Douglas. Thank you for everything you do. And WTF says, much love from Australia. Thank you, sir. And we spoke of Australia earlier. Spra Spracathon, some questions people had. Hope everyone uh, will join in listening to that. And let me take these last few minutes uh, we have left to us tonight. And hopefully next week, we Sunday night, we can bring uh, Mr. George Knight on with us. It'll be the day after, um, you know, this little interview I have with our um, lovely Penny Bradley. And uh, that, ought to be, um, that ought to be cute. And uh, we'll see where we go with that. And um, I have no doubt it'll be of some level of... Uh, entertainment, uh, if not education and information. I'm sure it'll be all of that. All right. Um, gosh, I hate, um, you know, soliciting. It is like pulling teeth for me. Anyone who knows me knows that. Uh, but uh, definitely in uh, what time we have remaining, um, The uh, at this point, um, less than 10 minutes, probably about eight, uh, let me try and uh, emphasize uh, the most important things. First off, I'm getting dental work done and I need to be able to pay the rent. And therefore, I want everyone to understand that while I've got a great deal covered by all of you wonderful people that I've given credit to, a uh, shout out again to these wonderful people. Uh, I sent the link of 
the episode dedicated to Australia, uh, to um, Louis Rogers in New South Wales. I'm hoping WTF reviews that or has reviewed it uh, and will review the follow up tonight and uh, I, I, on that subject and uh, why there's a geopolitical inevitability. Uh, I want to towards what I was saying in terms of my analysis, my uh, you know, predictions uh, for Australia as a superpower on the world stage. And I um, also described the kind uh, that it will be, and I'm not effusing, I'm simply contextualizing. We're talking about a birth of a totalitarian empire um, that will uh, be viewed the same way we viewed the Soviet Union. Um, a blight on the maps, but uh, obviously a different way of life that is almost inevitable in terms of its reappearance on the social spectrum in uh, times like these that have led to so much want and and, uh, and, and the need for security, overcoming the sense of a need for freedom. And uh, we'll see that most evident in the South Pacific um, for reasons I've articulated in that analysis on Australia that I conducted in honor of Louis Rogers for the money he contributed. He, the episode uh, to preceding tonight was dedicated to Joe Tai. Uh, in a sense, this is dedicated to him as well because we're on running from the themes that I introduced in that episode and we'll kind of draw them all together or, you know, uh, bring them to a kind of conclusion, a narrative conclusion on um, Sunday night. It's just oftentimes I get so uh, whacked uh, before I get on uh, transmission. Uh, honestly, I need people to buy me time and I find these wonderful people that are willing to do that. And then by the time I get started, there isn't enough time. So, uh, we'll see what I do on Sunday next. And, um, in the meantime, to make certain that I get there, <laughs> to make certain that, uh, I get to the end of the month with the ability to buy supplies for myself, make a certain to render contribution. Uh, the way you can do that is on screen paypal.me forward slash Douglas Dietrich is likely the easiest. Uh, Joe Tai used it to relay 250 United States dollars. Uh, God bless him. Uh, Eric Lastic sent a quarter of a hundred dollars by uh, check. Uh, and of course, our wonderful Salman Sheikh sent uh, 